Introduction of Young People's Treasury, Volume 6, Famous Travels and Adventures. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty B. Young People's Treasury, Volume 6, Famous Travels and Adventures by Hamilton Wright Maybe. Introduction the men or women are few who do not love to listen to travellers tales nor desire themselves to go out and see the world and to the imaginative youngster the hills which set a blue bound to his home horizon seem to hide a fascinating paradise of wonders and joy which he resolves to explore when he is grown up it has always been so and doubtless always will be although the world seems now so small to the globe-trotter and the newspaper tells us day by day what is happening in countries which a few years ago were almost as remote and inaccessible as the moon where stanley laboriously marched for weeks to meet livingstone one may now go by rail in a single night the falls of the zambezi utterly out of reach and lone when livingstone described them only a half century ago are furnishing electric light and power to highly civilized towns a burnaby need no longer ride for weary days across a desert to reach kiva for cooks will furnish him a railroad ticket thither or to the cities of marco polo's mysterious tartary far beyond even mecca itself where burton penetrated only after spending a lifetime in perfecting his disguise may soon be the terminus of a few days tour from cairo or jerusalem one who has been to the other side of the globe is no longer therefore remarkable not only london and new york but many smaller cities as well have travellers clubs and explorers clubs even women conduct expeditions into savage lands and climb the peaks of the andes or himalayas have this modern case of journeying into once remote and forbidden regions and the plentitude of advance information as to what may be seen there decreased travel or dulled the desire seemingly not the greater the facility the more the attraction many may go now to whom formerly it would be impossible steamships and railways thrive wherever established and are supported largely by their tourist traffic most travellers are more interested in old lands than in exploring new ones few of the thousands who visit jerusalem dare the hardships of the syrian desert to view wondrous petra or the abandoned cities of bashan as did burckhardt and porter yet no reading is more delightful than the accounts of their experiences by venturesome travellers like these we thrill as we turn the pages describing deliverance from bloody perils and in the comfort of our easy chairs find a fearful joy in details of privation and distress such as warburton underwent in the australian desert because we feel the heroic spirit of the writer animating the text moreover a lively narration of strange scenes and peoples pleasantly stimulates the imagination and makes us wish to read the book of some other person who has travelled there and get the picture as he saw it to read a good book of travel is like journeying with a remarkably wise companion who relieves us all of the trouble of the trip and gives us only the pleasure it was indeed the eager interest with which his home-keeping neighbors listened to his stories when perchance one had gone afield and had seen strange sights that led to that humorous and kindly exaggeration which presently made traveller's tales a proverb it was a wonder-loving age in which marco polo wandered through the regions of the khan even to japan because it was an ignorant one every marvel was acceptable so long as the minds of men were not yet free from the wild superstitions of the middle ages corrupted relics of the poetic myths of antiquity the discovery of the new western continent the circumnavigation of africa and then of the whole globe had stupefied the stay-at-home world with surprise there was scant information by which to judge of truth and romancers took quick advantage of this ignorance and interest to embroider and invent 
more and more startling stories because they would sell and nobody could gainsay them we now realize that the best of the early voyagers were substantially truthful but the narratives of the soberest of them are vivid and quaint and some of the others are most amusing in their luxuriant fertility of imagination their startling brilliant overwhelming mendacity no longer can travellers tales beguile the wits of the simplest of rustics and science takes the place of romance no modern voyager to quote lowell's whimsical complaint brings back the magical foundation stones of a tempest no marco polo traversing the desert beyond the city of Locke would tell of things able to inspire the mind of milton with calling shapes and beckoning shadows dire and airy tongues that syllable men's names on sands and shores and desert wildernesses it is easy enough to believe the story of dante when two-thirds of even the upper world were yet untraversed and unmapped with every step of the recent traveller our inheritance of the wonderful is diminished now whether we regard with the poets the disappearance of the childish ignorance of the sixteenth century as a loss or with ordinary folk count it as gain that men and women have acquired the world wisdom of the twentieth century certain it is that the change has come about primarily through the brave work and observant records of explorers and travellers these voyagers by sea and hardy adventurers by land have spread the map from a few hundred miles around the mediterranean until it has enveloped the globe but a better result than enlarging the atlas has been enlarging the minds of men and the peace of god in the old days stranger and enemy were synonyms travel has shown the error of this in fact and its bad policy as a theory travel has disclosed that other countries have products and goods which we need and which they will exchange for ours still better that they have men who can exchange with us ideas profitable to both so it has stimulated communication and commerce commerce produces mutual appreciation and confidence which lead to friendship and conserve public peace this national benefit has come about through the combined enlightenment of thousands of citizens who by actual travel themselves or by reading the accounts of others more fortunate have been lifted out of the narrow bounds that limit the mind as well as the feet of the homestayers traveling bartlett reminds us enlarges our views gives a knowledge of men and manners causes us to embrace the human race as one great family and call every child of misfortune our brother says another a man who has traveled and seen the world brings all countries to his fireside sees mankind as they are not as he could wish to have them can calculate correctly on all he sees and hears and seldom suffers severely by misfortune again the use of travelling is to widen the sphere of observation and to enable us to examine and judge of things for ourselves these benefits still accrue the more cultivated a man is or seeks to be the more he feels the need of widening his sphere of observation all men may not be able to go abroad study new scenes and people and enjoy places and things associated in his recollection with those features of history art and literature which have interested him from childhood but in these days every person may read the books of those who have had this privilege no kind of reading is more entertaining nor more profitable the present volume exhibits its charm and its variety it is to be hoped that it will lead the youth into whose hands it may fall to wander widely in this field of literature ernest ingersoll end of introduction chapter one of young people's treasury volume six famous travels and adventures this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by betty b young people's treasury volume six famous travels and adventures by hamilton wright maybe chapter one 
the early explorers marco polo's account of japan the island of chipangu and the great khan's dispatch of a host against it chipangu is an island toward the east in the high seas fifteen hundred miles distant from the continent and a very great island it is the people are white civilized and well favored they are idolaters and are dependent on nobody and i can tell you the quantity of gold they have is endless for they find it in their own islands and the king does not allow it to be exported moreover few merchants visit the country because it is so far from the mainland and thus it comes to pass that their gold is abundant beyond all measure i will tell you a wonderful thing about the palace of the lord of that island you must know that he hath a great palace which is entirely roofed with fine gold just as our churches are roofed with lead insomuch that it would scarcely be possible to estimate its value moreover all the pavement of the palace and the floors of its chambers are entirely of gold in plates like slabs of stone a good two fingers thick and the windows also are of gold so that altogether the richness of this palace is past all bounds and all belief they have also pearls in abundance which are of a rose color but fine big and round and quite as valuable as the white ones in this island some of the dead are buried and others are burned when a body is burned they put one of these pearls in the mouth for such is their custom they have also quantities of other precious stones kublai the grand khan who now reigneth having heard much of the immense wealth that was in this island formed a plan to get possession of it for this purpose he sent two of his barons with a great navy and a great force of horse and foot these barons were able and valiant men one of them called abacan and the other von sachin and they weighed with all their company from the ports of zaytan and kinsay and put out to sea they sailed until they reached the island aforesaid and there they landed and occupied the open country and the villages but did not succeed in getting possession of any city or castle and so a disaster befell them as i shall now relate you must know that there was much ill-will between these two barons so that one would do nothing to help the other and it came to pass that there arose a north wind which blew with great fury and caused great damage along the coasts of that island for its harbors were few it blew so hard that the great khan's fleet could not stand against it and when the chiefs saw that they came to the conclusion that if the ships remained where they were the whole navy would perish so they all got on board and made sail to leave the country but when they had gone about four miles they came to a small island on which they were driven ashore in spite of all they could do and a great part of the fleet was wrecked and a great multitude of the force perished so that there escaped only some thirty thousand men who took refuge on this island these held themselves for dead men for they were without food and knew not what to do and they were in great despair when they saw that such of the ships as had escaped the storm were making full sail for their own country without the slightest sign of turning back to help them and this was because of the bitter hatred between the two barons in command of the force for the baron who escaped never showed the slightest desire to return to his colleague who was left upon the island in the way you have heard though he might easily have done so after the storm ceased and it endured not long he did nothing of the kind however but made straight for home and you must know that the island to which the soldiers had escaped was uninhabited there was not a creature upon it but themselves now we will tell you what befell those who escaped on the fleet and also those who were left upon the island what further came of the great khan's expedition against chipangu you see those who were left upon the island some thirty thousand souls as i have said did hold themselves for dead men for they saw no possible means of escape and when the king of the great island got news how the one part of the expedition had saved themselves upon that isle and the other part was scattered and fled he was right glad thereat and he gathered together all the ships of his territory and proceeded with them the sea now being calm 
to the little isle and landed his troops all around it and when the tartars saw them thus arrive and the whole force landed without any guard having been left on board the ships the act of men very little acquainted with such work they had the sagacity to feign flight now the island was very high in the middle and while the enemy were hastening after them by one road they fetched a compass by another and in this way managed to reach the enemy's ships and to get aboard of them this they did easily enough for they encountered no opposition once they were on board they got under way immediately for the great island and landed there carrying with them the standards and banners of the king of the island and in this wise they advanced to the capital the garrison of the city suspecting nothing wrong when they saw their own banners advancing supposed that it was their own host returning and so gave them admittance the tartars as soon as they had got in seized all the bulwarks and drove out all who were in the place except the pretty women and these they kept for themselves in this way the great khan's people got possession of the city when the king of the great island and his army perceived that both fleet and city were lost they were greatly cast down howbeit they got away to the great island on board some of the ships which had not been carried off and the king then gathered all his host to the siege of the city and invested it so straitly that no one could go in or come out those who were within held the place for seven months and strove by all means to send word to the great khan but it was all in vain they never could get the intelligence carried to him so when they saw they could hold out no longer they gave themselves up on condition that their lives should be spared but still that they should never quit the island and this befell in the year of our lord twelve seventy nine the great khan ordered the baron who had fled so disgracefully to lose his head and afterward he caused the other also who had been left on the island to be put to death for he had never behaved as a good soldier ought to do but i must tell you a wonderful thing that i had forgotten which happened on this expedition you see at the beginning of the affair when the khan's people had landed on the great island and occupied the open country as i told you they stormed a tower belonging to some of the islanders who refused to surrender and they cut off the heads of all the garrison except eight on these eight they found it impossible to inflict any wound now this was by virtue of certain stones which they had in their arms inserted between the skin and the flesh with such skill as not to show at all externally and the charm and virtue of these stones was such that those who wore them could never perish by steel so when the barons learned this they ordered the men to be beaten to death with clubs and after their death the stones were extracted from the bodies of all and were greatly prized but now let us have done with the matter and return to our subject concerning the fashion of the idols now you must know the idols of cafe and of manzi and of this island are all of the same class and in this island as well as elsewhere there be some of the idols that have the head of an ox some that have the head of a pig some of a dog some of a sheep and some of diverse other kinds and some of them have four heads while some have three one growing out of either shoulder there are also some that have four hands some ten some a thousand and they do put more faith in those idols that have a thousand hands than in any of the others and when any christian asks them why they make their idols in so many different guises and not all alike they reply that just so their forefathers were wont to have them made, and just so they will leave them to their children, and these to the after generations, and so they will be handed down for ever. And you must understand that the deeds ascribed to these idols are such a parcel of devilries as it is best not to tell. So let us have done with the idols and speak of other things. But I must tell you one thing still concerning that island and tis the same with the other indian islands that if the natives take prisoner an enemy who cannot pay a ransom he who hath the prisoner summons all his friends and relations and they put the prisoner to death and then they cook him and eat him and they say there is no meat in the world so good but now we will have done with that island 
and speak of something else. End of chapter 1《Chapter Two of Young People's Treasury, Volume Six: Famous Travels and Adventures by Hamilton Wright Maybe. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Betty B. The Early Explorers, The Discovery of Vinland, from the Saga of Eric the Red. After that, sixteen winters had elapsed from the time when Eric the Red went to colonize Greenland. Leif Eric's son sailed out from Greenland to Norway. He arrived in Drontheim in the autumn, when King Olaf Tryggvason was come down from the north, out of Haligoland. Leif put into Nidaros with his ship and set out at once to visit the king. King Olaf expounded the faith to him as he did to other heathen men who came to visit him. It proved easy for the king to persuade Leif, and he was accordingly baptized together with all of his shipmates. Leif remained throughout the winter with the king, by whom he was well entertained. Heriulf was a son of Bard Heriulfsson. He was a kinsman of Ingolf, the first colonist. Ingolf allotted land to Heriulf between Vag and Reykianus, and he dwelt at first at Drepstock. Heriulf's wife's name was Thorgerd, and their son, whose name was Biarni, was a most promising man. He formed an inclination for voyaging while he was still young, and he prospered both in property and public esteem. It was his custom to pass his winters alternately abroad and with his father. Biarni soon became the owner of a trading ship, and during the last winter that he spent in Norway, his father, Heriulf, determined to accompany Eric on his voyage to Greenland, and made his preparations to give up his farm. Upon the ship with Heriulf was a Christian man from the Hebrides. He it was who composed the sea roller song, which contains this stave. Mine adventure to the meek one, monk heart searcher, I commit now. He who heaven's halls doth govern, hold the hawk seat ever o'er me. Heriulf settled at Heriulfsness, and was a most distinguished man. Eric the Red dwelt at Bratalid, where he was held in the highest esteem, and all men paid him homage. These were Eric's children, Leif, Thorvald, and Thorstein, and a daughter whose name was Freydis. She was wedded to a man named Thorvard, and they dwelt at Gardar, where the episcopal seat now is. She was a very haughty woman, while Thorvard was a man of little force of character and Freydis had been wedded to him chiefly because of his wealth. At that time the people of Greenland were heathen. Bjarni arrived with his ship at Irar, in Iceland, in the summer of the same year, in the spring of which his father had sailed away. Bjarni was much surprised when he heard this news, and would not discharge his cargo. His shipmates inquired of him what he intended to do, and he replied that it was his purpose to keep to his custom and make his home for the winter with his father. And I will take the ship to Greenland, if you will bear me company. They all replied that they would abide by his decision. Then said Biarni, Our voyage must be regarded as foolhardy, seeing that no one of us has ever been in the Greenland Sea. Nevertheless, they put out to sea when they were equipped for the voyage, and sailed for three days, until the land was hidden by the water, and then the fair wind died out and north winds arose, and fogs, and they knew not whither they were drifting, and thus it lasted for many doger. Then they saw the sun again, and were able to determine the quarters of the heavens. They hoisted sail, and sailed that doger through before they saw land. They discussed among themselves what land it could be, and Bjarni said that he did not believe that it could be Greenland. They asked whether he wished to sail to this land or not. It is my counsel, said he, to sail close to the land. They did so, and soon saw that the land was level, and covered with woods, and that there were small hillocks upon it. They left the land on their larboard, and let the sheet turn toward the land. They sailed for two doger before they saw another land. They asked whether Bjarni thought this was Greenland yet. He replied that he did not think this any more like Greenland than the former, 
because in Greenland there are said to be many great ice mountains. They soon approached this land and saw that it was a flat and wooded country. The fair wind failed them then, and the crew took counsel together and concluded that it would be wise to land there, but Biarni would not consent to this. They alleged that they were in need of both wood and water. Ye have no lack of either of these, said Biarni, a course forsooth which won him blame among his shipmates. He bade them hoist sail, which they did, and turning the prow from the land they sailed out upon the high seas, with southwesterly gales, for three doger, when they saw the third land. This land was high and mountainous, with ice mountains upon it. They asked Bjarni then whether he would land there, and he replied that he was not disposed to do so, because this land does not appear to offer me any attractions. Nor did they lower their sail, but held their course off the land and saw that it was an island. They left this land astern and held out to sea with the same fair wind. The wind waxed amain, and Biarni directed them to reef, and not to sail at a speed unbefitting their ship and rigging. They sailed now for four doger when they saw the fourth land. Again they asked Biarni whether he thought this could be Greenland or not. Biarni answers, This is likest Greenland, according to that which has been reported to me concerning it, and here we will steer to the land. They directed their course thither, and landed in the evening, below a cape upon which there was a boat, and there, upon this cape, dwelt Heriulf, Biarni's father, whence the cape took its name, and was afterward called Heriulfsness. Biarni now went to his father, gave up his voyaging, and remained with his father while Heriulf lived, and continued to live there after his father. Next to this is now to be told how Biarni Heriulfsson came out from Greenland on a visit to Earl Eric, by whom he was well received. Biarni gave an account of his travels, upon the occasion when he saw the lands, and the people thought that he had been lacking in enterprise, since he had had no report to give concerning these countries, and the fact brought him reproach. Biarni was appointed one of the Earl's men, and went out to Greenland the following summer. There was now much talk about voyages of discovery. Leif, the son of Eric the Red, of Bradalid, visited Bjarni Heriolfsson and bought a ship of him, and collected a crew, until they formed altogether a company of thirty-five men. Leif invited his father, Eric, to become the leader of the expedition, but Eric declined, saying that he was then stricken in years, and adding that he was less able to endure the exposure of sea life than he had been. Leif replied that he would nevertheless be the one who would be most apt to bring good luck, and Eric yielded to Leif's solicitation and rode from home when they were ready to sail. When he was but a short distance from the ship, the horse which Eric was riding stumbled, and he was thrown from his back and wounded his foot, whereupon he exclaimed, It is not designed for me to discover more lands than the one in which we are now living, nor can we now continue longer together. Eric returned home to Bradalid, and Leif pursued his way to the ship with his companions, thirty-five men. One of the company was a German, named Turker. They put the ship in order, and when they were ready, they sailed out to sea, and found first that land which Biarni and his shipmates found last. They sailed up to the land and cast anchor, and launched a boat, and went ashore, and saw no grass there. Great ice mountains lay inland, back from the sea, and it was as a tableland of flat rock all the way from the sea to the ice mountains, and the country seemed to them to be entirely devoid of good qualities. Then said Leif, It has not come to pass with us in regard to this land, as with Bjarni, that we have not gone upon it. To this country I will now give a name, and call it Helioland. They returned to the ship, put out to sea, and found a second land. They sailed again to the land, and came to anchor, and launched the boat, and went ashore. This was a level wooded land, and there were broad stretches of white sand where they went, and the land was level by the sea. Then said Leif, This land shall have a name after its nature, and we will call it Markland. They returned to the ship forthwith, and sailed away upon the main with northeast winds, 
and were out to Dogger before they sighted land. They sailed toward this land and came to an island which lay to the northward off the land. There they went ashore and looked about them, the weather being fine, and they observed that there was dew upon the grass, and it so happened that they touched the dew with their hands and touched their hands to their mouths, and it seemed to them that they had never before tasted anything so sweet as this. They went aboard their ship again and sailed into a certain sound, which lay between the island and a cape, which jutted out from the land on the north, and they stood in westering past the cape. At ebb tide there were broad reaches of shallow water there, and they ran their ship aground there, and it was a long distance from the ship to the ocean, yet were they so anxious to go ashore that they could not wait until the tide should rise under their ship, but hasten to the land, where a certain river flows out from a lake. As soon as the tide rose beneath their ship, however, they took the boat and rowed to the ship, which they conveyed up the river, and so into the lake, where they cast anchor and carried their hammocks ashore from the ship, and built themselves booths there. They afterward determined to establish themselves there for the winter, and they accordingly built a large house. There was no lack of salmon there either in the river or in the lake and larger salmon than they had ever seen before. The country thereabout seemed to be possessed of such good qualities that cattle would need no fodder there during the winters. There was no frost there in the winters, and the grass withered but little. The days and nights there were of more nearly equal length than in Greenland or Iceland. On the shortest day of winter, the sun was up between Eiktarstad and Dagmalastad. When they had completed their house, Leif said to his companions, I propose now to divide our company into two groups and to set about an exploration of the country. One half of our party shall remain at home at the house, while the other half shall investigate the land, and they must not go beyond a point from which they can return home the same evening, and are not to separate from each other. Thus they did for a time. Leif himself by turns joined the exploring party or remain behind at the house. Leif was a large and powerful man, and of a most imposing bearing, a man of sagacity, and a very just man in all things. It was discovered one evening that one of their company was missing, and this proved to be Turker, the German. Leif was sorely troubled by this, for Turker had lived with Leif and his father for a long time, and had been very devoted to Leif when he was a child. Leif severely reprimanded his companions and prepared to go in search of him, taking twelve men with him. They had proceeded but a short distance from the house when they were met by Turker, whom they received most cordially. Leif observed at once that his foster father was in lively spirits. Turker had a prominent forehead, restless eyes, small features, was diminutive in stature, and rather a sorry-looking individual withal but was, nevertheless, a most capable, handy craftsman. Leif addressed him and asked, Wherefore art thou so belated, foster father mine, and astray from the others? In the beginning, Turker spoke for some time in German, rolling his eyes and grinning, and they could not understand him, but after a time he addressed them in the northern tongue. I did not go much further than you, and yet I have something of novelty to relate. I have found vines and grapes. Is this indeed true, foster father? said Leif. Of a certainty it is true, quoth he, for I was born where there is no lack of either grapes or vines. They slept the night through, and on the morrow Leif said to his shipmates, We will now divide our labors, and each day will either gather grapes or cut vines and fell trees, so as to obtain a cargo of these for my ship. They acted upon this advice, and it is said that their after-boat was filled with grapes. A cargo sufficient for the ship was cut, and when the spring came, they made their ship ready and sailed away, and from its products Leif gave the land a name, and called it Wineland. They sailed out to sea, and had fair winds until they sighted Greenland, and the fells below the glaciers. Then one of the men spoke up and said, Why do you steer the ship so much into the wind? Leif answers, I have my mind upon my steering, but on other matters as well. Do ye not see anything out of the common? They replied that they saw nothing strange. 
I do not know, says Leif, whether it is a ship or a skerry that I see. Now they saw it and said that it must be a skerry. But he was so much keener of sight than they that he was able to discern men upon the skerry. I think it is best to tack, said Leif, so that we may draw near to them, that we may be able to render them assistance if they should stand in need of it, and if they should not be peaceably disposed, we shall still have better command of the situation than they. They approached the skerry, and, lowering their sail, cast anchor, and launched a second small boat, which they had brought with them. Turker inquired who was the leader of the party. He replied that his name was Thori, and that he was a Norseman. But what is thy name? Leif gave his name. Art thou a son of Eric the Red of Bradalid? says he. Leif responded that he was. It is now my wish, says Leif, to take you all into my ship, and likewise so much of your possessions as the ship will hold. This offer was accepted, and with their ship thus laden, they held away to Eriksfirth, and sailed until they arrived at Bradalid. Having discharged the cargo, Leif invited Thori with his wife Gudrid and three others to make their home with them, and procured quarters for the other members of the crew, both for his own and Thori's men. Leif rescued fifteen persons from the skerry. He was afterwards called Leif the Lucky. Leif had now goodly store both of property and honor. There was serious illness that winter in Thori's party, and Thori and a great number of his people died. Eric the Red also died that winter. There was now much talk about Leif's wineland journey, and his brother, Thorvald, held that the country had not been sufficiently explored. Thereupon Leif said to Thorvald, If it be thy will, brother, thou mayest go to wineland with my ship, but I wish the ship first to fetch the wood which Thori had upon the skerry. And so it was done. End of chapter 2 Chapter 3 of Young People's Treasury, Volume 6, Famous Travels and Adventures by Hamilton Wright Maybe. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Betty B. First Voyage of Columbus. It was on Friday, August 3rd, 1492, early in the morning, that Columbus set sail from the Bar of Saltus, a small island formed by the arms of the Odiel in front of the town of Huelva, and steered in a southwesterly direction for the Canary Islands, whence it was his intention to strike due west. As a guide by which to sail, he had prepared a map or chart improved upon that sent him by Paolo Toscanelli. The exultation of Columbus at finding himself, after so many years of baffled hopes, fairly launched on his grand enterprise, was checked by his want of confidence in the resolution and perseverance of his crews. Symptoms soon appeared to warrant his apprehensions. On the third day, the Pinta made signal of distress. Her rudder was discovered to be broken and unhung. This Columbus surmised to be done through the contrivance of the owners of the caravel, Gomez Rascon and Cristoval Quintero, to disable their vessel and cause her to be left behind. They had been pressed into service greatly against their will, and their caravel seized upon for the expedition in conformity to the royal orders. Columbus was much disturbed at this occurrence. The wind was blowing strongly at the time, so he could not assist her without endangering his own vessel. Fortunately, Martin Alonso Pinzon commanded the Pinta, and being an able seaman, succeeded in securing the rudder with cords. This, however, was but a temporary expedient. The fastings gave way on the following day, and the other ships had to shorten sail until the rudder could be secured. This damaged state of the Pinta, as well as her being in a leaky condition, determined the Admiral to touch at the Canary Islands and seek a vessel to replace her. They reached there on the ninth and were detained three weeks, seeking in vain another vessel. They were obliged, therefore, to make a new rudder for the Pinta and repair her for the voyage. The Latin sails of the Nina were also altered into square sails that she might work more steadily and securely and be able to keep company with the other vessels. Early on September 6th, Columbus set sail from the island of Gomera. 
and now might be said first to strike into the region of discovery for three days a provoking calm kept the vessels loitering with flagging sails but on the ninth a breeze sprang up with the sun their sails were once more filled and in the course of the day the last trace of land faded from the horizon and the hearts of the crews failed them the admiral tried in every way to soothe their distress he described to them the magnificent countries to which he was about to conduct them and promised them land and riches he issued orders to the commanders of the other vessels that in the event of separation by any accident they should continue directly westward but that after sailing seven hundred leagues they should lay by from midnight until daylight as about that distance he confidently expected to find land he then resorted to stratagem and kept two reckonings one correct and which was retained in secret for his own government in the other which was open to general inspection a number of leagues was daily subtracted from the sailing of the ship so that the crews were kept in ignorance of the real distance they had advanced on the thirteenth of september being about two hundred leagues from the canary islands columbus noticed the variation of the needle a phenomenon which had never before been remarked he perceived about nightfall that the needle instead of pointing to the north star varied about half a point or between five and six degrees to the northwest and still more on the following day struck with this circumstance he observed it attentively for three days and found that the variation increased as he advanced he at first made no mention of this phenomenon knowing how ready his people were to take alarm but it soon attracted the attention of the pilots and filled them with consternation they apprehended that the compass was about to lose its mysterious virtues and without this guide what was to become of them in a vast and trackless ocean columbus tasked his science and ingenuity for reasons with which to allay their terror he observed that the direction of the needle was not to the polar star but to some fixed and invisible point the variation therefore was not caused by any fallacy in the compass but by the movement of the north star itself which like the other heavenly bodies had its changes and revolutions and every day described a circle round the pole the high opinion which the pilots entertained of columbus as a profound astronomer gave weight to this theory and their alarm subsided on september fourteenth the voyagers were rejoiced by the sight of what they considered harbingers of land a heron and a tropical bird hovered about the ships they had now arrived within the influence of the trade wind with this propitious breeze directly aft they were wafted gently but speedily over a tranquil sea notwithstanding columbus's precaution to keep the people ignorant of the distance they had sailed they were now growing extremely uneasy at the length of the voyage it is true they had been flattered by various indications of land and still others were occurring but all mocked them with vain hopes on september twenty fifth the wind being favorable they continued their course directly to the west for several days they continued on with the same propitious breeze tranquil sea and mild delightful weather on october second the weed seemed floated from east to west and on the third day no birds were to be seen the crews now began to fear that they had passed between islands from one to the other of which the birds had been flying columbus had also some doubts of the kind but refused to alter his westward course until october seventh when he altered his course to the west southwest for three days they stood in this direction and the further they went the more frequent and encouraging were the signs of land the herbage which floated by was fresh and green as if recently from land tunny fish played about the smooth sea and a heron a pelican and a duck were seen all bound in the same direction all these however were regarded by the crews as so many delusions beguiling them on to destruction and when on the third day they beheld the sun go down upon a shoreless ocean they broke forth into turbulent clamor they insisted upon turning homeward and abandoning the voyage as hopeless but columbus told them it was useless to murmur the expedition had been sent by the sovereigns to seek the indies and happen what might he was determined to persevere until by the blessing of god 
he should accomplish the enterprise. The Landing of Columbus Columbus was now at open defiance with his crew, and his situation became desperate. Fortunately, the manifestations of the vicinity of land were such on the following day as to no longer to admit a doubt. Beside a quantity of fresh weeds, such as grow in waters, they saw a green fish of a kind which keeps about rocks, then a branch of thorn with berries on it, and recently separated from the tree, floated by them. Then they picked up a reed, a small board, and above all, a staff artificially carved. All gloom and mutiny now gave way to sanguine expectation, and throughout the day each one was eagerly on the watch, in hopes of being the first to discover the long-sought-for land. In the evening, when according to invariable custom, on board of the admiral's ship, the mariners had sung the Salve Regina, or Vesper hymn to the Virgin, he made an impressive address to his crew. He pointed out the goodness of God in thus conducting them by soft and favoring breezes across a tranquil ocean, cheering their hopes continually with fresh signs, increasing as their fears augmented, and thus leading and guiding them to a promised land. He now reminded them of the orders he had given on leaving the Canaries, that, after sailing westward seven hundred leagues, they should not make sail after midnight. Present appearances authorized such a precaution. He thought it probable that they would make land that very night. He ordered, therefore, a vigilant lookout to be kept from the forecastle, promising to whosoever should make the discovery a doublet of velvet, in addition to the pension to be given by the sovereigns. The breeze had been fresh all day, with more sea than usual, and they had made great progress. At sunset they had stood again to the west, and were ploughing the waves at a rapid rate, the Pinta keeping the lead from her superior sailing. The greatest admiration prevailed throughout the ships. Not an eye was closed that night. As the evening darkened, Columbus took his station on the top of the castle, or cabin on the high poop of his vessel, ranging his eye along the dusky horizon and maintaining an intense and unremitting watch. About ten o'clock he thought he beheld a light glimmering at a great distance. Fearing his eager hopes might deceive him, he called to Pedro Gutierrez, gentleman of the king's bedchamber, and inquired whether he saw such a light. The latter replied in the affirmative. Doubtful whether it might not yet be some delusion of the fancy, Columbus called Rodrigo Sanchez of Segovia and made the same inquiry. By the time the latter had ascended the roundhouse, the light had disappeared. They saw it once or twice afterwards in sudden and passing gleams, as if it were a torch in the bark of a fisherman, rising and sinking with the waves, or in the hand of some person on shore, borne up and down as he walked from house to house. So transient and uncertain were these gleams that few attached any importance to them. Columbus, however, considered them as certain signs of land, and moreover, that the land was inhabited. They continued their course until two in the morning, when a gun from the Pinta gave the joyful signal of land. It was first described by a mariner named Rodrigo de Triana, but the reward was afterwards adjudged to the admiral for having previously perceived the light. The land was now clearly seen about two leagues distant, whereupon they took in sail and lay to, waiting impatiently for the dawn. The thoughts and feelings of Columbus in this little space of time must have been tumultuous and intense. At length, in spite of every difficulty and danger, he had accomplished his object. The great mystery of the ocean was revealed. His theory, which had been the scoff of sages, was triumphantly established. He had secured to himself a glory durable as the world itself. It is difficult to conceive the feelings of such a man at such a moment, or the conjectures which must have thronged upon his mind, as to the land before him, covered with darkness. That it was fruitful was evident from the vegetables which floated from its shores. He thought, too, that he perceived the fragrance of aromatic groves. The moving light he had beheld proved it the residence of man. But what were its inhabitants? Were they like those of the other parts of the globe, or were they some strange and monstrous race, such as the imagination was prone in those times to give to all remote and unknown regions. 
Had he come upon some wild island far in the Indian Sea? Or was this the famed Chipango itself, the object of his golden fancies? A thousand speculations of the kind must have swarmed upon him, as, with his anxious crews, he waited for the night to pass away, wondering whether the morning light would reveal a savage wilderness or dawn upon spicy groves and glittering fanes and gilded cities, and all the splendor of Oriental civilization. It was on Friday morning, the 12th of October, that Columbus first beheld the New World. As the day dawned, he saw before him a level island, several leagues in extent, and covered with trees like a continual orchard. Though apparently uncultivated, it was populous, for the inhabitants were seen issuing from all parts of the woods and running to the shore. They were perfectly naked, and, as they stood gazing at the ships, appeared by their attitudes and gestures to be lost in astonishment. Columbus made signal for the ships to cast anchor and the boats to be manned and armed. He entered his own boat, richly attired in scarlet and holding the royal standard, while Martin Alonso Pinzon and Vincente Yanez, his brother, put off in company in their boats, each with a banner of the enterprise, emblazoned with a green cross, having on either side the letters F and Y, the initials of the Castilian monarchs, Fernando and Isabel, surmounted by crowns. As he approached the shore, Columbus, who was disposed for all kinds of agreeable impressions, was delighted with the purity and suavity of the atmosphere, the crystal transparency of the sea, and the extraordinary beauty of the vegetation. He beheld also fruits of an unknown kind upon the trees which overhung the shores. On landing, he threw himself on his knees, kissed the earth, and returned thanks to God with tears of joy. His example was followed by the rest, whose hearts indeed overflowed with the same feelings of gratitude. Columbus, then rising, drew his sword, displayed the royal standard, and assembling round him the two captains, with Rodrigo de Escobedo, notary of the armament, Rodrigo Sanchez, and the rest who had landed. He took solemn possession in the name of the Castilian sovereigns, giving the island the name of San Salvador. Having complied with the requisite forms and ceremonies, he called upon all present to take the oath of obedience to him as admiral and viceroy, representing the persons of the sovereigns. The feelings of the crew now burst forth in the most extravagant transports. They had recently considered themselves devoted men, hurrying forward to destruction. They now looked upon themselves as favorites of fortune, and gave themselves up to the most unbounded joy. They thronged around the admiral with overflowing zeal, some embracing him, others kissing his hands. Those who had been most mutinous and turbulent during the voyage were now most devoted and enthusiastic. Some begged favors of him, as if he had already wealth and honors in his gift. Many abject spirits, who had outraged him by their insolence, now crouched at his feet, begging pardon for all the trouble they had caused him and promising the blindest obedience for the future. The natives of the island, when, at the dawn of day, they had beheld the ships hovering on their coast, had supposed them monsters which had issued from the deep during the night. They had crowded to the beach and watched their movements with awful anxiety, their veering about apparently without effort, and the shifting and furling of their sails resembling huge wings filled them with astonishment. When they beheld their boats approach the shore, and a number of strange beings clad in glittering steel, or raiment of various colors, landing upon the beach, they fled in affright to the woods. Finding, however, that there was no attempt to pursue nor molest them, they gradually recovered from their terror, and approached the Spaniards with great awe, frequently prostrating themselves on the earth, and making signs of adoration. During the ceremonies of taking possession, they remained, gazing in timid admiration at the complexion, the beards, the shining armor, and splendid dress of the Spaniards. The admiral particularly attracted their attention, from his commanding height, his air of authority, his dress of scarlet, and the deference which was paid him by his companions, all which pointed him out to be the commander. When they had still further recovered from their fears, they approached the Spaniards, touched their beards, and examined their hands and faces, 
admiring their whiteness. Columbus was pleased with their gentleness and confiding simplicity, and suffered their scrutiny with perfect acquiescence, winning them by his benignity. They now supposed that the ships had sailed out of the crystal firmament which bounded their horizon, or had descended from above on their ample wings, and that these marvelous beings were inhabitants of the skies. The natives of the island were no less objects of curiosity to the Spaniards, differing as they did from any race of men they had ever seen. Their appearance gave no promise of either wealth or civilization, for they were entirely naked and painted with a variety of colors. With some it was confined merely to a part of the face, the nose, or around the eyes. With others it extended to the whole body, and gave them a wild and fantastic appearance. Their complexion was of a tawny or copper hue, and they were entirely destitute of beards. Their hair was not crisp, like the recently discovered tribes of the African coast, under the same latitude, but straight and coarse, partly cut short above their ears, but some locks were left long behind and falling upon their shoulders. Their features, though obscured and disfigured by paint, were agreeable. They had lofty foreheads and remarkably fine eyes. They were of moderate stature and well-shaped. Most of them appeared to be under thirty years of age. There was but one female with them, quite young, naked like her companions, and beautifully formed. As Columbus supposed himself to have landed on an island at the extremity of India, he called the natives by the general appellation of Indians, which was universally adopted before the true nature of his discovery was known, and has since been extended to all the aborigines of the New World. The islanders were friendly and gentle. Their only arms were lances, hardened at the end by fire, or pointed with a flint, or the teeth or bone of a fish. There was no iron to be seen, nor did they appear acquainted with its properties, for when a drawn sword was presented to them, they unguardedly took it by the edge." Columbus distributed among them colored caps, glass beads, hawks' bells, and other trifles, such as the Portuguese were accustomed to trade with among the nations of the Gold Coast of Africa. They received them eagerly, hung the beads around their necks, and were wonderfully pleased with their finery, and with the sound of the bells. The Spaniards remained all day on shore, refreshing themselves after their anxious voyage, amidst the beautiful groves of the island, and returned on board late in the evening, delighted with all they had seen. On the following morning at break of day, the shore was thronged with the natives. Some swam off to the ships, others came in light barks which they called canoes, formed of a single tree, hollowed, and capable of holding from one man to the number of forty or fifty. These they managed dexterously with paddles, and, if overturned, swam about in the water with perfect unconcern, as if in their natural element, riding their canoes with great facility, and bailing them with calabashes. They were eager to procure more toys and trinkets, not apparently from any idea of their intrinsic value, but because everything from the hands of the strangers possessed a supernatural virtue in their eyes, as having been brought from heaven. They even picked up fragments of glass and earthenware as valuable prizes. They had but few objects to offer in return, except parrots, of which great numbers were domesticated among them, and cotton yarn, of which they had abundance, and would exchange large balls of five and twenty pounds weight for the merest trifle. They brought also cakes of a kind of bread called cassava, which constituted a principal part of their food and was afterwards an important article of provisions with the Spaniards. It was formed from a great root called yucca, which they cultivated in fields. This they cut into small morsels, which they grated or scraped, and strained in a press, making a broad, thin cake, which was afterwards dried hard, and would keep for a long time, being steeped in water when eaten. It was insipid but nourishing, though the water strained from it in the preparation was a deadly poison. There was another kind of yucca destitute of this poisonous quality, which was eaten in the root, either boiled or roasted. The avarice of the discoverers was quickly excited by the sight of small ornaments of gold, 
worn by some of the natives in their noses. These the latter gladly exchanged for glass beads and hawks' bells, and both parties exulted in the bargain, no doubt admiring each other's simplicity. As gold, however, was an object of royal monopoly in all enterprises of discovery, Columbus forbade any traffic in it without his express sanction, and he put the same prohibition on the traffic for cotton, reserving to the crown all trade for it, wherever it should be found in any quantity. He inquired of the natives where this gold was procured. They answered him by signs, pointing to the south, where he understood them dwelt a king of such wealth that he was served in vessels of wrought gold. He understood also that there was land to the south, the southwest and the northwest, and that the people from the last mentioned quarter frequently proceeded to the southwest in quest of gold and precious stones, making in their way descents upon the islands and carrying off the inhabitants. Several of the natives showed him scars of wounds received in battles with these invaders. It is evident that a great part of this fancied intelligence was self-delusion on the part of Columbus, for he was under a spell of the imagination which gave its own shapes and colors to every object. He was persuaded that he had arrived among the islands described by Marco Polo as lying opposite Cafe in the Chinese Sea, and he construed everything to accord with the account given of those opulent regions. Thus the enemies which the natives spoke of as coming from the northwest he concluded to be the people of the mainland of Asia, the subjects of the great Khan of Tartary, who were represented by the Venetian traveler as accustomed to make war upon the islands and to enslave their inhabitants. The country to the south, abounding in gold, could be no other than the famous island of Topango, and the king who was served out of vessels of gold must be the monarch whose magnificent city and gorgeous palace covered with plates of gold had been extolled in such splendid terms by Marco Polo. The island where Columbus had thus, for the first time, set his foot upon the new world was called by the natives Guanahani. It still retains the name of San Salvador, which he gave to it. End of chapter 3 Chapter 4 of Young People's Treasury, Volume 6, Famous Travels and Adventures by Hamilton Wright Maybe. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Betty B. Amerigo Vespucci's Account of His First Voyage From a letter of Amerigo Vespucci to Pier Soderini, Gonfalonier of the Republic of Florence. Magnificent Lord, the chief cause which moved me to write to you was at the request of the present bearer, who is named Benvenuto Benvenuti, our Florentine, very much, as it is proven, your magnificence's servant and my very good friend, who, happening to be here in this city of Lisbon, begged that I should make communication to your magnificence of the things seen by me in diverse regions of the world, by virtue of four voyages which I have made in discovery of new lands, two by order of the King of Castile, King Don Ferrando the Sixth, across the great gulf of the Ocean Sea, towards the west, and the other two by command of the Puissant, King Don Manuel, King of Portugal, towards the south, telling me that your magnificence would take pleasure thereof, and that herein he hoped to do you service, wherefore I set me to do it. I made preparation for going to see part of the world and its wonders, and herefore the time and place presented themselves most opportunely to me, which was that that the King Don Ferrando of Castile, being about to dispatch four ships to discover new lands toward the west, I was chosen by His Highness to go in that fleet to aid in making discovery, and we set out from the port of Cadiz on May 10, 1497, and took our route through the great gulf of the ocean sea, in which voyage we were eighteen months, and discovered much continental land and innumerable islands, and great part of them inhabited. As I said before, we left the port of Cadiz, four consort ships, and began our voyage in direct course to the Fortunate Isles, 
which are called today La Gran Canaria, which are situated in the ocean sea at the extremity of the inhabited west, set in the third climate, over which the North Pole has an elevation of twenty-seven and one-half degrees beyond their horizon, and they are two hundred and eighty leagues distant from this city of Lisbon, by the wind between Mezodi and Lebecchio, where we remained eight days, taking in provision of water and wood and other necessary things, and from here, having said our prayers, we weighed anchor and gave the sails to the wind, beginning our course to westward, taking one quarter by southwest, and so we sailed on till at the end of thirty-seven days we reached a land which we deemed to be a continent, which is distant westwardly from the Isles of Canary, about a thousand leagues, beyond the inhabited region within the torrid zone. For we found the North Pole at an elevation of sixteen degrees above its horizon, and westward, according to the showing of our instruments, seventy-five degrees from the Isles of Canary, whereat we anchored with our ships a league and a half from land, and we put out our boats freighted with men and arms. We made towards the land, and before we reached it, had sight of a great number of people who were going along the shore, by which we were much rejoiced, and we observed that they were a naked race. They showed themselves to stand in fear of us, I believe because they saw us clothed, and of other appearance they all withdrew to a hill, and for whatsoever signals we made to them of peace and of friendliness, they would not come to parley with us, so that as the night was now coming on, and as the ships were anchored in a dangerous place, being on a rough and shelterless coast, we decided to remove from there the next day, and to go in search of some harbor or bay, where we might place our ships in safety. And we sailed with the maestral wind, thus running along the coast with the land ever in sight, continually in our course observing people along the shore, till after having navigated for two days we found a place sufficiently secure for the ships, and anchored half a league from land, on which we saw a very great number of people, and this same day we put to land with the boats, and sprang on shore full forty men in good trim, and still the land's people appeared shy of converse with us, and we were unable to encourage them so much as to make them come to speak with us, and this day we labored so greatly in giving them of our wares, such as rattles and mirrors, beads, spalline, and other trifles, that some of them took confidence and came to discourse with us, and after having made good friends with them, the night coming on, we took our leave of them and returned to the ships, and the next day when the dawn appeared, we saw that there were infinite numbers of people upon the beach, and they had their women and children with them. We went ashore and found that they were all laden with their worldly goods, which are such like as, in its place, shall be related. And before we reached the land, many of them jumped into the sea and came swimming to receive us at a bow-shot's length, for they are very great swimmers, with as much confidence as if they had for a long time been acquainted us, and we were pleased with this their confidence. For so much as we learned of their manner of life and customs, it was that they go entirely naked, as well the men as the women. They are of medium stature, very well proportioned, their flesh is of a color that verges into red like a lion's mane, and I believe that if they went clothed they would be as white as we. They have not any hair upon the body except the hair of the head, which is long and black, and especially in the women whom it renders handsome. In aspect they are not very good-looking, because they have broad faces, so that they would seem tartar-like. They let no hair grow on their eyebrows, nor on their eyelids, nor elsewhere, except the hair of the head, for they hold hairiness to be a filthy thing. They are very light-footed in walking and in running, as well as the men as the women, so that a woman wrecks nothing of running a league or two, as many times we saw them do, and herein they have a very great advantage over us Christians. They swim beyond all belief, and the women better than the men, for we have many times found and seen them swimming two leagues out at sea without anything to rest upon. Their arms are bows and arrows, very well made, 
save that are not with iron nor any other kind of hard metal and instead of iron they put animals or fishes teeth or a spike of tough wood with the point hardened by fire they are sure marksmen for they hit whatever they aim at and in some places the women use these bows they have other weapons such as fire hardened spears and also clubs with knobs beautifully carved warfare is used amongst them which they carry on against people not of their own language very cruelly without granting life to any one except for greater suffering when they go to war they take their women with them not that these may fight but because they carry behind them their worldly goods for a woman carries on her back for thirty or forty leagues a load which no man could bear as we have seen many times them do they are not accustomed to have any captain nor do they go in any ordered array for every one is lord of himself and the cause of their wars is not for lust of dominion nor of extending their frontiers nor for inordinate covetousness but for some ancient enmity which in bygone times arose amongst them and when asked why they made war they knew not any other reason to give than that they did so to avenge the death of their ancestors or of their parents these people have neither king nor lord nor do they yield obedience to any one for they live in their own liberty and how they be stirred up to go to war is that when their enemies have slain or captured any of them his oldest kinsman rises up and goes about the highways haranguing them to go with him and avenge the death of such his kinsmen and so are they stirred up by fellow feeling they have no judicial system nor do they punish the ill-doer nor does the father nor the mother chastise the children and marvelously or never did we see any dispute among them in their conversation they appear simple and they are very cunning and acute in that which concerns them they speak little and in a low tone they use the same articulations as we since they form their utterances either with the palate or with the teeth or on the lips except that they give different names to things many are the varieties of tongues for in every one hundred leagues we found a change of language so that they are not understandable each to the other the manner of their living is very barbarous for they do not eat at certain hours and as oftentimes as they will and it is not much of a boon to them that the will may come more at midnight than by day for they eat at all hours and they eat upon the ground without a tablecloth or any other cover for they have their meats either in earthen basins which they make themselves or in the halves of pumpkins they sleep in certain very large nettings made of cotton suspended in the air and although this their sleeping may seem uncomfortable i say that it is sweet to sleep in those and we slept better in them than in the counterpanes they are a people smooth and clean of body because of so continually washing themselves as they do amongst those people we did not learn that they had any law nor can they be called moors nor jews and worse than pagans because we did not observe that they offered any sacrifice nor even had they a house of prayer their manner of living i judge to be epicurean their dwellings are in common and their houses made in the style of huts but strongly made and constructed with very large trees and covered over with palm leaves secure against storms and winds and in some places of so great breadth and length that in one single house we found there were six hundred souls and we saw a village of only thirteen houses where there were four thousand souls every eight or ten years they changed their habitations and when asked why they did so because of the soil which from its filthiness was already unhealthy and corrupted and that it bred aches in their bodies which seemed to us a good reason their riches consist of birds plumes of many colors or of rosaries which they make from fish bones or of white or green stones which they put in their cheeks and in their lips and ears and of many other things which we in no wise value they use no trade they neither buy nor sell in fine they live and are contented with that which nature gives them the wealth that we enjoy in this our europe and elsewhere such as gold jewels pearls and other riches they hold as nothing and although they have them in their own lands 
they do not labor to obtain them nor do they value them they are liberal in giving for it is rarely they deny you anything and on the other hand liberal in asking when they show themselves your friends when they die they use diverse manners of obsequies and some they bury with water and victuals at their heads thinking that they shall have to eat they have not nor do they use ceremonies of torches nor of lamentation in some other places they use the most barbarous and inhuman burial which is that when a suffering or infirm is as it were at the last pass of death his kinsmen carry him into a large forest and attach one of those nets of theirs in which they sleep to two trees and then put him in it and dance around him for a whole day and when the night comes on they place at his bolster water with other victuals so that he may be able to subsist for four or six days and then they leave him alone and return to the village and if the sick man helps himself and eats and drinks and survives he returns to the village and his receive him with ceremony but few are they who escape without receiving any further visit they die and that is their sepulture and they have many other customs which for prolixity are not related they use in their sicknesses various forms of medications so different from ours that we marveled how any one escaped for many times i saw that with a man sick of fever when it heightened upon him they bathed him from head to foot with a large quantity of cold water then they lit a great fire around him making him turn and turn again every two hours until they tired him and left him to sleep and many were cured with this they make use of dieting for they remain three days without eating and also of bloodletting but not from the arm only from the thighs and the loins and the calf of the leg also they provoke vomiting with their herbs which are put into the mouth and they use many other remedies which it would be long to relate they are much vitiated in the phlegm and in the blood because of their food which consists chiefly of roots of herbs and fruits and fish they have no seed of wheat nor other grain and for their ordinary use and feeding they have a root of a tree from which they make flour tolerably good and they call it ayuka and another which they call kazabi and another ignami they eat little flesh except human flesh for your magnificence must know that herein they are so inhuman that they outdo every custom of beasts for they eat all their enemies whom they kill or capture as well females as males with so much savagery that to relate it appears a horrible thing End of chapter four chapter five of young people's treasury volume six famous travels and adventures by hamilton wright maybe this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by betty b voyages of the cabots from hacklet's principal navigations voyages and discoveries of the english nation an extract taken out of the map of sebastian cabot cut by clement adams concerning his discovery of the west indies which is to be seen in her majesty's private gallery at westminster and in many other ancient merchants houses in the year of our lord fourteen ninety seven john cabot a venetian and his son sebastian with an english fleet set out from bristol discovered that land which no man before that time had attempted on the twenty fourth of june about five of the clock early in the morning this land he called prima vista that is to say first seen because as i suppose it was that part whereof they had the first sight from sea that island which lieth out before the land he called the island of st john upon this occasion as i think because it was discovered upon the day of john the baptist the inhabitants of this island are to wear beast skins and have them in as great estimation as we have our finest garments in their wars they use bows arrows pikes darts wooden clubs and slings the soil is barren in some places and yieldeth little fruit but it is full of white bears and stags far greater than ours it yieldeth plenty of fish 
and those very great as seals and those which commonly we call salmons there are soles also about a yard in length there is great abundance of that kind of fish which the savages call bacalaos in the same island also there breed hawks but they are so black that they are very like to ravens as also their partridges and eagles which are in like sort black a discourse of sebastian cabot touching his discovery of part of the west india out of england in the time of king henry the seventh used to galatius butrigarius the pope's legate in spain and reported by the said legate in this sort do you not understand said he speaking to certain gentlemen of venice how to pass to india toward the northwest as did of late a citizen of venice so valiant a man and so well practised in all things pertaining to navigations and the science of cosmography that at this present he hath not his like in spain insomuch that for his virtues he is preferred above all other pilots that sail to the west indies who may not pass thither without his license and is therefore called pilato mayor that is the grand pilot and when we said that we knew him not he proceeded saying that being certain years in the city of Sayul, and desirous to have some knowledge of the navigations of the spaniards it was told him that there was in the city a valiant man a venetian born named sebastian cabot who had the charge of those things being an expert man in that science and one that could make cards for the sea with his own hand and by this report seeking his acquaintance he found him a very gentle person who entertained him friendly and showed him many things and among other a large map of the world with certain particular navigations as well as of the portugals as of the spaniards and that he spake further unto him to this effect when my father departed from venice many years since to dwell in england to follow the trade of merchandises he took me with him to the city of london while i was very young yet having nevertheless some knowledge of letters of humanity and of the sphere and when my father died in that time when news were brought that don christopher colonus genuese had discovered the coasts of india whereof was great talk in all the court of king henry the seventh who then reigned insomuch that all men with great admiration affirmed it to be a thing more divine than humane to sail by the west into the east where spices grow by a way that was never known before by this fame and report there increased in my heart a great flame of desire to attempt some notable thing and understanding by reason of the sphere that if i should sail by way of the northwest i should by a shorter track come into india i thereupon caused the king to be advertised of my device who immediately commanded two carols to be furnished with all things appertaining to the voyage which was as far as i remember in the year fourteen ninety six in the beginning of summer i began therefore to sail toward the northwest not thinking to find any other land than that of cathay and from thence to turn toward india but after certain days i found that the land ran towards the north which was to me a great displeasure nevertheless sailing along by the coast to see if i could find any gulf that turned i found the land still continent to the fifty-sixth degree under our pole and seeing that there the coast turned toward the east despairing to find the passage i turned back again and sailed down by the coast of that land toward the equinoctial ever with intent to find the said passage to india and came to that part of this firm land which is now called florida where my victuals failing i departed from thence and returned to england where i found great tumults among the people and preparation for wars in scotland by reason whereof there was no more consideration had to this voyage whereupon i went into spain to the catholic king and queen elizabeth which being advertised what i had done entertained me and at their charges furnished certain ships wherewith they caused me to sail to discover the coasts of brazil where i found an exceeding great and large river named at this present rio de la plata that is the river of silver 
into the which I sailed and followed it into the firm land, more than six score leagues, finding it everywhere very fair and inhabited with infinite people, which with admiration came running daily to our ships. Into this river run so many other rivers that it is in manner incredible. After this I made many other voyages, which I now predetermine and waxing old, I give myself to rest from such travels, because there are now many young and lusty pilots and mariners of good experience, by whose forwardness I do rejoice in the fruit of my labors, and rest with the charge of this office, as you see. Another testimony of the voyage of Sebastian Cabot to the west and northwest, taken out of the sixth chapter of the third decade of Peter, martyr of Anglia. These North Seas have been searched by one Sebastian Cabot, a Venetian-born, whom being yet but in manner an infant, his parents carried with them into England, having occasion to resort thither for trade of merchandise, as is the manner of the Venetians, to leave no part of the world unsearched to obtain riches. He therefore furnished two ships in England at his own charges, and first with three hundred men directed his course so far towards the North Pole, that even in the month of July he found monstrous heaps of ice swimming on the sea, and in manner continual day light, yet saw he the land in that tract free from ice, which had been molten by the heat of the sun. Thus seeing such heaps of ice before him, he was enforced to turn his sails and follow the west, so coasting still by the shore, that he was thereby brought so far into the south, by reason of the land bending so much southwards that it was there almost equal in latitude, and with the sea, Freetum Herculeum, having the North Pole elevate in manner in the same degree. He sailed likewise in this tract so far towards the west that he had the island of Cuba on his left hand in manner in the same degree of longitude. As he travelled by the coasts of this great land, which he named Bacalaus, he saith that he found the like course of the waters toward the west, but the same to run more softly and gently than the swift waters which the Spaniards found in their navigation southwards. Wherefore it is not only more like to be true, but ought also of necessity to be concluded that between both the lands hitherto unknown there should be certain great open places whereby the waters should thus continually pass from the east into the west which waters I suppose to be driven about the globe of the earth by the incessant moving and impulsion of the heavens, and not to be swallowed up and cast up again by the breathing of Demogorgon, as some have imagined, because they see the seas by increase and decrease to ebb and flow. Sebastian Cabot himself named these lands Bacalaus, because that in the seas thereabout he found so great multitudes of certain big fishes, much like unto tunies, which the inhabitants call bacalaos, that they sometimes stayed his ships. He found also the people of those regions covered with beasts' skins, yet not without the use of reason. He also saith there is great plenty of bears in those regions which used to eat fish, for plunging themselves in the water where they perceive a multitude of these fishes to lie they fasten their claws in their scales and so draw them to land and eat them so as he saith the bears being thus satisfied with fish are not noisome to men he declareth further that in many places of these regions he saw great plenty of copper among the inhabitants cabot is my very friend whom i use familiarly and delight to have him sometimes keep me company in my own house. For being called out of England by the commandment of the Catholic King of Castile, after the death of King Henry the Seventh of that name King of England, he was made one of our council and assistants, as touching the affairs of the New Indies, looking for ships daily to be furnished for him to discover this hid secret of nature. End of chapter 5《Chapter Six of Young People's Treasury, Volume Six: Famous Travels and Adventures by Hamilton Wright Maybe. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 
Recording by Betty B. Vasco da Gama's Voyage to India by Thomas Frost. On July 8, 1497, Vasco da Gama sailed from the Tagus in command of three small vessels manned by 160 men for the purpose of finding the route to India round the Cape of Good Hope, which had been discovered by Diaz. The vessels separated on a dark and tempestuous night, but assembled again at Cape Verde and sailed in company for the south. After enduring very stormy weather, they reached St. Helena on November 4th. So much hostility was evinced by the islanders that, after an affray with them, the little squadron weighed anchor without obtaining the needed supplies and proceeded on the voyage. On the evening of the 18th, they were in sight of the promontory which Diaz had named the Cape of Storms, and which again seemed to merit the appellation. Contrary winds prevailed, and for two days compelled the explorers to tack, constantly shifting the sails. But at length, on Wednesday, November 20th, all the squadron doubled this tremendous promontory. On the 24th, a landing was made at a place called Angra del Bla, where the dusky natives seemed to have been both suspicious and treacherous. The exploring party fell into an ambush and retreated to their boats, but upon two guns being fired from one of the ships, the natives dropped their weapons in a fright and fled inland. Gama afterward had a pillar bearing the royal arms of Portugal set up on the beach to commemorate his presence there, but it was pulled down again by the natives. The little squadron then sailed away and for several days was compelled by stormy weather to stand away from the coast. Land was in sight again on January 11th, and after coasting it for some distance, two of Gama's officers went ashore and had an interview with the king, probably a chief of one of the Kaffir tribes of the country. Presents were made to this dusky potentate, who in return regaled his visitors with a supper of boiled fowl and millet. Leaving this place, the expedition sailed fifty leagues beyond Sofala, where, on the 24th, Gama ascended a wide river, which must have been one of the mouths of the Zambezi. The natives received the adventurers hospitably. Gama set up a mark on the beach to commemorate his visit, and, after a stay for the requisite repairs of the little fleet, continued his journey. Some islands were passed, which were probably the cluster of islets southward of Cape Delgado. There being much sickness aboard, the vessels anchored before Mozambique. The natives are described as speaking Arabic and having a considerable trade with India. No difficulty was experienced in procuring the supplies that were needed, but as soon as the sheik discovered that the strangers were not worshippers of the prophet of Mecca, his civility diminished, and the people regarded them with mistrust. Instead of two pilots, only one was sent, and the permission to take water was withdrawn. Fresh water being essential to the success of the enterprise, Gama ordered his men to take it by force, and then occurred a collision. Gama brought the broadside of his vessel to the town and subjected it to a vigorous cannonade. The voyage was then resumed, and on April 7th they reached Mombasa. Here they found more native mistrust. One of the vessels ran upon a shoal, and an attempt was made to cut her cable. The ship being got off without much damage, they sailed again on the 13th. On the same day, a native vessel was seized, and much gold and silver found aboard her, which the captors took possession of, making the crew prisoners. In the evening, they anchored before Melinda. To the king of Melinda, Gama delivered his Arab prisoners, and then, having obtained some information concerning the navigation, left there April 22nd, and on May 20th anchored before Calicut, being the first European vessels that had ever entered an Indian port. Eight days elapsed before Gama received permission to go ashore, which he then did in great state and attended public worship in a Hindu temple. From the pagoda, Gama went to the palace and made presents to the king, who evinced dissatisfaction at the smallness of their value, representing through his ministers that, to a sovereign of his rank, articles of gold and silver should have been sent. The Mohammedan traders used all their influence for Gama's discomfiture, and it availed to have him arrested. 
on entering into an agreement to land his cargo he was released and he took care not to go ashore any more the goods landed heavy dues were demanded and gama's factor and his secretary were arrested having sold his cargo gama made reprisals by seizing several persons of distinction and putting to sea finding his vessels followed by an armed flotilla he threatened to massacre his prisoners if his factor and secretary were not released and by this threat he obtained their liberty but instead of thereupon liberating his own prisoners he set free only a certain number the flotilla continued the pursuit but he kept the boats at a distance by firing his guns and taking advantage of a fresh and favoring gale made his escape his ships were attacked soon after however by vessels supposed to be piratical one of which was captured and others beaten off and driven ashore a native vessel brought him a message from the ruler of goa gama suspected a treacherous design and the messenger being tortured confessed that gama was to be lured to goa and there seized then came contrary winds with alternate storms and calms during which gama seems to have lost his course for on february second he found himself at Magadoxo. he cannonaded the town since the authorities of the place were mohammedans and mohammedans had been his enemies elsewhere continuing his voyage homeward he arrived at melinda where he stayed for five days and renewed friendly relations with the king he then proceeded to zanzibar where he was well received sickness had so reduced his crew that he had not enough to navigate three vessels so the least sea worthy of which he burned he now ran southward as far as san blas and put into that port to refresh his crews the cape was doubled on april twenty fifth and then they ran northwest for twenty days after leaving the cape baird islands the ships encountered a severe storm and when the sky became clear the smaller vessel had disappeared it was surmised afterward that her captain purposely separated from gama in order to reach the tagus first for gama found him there on his arrival the commercial results of this voyage were immense it enabled the portuguese to have the monopoly of indian trade for more than a century the southern and eastern coasts of africa were no longer a terra incognita and the sea of darkness was disarmed of its terrors for the mariner End of chapter six chapter seven of young people's treasury volume six famous travels and adventures by hamilton wright maybe this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by betty b sir francis drake's voyage round the world by thomas frost toward the close of fifteen seventy seven a small fleet of five vessels the largest of which was only one hundred tons was equipped at plymouth partly at the cost of sir francis drake and partly by the aid of certain distinguished persons among whom the queen is said to have been one the admiral assumed the command and besides the officers of the several vessels was accompanied by a considerable number of gentlemen as volunteers the little fleet sailed from plymouth november fifteenth but encountered such bad weather that the ships were obliged to put into falmouth to refit and did not resume the voyage until december thirteenth on the twenty seventh they anchored before mogador and sailing from that port on the last day of the year stood to the southwest capturing several spanish vessels on their way on january seventeenth fifteen seventy eight they were off cape blanco where they landed their prisoners and remained several days bartering with the natives on the twenty seventh they were at muyo whence supplies being refused them there they stood to the westward as they sailed past san jago three guns were fired at them but without doing any damage and in revenge a portuguese vessel laden with wine was seized the crew were allowed to go free with the exception of the pilot who because he was well acquainted with the south american coast was detained having taken in water at brava they sailed for the coast of brazil which was sighted april fifth on may fifteenth as the fleet sailed slowly along the coast a bay was discovered which drake proceeded in his barge to explore two huts were seen 
but no natives were visible. Many reis were observed running over the plains and their eggs discovered in sandy hollows. The unseaworthiness of some of the smaller vessels was so apparent that Drake brought the fleet to anchor and had one of them broken up. During the progress of this work, many of the natives were seen. They were naked and had long black hair. Their weapons were bows and arrows. The expedition sailed again on June 3rd, but another vessel broke down and the fleet anchored a few days to break it up. On the 19th, they entered Port Julian, where they encountered the savage natives of Patagonia. With these giants, the explorers were soon on friendly terms. Leaving Port Julian, Drake entered the Strait of Magellan on August 20th and discovered some small islands, which he named Elizabethides, in honor of the Queen. The passage of the Strait was effected in 17 days. The shores were explored and observations taken of the currents and soundings and of the habits and manners of the savage Aborigines. The western extremity of the Strait was reached September 6th, but there arose a violent storm which lasted more than a month. One of the smaller vessels was separated from the other ships, and after being tossed about several weeks, returned to England. Drake's ship and her sole remaining companion were driven by the storm as far south as the 55th parallel of latitude, where some islands were discovered on which the crews found vegetables and fresh water, both of which were much needed. Rested and refreshed from their late hardships and fatigue, the explorers resumed their voyage, but the storm burst forth again with renewed fury and inclemency. To this tempestuous weather, however, Drake owed the chief geographical discovery of his trip, for the storm drove them so far south that Cape Horn was discovered. Drake saw the Atlantic Ocean and the South Sea meet in a large and free scope, and sailing into the Pacific, anchored in one of the numerous bays on the west coast of Patagonia. The crew of a boat which he had here sent ashore were attacked by the natives and every man wounded by a shower of arrows. Sailing from this inhospitable shore, Drake anchored in the harbor of Valparaiso, where he seized a Spanish vessel laden with wine. Thence they sailed to Coquimbo, where the Spaniards made such preparations for resistance as caused Drake to refrain from attacking the place. He sailed slowly along the coast, plundering the Spaniards and trafficking with the Indians, and on February 7, 1579, arrived at Arica, where he captured three vessels. A week later, he captured several vessels at Calau. Drake now stood to the northwest, overhauling and plundering several small Spanish vessels in his course, and after taking in wood and water, at the Isle of Canes, sailed as far in that direction as the 43rd parallel of north latitude. Here the cold was found so intolerable that the course was changed, and the ships running southward discovered a bay on the coast of California, where they anchored June 17th. Finding the country fertile and the natives hospitable, Drake took formal possession in the name of the Queen of England, and gave the region the name of New Albion. Drake sailed from these auriferous shores on July 23rd and steered toward the rich islands of the eastern archipelago. On September 30th, some small islands were discovered in 30 degrees north, and then Drake sailed toward the equator. The Malukas were in sight on November 3rd, and on the 5th he anchored off Ternate. Thereupon, three large barges, says Moore, with the viceroy and several of the principal nobility, came out to conduct the vessel safe into harbor. The king, likewise, having been presented with a velvet cloak in sign of amity, afterward came in great state and was received under the discharge of the cannon, the music striking up as he approached. This prince had guards who understood the use of firearms, though javelins and bows and arrows were their principal weapons. He was of majestic mien and graceful aspect. Those who attended him were dressed in cottons, and some of them were of venerable aged appearance. He withdrew when the ship came to an anchor, giving his subjects leave to traffic with the strangers, and promised to return within the space of two days. Drake, having sent some gentlemen on shore, they were conducted to the castle, and being introduced at court, found there were near a thousand people. 
on each side of the outer gate there waited old interpreters of other countries when his majesty appeared on this occasion he was dressed in cloth of gold and had his hair woven into golden ringlets he had diamond rings on his fingers and a gold chain round his neck near his chair was a page with a fan set with sapphires which was useful in moderating the heat and he sat under a rich canopy where he received the english in state and with marks of honor and respect on the ninth having taken four tons of cloves aboard drake weighed anchor and sailed to the southward both his ships were so leaky and foul however that on reaching a beautiful fertile island which was found to be uninhabited he anchored in a creek turtles and fruit were plentiful and the double processes of refitting the ships and refreshing the crews went on together very pleasantly for a month drake left on this island a negro lad and a mulatto girl whom he had taken out of one of his prizes for which act he has been severely condemned on the night of january nineteenth fifteen eighty his ship grounded on a concealed rock and though the guns and water casks were cast overboard could not be moved the crew were mustered and to every man the chaplain administered the sacrament of the communion all on board expecting a watery grave but the wind changed and the ship was heaved off the rock having sustained very little damage they now sailed very cautiously to baratine where they refitted proceeding thence to java there drake and his officers were sumptuously entertained by the king and allowed to refit which had again become necessary and to obtain the supplies they required for the continuance of the voyage the crews were now become clamorous for returning to england and orders were given to steer for the cape of good hope that famous promontory was doubled on june fifteenth and on july twenty second the expedition was at sierra leone where two days were spent thence they steered homeward and on november third anchored in plymouth harbor having completed the first circumnavigation of the globe ever performed by englishmen End of chapter seven chapter eight of young people's treasury volume six famous travels and adventures by hamilton wright maybe this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Betty B. Sir Walter Raleigh's Explorations in Guyana by Thomas Frost. Raleigh sailed from Plymouth February 6, 1595, in his own ship, accompanied by a small bark commanded by Captain Cross. He arrived at Trinidad on March 28th, and leaving the ships at anchor off Point Curiapus, explored the coast of the island in his barge entering every creek and finding oysters growing on the branches of trees as described by pliny entering port of spain he gleaned all the information he could from the spanish soldiers of the garrison who having he says been many years without wine a few draughts made them merry in which mood they vaunted of guiana and the riches thereof and all they knew of the ways and passages having captured the town of san joseph by a night assault and destroyed it with fire he returned to his anchorage carrying with him as a prisoner the governor of the place from whom he elicited all the information he could concerning the navigation of the orinoco and the supposed situation of el dorado being joined by two ships under the command of captains gifford and chemus and a small bark commanded by captain caulfield he at length prepared to ascend the Orinoco in quest of the Golden City. The island of Trinidad is situated at the mouth of the Gulf of Para, in the southwest corner of which is the Bay of Guanipa, into which flows the stream that bounds the great delta of the Orinoco on the west. Casting anchor in this bay, Raleigh sent Gifford and Caulfield to the Capuri, but they could not pass the sands that obstructed its mouth. He then sent the master of the lion's whelp, one of the boats, to try the passage of the river Amana, at the bottom of the bay of Guanipa. But he, being frightened by a report that the natives were ferocious cannibals, beat a quick retreat, and informed Raleigh that the Amana was as impracticable as the Capuri. He next had a galego cut down, so as to draw only five feet of water, 
and sent the master to explore the navigation in another direction. The result of this survey was the discovery of four channels, one of which was as wide as the Thames at Woolwich, but all shallow. Raleigh now resolved upon a boating expedition, and started with one hundred men, under the guidance of an Indian, who undertook to pilot them into the Orinoco. But, says Raleigh, of that which he entered he was utterly ignorant, for he had not seen it for twelve years before. But it chanced that entering into a river, which because it had no name we called the River of the Red Cross, ourselves being the first Christians that ever came therein, on May 22nd we espied a small canoe with three Indians, which I overtook before they could cross the river. The rest of the people on the banks gazed on with a doubtful fear. But when they perceived that we offered them no violence, they began to offer to traffic with us for such things as they had. As we drew near the bank, they all stayed, and we came with our barge to the mouth of a little creek which came from their town into the great river. Here the Indian pilot and his brother went ashore for wine and fruit and were nearly slain, the chief of that district being angry with them for bringing strangers into the country. An old Indian was seized as a hostage for the safe return of the pilot and was installed in the latter's place. Under the guidance of this old man, the expedition ascended the river with the tide. On the third day, the galley grounded and could not be hauled off until all the ballast was cast out. Next day they entered the river Amana, where there was no tide and the current ran so strong that rowing became hard work. The explorers persevered for three days. About an hour after midnight, lights were observed ahead, and soon afterwards a village was reached. Most of the inhabitants were absent, having accompanied the chief on an expedition to the head of the Orinoco. But bread, fish, and poultry were obtained and the explorers rested and refreshed themselves. Daylight showed them that they were in a very beautiful country. Continuing the ascent of the river, they saw four canoes and gave chase, and overtaking them took one of the men for a pilot and sent back their former pilots in one of the canoes. On the fifteenth day, they discovered afar off the mountains of Guyana, to our great joy, and toward evening came in sight of the Orinoco. Anchoring for the night, they landed on the sands, where they found thousands of turtles' eggs. The following morning, a chief came to them, with thirty or forty of the men of his tribe, and conducted them to his village, where some of our captains caroused of his wine until they were reasonably pleasant. The chief provided Raleigh with a pilot, under whose guidance the adventurers began to ascend the Orinoco. Passing the island of Asapana, they anchored at night by the island of Okewita, and on the following night by the island of Putapaima, choosing islands rather than the main banks to anchor under, on account of their being better for fishing and abounding in turtles' eggs. On the following day they surveyed the country on the right, which the Indian pilot said was the great plain of Sema, stretching northward to Cumana and Caracas. They anchored at night off the opposite bank, and on the following night, near a village, the chief of which visited them the next morning, attended by many of his people, bringing venison, pork, poultry, fish, fruit, vegetables, and bread. This Kazik, who said he was one hundred and ten, and had walked fourteen miles to see them, also presented Raleigh with an armadillo and several parakeets, one of which was no bigger than a wren. On the following night they anchored off the island of Kayama, and next day reached the mouth of the Karoli, which was so shallow that the barge could not get in. The adventurers encamped on the bank, therefore, and having received some supplies of food from a neighboring chief, divided themselves into three parties. One party, commanded by Captain Whidden, searched for gold. Some of the gentlemen volunteers ascended the river by land, and Raleigh himself set off to view the falls of Caroli, finding them very beautiful, as well as the country around about them. Captain Whidden found some stones which were thought to be sapphires. But, says Raleigh, whether it be crystal of the mountains, Bristol diamond or sapphire, I do not yet know, but I hope the best. The ascent of the Orinoco was not continued beyond this point. The wet season had commenced and the river was rising daily, while the explorers were exposed to almost incessant showers of rain 
and violent gusts of wind raleigh determined to rejoin his ships first collecting some specimens of gold ore and leaving a man and a boy in the village of the centenarian cacique to learn the language of the indians he would not leave the orinoco however without learning all he could of the natural features and products of that region he made another excursion inland finding the woods full of deer and the rivers alive with fish and fowl he went no farther himself but leaving captain kemus to complete the survey in that direction returned to the orinoco and entered a branch of the winnicapura he had received a report of a marvelous mountain of crystal and wished to see it the chief of the next village at which he arrived offered to furnish a guide to the crystal mountain but his visit was made at the time of a native festival and we found them all as drunk as beggars the adventurers being weary and athirst joined in the carouse and the crystal mountain seems to have been forgotten having obtained a supply of provisions and wine the descent of the river was continued in a violent thunderstorm and the next day they reached the island of Asapana, where they feasted on the armadillo storm now succeeded storm but the strength of the current enabled them to run one hundred miles daily and the following night they anchored at the mouth of the Kapuri. When they reached the bay of Guanipa, where the ships had been left at anchor, they found them gone. So they rowed by night across the mouth of the estuary, and on the following morning had Trinidad in sight, where they found the vessel safely anchored. Returning to England, Raleigh was mortified to find that little regard was paid to his narrative of his discoveries, either by the queen or by the nation, he had not related the result of the journey of Captain Kemus to the Gold Mountains, but when he had been several years in the Tower for his participation in the conspiracy against James I, he disseminated a report of a rich gold mine which he had discovered in Guyana, and the tide of public sympathy at once turned in his favor. James gave little credit to the report, but ordered Raleigh's release, and subsequently gave him permission to lead a second expedition to the Orinoco, with the stipulation not to attack any Spanish settlement. The disastrous result of this second expedition is matter of history. Raleigh, on reaching the mouth of the Orinoco, sent a force under his son and Captain Kemus to attack the Spanish settlement of San Tomas, which was taken by assault and destroyed by fire. Though Kemus pretended to be well acquainted with the locality of the gold mine and to be within a few miles of it he refused to lead his followers to it and return to the ships what passed between him and raleigh is unknown but chemus retired to his cabin and committed suicide while the disappointment felt by their followers was so great that they resolved to return to england and take raleigh with them to answer to the king for his depredations against the spanish nation on the return of the expedition the Spanish court was clamorous against Raleigh, and as he had not been pardoned by the king, the warrant for his execution was signed, and the sentence was carried out, which had been hanging over him for years. End of chapter 8「Chapter 9 of Young People's Treasury, Volume 6, Famous Travels and Adventures by Hamilton Wright Maybe. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Betty B. The Colorado Cliff Dwellers By Alfred Terry Bacon When the conquerors of Mexico reached the seven cities of Cibola, the buffalo, great in wealth and population, lying in the valley of the Rio de Zuni, they found not cities, but rather villages of peaceful agricultural people dwelling in great pueblos, three and four stories high, and they searched in vain for the rumored stores of gold. At that time the Pueblos held a large population, skilled in many arts of civilization. They cultivated large tracts of ground, wove fabrics of cotton, and produced ornate pottery. Their stone masonry was admirable, but even three hundred years ago it seems that the people were but a remnant of what they had once been. Even then the conquerors wondered at the many ruins which indicated a decline from former greatness. The people have not now the same degree of skill in their native arts which the race once had. 
and it is probable that when the spaniards came and found them declining in numbers the old handicrafts were already on the wane in a remote age the ancestors of these pueblo tribes or a race of kindred habits filled most of that vast region which is drained by the colorado river and its affluents and spread beyond into the valley of the rio grande the explorers of a great extent of country in utah arizona new mexico and colorado have found everywhere evidences of the wide distribution and wonderful industry of that ancient people on the low land which they used to till lie the remains of their villages rectangular buildings of enormous dimensions and large circular estufas or halls for council and worship on the sides of the savage cliffs that wall in or overarch the canyons are scattered in every crevice and wrinkle those strange and picturesque ruins which give us the name cliff dwellers to distinguish this long forgotten people and on commanding points seen far away down the canyons or across the mesas stand the solitary watch-towers where sentinels might signal to the villagers below on the approach of northern barbarians there is no other district which embraces in so small a compass so great a number and variety of the cliff dwellers ruined works as the canyon of the little rio mancos in southwestern colorado the stream rises in a spur of the san juan mountains near the remote mining camp called parrot city flowing southward for a few miles through an open valley it is soon enclosed between the walls of a profound canyon which cuts for nearly thirty miles through a tableland called the mesa verde the canyon is wide enough to have permitted the old inhabitants to plant their crops along the stream and the cliffs rising on either side to a height of two thousand feet are so curiously broken and grooved and shelving from the decay of the soft horizontal strata and the projection of the harder as to offer remarkable facilities for building fortified houses hard of approach and easy of defense therefore the whole length of the canyon is filled with ruins and for fifteen miles beyond it to the borders of new mexico where the river meets the rio san juan the valley bears many traces of the ancient occupation the scenery of the canyon is wild and imposing in the highest degree in the dry colorado air there are few lichens or weather stains to dull the brightness of the strata to the universal hoariness of moister climates the vertical cliffs standing above long slopes of debris are colored with the brilliant tints of freshly quarried stone a gay ribbon of green follows the course of the rivulet winding down through the canyon till it is lost to sight in the vista of crags the utter silence and solitude of the wilderness reigns through the valley it is not occupied by any savage tribe and only a few white men within the last few years have passed through it and told of its wonders and yet its whole length is but one series of houses and temples that were forsaken centuries ago i can hardly imagine a more exciting tour of exploration than that which mr jackson's party made on first entering this canyon in eighteen seventy four above the entrance of the canyon the evidences of prehistoric life begin on the bottom land concealed by shrubbery are the half obliterated outlines of square and circular buildings the houses were of large size and were plainly no temporary dwelling places for an accumulation of decorated pottery fills the ground about them indicating long occupation no doubt they were built of adobe masses of hard clay dried in the sun which the wear of ages has reduced to smoothly rounded mounds for some miles down the canyon remains of this sort occur at short intervals and at one point there stands a wall built of squared sandstone blocks along the ledges of the cliffs on the right bits of ruinous masonry are detected here and there but for a time there is nothing to excite close attention at last a watchful eye is arrested by a more interesting object perched at a tremendous height on the western wall of the canyon it is a house built upon a shelf of rock between the precipices but standing seven hundred feet above the stream and differing not at all 
in color from the crags about it. Only the sharpest eyesight can detect the unusual form of the building and the windows marking the two stories. The climb up to the house platform is slow and fatiguing, but the trouble is repaid by a sight of one of the most curious ruins on this continent. Before the door of the house, part of the ledge has been reserved for a little esplanade, and to make it broader, three small abutments of stone, which once supported a floor, are built on the sloping edge of the rock. Beyond this, the house is entered by a small aperture which served as a door. It is the best specimen of a cliff-dweller's house that remains to our time. The walls are admirably built of squared stones laid in a hard white mortar. The house is divided into two stories of three rooms each. Behind it, a semicircular cistern nearly as high as the house is built against the side of it, and a ladder is arranged for descending from an upper window to the water level. The floor of the second story was supported by substantial cedar timbers, but only fragments of them remain. The roof, too, has entirely disappeared, but the canopy of natural rock overhanging serves to keep out the weather. The front rooms in both stories are the largest and are most carefully finished. Perhaps they were the parlor and best bedroom of some prehistoric housewife, and even in that remote age, the mania for household decoration had a beginning. Floor, walls, and ceiling were colored a deep red, surrounded by a broad border of white. The same cliff on which this house stands has on its side many other ruins, some half destroyed by gradual decay, some crushed by falling rocks, none so perfect as the one described, but all are crowded into the strangest, unapproachable crevices of the canyon wall, like the crannies which swallows choose to hold their nests, far removed from the possibility of depredation. Some are so utterly inaccessible that the explorers, with all their enthusiasm and activity, have never been able to reach them. How any beings not endowed with wings could live at such points, it is hard to conceive. It makes one suspicious that the cliff dwellers had not quite outgrown the habits of monkey ancestors. As the canyon widens with the descent of the stream, the ruins in the western wall increase in number. One fearful cliff a thousand feet in height is chinked all over its face with tiny houses of one room each, but only a few of them can be detected with the naked eye. One, which was reached by an explorer at the peril of his life, stands intact. Ceiling and floor are of the natural rock, and the wall is built in a neat curve conforming to the shape of the ledge. A mile farther down the stream, there is a most interesting group of houses. Eight hundred feet above the valley, there is a shelf in the cliff sixty feet in length that is quite covered by a house. The building contains four large rooms, a circular sacred apartment, and smaller rooms of irregular shape. It was called by its discoverers the House of the Sixteen Windows. Behind this house, the cliffside rises smooth and perpendicular thirty feet, but it can be scaled by an ancient stairway cut into it, which ascends to a still higher ledge. The stairs lead to the very door of another house, filling a niche a hundred and twenty feet long. A great canopy of solid rock overarches the little fortress, reaching far forward beyond the front wall, while from below it is absolutely unapproachable except by the one difficult stairway of niches cut in the rock. In time of war it must have been impregnable. These dwellings have given more ideas about their interior furnishing than any of the others. Among the accumulated rubbish were found corn and beans stored away. In the lower house were two large water jars of corrugated pottery, standing on a floor covered with neatly woven rush matting. In a house not far above were found a bin of charred corn and a polished hatchet of stone made with remarkable skill. From this point onward, both the valley and the cliffs are filled with the traces of a numerous population, every mile of travel bringing many fresh ones into sight. Among the cliff houses there is of necessity a variety in form and size as great as the differences of the caves and crevices 
that hold them but among the buildings of the low ground there is more uniformity not only in this canyon but in all the valleys of the region most of them may be classed as aggregated dwellings or pueblos with rectangular rooms round watch-towers and large circular buildings to these must be added a few which seem to have been built only for defense the straight walls have generally fallen except the parts supported by an angle of a building but as usual in old masonry the circular walls have much better resisted decay about midway down the canyon the curved wall of a large ruin rises above the thicket it is a building of very curious design the outer wall was an exact circle of heavy masonry a hundred and thirty feet in circumference within there is another circular wall concentric with the outer enclosing one round room with a diameter of twenty feet the annular space between the two walls was divided by partitions into ten small apartments other buildings of the same type occur in this region some of much larger size and with triple walls even in this one which is comparatively well preserved the original height is uncertain though the ruin still stands about fifteen feet high the vast quantity of debris about some of them indicates that they were of no significant height and their perfect symmetry of form the careful finish of the masonry the large dimensions and great solidarity made them the most imposing architectural works of that ancient people i find no reason to doubt that they were their temples and the presumption is very strong that there were temples for sun worship the occurrence of a circular room in connection with nearly every group of buildings is of special interest as seeming to link the cliff dwellers to the modern pueblo tribes in their religious customs most striking and picturesque of all the ruins are the round watch-towers on commanding points in the valley and on the highest pinnacles of the cliffs overlooking the surface of the mesa they occur with a frequency which is almost pathetic as an indication of the life of eternal vigilance which was led by that old race through the years perhaps centuries of exterminating warfare which the savage red men from the north waged upon them to us the suffering of frontier families at the hands of the same bloodthirsty savages is heartrending what was it to those who saw year by year their whole race's life withering away crushed by those wild tribes near the lower end of the canyon stands one of the most perfect of these towers rising sixteen feet above the mound on which it is built it was once attached to an oblong stone building which seems to have been a strongly fortified house the rectangular walls as usual are prostrate and have left the tower standing as solitary and picturesque and as full of mystery as the round towers of ireland in the montezuma canyon just beyond the colorado state border there are some remains built after an unusual manner with stones of great size one building of many rooms nearly covering a little solitary mesa is constructed of huge stone blocks not unlike the prehistoric masonry of southern europe in the same district there is a ruined line of fortification from which the smaller stones have fallen away and are crumbling to dust leaving only certain enormous upright stones standing they rise to a height of seven feet above the soil and the lower part is buried to a considerable depth their resemblances to the hoary druidical stones of karnak and stonehenge is striking and there is nothing in their appearance to indicate that they belong to a much later age than those primeval monuments of europe all the certain knowledge that we have of the history and manners of the cliff dwellers may be very briefly told for there is no written record of their existence except their own rude picture writing cut or painted on the canyon walls and it is not likely that those hieroglyphs will ever be deciphered but much may be inferred from their evident kinship to the moqui of our time and the resemblance of the ancient architecture and ceramics to the arts as they are still practiced in the degenerate pueblos of arizona gives us many intimations in regard to the habits of the cliff dwellers it was centuries ago how long a time no one will ever know 
when that old race was strong and numerous filling the great region from the rio grande to the colorado of the west and from the san juan mountains far down into northern mexico they must have numbered many hundreds of thousands perhaps millions it is not probable that they were combined under one government or that they were even closely leagued together but that they were essentially one in blood and language is strongly indicated by the similarity of their remains that they were sympathetic in a common hostility to the dangerous savage tribes about them can hardly be doubted they were of peaceful habits and lived by agriculture having under cultivation many thousands of acres in the rich river bottoms which they knew well how to irrigate from streams swollen in summer by the melting snows of the high mountain ranges we read of their dry canals in arizona so deep that a mounted horseman can hide in them we know that they raise crops of corn and beans and in the south cotton which they skillfully wove that they had commercial dealing across their whole country is shown by the quantity of shell ornaments brought from the pacific coast which are found in their colorado dwellings they did not understand the working of metals but their implements of stone are of most excellent workmanship their weapons indicate the practice of hunting and while the race was still numerous their forts and their sharp obsidian arrows made easy their resistance to the wandering savage hordes i believe that no instance can be cited of a people still in their stone age who have surpassed that old race in the mason's art indeed i doubt if any such people has even approached their skill in that respect the difficulty of constructing a great work of well-squared hammer-dressed stones is enormously increased if the masons must work only with stone implements imagine the infinite toilsome patience of a people who in such a way could rear the ancient pueblo bonito of new mexico five hundred and forty feet long three hundred and fourteen feet wide and four stories high in one wall of a neighboring building of stone less carefully dressed it is estimated that there were originally no less than thirty million pieces which were transported fashioned and laid by men without a beast of burden or a trowel chisel or hammer of metal at the time of the spanish conquest the pueblo tribes were worshippers of the sun and fire like all the races of this continent which were above barbarism today even in those pueblos where a corrupted form of the roman faith is accepted there are traces of the old sun worship mingled with it and in all pueblos there are large circular rooms called estufas reserved for councils and for worship the invariable appearance of estufas among the ruined towns and even on the ledges of the cliffs shows what sacredness was attached to the circular room which perhaps was symbolic of the sun's orb it indicates a unity of religious faith between the ancients and moderns end of chapter nine chapter ten of young people's treasury volume six famous travels and adventures by hamilton wright maybe this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by betty b the mammoth caves of kentucky by therese yelverton around the caves for eight or ten miles was a series of deep ravines studded with projecting cliffs and rocks and covered with oak principally the english oak and another gigantic species with leaves from a quarter to half a yard long but of the same form as the ordinary oak leaf up and down the ravines we scrambled and roamed as happy as goats or wild chamois these ravines or glens have no doubt been the beds of some ancient river now perhaps flowing through the bowels of the earth for this part of the country is intersected by underground rivers a stream often suddenly appearing which after flowing on for a few miles plunges rapidly into the earth and is lost to sight an anecdote is told of two millers who had their mills on two different rivers thirty miles apart there had been a long drought and neither mill had been working but one day miller number one heard his wheel going round at a tremendous pace and going to examine it perceived 
a quantity of water, although there had not been a drop of rain for some time. He went over to communicate his good luck to his neighbor. Oh, exclaimed Miller number two, you're getting my water unbeknownst, for a cloud burst over us the other night and nearly drowned us all. It was evident the Millers were working the same stream, which ran for thirty miles underground, similar to the lakes in Florida, called sinks, which suddenly disappear, leaving all the fish stranded. Sometimes the water returns, sometimes not. Independent of the caves, the scenery around, to a lover of nature, is well worthy of a visit, and for a summer resort is unsurpassed. Shady, romantic walks through the woods, a delicious air breathed from the gigantic mouth of the cavern, whence, in the hot months, it blows cool and refreshing, in the cold ones, soft and warm, the actual temperature of the cave never varying. The sensations of heat and cold are produced by comparison with the outer air. It occurred to a medical man that the uniform atmosphere of this cave might be a specific for consumption. Possessed with this theory, the doctor had a dozen small houses constructed in the cavern about a mile or two from its mouth, and to these he conveyed his patients. From the appearance of these places of abode, the only wonder is that the poor invalids did not expire after twenty-four hours of residence in them. They, however, contrived to exist there about three months, most of them being carried out in extremis. The houses consisted of a single room built of the rough stone of the cavern, which in this part bears all the appearance of a stone quarry, and without one particle of comfort beyond a boarded floor, the small dwelling being constructed entirely on the model of a lock-up or stone jug. The cells of a modern prison are quite palatial in comparison with them. The darkness is such as might be felt, and it is impossible to realize what darkness actually is until experienced in some place where a ray of sunlight has never penetrated. From the mouth of the cavern to that part where the doctor's houses were built was a continual, though gradual, descent, and at that spot there was a solid roof of a 150 feet of earth. The houses, or rather detached stone boxes, were so small that without vitiating the air, only one person could remain in them at one time, so that, beside the darkness, in case of any accident to their lamps, these poor creatures must have endured utter solitude. Their food was brought from the hotel two or three miles away on the hill, and consequently must have been cold and comfortless. They were kept prisoners within their narrow cells, for the rough rocks and stones everywhere abounding rendered a promenade for invalids quite impracticable. The deprivation of sunlight, fresh air, and all the beauties of the earth must have been the direst punishment imaginable. No wonder these poor creatures were carried out, one by one, to die. The last one having become so weak that it was deemed unsafe to move him, his friends resolved to stay with him in the cavern till the last. What transpired is now beyond investigation. Whether some effect of light, which in this cavern has a most mysterious and awful appearance, or whether the deathbed was one of terrors, owing to some imp of mischief having laid a plan to scare them, as they say in this country, is not known. But they rushed terror-stricken from the cave, and on reaching the hotel, fell down insensible. Subsequently they declared they had seen spirits carrying away their friend. Mustering a strong force, the people from terra firma, with the guides and plenty of torches, sallied down to the lower and supposed infernal regions. The spirits, however, had fled, leaving nothing but the stiffening corpse of the poor consumptive. This ended all hope of the cavern as a cure for consumption. The Mammoth Cave is perhaps the most extensively explored cavern known. It extends for nine continuous miles, so that it would be possible to walk fifty miles in and out by different roads. The cavern consists of various large chambers and lofty domes, averaging from twenty to one hundred feet in height. Some of the chambers exactly resemble the tombs of the kings of Egypt, and the narrow, tortuous defiles through the rocks are also very like the roads into the pyramids. Most of these chambers are merely natural excavations in the solid rock. 
one of the white domed ceilings is covered with a thick scroll pattern traced in black and consists entirely of bats which take up their winter quarters in these caverns and fare better in them apparently than the consumptives it is curious how these sightless creatures from various parts of the country find out the caves so impervious to light and cold and where from the noise they make they seem to have a merry time of it not so however the visitors passing through this part of the cave for the bats are apt to fly right in one's face or stick against one's clothes and bite furiously at any attempt to dislodge them still farther on there is a vast vault upward of eighty feet high formed of gypsum with some sort of crystals embedded in it when you sit and gaze on it for some time by the dim light of the lamps this was written before the electric lamp was in use the vault seems to recede into azure space a bright sparkling veil hangs over it like the milky way seen dimly between the shelving rocks which bulge out in round soft layers of a whitish gray cast and look exactly like petrified clouds by a judicious movement of the light of the lamps a most beautiful phenomenon of cloud scenery is effected and by their gradual extinction a stygian darkness seems to wrap all in perfect horror this the star chamber is one of the finest effects in the mammoth cave and it might be enhanced to the wildest magnificence by an artistic arrangement of variously colored lights the cave would be a fine place in which to read dante's inferno here and there through the cave there are immense pits or chasms only some few yards in circumference but from two to three hundred feet in depth a piece of paper saturated in oil is thrown down and displays the fearful gulf the bottom of which appears to have the same formation of rock and clay as the top sometimes we ascended ten or twenty feet by ladders and occasionally descended we traversed about a mile of passage where the ceiling six feet high was as smooth as white and plaster could have made it it was literally covered with the names of former visitors in some places there were hundreds of cards on the floor left by guests for eight or nine miles we continued to traverse passages and chambers sometimes over rough pieces of rock sometimes through the thick dust of ages sometimes through the tortuous gorges mere slits between the rocks through which we had to creep sometimes coming upon a well or spring of sweet water at about three or four miles from the mouth we came to the chamber called the church from its resemblance to the ancient cathedral vault frequently to be seen on the european continent under churches or monasteries and called the crypt this church of the mammoth cave is a singular phenomenon the roof which is not lofty is supported by a number of pillars in many places forming gothic arches and running at somewhat regular distances dividing the church into aisles these columns are actually enormous stalactites and the fresco of petrified water upon them has all the appearance of the most rich and elaborate carving in some places the pillars of stone have not quite reached the ground and remain suspended from the roof other and smaller condensed stalactites resemble the drooping rosettes which unite the spring of gothic arches in one portion of the church is an enormous stone carved out exactly like the bishop's chair or throne usually seen on the high altar the altar itself is very like those primitive stone edifices sculptured by the early christians when driven to celebrate their worship in the catacombs of rome this chamber is a marvellous freak of nature imitating art for the hand of man has never touched it or worked it into shape yet if any one were transported here unconsciously he would on looking round imagine himself in the chancel crypt of some old cathedral of the ninth or tenth century some romantic lovers evidently influenced by this idea had actually a few weeks before our visit arrived at the cave accompanied by their friends and the clergyman and caused the marriage ceremony to be performed in that very church it was a whimsical idea and must have been a cold comfortless clammy affair a few miles farther on we came to the great natural marvel 
the subterranean river with its buried water and eyeless fish its beautiful parterres of stone flowers and shrubs like a garden covered with morning hoar-frost on this dismal river we were launched in a little skiff not the most seaworthy in the world and i must confess to having experienced a feeling of dread of being upset on that mysterious stream whose outlet might be for all we know in a region we did not care to visit or even to contemplate the possibility of visiting the echo had a thrill of awe that made one's flesh creep and hair stand on end if one called spirits there from the vasty deep and they did not come yet they certainly answered from the dark shadows of the rocks falling around the lurid glare of the torches the only light on the river of erebus it was quite easy to believe there were myriads of spirits flitting around and stretching out their weird arms to carry us down to bottomless hades there is another very interesting cave which is not so frequently visited by travellers who when they have seen the big thing are only anxious to rush away again it is not so extensive as the mammoth but infinitely more beautiful and more inaccessible the descent having to be accomplished by ladders but once down it is a fairyland a continuous scene of rapturous enchantment the stalactites simulate the most exquisite parterre of flowers the most magnificent forest of crystallized trees the most wondrous marble carving even to that perfection of art which shrouds the figure in transparent drapery like the statue of the dead christ at naples nor was apollo's charm unknown there our guide tapped upon these magic crystals and produced the sweetest harmony here ever heard or at least it sounded so the walls of the chambers and passages were encrusted with the stalactite flowers they could be broken off their stems and as so few visitors ventured down the guide allowed me to take one one chamber was absolutely contained with this marvelous formation of petrified water and when the guide held the light behind the scene it produced the effect of being draped in the purest amber these drooping curtains some fifty feet in height emitted the most musical tones when struck if the physician had brought his patients to these fairy bowers he might i think have succeeded in sending them home quite cured but i believe the cave had not been discovered then with the brilliant light the spot was perfectly lovely and the atmosphere was that of constant unchanged temperature which puts the human lungs in a state of beatitude i should not in the least object to live in that paradise of crystal flowers and adamantine forms the most beautiful that the imagination of man has ever conceived to be curtained in living amber and pillowed well i must admit that in dust but it was such clean dust the texture of these stalactites when examined by daylight resembles alabaster thus the leaves flowers sprigs are perfectly beautiful nor are these caves without their incidents of life's drama the grave and the gay have been enacted here as elsewhere the episode of the physician and his patients was sad enough but a more terrible tragedy resulted from a wager the guides are particular on entering the caves with a large party to beg them to keep together as it would be impossible for a person to find his own way out of the labyrinth of passages chambers etc two gentlemen of a party made a bet that they would accomplish the feat and taking their opportunity slipped away from their party without the guides being aware of their absence and it was not until late in the evening that the other party to the wager remarked that those two foolhardy fellows had not found their way out of the cavern this coming to the ears of the guide he exclaimed then they are dead men nevertheless they went in full force to do everything that was possible to find them but spent the night in vain searches sometimes they came upon their tracks in the soft dust then lost it again on the following day the search was renewed by the guide who had escorted the party and his description of the finding of one of the gentlemen was truly horrible it was the most tarnation cutting up job i ever had in my life said the guide we are not much of cowards we guides we get accustomed to awfulness down in the bowels of the earth but when that critter's shrieks first came to my ear, I just shivered all over and my feet rooted to the ground. 
not that i did not wish to save him the poor devil but i got an idea that that shriek came right straight from hell and no mistake and i had no fancy to go there before i was sent for well when i had wiped my brow and taken a drink i went on in the direction of the sound for it came every now and again the echoes making like fifty devils instead of one i found him sooner than i expected he was a sight to behold he flew at me like a tiger he clutched me and pulled me and wrestled with me yelling and howling like a wild beast i thought he would have torn me to pieces i should not have known him again for the same gentleman his eyes glared his mouth was foaming and his hair on end his clothes all torn and covered with dust he was a real raving maniac and so he remained as far as i know the work i had to get him out of that cave he would stand stock still and shake all over then suddenly clutch at me again i was the stronger man of the two and he was weak from long fasting or i never should have got him out the doctor said he was fright-stricken and this was the case as they thought with the other poor fellow who was not found for weeks it having been conjectured that he had fallen down a hole one of the guides making some new exploration discovered him sitting down no sign of decomposition having taken place and no sign of his having died of starvation for a piece of biscuit was found in his pocket he was supposed to have died of terror the terrible darkness working upon the nervous system and the hopelessness of penetrating it making the minutes appear hours a guide who had once been lost there himself for some twenty hours said he never could believe he had not been there for several days End of chapter 10chapter eleven of young people's treasury volume six famous travels and adventures by hamilton wright maybe this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by betty b the buffalo on the plains by f parkman the wagons one morning had left the camp shaw and i were already on horseback but henry chatillon still sat cross-legged by the dead embers of the fire playing pensively with the lock of his rifle while his sturdy wyandot pony stood quietly behind him looking over his head at last he got up patted the neck of the pony whom from an exaggerated appreciation of merits he had christened five hundred dollar and then mounted with a melancholy air what is it henry ah uh, i feel lonesome i never been here before but i see away yonder over the buttes and down there on the prairie black all black with buffalo in the afternoon he and i left the party in search of an antelope until at the distance of a mile or two on the right the tall white wagons and the little black specks of horsemen were just visible so slowly advancing that they seemed motionless and far on the left rose the broken line of scorched desolate sand hills the vast plain waved with tall rank grass that swept our horses bellies it swayed to and fro in billows with the light breeze and far and near antelope and wolves were moving through it the hairy backs of the latter alternately appearing and disappearing as they bounded awkwardly along while the antelope with the simple curiosity peculiar to them would often approach us closely their little horns and white throats just visible above the grass tops as they gazed eagerly at us with their round black eyes i dismounted and amused myself with firing at the wolves henry attentively scrutinized the surrounding landscape at length he gave a shout and called on me to mount again pointing in the direction of the sand hills a mile and a half from us two minute black specks slowly traversed the face of one of the bare glaring declivities and disappeared behind the summit let us go cried henry belaboring the sides of five hundred dollar and i following in his wake we galloped rapidly through the rank grass toward the base of the hills from one of their openings descended a deep ravine widening as it issued on the prairie we entered it and galloping up in a moment were surrounded by the bleak sand hills half of their steep sides were bare the rest were scantily clothed with clumps of grass and various uncouth plants conspicuous among which appeared the reptile-like prickly pear 
they were gashed with numberless ravines and as the sky had suddenly darkened and a cold gusty wind arisen the strange shrubs and the dreary hills looked doubly wild and desolate but henry's face was all eagerness he tore off a little hair from the piece of buffalo robe under his saddle and threw it up to show the course of the wind it blew directly before us the game were therefore to windward and it was necessary to make our best speed to get round them we scrambled from the ravine and galloping away through the hollows soon found another winding like a snake among the hills and so deep that it completely concealed us we rode up the bottom of it glancing through the shrubbery at its edge till henry abruptly jerked his rein and slid out of his saddle full a quarter of a mile distant on the outline of the farthest hill a long procession of buffalo were walking in indian file with the utmost gravity and deliberation then more appeared clambering from a hollow not far off and ascending one behind the other the grassy slope of another hill then a shaggy head and a pair of short broken horns appeared issuing out of a ravine close at hand and with a slow stately step one by one the enormous brutes came into view taking their way across the valley wholly unconscious of an enemy in a moment henry was worming his way lying flat on the ground through grass and prickly pears toward his unsuspecting victims he had with him both my rifle and his own he was soon out of sight and still the buffalo kept issuing into the valley for a long time he was silent i sat holding his horse and wondering what he was about when suddenly in rapid succession came the sharp reports of the two rifles and the whole line of buffalo quickening their pace into a clumsy trot gradually disappeared over the ridge of the hill henry rose to his feet and stood looking after them you have missed them said i yes said henry let us go he descended into the ravine loaded the rifles and mounted his horse we rode up the hill after the buffalo the herd was out of sight when we reached the top but lying on the grass not far off was one quite lifeless and another violently struggling in the death agony you see i miss him remarked henry he had fired from a distance of more than a hundred and fifty yards and both balls had passed through the lungs the true mark in shooting buffalo the darkness increased and a driving storm came on tying our horses to the horns of the victims henry began the bloody work of dissection slashing away with the science of a connoisseur while i vainly endeavored to imitate him old hendrick recoiled with horror and indignation when i endeavored to tie the meat to the strings of rawhide always carried for this purpose dangling at the back of the saddle after some difficulty we overcame his scruples and heavily burdened with the more eligible portions of the buffalo we set out on our return scarcely had we emerged from the labyrinth of gorges and ravines and issued upon the open prairie when the pricking sleet came driving gust upon gust directly in our faces it was strangely dark though wanting still an hour of sunset the freezing storm soon penetrated to the skin but the uneasy trot of our heavy gaited horses kept us warm enough as we forced them unwillingly in the teeth of the sleet and rain by the powerful suasion of our indian whips the prairie in this place was hard and level a flourishing colony of prairie dogs had burrowed into it in every direction and the little mounds of fresh earth around their holes were about as numerous as the hills in a cornfield but not a yelp was to be heard not the nose of a single citizen was visible all had retired to the depths of their burrows and we envied them their dry and comfortable habitations an hour's hard riding showed us our tent dimly looming through the storm one side puffed out by the force of the wind and the other collapsed in proportion while the disconsolate horses stood shivering close around and the wind kept up a dismal whistling in the boughs of three old half-dead trees above shaw like a patriarch sat on his saddle in the entrance with a pipe in his mouth and his arms folded contemplating with cool satisfaction the piles of meat that we flung on the ground before him a dark and dreary night succeeded but the sun rose with a heat so sultry and languid that the captain excused himself on that account from waylaying an old buffalo bull who with stupid gravity was walking over the prairie 
to drink at the river so much for the climate of the platte but it was not the weather alone that had produced this sudden abatement of the sportsmanlike zeal which the captain had always professed he had been out on the afternoon before together with several members of his party but their hunting was attended with no other result than the loss of one of their best horses severely injured by sorrel in vainly chasing a wounded bull the captain whose ideas of hard riding were all derived from transatlantic sources expressed the utmost amazement at the feats of sorrel who went leaping ravines and dashing at full speed up and down the sides of precipitous hills lashing his horse with the recklessness of a rocky mountain rider unfortunately for the poor animal he was the property of r against whom sorrel entertained an unbounded aversion the captain himself it seemed had also attempted to run a buffalo but though a good and practised horseman he had soon given over the attempt being astonished and utterly disgusted at the nature of the ground he was required to ride over nothing unusual occurred on that day but on the following morning henry chatillon looking over the ocean-like expanse saw near the foot of the distant hills something that looked like a band of buffalo he was not sure he said but at all events if they were buffalo there was a fine chance for a race shaw and i at once determined to try the speed of our horses come captain we'll see which can ride hardest a yankee or an irishman but the captain maintained a grave and austere countenance he mounted his led horse however though very slowly and we set out at a trot the game appeared about three miles distant as we proceeded the captain made various remarks of doubt and indecision and at length declared he would have nothing to do with such a breakneck business protesting that he had ridden plenty of steeplechases in his day but he never knew what riding was till he found himself behind a band of buffalo day before yesterday i am convinced said the captain that running is out of the question take my advice now and don't attempt it it's dangerous and of no use at all then why did you come with us what do you mean to do i shall approach replied the captain you don't mean to approach with your pistols do you we have all of us left our rifles in the wagons the captain seemed staggered at the suggestion in his characteristic indecision at setting out pistols rifles running and approaching were mingled in an inextricable medley in his brain he trotted on in silence between us for a while but at length he dropped behind and slowly walked his horse back to rejoin the party shaw and i kept on when lo as we advanced the band of buffalo were transformed into certain clumps of tall bushes dotting the prairie for a considerable distance at this ludicrous termination of our chase we followed the example of our late ally and turned back toward the party we encamped that night upon the bank of the river among the emigrants there was an overgrown boy some eighteen years old with a head as round and about as large as a pumpkin and fever and ague fits had dyed his face of a corresponding color he wore an old white hat tied under his chin with a handkerchief his body was short and stout but his legs of disproportioned and appalling length i observed him at sunset breasting the hill with gigantic strides and standing against the sky on the summit like a colossal pair of tongs in a moment after we heard him screaming frantically behind the ridge and nothing doubting that he was in the clutches of indians or grizzly bears some of the party caught up their rifles and ran to the rescue his outcries however proved but an ebullition of joyous excitement he had chased two little wolf pups to their burrow and he was on his knees grubbing away like a dog at the mouth of the hole to get at them before morning he caused more serious disquiet in the camp it was his turn to hold the middle guard but no sooner was he called upon than he coolly arranged a pair of saddle-bags under a wagon laid his head upon them closed his eyes opened his mouth and fell asleep the guard on our side of the camp thinking it no part of his duty to look after the cattle of the emigrants contented himself with watching our own horses and mules the wolves he said were unusually noisy but still no mischief was anticipated until the sun rose and not a hoof or horn was in sight the cattle were gone while tom was quietly slumbering the wolves had driven them away then we reaped the fruits of r s precious plan of travelling in company with emigrants 
to leave them in their distress was not to be thought of and we felt bound to wait until the cattle could be searched for and if possible recovered but the reader may be curious to know what punishment awaited the faithless tom by the wholesome law of the prairie he who falls asleep on guard is condemned to walk all day leading his horse by the bridle and we found much fault with our companions for not enforcing such a sentence on the offender nevertheless had he been of our own party i have no doubt he would in like manner have escaped scot-free but the emigrants went farther than mere forbearance they decreed that since tom couldn't stand guard without falling asleep he shouldn't stand guard at all and henceforward his slumbers were unbroken establishing such a premium on drowsiness could have no very beneficial effect upon the vigilance of our sentinels for it is far from agreeable after riding from sunrise to sunset to feel your slumbers interrupted by the butt of a rifle nudging your side and a sleepy voice growling in your ear that you must get up to shiver and freeze for three weary hours at midnight buffalo buffalo it was but a grim old bull roaming the prairie by himself in misanthropic seclusion but there might be more behind the hills dreading the monotony and languor of the camp shaw and i saddled our horses buckled our holsters in their places and set out with henry chatillon in search of the game henry not intending to take part in the chase but merely conducting us carried his rifle with him while we left ours behind as encumbrances we rode for some five or six miles and saw no living thing but wolves snakes and prairie dogs this won't do at all said shaw what won't do there's no wood about here to make a litter for the wounded man i have an idea that one of us will need something of the sort before the day is over there was some foundation for such an apprehension for the ground was none of the best for a race and grew worse continually as we proceeded indeed it soon became desperately bad consisting of abrupt hills and deep hollows cut by frequent ravines not easy to pass at length a mile in advance we saw a band of bulls some were scattered grazing over a green declivity while the rest were crowded more densely together in the wide hollow below making a circuit to keep out of sight we rode toward them until we ascended a hill within a furlong of them beyond which nothing intervened that could possibly screen us from their view we dismounted behind the ridge just out of sight drew our saddle girths examined our pistols and mounting again rode over the hill and descended at a canter toward them bending close to our horses necks instantly they took the alarm those on the hill descended those below gathered into a mass and the whole got in motion shouldering each other along at a clumsy gallop we followed spurring our horses to full speed and as the herd rushed crowding and trampling in terror through an opening in the hills we were close at their heels half suffocated by the clouds of dust but as we drew near their alarm and speed increased our horses showed signs of the utmost fear bounding violently aside as we approached and refusing to enter among the herd the buffalo now broke into several small bodies scampering over the hills in different directions and i lost sight of shaw neither of us knew where the other had gone old pontiac ran like a frantic elephant uphill and downhill his ponderous hoofs striking the prairie like sledge-hammers he showed a curious mixture of eagerness and terror straining to overtake the panic-stricken herd but constantly recoiling in dismay as we drew near the fugitives indeed offered no very attractive spectacle with their enormous weight and size their shaggy manes and the tattered remnants of their last winter's hair covering their backs in irregular shreds and patches and flying off in the wind as they are at length i urged my horse close behind a bull and after trying in vain by blows and spurring to bring him alongside i shot a bullet into the buffalo from this disadvantageous position at the report pontiac swerved so much that i was again thrown a little behind the game the bullet entering too much in the rear failed to disable the bull for a buffalo requires to be shot at particular points or he will certainly escape the herd ran up a hill and i followed in pursuit as pontiac rushed headlong down on the other side 
i saw shaw and henry descending the hollow on the right at a leisurely gallop and in front the buffalo were just disappearing behind the crest of the next hill their short tails erect and their hoofs twinkling through a cloud of dust at that moment i heard shaw and henry shouting to me but the muscles of a stronger arm than mine could not have checked at once the furious course of pontiac whose mouth was as insensible as leather added to this i rode him that morning with a common snaffle having the day before for the benefit of my other horse unbuckled from my bridle the curb which i ordinarily used a stronger and hardier brute never trod the prairie but the novel sight of the buffalo filled him with terror and when at full speed he was almost uncontrollable gaining the top of the ridge i saw nothing of the buffalo they had all vanished amid the intricacies of the hills and hollows reloading my pistols in the best way i could i galloped on until i saw them again scuttling along at the base of the hill their panic somewhat abated down went old pontiac among them scattering them to the right and left and then we had another long chase about a dozen bulls were before us scouring over the hills rushing down the declivities with tremendous weight and impetuosity and then laboring with a weary gallop upward still pontiac in spite of spurring and beating would not close with them one bull at length fell a little behind the rest and by dint of much effort i urged my horse within six or eight yards of his side his back was darkened with sweat he was panting heavily while his tongue lolled out a foot from his jaws gradually i came up abreast of him urging pontiac with leg and rein nearer to his side when suddenly he did what buffalo in such circumstances will always do he slackened his gallop and turning toward us with an aspect of mingled rage and distress lowered his huge shaggy head for a charge pontiac with a snort leaped aside in terror nearly throwing me to the ground as i was wholly unprepared for such an evolution i raised my pistol in a passion to strike him on the head but thinking better of it fired the bullet after the bull who had resumed his flight then drew rein and determined to rejoin my companions it was high time the breath blew hard from pontiac's nostrils and the sweat rolled in big drops down his sides i myself felt as if drenched in warm water pledging myself and i redeemed the pledge to take my revenge at a future opportunity i looked round for some indication to show me where i was and what course i ought to pursue i might as well have looked for landmarks in the midst of the ocean how many miles i had run or in what direction i had no idea and around me the prairie was rolling in steep swells and pitches without a single distinctive feature to guide me i had a little compass hung at my neck and ignorant that the platte at this point diverged considerably from its easterly course i thought that by keeping to the northward i should certainly reach it so i turned and rode about two hours in that direction the prairie changed as i advanced softening away into easier undulations but nothing like the platte appeared nor any sign of a human being the same wild endless expanse lay around me still and to all appearance i was as far from my object as ever i began now to consider myself in danger of being lost and therefore reining in my horse summoned the scanty share of woodcraft that i possessed if that term be applicable upon the prairie to extricate me looking round it occurred to me that the buffalo might prove my best guides i soon found one of the paths made by them in their passage to the river it ran nearly at right angles to my course but turning my horse's head in the direction it indicated his freer gait and erected ears assured me that i was right but in the meantime my ride had been by no means a solitary one the whole face of the country was dotted far and wide with countless hundreds of buffalo they trooped along in files and columns bulls cows and calves on the green faces of the declivities in front they scrambled away over the hills to the right and left and far off the pale blue swells in the extreme distance were dotted with innumerable specks sometimes i surprised shaggy old bulls grazing alone or sleeping behind the ridges i ascended they would leap up at my approach 
stare stupidly at me through their tangled manes and then gallop heavily away the antelope were very numerous and as they are always bold when in the neighborhood of buffalo they would approach quite near to look at me gazing intently with their great round eyes then suddenly leap aside and stretch lightly away over the prairie as swiftly as a racehorse squalid ruffian-like wolves sneak through the hollows and sandy ravines several times i passed through villages of prairie dogs who sat each at the mouth of his burrow holding his paws before him in a supplicating attitude and yelping away most vehemently energetically whisking his little tail with every squeaking cry he uttered prairie dogs are not fastidious in their choice of companions various long checkered snakes were sunning themselves in the midst of the village and demure little gray owls with a large white ring around each eye were perched side by side with the rightful inhabitants the prairie teemed with life again and again i looked toward the crowded hillsides and was sure i saw horsemen and riding near with a mixture of hope and dread for indians were abroad i found them transformed into a group of buffalo there was nothing in human shape amid all this vast congregation of brute forms when i turned down the buffalo path the prairie seemed changed only a wolf or two glided past at intervals like conscious felons never looking to the right or left being now free from anxiety i was at leisure to observe minutely the objects around me and here for the first time i noticed insects wholly different from any of the varieties found farther to the eastward gaudy butterflies fluttered about my horse's head strangely formed beetles glittering with metallic luster were crawling upon plants that i had never seen before multitudes of lizards too were darting like lightning over the sand i had run to a great distance from the river it cost me a long ride on the buffalo path before i saw from the ridge of a sand hill the pale surface of the platte glistening in the midst of its desert valleys and the faint outline of the hills beyond waving along the sky from where i stood not a tree nor a bush nor a living thing was visible throughout the whole extent of the sun-scorched landscape in half an hour i came upon the trail not far from the river and seeing that the party had not yet passed i turned eastward to meet them old pontiac's long swinging trot again assuring me that i was right in doing so having been slightly ill on leaving camp in the morning six or seven hours of rough riding had fatigued me extremely i soon stopped therefore flung my saddle on the ground and with my head resting on it and my horse's trail rope tied loosely to my arm lay waiting the arrival of the party speculating meanwhile on the extent of the injuries pontiac had received at length the white wagon coverings rose from the verge of the plain by a singular coincidence almost at the same moment two horsemen appeared coming down from the hills they were shaw and henry who had searched for me a while in the morning but well knowing the futility of the attempt in such a broken country had placed themselves on the top of the highest hill they could find and picketing their horses near them as a signal to me had laid down and fallen asleep the stray cattle had been recovered as the emigrants told us about noon before sunset we pushed forward eight miles farther june seventh eighteen forty six four men are missing r sorrel and two emigrants they set out this morning after buffalo and have not yet made their appearance whether killed or lost we cannot tell i find the above in my notebook and well remember the council held on the occasion our fire was the scene of it for the palpable superiority of henry chatillon's experience and skill made him the resort of the whole camp upon every question of difficulty he was moulding bullets at the fire when the captain drew near with the perturbed and careworn expression of countenance faithfully reflected on the heavy features of jack who followed close behind then emigrants came straggling from their wagons toward the common centre various suggestions were made to account for the absence of the four men and one or two of the emigrants declared that when out after the cattle they had seen indians dogging them and crawling like wolves along the ridges of the hills at this the captain slowly shook his head 
with double gravity and solemnly remarked it's a serious thing to be traveling through this cursed wilderness an opinion in which jack immediately expressed a thorough coincidence henry would not commit himself by declaring any positive opinion maybe he only followed the buffalo too far maybe indian kill him maybe he got lost i cannot tell with this the auditors were obliged to rest content the emigrants not in the least alarmed though curious to know what had become of their comrades walked back to their wagons and the captain betook himself pensively to his tent shaw and i followed his example End of chapter 11chapter twelve of young people's treasury volume six famous travels and adventures by hamilton wright maybe this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by betty b in the rocky mountains by john c fremont leaving camp about eleven o'clock on august twenty fifth we travelled a short distance down the river and halted to noon on the bank at a point where the road quits the valley of bear river and crossing a ridge which divides the great basin from the pacific waters reaches fort hall by way of the port neuf river in a distance of probably fifty miles or two and a half days journey for wagons an examination of the great lake which is the outlet of the river and the principal feature of geographical interest in the basin was one of the main objects contemplated in the general plan of our survey and i accordingly determined at this place to leave the road and after having completed a reconnaissance of the lake regain it subsequently at fort hall but our little stock of provisions had again become extremely low we had only dried meat sufficient for one meal and our supply of flour and other comforts was entirely exhausted i therefore immediately dispatched one of the party henry lee with a note to carson at fort hall directing him to load a pack horse with whatever could be obtained there in the way of provisions and endeavor to overtake me on the river in the meantime we had picked up along the road two tolerably well-grown calves which would have become food for wolves and which had probably been left by some of the earlier emigrants none of those we had met having made any claim to them and on these i mainly relied for support during our circuit to the lake in sweeping around the point of the mountain which runs down into the bend the river here passes between perpendicular walls of basalt which always fix the attention from the regular form in which it occurs and its perfect distinctness from the surrounding rocks among which it has been placed the mountain which is rugged and steep and by our measurement fourteen hundred feet above the river directly opposite the place of our halt is called the sheep rock probably because a flock of the common mountain sheep ovis montana has been seen on the craggy point as we were about resuming our march in the afternoon i was attracted by the singular appearance of an isolated hill with a concave summit in the plain about two miles from the river and turned off toward it while the camp proceeded on its way to the southward in search of the lake i found the thin and stony soil of the plain entirely underlaid by the basalt which forms the river walls and when i reached the neighborhood of the hill the surface of the plain was rent into frequent fissures and chasms of the same scoriated volcanic rock from forty to sixty feet deep but which there was not sufficient light to penetrate entirely and which i had not time to descend arrived at the summit of the hill i found that it terminated in a very perfect crater of an oval or nearly circular form three hundred and sixty paces in circumference and sixty feet at the greatest depth the walls which were perfectly vertical and disposed like masonry in a very regular manner were composed of a brown-colored scoriaceous lava evidently the production of a modern volcano and having all the appearance of the lighter scoriaceous lavas of mount etna vesuvius and other volcanoes the faces of the walls were reddened and glazed by the fire in which they had been melted and which had left them contorted and twisted by its violent action our route during the afternoon was a little rough 
being in the direction we had taken over a volcanic plain where our progress was sometimes obstructed by fissures and black beds composed of fragments of the rock on both sides the mountains appeared very broken but tolerably well timbered august twenty sixth crossing a point of ridge which makes into the river we fell upon it again before sunset and encamped on the right bank opposite to the encampment of three lodges of snake indians they visited us during the evening and we obtained from them a small quantity of roots of different kinds in exchange for goods among them was a sweet root of very pleasant flavor having somewhat the taste of preserved quince my endeavors to become acquainted with the plants which furnished to the indians a portion of their support were only gradually successful and after long and persevering attention and even after obtaining i did not succeed in preserving them until they could be satisfactorily determined in this portion of the journey i found this particular root cut up into such small pieces that it was only to be identified by its taste when the bulb was met with imperfect form among the indians lower down on the columbia among whom it is the highly celebrated camas it was long afterward on our return through upper california that i found the plant itself in bloom which i supposed to furnish the camas root camasia esculenta the root diet had a rather mournful effect at the commencement and one of the calves was killed this evening for food the animals fared well on rushes august twenty seventh the morning was cloudy with appearance of rain and the thermometer at sunrise at twenty nine degrees making an unusually early start we crossed the river at a good ford and following for about three hours a trail which led along the bottom we entered a labyrinth of hills below the main ridge and halted to noon in the ravine of a pretty little stream timbered with cottonwood of a large size ash-leafed maple with cherry and other shrubby trees the hazy weather which had prevented any very extended views since entering the green river valley began now to disappear there was a slight rain in the earlier part of the day and at noon when the thermometer had risen to seventy nine point five degrees we had a bright sun with blue sky and scattered cumuli according to the barometer our halt here among the hills was at an elevation of five thousand three hundred twenty feet crossing a dividing ridge in the afternoon we followed down another little bear river tributary to the point where it emerged on an open green flat among the hills timbered with groves and bordered with cane thickets but without water a pretty little rivulet coming out of the hillside and overhung by tall flowering plants of a species i had not hitherto seen furnished us with a good camping place the evening was cloudy the temperature at sunset sixty nine degrees and the elevation five thousand one hundred forty feet among the plants occurring along the line of road during the day epinette de prairie grindelia squarosa was in considerable abundance and is among the very few plants remaining in bloom the whole country having now an autumnal appearance in the crisp and yellow plants and dried up grasses many cranes were seen during the day with a few antelopes very shy and wild august twenty eighth during the night we had a thunderstorm with moderate rain which has made the air this morning very clear the thermometer being at fifty five degrees leaving our encampment at the cane spring and quitting the trail on which we had been traveling and which would probably have afforded us a good road to the lake we crossed some very deep ravines and in about an hour's traveling again reached the river we were now in a valley five or six miles wide between mountain ranges which about thirty miles below appeared to close up and terminate the valley leaving for the river only a very narrow pass or a canyon behind which we imagined that we should find the broad waters of the lake we made the usual halt at the mouth of a small clear stream having a slightly mineral taste perhaps of salt four thousand seven hundred sixty feet above the gulf in the afternoon we climbed a very steep sandy hill and after a slow and winding day's march of twenty-seven miles encamped at a slough on the river 
there were great quantities of geese and ducks of which only a few were shot the indians having probably made them very wild the men employed themselves in fishing but caught nothing a skunk mephitis americana which was killed in the afternoon made a supper for one of the messes the river is bordered occasionally with fields of cane which were regarded as an indication of our approach to a lake country we had frequent showers of rain during the night with thunder august twenty ninth the thermometer at sunrise was fifty four degrees with air from the northwest and dark rainy clouds moving on the horizon rain squalls and bright sunshine by intervals i rode ahead with basil to explore the country and continuing about three miles along the river turned directly off on a trail running toward three marked gaps in the bordering range where the mountains appeared cut through to their bases toward which the river plain rose gradually putting our horses into a gallop on some fresh tracks which showed very plainly in the wet path we came suddenly upon a small party of shoshone indians who had fallen into the trail from the north we could only communicate by signs but they made us understand that the road through the chain was a very excellent one leading into a broad valley which ran to the southward we halted to noon at what may be called the gate of the pass on either side of which were huge mountains of rock between which stole a little pure water stream with a margin just sufficiently large for our passage from the river the plain had gradually risen to an altitude of fifty five hundred feet and by meridian observation the latitude of the entrance was forty two degrees in the interval of our usual halt several of us wandered along up the stream to examine the pass more at leisure within the gate the rocks receded a little back leaving a very narrow but most beautiful valley through which the little stream wound its way hidden by different kinds of trees and shrubs aspen maple willow cherry and elder a fine verdure of smooth short grass spread over the remaining space to the bare sides of the rocky walls these were of a blue limestone which constitutes the mountain here and opening directly on the grassy bottom were several curious caves which appeared to be inhabited by root diggers on one side was gathered a heap of leaves for a bed and they were dry open and pleasant on the roofs of the caves are remarked bituminous exudations from the rock the most remarkable feature of the pass is the standing rock which has fallen from the cliffs above and standing perpendicularly near the middle of the valley presents itself like a watch-tower in the pass it will give you a tolerably correct idea of the character of the scenery in this country where generally the mountains rise abruptly up from comparatively unbroken plains and level valleys but it will entirely fail in representing the picturesque beauty of this delightful place where a green valley full of foliage and a hundred yards wide contrasts with naked crags that spire up into a blue line of pinnacles three thousand feet above sometimes crested with cedar and pine and sometimes ragged and bare the detention we met with in opening the road and perhaps a willingness to linger on the way made the afternoon's travel short and about two miles from the entrance we passed through another gate and encamped on the stream at the junction of a little fork from the southward around which the mountains stooped more gently down forming a small open cove as it was still early in the afternoon basil and myself in one direction and mr pruss in another set out to explore the country and ascended different neighboring peaks in the hope of seeing some indications of the lake but though our elevation afforded magnificent views the eye ranging over a long extent of bear river with the broad and fertile cache valley in the direction of our search was only to be seen a bed of apparently impracticable mountains among these the trail we had been following turned sharply to the northward and it began to be doubtful if it would not lead us away from the object of our destination but i nevertheless determined to keep it in the belief that it would eventually bring us right a squall of rain drove us out of the mountain and it was late when we reached the camp the evening closed in with frequent showers of rain with some lightning and thunder august thirtieth we had constant thunderstorms during the night 
but in the morning the clouds were sinking to the horizon and the air was clear and cold with the thermometer at sunrise at thirty nine degrees elevation by barometer five thousand five hundred eighty feet we were in motion early continuing up the little stream without encountering any ascent where a horse would not easily gallop and crossing a slight dividing ground at the summit descended upon a small stream along which we continued on the same excellent road in riding through the pass numerous cranes were seen and prairie hens or grouse bonus umbellus which lately had been rare were very abundant this little affluent brought us to a larger stream down which we traveled through a more open bottom on a level road where heavily laden wagons could pass without obstacle the hills on the right grew lower and on entering a more open country we discovered a shoshone village and being desirous to obtain information and purchase from them some roots and berries we halted on the river which was lightly wooded with cherry willow maple service berry and aspen the barometer indicated a height of five thousand one hundred seventy feet a number of indians came immediately over to visit us and several men were sent to the village with goods tobacco knives cloth vermilion and the usual trinkets to exchange for provisions several of the indians drew aside their blankets showing me their lean and bony figures and i would not any longer tempt them with a display of our merchandise to part with their wretched subsistence when they gave as a reason that it would expose them to temporary starvation a great portion of the region inhabited by this nation formerly abounded in game the buffalo ranging about in herds as we had found them on the eastern waters and the plains dotted with scattered bands of antelope but so rapidly have they disappeared within a few years that now as we journeyed along an occasional buffalo skull and a few wild antelope were all that remained of the abundance which had covered the country with animal life end of chapter twelve chapter thirteen of young people's treasury volume six famous travels and adventures by hamilton wright maybe this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by betty b polar research by george gerland leaving out of view the commercial enterprises of the ancient inhabitants of the iberian peninsula and the voyages of the primitive celtic people of britain the earliest explorer of the north was a young contemporary of alexander the great pythias of marsilia who braved the perils of that region impelled by purely scientific motives he returned with abundant results but was not understood by the people of his time and more than two thousand years elapsed before men sailed north again in scientific inquiry it is true that many voyages were made to the north during the middle ages the northmen during that period founded colonies in greenland in the farthest north as their countrymen settled in the fair southern regions of apulia and sicily but both sets of settlements failed to be a permanent establishment the voyage of the venetian zeno to the faroe islands in thirteen ninety was without historical significance and the voyage of christopher columbus beyond iceland in fourteen seventy seven is mythical at the close of the middle ages when the deficiency of knowledge of the earth was great avarice and the quest for the goods of the south led men into the northern ice they sought to reach india by the shortest possible routes where they would not meet rivals and enemies this was the object of magellan's circumnavigation the satirum sensio of james lancaster asserted that the way to india was north around america india was the object of the polar navigators cabot in the fifteenth frobisher and davis in the sixteenth and hudson and baffin in the seventeenth centuries to name only a few of the most famous it is astonishing what these daring british and dutch sailors risked suffered and gained in the seventeenth century appeared such men as kepler cassini newton and boyle the shape of the earth was actively discussed improved maps were made and new aims and motives were conceived the development of which has caused the nineteenth century 
to be so sharply distinguished from its predecessors now knowledge of the earth is sought for itself and in this respect the polar research of the present has all at once assumed another aspect under which it is differentiated from that of the past northwestern and northeastern passages have been sought in our days but not in order to reach india when mcclure achieved the former in eighteen fifty two and nordenskold the latter in eighteen seventy nine the value attached to the discoveries was not that they furnished routes but that a correct knowledge of the northern coasts of the two continents and rich stores of other scientific information had been gained by them fruits like those no longer the interests of trade justified the high prizes which the english government offered for the discovery of the passage and the costly expeditions which were dispatched for that purpose the early trade routes became highways for scientific investigation and the nature of the polar regions as a whole was inquired into such objects were pursued by individuals scoresby while hunting for whales made constant studies of the highest scientific value of the hydrography magnetism and meteorology of the arctic regions and so did carl ludwig Gisecki, afterward professor of mineralogy at dublin who traveled through east and west greenland from eighteen o seven to eighteen thirteen solely for the thorough study of the geology of their coasts till eighteen sixty the english and afterward the americans with them were in the front as polar explorers the most important results of their work were the discovery of the magnetic pole in eighteen thirty one by john and james ross the definition of the coast of arctic america and numerous single observations more recently other nations have come forward the danes in greenland and the swedes whose most illustrious representative is nordenskold two german expeditions have been sent to east greenland an Austrian expedition under Weyprecht and Preyer has discovered Franz Joseph Land. The Dutch have explored south of Spitsbergen, the Russians on the northern coast of Siberia, and now with Nansen and Mohn, the Norwegians have advanced to the very front. In 1882-83, at the instance of the German Neumayer and the Austrian Weyprecht, a chain of observation stations was established around the Pole, to be kept up for a year an enterprise in which germany england the united states russia austria france sweden norway and finland took part the year eighteen eighty three was further marked by nordenskold's return from the inland ice of greenland and by nansen's conception of his scheme for traversing greenland on snowshoes which he carried into effect the next year north polar research is therefore almost exclusively the work of the germanic nations for the russian explorers have been chiefly of that stock the romanic nations no less seafaring people have kept away from the north pole but france has done something in south polar exploration the south pole has been comparatively neglected on account of the unfavorable character of its surroundings large masses of land are wanting and the immense wastes of water of the south offer only a few islands possessing neither large mammals nor human inhabitants while the eskimos of the north are of incalculable advantage to exploration magellan's southern voyage was not followed up for two hundred and fifty years the first after him to reach high southern latitudes was james cook in seventeen seventy four and no other similar expeditions followed for fifty years more those best known were those of the french under dumont d'urville in eighteen thirty nine of the americans under wilkes and of the english under james ross who in eighteen forty two penetrated to the seventy eighth degree the highest southern latitude yet attained after a year's maintenance of a german station on the south georgian islands and of a french station at the southern point of america both of which belonged to the international system of eighteen eighty three and after a few dashes southward in later years a number of nations germany austria england the united states and others are again preparing to cooperate in another polar siege at the austral end of the world 
for the benefit of science nowhere are more questions to be found for which to seek answers than in the polar regions here the magneto-electric light of the earth manifests itself in the wonderful phenomenon of the northern lights all the wind currents of the earth press toward the pole and the sea currents too curious dispositions of nature are found here with great volcanoes the outer cones of which are constituted of strata of ice covered with lava and under the masses of ice we discover remains of plants that demonstrate the presence not so very long ago of a flourishing tropical or subtropical vegetation instead of the present ice we meet mountains of ice everywhere and everywhere the arctic region is sublime there is thus much to observe and much to learn in these regions for the satisfaction of our irresistible longings first we are able to study in the polar regions the division of land and sea the size elevation and topography of the land the whole question in short of polar geography the form of the earth's surface is not casual but is the result of interactions of the crust and the interior of the globe the discovery by nansen's expedition of the profundity of the polar sea tallies with professor mohn's observations of the great depths between greenland and spitzbergen and with those of the fjords and interinsular channels of the north atlantic further the sea bottoms are penetrated by volcanoes some of them still active here single as in jan mayen island there in groups as in franz joseph land and fire island a marked difference exists in this respect between the atlantic half of the polar regions north of europe and eastern north america where disturbance and divisions of the land are the rule and the pacific side north of siberia and western america where quiet prevails with regular coast forms and few islands the lands on the atlantic side have moreover been gradually rising for an incalculable length of time and are still rising while those on the opposite side have until very recently been subsiding these facts selected as examples from a great number of phenomena may serve to illustrate how important is a knowledge of the polar regions to that of the earth as a whole its importance is in fact quite beyond comprehension so the magnetism of the earth the colored beams of the northern lights the flickering of their draperies and bands are of interest far beyond their relations to the earth alone for the movement of the magnetic elements reflects the processes of the sun's atmosphere and may be connected with the immense periods of the revolution of our solar system a relation between the northern lights and the weather has been established by repeated observations and that brings us to another group of phenomena those of meteorology which are of interest to the whole earth and are especially remarkable in the polar regions an interchange of great wind currents between the equator and the poles is constantly going on upon which the movements of the atmosphere and the pressure in the intermediate regions are ultimately dependent and the study of the atmospheric phenomena of the polar regions is indispensable to our proper knowledge of them the excess of heat at the equator forces masses of air into the highest regions of the atmosphere the congestion at the pole the necessary consequence of accumulation there forces them back to the earth on their way through the higher regions these masses are attenuated and cooled so that even when condensed at their sinking they cannot overcome the polar cold and as they bring little moisture and consequently little cloudiness the radiation of heat goes on continuously during the long polar night the more so because snow and ice are extremely good radiators hence the extreme cold which nansen found in greenland and which makes that interior a second pole of cold along with that in the interior of siberia is fully explained yet the winds contribute to the warming of the polar sea they drive the waters from warmer regions in wide superficial currents into the higher latitudes where being heavier in consequence of their greater content of salt than the fresher water resulting from the melting of the glaciers and the ice and from the outpour of the great siberian rivers they sink beneath them to the bottom 
and keep the temperature of the sea constantly above the freezing point the colder lighter water has to give way to these undersea currents and flows into the atlantic ocean cooling the american coasts at the south pole currents flow in from all the seas and superficial waters spread into all the oceans how shall we account for the masses of polar ice for the immense icebergs and the glaciation of greenland the snowfall of the polar regions is light the air is nowhere drier than over the cold glacier ice as is proved every day in switzerland by the quickness with which clothes dry when hung over it at the same time the ice is covered with extremely fine hardly visible snow crystals if we boil water in a retort which is connected with another vessel containing a piece of ice all the steam will pass over on to the ice and deposit itself as ice upon it the same takes place in a larger degree on the earth where the retort is the warm evaporating water of the tropical regions the connecting pipe is the upper atmosphere and the thickening ice is at the pole thus without any rain or snow falling all the moisture and all the vapor is withdrawn from the atmosphere by this ice and deposited upon it in fine crystals and as the influx of air is constant and all-pervading a never-ceasing supply of frost is going on all the time in consequence of the larger quantity of moisture the process is still more marked and regular at the south pole the explanation of the glaciation of the northern part of our temperate zone during the ice age still unfound is a matter of great importance for the present topography of the land was brought out and the organic life of the whole earth was modified by it and it is the general opinion that the solution of the problem is to be found if it is found by the study of the polar regions in the period immediately preceding the ice age the polar regions were not covered with ice but had a rich growth of plants reaching up even to the glaciers of their mountains and plants were represented in them which are now known only in warmer climates this was a very noteworthy time in the history of the earth organic life in the continents at least was in its greatest extension and i believe specificism and diversity the forests also were more luxuriant than now and this was the time when man originated upon this came the ice age during which man was scattered over the whole world and organic beings were divided according to their capacity to resist the cold into the three great classes of arctic temperate and tropical life a division which probably existed too during the earlier period but then only locally as on mountain ranges the study of the organic life of the poles is therefore of the greatest importance for the understanding of the history of the organic life of our planet and the more so because the arctic region has always been an important station for the distribution of organisms the plants and animals of the south polar lands on the contrary and of the pointed southern continental terminations have never shown any permanent community with one another this peculiar feature of the southern continents appeared very early knowledge concerning the origin and spread of peoples may likewise receive valuable contributions from polar research that is shown by the eskimos and their wonderful adaptation to that nature which is so destructive to civilized peoples in this we have a clear demonstration of the maxim which is one of the most important if not the most important law of all organic and human life that what is to be permanent can be brought about only by gradual extremely slow formation never by sudden immediate transition or by sharp violent breach End of chapter 13chapter fourteen of young people's treasury volume six famous travels and adventures by hamilton wright maybe this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by betty b an ancient mexican palace by desiree charnay we cleared away rubbish until we reached the floor following the walls corners and openings of the various apartments as we had done at tula and when three days later the engineer joined us 
ten rooms forming part of the house had been unearthed he was so surprised at our success that stopping short he exclaimed why it is our tula palace over again and so it was inner court apartments on different levels everything as we had found before save that here the rooms were much larger and most supported by pillars one of these chambers measured forty-nine feet on one side that is seven hundred and thirty-two feet in circumference the walls nearly six feet seven inches thick are built of stone and mortar encrusted with deep cement sloping up about three feet and terminating perpendicularly the centre of the room is occupied by six pillars on which rose stone brick or wood columns bearing the roof this is undoubtedly a palace and these are the reception rooms the sleeping apartments were behind unfortunately they lie under cultivated ground covered with indian corn so we are not permitted to disturb them in the large room we observe small stone rings fixed to the wall and on each side of the entrance also fixed to the wall two small painted slabs what had been their use to support lights at night but how was that possible for even now the only lights the natives use are okotes pieces of resinous wood whilst the slabs bear no traces of smoke i had it is true met in the course of my excavations with terracotta objects which might have been taken for candlesticks but to which i had attached no importance when i suddenly remembered a passage in sahagan bearing on the subject the chandler who knows how to do his work first bleaches cleans and melts the wax and when in a liquid state he pours it on a wick and rolls it between two slabs he sometimes puts a layer of black wax within a white layer etc my first supposition had been right here also the floors and walls are coated with mortar stucco or cement save that in the dwellings of the rich necessarily few they are ornamented with figures as principal subject with a border like an aubusson carpet the colors are not at all effaced red black blue yellow and white are still discernible a few examples of these frescoes are to be seen in the trocadero i am convinced that numerous treasures might be brought to light were regular excavations to be made but the mexican government which would have most interest in such a work does not seem to care to undertake it leaving my men under the direction of colonel castro i returned to the path of death composed of a great number of small mounds lotulus the tombs of great men they are arranged symmetrically in avenues terminating at the sides of the great pyramids on a plain of some six hundred and twenty feet to nine hundred and seventy five feet in length fronting them are cemented steps which must have been used as seats by the spectators during funeral ceremonies or public festivities on the left amidst a mass of ruins are broken pillars said to have belonged to a temple the huge capitals have some traces of sculpture next comes a quadrangular block of which a cast is to be found in the main gallery of the trocadero in the course of my excavations i had found now and again numerous pieces of worked obsidian precious stones beads etc within the circuit of ants nests which these busy insects had extracted from the ground in digging their galleries and now on the summit of the lesser pyramid i again came upon my friends and among the things i picked out of their nests was a perfect earring of obsidian very small and as thin as a sheet of paper it is not so curious as it seems at first for we are disturbing a ground formed by fifty generations glass does not seem to have been known to the indians for although tezcatlipoca was often figured with a pair of spectacles they may only have been figurative ones like those of the manuscripts terracotta or basi relievi for there is nothing to show that they had any idea of optics i now went back to my men when to my great delight i found they had unearthed two large slabs showing the entrance of two sepulchres they were the first i had yet found and considering them very important i immediately telegraphed to messrs chavero and berra 
both of whom are particularly interested in american archaeology i expected to see them come by the very next train to view not only the tombstones but also the palace which attracted a great many visitors but to my surprise one sent word that he had a headache while the other pleaded a less poetic ailment one of the slabs closed a vault and the other a cave with perpendicular walls we went down the former by a flight of steps in fairly good condition yet it was a long and rather dangerous affair for we were first obliged to demolish a wall facing us in which we found a skull before we could get to the room which contained the tombs the vases within them are exactly like those we found in the plaza except that one is filled with a fatty substance like burnt flesh mixed with some kind of stuff the woof of which is still discernible besides beads of serpentine bones of dogs and squirrels knives of obsidian twisted by the action of fire we know from sahagan that the dead were buried with their clothes and their dogs to guide and defend them in their long journey when the dead were ushered into the presence of the king of the nether world might lend to Koltai, they offered him papers bundles of sticks pine wood and perfumed reeds together with loosely twisted threads of white and red cotton a manta a maxli tunics and shirts when a woman died her whole wardrobe was carefully put aside and a portion burnt eighty days after this operation was repeated on that day twelve months for four years when everything that had belonged to the deceased was finally consumed the dead then came out of the first circle to go successively through nine others encompassed by a large river on its banks were a number of dogs which helped their owners to cross the river whenever a ghost neared the bank his dog immediately jumped into the river and swam by his side or carried him to the opposite bank it was on this account that indians had always several dogs about them the speech which was addressed to the dead when laid out previous to being buried is so remarkable as to make one suspect that the author unconsciously added something of his own son your earthly hardships and sufferings are over we are but mortal and it has pleased the lord to call you to himself we had the privilege of being intimately acquainted with you but now you share the abode of the gods whither we shall all follow for such is the destiny of man the place is large enough to receive every one, but although all are bound for the gloomy bourne, none ever return. Then followed the speech addressed to the nearest kinsman of the dead. O son, cheer up, eat, drink, and let not your mind be cast down. Against the divine fiat who can contend, this is not of man's doing, it is the Lord's. Take comfort to bear up against the evils of daily life for who is able to add a day an hour to his existence cheer up therefore as becomes a man but to return to our tombstones they are both alike being about five feet high three feet five inches broad and six and a half inches thick the upper side is smooth the lower has some carving in the shape of a cross four big tears or drops of water and a pointed tongue in the centre which starting from the bottom of the slab runs up in a line parallel to the drops knowing how general was the worship of talak among the indians i conjecture this has been a monument to the god of rain to render him propitious to the dead a view shared and enlarged upon by dr hammy in a paper read before the academie des sciences in november eighteen eighty two and that i should be in accord with the eminent specialist on american antiquities is a circumstance to make me proud i may add that the carving of this slab is similar to that of the cross on the famous basso relievo at palenque so that the probability of the two monuments having been erected to the god of rain is much strengthened thereby as our slabs are far more archaic than those at palenque we think we are justified in calling them earlier in time the parent samples of the later ones nor is our assumption unsupported for we shall subsequently find that the cult of talak and quetzalcoatl was carried by the toltecs in their distant peregrinations these slabs therefore and the pillars which were found in the village acquire a paramount importance 
in establishing the affiliation of Toltec settlements in Tabasco, Yucatan, and other places, furnishing us with further data in regard to certain monuments at Palenque, the steles of Tikal, and the massive monolith idols of Copain. I next attacked the terrace court fronting the palace toward the path of death and the amount of constructions and substructures we came upon is almost beyond belief inclined stuccoed walls crossing each other in all directions flights of steps leading to terraces within the pyramid ornaments pottery and detritus so much so that the pyramid might not improperly be called a necropolis in which the living had their dwellings in a word our campaign at teotihuacan was as successful as our campaign at tula we were attended by the same good fortune and the reader whom such things may interest will find a bas-relief of both toltec palaces and of one of the tombstones in the trocadero from what has been said it will be seen that the monuments at teotihuacan were partly standing at the time of the conquest end of chapter fourteen Chapter 15 of Young People's Treasury, Volume 6, Famous Travels and Adventures by Hamilton Wright Maybe. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Betty B. The Ascent of Mount Tyndall by Clarence King. Climbing became exceedingly difficult. Light air, for we had already reached 12,500 feet, beginning to tell on our lungs to such an extent that my friend, who had taken turns with me in carrying my pack, was unable to do so any longer, and I adjusted it to my own shoulders for the rest of the day. After four hours of slow, laborious work, we made the base of the debris slope, which rose about a thousand feet to a saddle pass in the western mountain wall, that range upon which Mount Brewer, named after our comrade, is so prominent a point. We were nearly an hour in toiling up this slope over an uncertain footing, which gave way at almost every step. At last, when almost at the top, we paused to take breath, and then all walked out upon the crest, laid off our packs, and sat down together upon the summit of the ridge, and for a few moments not a word was spoken. The Sierras are here two parallel summit ranges. We were upon the crest of the western range, and looked down into a gulf five thousand feet deep, sinking from our feet in abrupt cliffs nearly or quite two thousand feet, whose base plunged into a broad field of snow lying steep and smooth for a great distance, but broken near its foot by craggy steps often a thousand feet high. Vague blue haze obscured the lost depths, hiding details, giving a bottomless distance out of which, like the breath of wind, floated up a faint treble, vibrating upon the senses, yet never clearly heard. Rising on the other side, cliff above cliff, precipice piled upon precipice, rock over rock, up against sky, towered the most gigantic mountain wall in America, culminating in a noble pile of gothic finished granite and enamel-like snow. How grand and inviting looked its white form, its untrodden, unknown crest so high and pure in the clear strong blue i looked at it as one contemplating the purpose of his life and for just one moment i would have rather liked to dodge that purpose or to have waited or to have found some excellent reason why i might not go but all this quickly vanished leaving a cheerful resolve to go ahead from the two opposing mountain walls singular thin knife-blade ridges of stone jutted out dividing the sides of the gulf into a series of amphitheaters each one a labyrinth of ice and rock piercing thick beds of snow sprang up knobs and straight isolated spires of rock mere obelisks curiously carved by frost their rigid slender forms casting a blue sharp shadow upon the snow embosomed in depressions of ice or resting on broken ledges were azure lakes deeper in tone than the sky which at this altitude even at midday has a violet duskiness to the south 
not more than eight miles, a wall of peaks stood across the gulf, dividing the kings, which flowed north at our feet from the Kern River that flowed down the trough in the opposite direction. I did not wonder that Brewer and Hoffman pronounced our undertaking impossible, but when I looked at Cotter, there was such complete bravery in his eye that I asked him if he were ready to start. His old answer, why not? Left the initiative with me, so I told Professor Brewer that we would bid him goodbye. Our friends helped us on with our packs in silence, and as we shook hands, there was not a dry eye in the party. Before he let go of my hand, Professor Brewer asked me for my plan, and I had to own that I had but one, which was to reach the highest peak in the range. After looking in every direction, I was obliged to confess that I saw as yet no practicable way. We bade them a good-bye, receiving their God bless you in return, and started southward along the range to look for some possible cliff to descend. Brewer, Gardner, and Hoffman turned north to push upward to the summit of Mount Brewer and complete their observations. We saw them whenever we halted, until at last, on the very summit, their microscopic forms were for the last time visible. With very great difficulty, we climbed a peak which surmounted our wall just to the south of the pass, and, looking over the eastern brink, found that the precipice was still sheer and unbroken. In one place, where the snow lay against it to the very top, we went to its edge and contemplated the slide, about three thousand feet of unbroken white, at a fearfully steep angle, lay below us. We threw a stone over it and watched it bound until it was lost in the distance. After fearful leaps, we could only detect it by the flashings of snow where it struck, and as these were in some instances three hundred feet apart, we decided not to launch our own valuable bodies and the still more precious barometer after it. There seemed but one possible way to reach our goal. That was to make our way along the summit of the cross ridge, which projected between the two ranges. This divide sprang out from our Mount Brewer wall, about four miles to the south of us. To reach it, we must climb up and down over the indented edge of the Mount Brewer wall. In attempting to do this, we had a rather lively time scaling a sharp granite needle, where we found our course completely stopped by precipices four and five hundred feet in height. Ahead of us, the summit continued to be broken into fantastic pinnacles, leaving us no hope of making our way along it. So we sought the most broken part of the eastern descent and began to climb down. The heavy knapsacks, beside wearing our shoulders gradually into a black and blue state, overbalanced us terribly and kept us in constant danger of pitching headlong. At last, taking them off, Cotter climbed down until he found a resting place upon a cleft of rock. Then I lowered them to him with our lasso, afterward descending cautiously to his side, taking my turn in pioneering downward, receiving the freight of knapsacks as before. In this manner we consumed more than half the afternoon in descending a thousand feet of broken, precipitous slope, and it was almost sunset when we found ourselves upon fields of level snow, which lay white and thick over the whole interior slope of the amphitheater. The gorge below us seemed utterly impassable. At our backs, the Mount Brewer wall either rose in sheer cliffs or in broken, rugged stairway, such as had offered us our descent. From this cruel dilemma, the cross divide furnished the only hope and the sole chance of scaling that was at its junction with the Mount Brewer wall. Toward this point we directed our course, and regions of debris, reaching about sunset the last alcove of the amphitheater, just at the foot of the Mount Brewer wall. It was evidently impossible for us to attempt to climb it that evening, and we looked about the desolate recesses for a sheltered camping spot. A high granite wall surrounded us upon three sides, recurving to the southward in long elliptical curves, no part of the summit being less than 2,000 feet above us, the higher crags not infrequently reaching 3,000 feet. 
A single field of snow swept around the base of the rock and covered the whole amphitheater, except where a few spikes and rounded masses of granite rose through it, and where two frozen lakes with their blue ice disks broke the monotonous surface. Through the white snow gate of our amphitheater, as through a frame, we looked eastward upon the summit group. Not a tree, not a vestige of vegetation in sight. Sky, snow, and granite, the only elements in this wild picture. After searching for a shelter, we at last found a granite crevice near the margin of one of the frozen lakes, a sort of shelf just large enough for Cotter and me, where we hastened to make our bed, having first filled the canteen from a small stream that trickled over the ice, knowing that in a few moments the rapid chill would freeze it. We ate our supper of cold venison and bread and whittled from the sides of the wooden barometer case shaving enough to warm water for a cup of miserably tepid tea, and then, packing our provisions and instruments away at the head of the shelf, rolled ourselves in our blankets and lay down to enjoy the view. After such fatiguing exercises, the mind has an almost abnormal clearness. Whether this is wholly from within or due to the intensely vitalizing mountain air, I am not sure. Probably both contribute to the state of exultation in which all alpine climbers find themselves. The solid granite gave me a luxurious repose, and I lay on the edge of our little rock niche and watched the strange yet brilliant scene. All the snow of our recess lay in the shadow of the high granite wall to the west, but the Kern Divide, which curved around us from the southeast, was in full light, its broken skyline battlemented and adorned with innumerable rough-hewn spires and pinnacles, was a mass of glowing orange, intensely defined against the deep violet sky. At the open end of our horseshoe amphitheater, to the east, its floor of snow rounded over in a smooth brink, overhanging precipices which sank 2,000 feet into the King's Canyon. Across the gulf rose the whole procession of summit peaks, their lower half rooted in a deep, somber shadow cast by the western wall. The heights bathed in a warm purple haze in which the irregular marbling of snow burned with a pure crimson light. A few fleecy clouds, dyed fiery orange, drifted slowly eastward across the narrow zone of sky which stretched from summit to summit like a roof. At times the sound of waterfalls, faint and mingled with echoes, floated up through the still air. The snow nearby lay in cold, ghastly shade, warmed here and there in strange flashes by light reflected downward from drifting clouds. The somber waste about us, the deep violet vault overhead, those far summits, glowing with reflected rose, the deep, impenetrable gloom which filled the gorge, and slowly and with vapor-like stealth climbed the mountain wall extinguishing the red light, combined to produce an effect which may not be described. Nor can I more than hint at the contrast between the brilliancy of the scene under full light and the cold, death-like repose which followed when the wan cliffs and pallid snow were all overshadowed with ghostly gray. A sudden chill enveloped us. Stars in a moment crowded through the dark heaven, flashing with a frosty splendor. The snow congealed, the brooks ceased to flow, and, under the powerful, sudden leverage of frost, immense blocks were dislodged all along the mountain summits and came thundering down the slopes, booming upon the ice, dashing wildly upon rocks. Under the lee of our shelf we felt quite safe, but neither Cotter nor I could help being startled, and jumping just a little, as these missiles, weighing often many tons, struck the ledge over our heads and whizzed down the gorge, their stroke resounding fainter and fainter until at last only a confused echo reached us. The thermometer at nine o'clock marked twenty degrees above zero. We set the minimum and rolled ourselves together for the night. The longer I lay, the less I liked that shelf of granite. It grew hard in time and cold also, my bones seeming to approach actual contact with the chilled rock. 
Moreover, I found that even so vigorous a circulation as mine was not enough to warm up the ledge to anything like a comfortable temperature. A single thickness of blanket is a better mattress than none, but the larger crystals of orthoclase protruding plentifully punched my back and caused me to revolve on a horizontal axis with precision and accuracy. How I love Cotter! How I hugged him and got warm while our backs gradually petrified till we whirled over and thawed them out together. The slant of that bed was diagonal and excessive, down it we slid till the ice chilled us awake, and we crawled back and chalked ourselves up with bits of granite inserted under my ribs and shoulders. In this pleasant position we got dozing again, and there stole over me a most comfortable ease. The granite softened perceptibly. I was delightfully warm and sank into an industrious slumber, which lasted with great soundness until four, when we arose and ate our breakfast of frozen venison. The thermometer stood at two above zero. Everything was frozen tight except the canteen, which we had prudently kept between us all night. Stars still blazed brightly, and the moon, hidden from us by western cliffs, shone in pale reflection upon the rocky heights to the east, which rose dimly white up from the impenetrable shadows of the canyon. Silence, cold, ghastly dimness, in which loomed huge forms the biting frostiness of the air wrought upon our feelings as we shouldered our packs and started with slow pace to climb up the divide soon to our dismay we found the straps had so chafed our shoulders that the weight gave us great pain and obliged us to pad them with our handkerchiefs and extra socks which remedy did not wholly relieve us from the constant wearing pain of the heavy load Directing our steps southward toward a niche in the wall, which bounded us only half a mile distant, we traveled over a continuous snowfield, frozen so densely as scarcely to yield at all to our tread, at the same time compressing enough to make that crisp, frosty sound which we all used to enjoy, even before we knew from the books that it had something to do with the severe name of regulation. As we advanced, the snow sloped more and more steeply up toward the crags, till by and by it became quite dangerous, causing us to cut steps with Cotter's large buoy knife, a slow, tedious operation requiring patience of a pretty permanent kind. In this way we spent a quiet social hour or so. The sun had not yet reached us, being shut out by the high amphitheater wall but its cheerful light reflected downward from a number of higher crags, filling the recess with the brightness of day and putting out of existence those shadows which so somberly darkened the earlier hours. To look back when we stopped to rest was to realize our danger, that smooth, swift slope of ice carrying the eye down a thousand feet to the margin of a frozen mirror of ice, ribs and needles of rocks piercing up through the snow, so closely grouped that, had we fallen, a miracle only might have saved us from being dashed. This led to rather deeper steps, and greater care that our burdens should be held more nearly over the center of gravity, and a pleasant relief when we got to the top of the snow and sat down on a block of granite to breathe and look up in search of a way up the thousand-foot cliff of broken surface, among the lines of fracture and the galleries winding along the face. It would have disheartened us to gaze up the hard, sheer front of precipices and search among splintered projections, crevices, shelves, and snow patches for an inviting route, had we not been animated by a faith that the mountains could not defy us. Choosing what looked like the least impossible way, we started, but, finding it unsafe to work with packs on, resumed the yesterday's plan. Cotter taking the lead, climbing about fifty feet ahead, and hoisting up the knapsacks and barometer as I tied them to the end of the lasso. Constantly closing up in hopeless difficulty before us, the way opened again and again to our gymnastics, till we stood together on a mere shelf, not more than two feet wide, which led diagonally up the smooth cliff. Edging along in careful steps, our backs flattened upon the granite, 
we moved slowly to a broad platform where we stopped for breath. There was no foothold above us. Looking down over the course we had come, it seemed, and I really believe it was, an impossible descent, for one can climb upward with safety where he cannot downward. To turn back was to give up in defeat, and we sat at least half an hour suggesting all possible routes to the summit, accepting none, and feeling disheartened. About thirty feet directly over our heads was another shelf, which, if we could reach, seemed to offer at least a temporary way upward. On its edge were two or three spikes of granite. Whether firmly connected with the cliff or merely blocks of debris, we could not tell from below. I said to Cotter, I thought of but one possible plan. It was to lasso one of these blocks and to climb, sailor fashion, hand over hand, up the rope. In the lasso I had perfect confidence, for I had seen more than one Spanish bull throw his whole weight against it without parting a strand. The shelf was so narrow that throwing the coil of rope was a very difficult undertaking. I tried three times, and Cotter spent five minutes vainly whirling the loop up at the granite spikes. At last I made a lucky throw, and it tightened upon one of the smaller protuberances. I drew the noose close and very gradually threw my hundred and fifty pounds upon the rope. Then Cotter joined me, and for a moment we both hung our united weight upon it. Whether the rock moved slightly or whether the lasso stretched a little, we were unable to decide, but the trial must be made, and I began to climb slowly. The smooth precipice face against which my body swung offered no foothold, and the whole climb had therefore to be done by the arms, an effort requiring all one's determination. When about halfway up, I was obliged to rest, and, curling my feet in the rope, managed to relieve my arms for a moment. In this position, I could not resist the fascinating temptation of a survey downward. Straight down, nearly a thousand feet below, at the foot of the rocks, began the snow, whose steep, roof-like slope exaggerated into an almost vertical angle, curved down in a long white field, broken far away by rocks and polished round lakes of ice. Cotter looked up cheerfully and asked how I was making it, to which I answered that I had plenty of wind left. At that moment, when hanging between heaven and earth, it was a deep satisfaction to look down at the wide gulf of desolation beneath and up to unknown dangers ahead and feel my nerves cool and unshaken. A few pulls hand over hand brought me to the edge of the shelf when, throwing my arm around the granite spike, I swung my body upon the shelf and lay down to rest, shouting to Cotter that I was all right and that the prospects upward were capital. After a few moments breathing, I looked over the brink and directed my comrade to tie the barometer to the lower end of the lasso, which he did, and that precious instrument was hoisted to my station and the lasso sent down twice for knapsacks, after which Cotter came up the rope in his very muscular way without once stopping to rest. We took our loads in our hands, swinging the barometer over my shoulder, and climbed up a shelf, which led in a zigzag direction upward and to the south, bringing us out at last upon the thin blade of a ridge which connected a short distance above the summit. It was formed of huge blocks, shattered and ready at a touch to fall. So narrow and sharp was the upper slope that we dared not walk, but got astride and worked slowly along with our hands, pushing the knapsacks in advance, now and then holding our breath when loose masses rocked under our weight. Once upon the summit, a grand view burst upon us. Hastening to step upon the crest of the divide, which was never more than ten feet wide, frequently sharpened to a mere blade, we looked down upon the other side and were astonished to find we had ascended the gentler slope, and that the rocks fell from our feet in almost vertical precipices, and for a thousand feet or more. A glance along the summit toward the highest group showed us that any advance in that direction was impossible, for the thin ridge was gashed down in notches three or four hundred feet deep, forming a procession of pillars, obelisks, and blocks piled upon each other, and looking terribly insecure. 
We then deposited our knapsacks in a safe place, and finding that it was already noon, determined to rest a little while and take a lunch at over 13,000 feet above the sea. West of us stretched the Mount Brewer Wall, with its succession of smooth precipices and amphitheater ridges. To the north, the great gorge of the King's River yawned down 5,000 feet. To the south, the Valley of the Kern, opening in the opposite direction, was broader, less deep, but more filled with broken masses of granite. Clustered about the foot of the divide were a dozen alpine lakes, the higher ones blue sheets of ice, the lowest completely melted. Still lower in the depths of the two canyons, we could see groups of forest trees, but they were so dim and so distant as never to relieve the prevalent masses of rock and snow. Our divide cast its shadow for a mile down King's Canyon in dark blue profile upon the broad sheets of sunny snow, from whose brightness the hard splintered cliffs caught reflections and wore an aspect of joy. Thousands of rills poured from the melting snow, filling the air with a musical tinkle as of many accordant bells. The Kern Valley opened below us with its smooth oval outline, the work of extinct glaciers, whose form and extent were evident from worn cliff surface and rounded wall. Snowfields, relics of the former Nev, glacier snow, hung in white tapestries around its ancient birthplace, and, as far as we could see, the broad, corrugated valley, for a breadth of fully ten miles, shone with burnishings wherever its granite surface was not covered with lakelets or thickets of alpine vegetation. Through a deep cut in the Mount Brewer wall, we gained our first view to the westward, and saw in the distance the wall of the South King's Canyon, and the granite point which Cotter and I had climbed a fortnight before. But for the haze we might have seen the plain, for above its farther limit were several points of the coast ranges, isolated like islands in the sea. The view was so grand, the mountain colors so brilliant, immense snowfields and blue alpine lakes so charming that we almost forgot we were ever to move, and it was only after a swift hour of this delight that we began to consider our future course. The King's Canyon, which headed against our wall, seemed untraversable. No human being could climb along that divide. We had then but one hope of reaching the peak, and our greatest difficulty lay at the start. If we could climb down to the Kern side of the divide and succeed in reaching the base of the precipices which fell from our feet, it really looked as if we might travel without difficulty among the rocks to the other side of the Kern Valley and make our attempt upon the southward flank of the great peak. One look at the sublime white giant decided us. We looked down over the precipice and at first could see no method of descent. Then we went back and looked at the road we had come up to see if that were not possibly as bad. But the broken surface of the rocks was evidently much better climbing ground than anything ahead of us. Cotter, with danger, edged his way along the wall to the east and I to the west to see if there might not be some favorable point. But we both returned with the belief that the precipice in front of us was as passable as any of it. Down it we must. After lying on our faces, looking over the brink ten or twenty minutes, I suggested that by lowering ourselves on the rope, we might climb from crevice to crevice, but we saw no shelf large enough for ourselves and the knapsacks too. However, we were not going to give it up without a trial, and I made the rope fast around my breast and, looping the noose over a firm point of rock, let myself slide gradually down to a notch, forty feet below. There was only room beside me for Cotter, so I had him send down the knapsacks first. I then tied these together by the straps with my silk handkerchiefs and hung them as far to the left as I could reach without losing my balance, looping the handkerchiefs over a point of rock. Cotter then slid down the rope, and with considerable difficulty we whipped the noose off its resting place above and cut off our connection with the upper world. We're in it for now, King, remarked my comrade, as he looked aloft and then down. But our blood was up, 
and danger added only an exhilarating thrill to the nerves the shelf was hardly more than two feet wide and the granite was so smooth that we could find no place to fasten the lasso for the next descent so i determined to try the climb with only as little aid as possible tying it round my breast again i gave the other end into cotter's hands and he bracing his back against the cliff found for himself as firm a foothold as he could and promised to give me all the help in his power i made up my mind to bear no weight unless it was absolutely necessary and for the first ten feet i found cracks and protuberances enough to support me making every square inch of surface do friction duty and hugging myself against the rocks as tightly as i could when within about eight feet of the next shelf i twisted myself round upon the face hanging by two rough blocks of protruding feldspar and looked vainly for some further handhold but the rock besides being perfectly smooth overhung slightly and my legs dangled in the air i saw that the next cleft was over three feet broad and i thought possibly i might by a quick slide reach it in safety without endangering cotter i shouted to him to be very careful and let go in case i fell loosened my hold upon the rope and slid quickly down my shoulders struck against the rock and threw me out of balance for an instant i reeled over upon the verge in danger of falling but in the excitement i thrust out my hand and seized a small alpine gooseberry bush the first piece of vegetation we had seen its roots were so firmly fixed in the crevice that it held my weight and saved me i could no longer see cotter but i talked to him and heard the two knapsacks come bumping along until they slid over the eaves above me and swung down to my station when i seized the lasso's end and braced myself as well as possible intending if he slipped to haul in slack and help him as best i might as he came slowly down from crack to crack i heard his hobnailed shoes grating on the granite presently they appeared dangling from the eaves above my head i had gathered in the rope until it was taut and then hurriedly told him to drop he hesitated a moment and let go before he struck the rock i had him by the shoulder and whirled him down upon his side thus preventing his rolling overboard which friendly action he took quite coolly the third descent was not a difficult one nor the fourth but when we had climbed down about two hundred and fifty feet the rocks were so glacially polished and water-worn that it seemed impossible to get any farther to our right was a crack penetrating the rock perhaps a foot deep widening at the surface to three or four inches which proved to be the only possible ladder as the chances seemed rather desperate we concluded to tie ourselves together in order to share a common fate and with a slack of thirty feet between us and our knapsacks upon our backs we climbed into the crevice and began descending with our faces to the cliff this had to be done with unusual caution for the foothold was about as good as none and our fingers slipped annoyingly on the smooth stone besides the knapsacks and instruments kept a steady backward pull tending to overbalance us but we took pains to descend one at a time and rest whenever the niches gave our feet a safe support in this way we got down about eighty feet of smooth nearly vertical wall reaching the top of a rude granite stairway which led to the snow and here we sat down to rest and found to our astonishment that we had been three hours from the summit after breathing a half minute we continued down jumping from rock to rock and having by practice become very expert in balancing ourselves sprang on never resting long enough to lose equilibrium and in this manner made a quick descent over rugged debris to the crest of a snow field which for seven or eight hundred feet more swept down in a smooth even slope a very high angle to the borders of a frozen lake without untying the lasso which bound us together we sprang upon the snow with a shout and slid down splendidly turning now and then a somersault and shooting out like cannonballs almost to the middle of the frozen lake i upon my back and cotter feet first in a swimming position the ice cracked in all directions 
it was only a thin transparent film through which we could see deep into the lake untying ourselves we hurried ashore in different directions lest our combined weight should be too great a strain upon any point with curiosity and wonder we scanned every shelf and niche of the last descent it seemed quite impossible that we could have come down there and now it actually was way beyond human power to get back again but what cared we sufficient unto the day we were bound for that still distant though gradually nearing summit and we had come from a cold shadowed cliff into deliciously warm sunshine and were jolly shouting singing songs and calling out the companionship of a hundred echoes six miles away with no grave danger no great difficulty beaten us lay the base of our grand mountain upon its skirts we saw a little grove of pines an ideal bivouac and toward this we bent our course after the continued climbing of the day walking was a delicious rest and forward we pressed with considerable speed our hobnails giving us firm footing on the glittering glacial surface every fluting of the great valley was in itself a considerable canyon into which we descended climbing down the scored rocks and swinging from block to block until we reached the level of the pines here sheltered among loose rocks began to appear little fields of alpine grass pale yet sunny soft under our feet fragrantly jeweled with flowers of fairy delicacy holding up amidst thickly clustered blades chalices of turquoise and amethyst white stars and fiery little globes of red lakelets small but innumerable were held in glacial basins the scorings and grooves of the old diamond's track ornamenting their smooth bottoms one of these a sheet of pure beryl hue gave us as much pleasure from its lovely transparency and because we lay down in the necklace of grass about it and smelled flowers while tired muscles relaxed upon warm beds of verdure and the pain in our burdened shoulders went away leaving us delightfully comfortable after the stern grandeur of granite and ice and with the peaks and walls still in view it was relief to find ourselves again in the region of life i never felt for trees and flowers such a sense of intimate relationship and sympathy when we had no longer excuse for resting i invented the palpable subterfuge of measuring the altitude of the spot since the few clumps of low wide-bowed pines nearby were the highest living trees so we lay longer with less and less will to rise and when resolution called us to our feet the getting up was sorely like rip van winkles in the third act the deep glacial canyon flutings across which our march then lay proved to be great consumers of time indeed it was sunset when we reached the eastern ascent and began to toil up through scattered pines and over trains of moraine glacial rocks toward the great peak stars were already flashing brilliantly in the sky and the low glowing arch in the west had almost vanished when we reached the upper trees and threw down our knapsacks to camp the forest grew on a sort of plateau shelf with a precipitous front to the west a level surface which stretched eastward and back to the foot of our mountain whose lower spurs reached within a mile of camp within the shelter lay a huge fallen log like all these alpine woods one mass of resin which flared up when we applied a match illuminating the whole grove by contrast with the darkness outside we seemed to be in a vast many-pillared hall the stream close by afforded water for our blessed teapot venison frizzled with mild appetizing sound upon the ends of pine sticks matchless beans allowed themselves to become seductively crisp upon our tin plates that supper seemed to me then the quintessence of gastronomy and i am sure cotter and i must have said some very good after-dinner things though i long ago forgot them all within the ring of warmth on elastic beds of pine needles we curled up and fell swiftly into a sound sleep i woke up once in the night to look at my watch and observed that the sky was overcast with a thin film of cirrus cloud to which the reflected moonlight lent the appearance of a glimmering tint stretched from mountain to mountain over canyons filled with impenetrable darkness only the vaguely lighted peaks and white snow fields distinctly seen i closed my eyes and slept soundly 
until Cotter awoke me at half past three, when we arose, breakfasted by the light of our fire, which still blazed brilliantly, and leaving our knapsacks, started for the mountain with only instruments, canteens, and luncheon. In the indistinct moonlight, climbing was very difficult at first, for we had to thread our way along a plain which was literally covered with glacier boulders, and the innumerable brooks which we crossed were frozen solid. However, our march brought us to the base of the great mountain, which rising high against the east shut out the coming daylight and kept us in profound shadow. From base to summit rose a series of broken crags, lifting themselves from a general slope of debris. Toward the left, the angle seemed to be rather gentler, and the surface less ragged, and we hoped, by a long detour round the base, to make an easy climb up this gentler surface. So we toiled on for an hour over the rocks, reaching at last the bottom of the north slope. Here our work began in good earnest. The blocks were of enormous size and in every stage of unstable equilibrium, frequently rolling over as we jumped upon them making it necessary for us to take a second leap and land where we best could. To our relief, we soon surmounted the largest blocks, reaching a smaller size, which served us as a sort of stairway. The advancing daylight revealed to us a very long, comparatively even snow slope, whose surface was pierced by many knobs and granite heads, giving it the aspect of an ice roofing fastened on with bolts of stone. It stretched in far perspective to the summit, where already the rows of sunrise reflected gloriously, kindling a fresh enthusiasm within us. Immense boulders were partly embedded in the ice just above us, whose constant melting left them trembling on the edge of a fall. It communicated no very pleasant sensation to see above you these immense missiles hanging by a mere band, and knowing that, as soon as the sun rose, you would be exposed to a constant cannonade. The east side of the peak, which we could now partially see, was too precipitous to think of climbing. The slope toward our camp was too much broken into pinnacles and crags to offer us any hope, or to divert us from the single way, dead ahead, up slopes of ice and among fragments of granite. The sun rose upon us while we were climbing the lower part of this snow, and in less than half an hour, melting began to liberate huge blocks which thundered down past us, gathering and growing into small avalanches below. We did not dare climb one above another, according to our ordinary mode, but kept about an equal level, a hundred feet apart, lest, dislodging the blocks, one should hurl them down upon the other. We climbed alternately up smooth faces of granite, clinging simply by the cracks and protruding crystals of feldspar and then huge steps up fearfully steep slopes of ice, zigzagging to the right and left to avoid the flying boulders. When midway up this slope we reached a place where the granite rose in perfectly smooth bluffs on either side of a gorge, a narrow cut, or walled away, leading up to the flat summit of the cliff. This we scaled by cutting ice steps, only to find ourselves fronted again by a still higher wall. Ice sloped from its front at too steep an angle for us to follow, but had melted in contact with it, leaving a space three feet wide between the ice and the rock. We entered this crevice and climbed along its bottom, with a wall of rock rising a hundred feet above us on one side and a thirty-foot face of ice on the other, through which light of an intense cobalt blue penetrated. Reaching the upper end, we had to cut our footsteps upon the ice again, and having braced our backs against the granite, climb up to the surface. We were now in a dangerous position. To fall into the crevice upon one side was to be wedged to death between rock and ice. To make a slip was to be shot down 500 feet and then hurled over the brink of a precipice. In the friendly seat which this wedge gave me, I stopped to take wet and dry observations with the thermometer, this being an absolute preventive of a scare, and to enjoy the view. The wall of our mountain sank abruptly to the left, opening for the first time an outlook to the eastward. Deep, it seemed almost vertically, beneath us we could see the blue waters of Owens Lake, 10,000 feet below. The summit peaks to the north were piled up in titanic confusion, their ridges overhanging the eastern slope with terrible abruptness. 
clustered upon the shelves and plateaus below were several frozen lakes and in all directions swept magnificent fields of snow the summit was now not over five hundred feet distant and we started on again with the exhilarating hope of success but if nature had intended to secure the summit from all assailants she could not have planned her defenses better for the smooth granite wall which rose above the snow slope continued apparently quite round the peak and we looked in great anxiety to see if there was not one place where it might be climbed it was all blank except in one place quite near us the snow bridged across the crevice and rose in a long point to the summit of the wall a great icicle column frozen in a niche of the bluff its base about ten feet wide narrowing to two feet at the top we climbed to the base of this spire of ice and with the utmost care began to cut our stairway the material was an exceedingly compacted snow passing into clear ice as it neared the rock we climbed the first half of it with comparative ease after that it was almost vertical and so thin that we did not dare to cut the footsteps deep enough to make them absolutely safe there was a constant dread lest our ladder should break off and we be thrown either down the snow slope or into the bottom of the crevasse at last in order to prevent myself from falling over backwards i was obliged to thrust my hand into the crack between the ice and the wall and the spire became so narrow that i could do this on both sides so that the climb was made as upon a tree cutting mere toe holes and embracing the whole column of ice in my arms at last i reached the top and with the greatest caution wormed my body over the brink and rolling out upon the smooth surface of the granite looked over and watched cotter make his climb he came up steadily with no sense of nervousness until he got to the narrow part of the ice and here he stopped and looked up with a forlorn face to me but as he climbed up over the ledge the broad smile came back to his face and he asked me if it had occurred to me that we had by and by to go down again we now had an easy slope to the summit and hurried up over rocks and ice reaching the crest at exactly twelve o'clock i rang my hammer upon the topmost rock we grasped hands and i reverently named the grand peak mount tyndall End of chapter 15chapter 16 of young people's treasury volume 6 famous travels and adventures by hamilton wright maybe this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by betty b the grand canyon of the colorado by john wesley powell august 13th 1869 we are now ready to start on our way down the great unknown our boats tied to a common stake are chafing each other as they are tossed by the fretful river. They ride high and buoyant, for their loads are lighter than we could desire. We have but a month's rations remaining. The flour has been re-sifted through the mosquito net sieve. The spoiled bacon has been dried and the worst of it boiled. The few pounds of dried apples have been spread in the sun and re-shrunken to their normal bulk. The sugar has all melted and gone on its way down the river but we have a large sack of coffee. The lightning of the boats has this advantage. They will ride the waves better, and we shall have but little to carry when we make a portage. We are three-quarters of a mile in the depths of the earth, and the great river shrinks into insignificance as it dashes its angry waves against the walls and cliffs that rise to the world above. They are but puny ripples, and we but pygmies, running up and down the sands or lost among the boulders. We have an unknown distance yet to run, an unknown river yet to explore. What falls there are we know not, what rocks beset the channel we know not, what walls rise over the river we know not. Ah, well, we may conjecture many things. The men talk as cheerfully as ever, jests are bandied out freely this morning, but to me the cheer is somber and the jests are ghastly. With some eagerness and some anxiety, and some misgiving we enter the canyon below and are carried along by the swift water through walls which rise from its very edge they have the same structure as we noticed yesterday tiers of irregular shelves below 
and above these steep slopes to the foot of marble cliffs. We run six miles in a little more than half an hour and emerge into a more open portion of the canyon, where high hills and ledges of rock intervene between the river and the distant walls. Just at the head of this open place, the river runs across a dike, that is, a fissure in the rocks open to depths below has been filled with eruptive matter, and this, on cooling, was harder than the rocks through which the crevice was made, and when these were washed away, the harder volcanic matter remained as a wall, and the river has cut a gateway through it several hundred feet high and as many wide. As it crosses the wall, there is a fall below and a bad rapid filled with boulders of trap, so we stop to make a portage. Then on we go, gliding by hills and ledges with distant walls in view, sweeping past sharp angles of rock, stopping at a few points to examine rapids which we find can be run, until we have made another five miles when we land for dinner. Then we let down our lines over a long rapid and start again. Once more the walls close in and we find ourselves in a narrow gorge, the water again filling the channel and very swift. With great care and constant watchfulness we proceed, making about four miles this afternoon and camp in a cave. August 14th. At daybreak we walk down the bank of the river on a little sandy beach to take a view of a new feature in the canyon. Heretofore hard rocks have given us bad river, soft rocks smooth water, and a series of rocks harder than any we have experienced sets in. The river enters the granite. We can see but a little way into the granite gorge, but it looks threatening. After breakfast we enter on the waves. At the very introduction it inspires all. The canyon is narrower than we have ever before seen it. The water is swifter. There are but few broken rocks in the channel, but the walls are set on either side with pinnacles and crags, and sharp, angular buttresses bristling with wind and wave-polished spires extend far out into the river. Ledges of rock jut into the stream, their tops just below the surface, sometimes rising few or many feet above, and island ledges and island pinnacles and island towers break the swift course of the stream into chutes and eddies and whirlpools. We soon reach a place where a creek comes in from the left, and just below the channel is choked with boulders, which have washed down this lateral canyon and formed a dam, over which there is a fall of thirty or forty feet. But on the boulders we can get foothold, and we make a portage. Three more such dams are found. Over one we make a portage. At the other two we find chutes through which we can run. As we proceed, the granite rises higher, until nearly a thousand feet of the lower part of the walls are composed of this rock. About eleven o'clock we hear a great roar ahead, and approach it very cautiously. The sound grows louder and louder as we run, and at last we find ourselves above a long broken fall, with ledges and pinnacles of rock obstructing the river. There is a descent of perhaps seventy-five or eighty feet in a third of a mile, and the rushing waters break into great waves on the rocks and lash themselves into a mad white foam. We can land just above, but there is no foothold on either side by which we can make a portage. It is nearly a thousand feet to the top of the granite, so it will be impossible to carry our boats around, though we can climb to the summit up a side gulch and passing along a mile or two can descend to the river. This we find on examination, but such a portage would be impracticable for us, and we must run the rapid or abandon the river. There is no hesitation. We step into our boats, push off, and away we go, first on smooth but swift water, then we strike a glassy wave and ride to its top, down again into the trough, up again on a higher wave, and down and up on waves higher and still higher until we strike one just as it curls back and a breaker rolls over our little boat. Still, on we speed, shooting past projecting rocks till the little boat is caught in a whirlpool and spun around several times. At last we pull out again into the stream, and now the other boats have passed us. The open compartment of the Emma Dean is filled with water, and every breaker rolls over us. Hurled back from a rock, now on this side, now on that, 
we are carried into an eddy in which we struggle for a few minutes and are then out again, the breaker still rolling over us. Our boat is unmanageable, but she cannot sink, and we drift down another hundred yards through breakers. How, we scarcely know. We find the other boats have turned into an eddy at the foot of the fall and are waiting to catch us as we come, for the men have seen that our boat is swamped. They push out as we come near and pull us in against the wall. We bail our boat and on we go again. The walls now are more than a mile in height, a vertical distance difficult to appreciate. Stand on the south steps of the Treasury Building in Washington and look down Pennsylvania Avenue to the Capitol Park and measure this distance overhead and imagine cliffs to extend to that altitude and you will understand what I mean. Or stand at Canal Street in New York and look up Broadway to Grace Church and you have about the distance. Or stand at Lake Street Bridge in Chicago and look down to the Central Depot and you have it again. A thousand feet of this is up through granite crags, then steep slopes and perpendicular cliffs rise, one above another, to the summit. The gorge is black and narrow below, red and gray and flaring above, with crags and angular projections on the walls, which, cut in many places by side canyons, seem to be a vast wilderness of rocks. Down in these grand gloomy depths we glide, ever listening, for the mad waters keep up their roar, ever watching, ever peering ahead, for the narrow canyon is winding and the river is closed in so that we can see but a few hundred yards, and what there may be below we know not, but what we listen for falls and watch for rocks, or stop now and then in the bay of a recess to admire the gigantic scenery. And ever, as we go, there is some new pinnacle or tower, some crag or peak, some distant view of the upper plateau, some strange-shaped rock, or some deep, narrow side canyon. Then we come to another broken fall, which appears more difficult than the one we ran this morning. A small creek comes in on the right, and the first fall of the water is over boulders, which have been carried down by this lateral stream. We land at its mouth and stop for an hour or two to examine the fall. It seems possible to let down with lines at least a part of the way, from point to point, along the right-hand wall. So we make a portage over the first rocks and find footing on some boulders below. Then we let down one of the boats to the end of her line. When she reaches a corner of the projecting rock, to which one of the men clings and steadies her while I examine an eddy below. I think we can pass the other boats down by us and catch them in the eddy. This is soon done and the men in the boats in the eddy pull us to their side. On the shore of this little eddy, there is about two feet of gravel beach above the water. Standing on this beach, some of the men take the line of the little boat and let it drift down against another projecting angle. Here is a little shelf on which a man from my boat climbs, and a shorter line is passed to him, and he fastens the boat to the side of the cliff. Then the second one is let down, bringing the line of the third. When the second boat is tied up, the two men standing on the beach above spring into the last boat, which is pulled up alongside of ours. Then we let down the boats for 25 or 30 yards by walking along the shelf, landing them again in the mouth of a side canyon. Just below this there is another pile of boulders, over which we make another portage. From the foot of these rocks we can climb to another shelf 40 or 50 feet above the water. On this beach we camp for the night. We find a few sticks which have lodged in the rocks. It is raining hard and we have no shelter, but kindle a fire and have our supper. We sit on the rocks all night, wrapped in our ponchos, getting what sleep we can. August 15th. This morning we find we can let down for three or four hundred yards, and it is managed in this way. We pass along the wall by climbing from projecting point to point, sometimes near the water's edge, at other places fifty or sixty feet above, and hold the boat with a line while two men remain aboard and prevent her from being dashed against the rocks and keep the line from getting caught in the wall. In two hours we have brought down all of them as far as it is possible in this way. A few yards below the river strikes with great violence against a projecting rock, and our boats are pulled up in a little bay above. We must now manage to pull out of this and clear the point below. 
The little boat is held by the bow obliquely up the stream. We jump in and pull out only a few strokes and sweep clear of the dangerous rock. The other boats follow in the same manner and the rapid is passed. It is not easy to describe the labor of such navigation. We must prevent the waves from dashing the boats against the cliffs. Sometimes, where the river is swift, we must put a bite of rope about a rock to prevent her being snatched from us by a wave. But where the plunge is too great or the chute too swift, we must let her leap and catch her below, or the undertow will drag her under the falling water and she sinks. Where we wish to run her out a little way from shore, through a channel between rocks, we first throw in little sticks of driftwood and watch their course, to see where we must steer so that she will pass the channel in safety. And so we hold and let go and pull and lift and ward among rocks, around rocks, and over rocks. And now we go on through this solemn, mysterious way. The river is very deep, the canyon very narrow, and still obstructed, so that there is no steady flow of the stream, but the waters wheel and roll and boil, and we are scarcely able to determine where we can go. Now the boat is carried to the right, perhaps close to the wall. Again she is shot into the stream, and perhaps is dragged over to the other side, where, caught in a whirlpool, she spins about. We can neither land nor run as we please. The boats are entirely unmanageable. No order in their running can be preserved. Now one, now another is ahead, each crew laboring for its own preservation. In such a place we come to another rapid. Two of the boats run it per force. One succeeds in landing, but there is no foothold by which to make a portage, and she is pushed out again into the stream. The next minute a great reflex wave fills the open compartment. She is waterlogged and drifts unmanageable. Breaker after breaker roll over her, and one capsizes her. The men are thrown out, but they cling to the boat, and she drifts down some distance alongside of us, and we are able to catch her. She is soon bailed out, and the men are aboard once more, but the oars are lost, so a pair from the Emma Dean is spared. Then for two miles we find smooth water. August 21st. We start early this morning, cheered by the prospect of a fine day, and encouraged also by the good run made yesterday. A quarter of a mile below camp, the river turns abruptly to the left, and between camp and that point is very swift, running down in a long, broken chute, and piling up against the foot of the cliff, where it turns to the left. We try to pull across, so as to go down on the other side, but the waters are swift, and it seems impossible for us to escape the rock below. But, in pulling across, the bow of the boat is turned to the farther shore so that we are swept broadside down and are prevented by the rebounding waters from striking against the wall. There we toss about for a few seconds in these billows and are carried past the danger. Below, the river turns again to the right. The canyon is very narrow and we see in advance but a short distance. The water, too, is very swift and there is no landing place. From around this curve there comes a mad roar, and down we are carried with a dizzying velocity to the head of another rapid. On either side, high over our heads, there are overhanging granite walls, and the sharp bends cut off our view, so that a few minutes will carry us into unknown waters. Away we go, on one long winding chute. I stand on deck, supporting myself with a strap, fastened on either side to the gunwale, and the boat glides rapidly where the water is smooth, or striking a wave, she leaps and bounds like a thing of life, and we have a wild, exhilarating ride for ten miles, which we make in less than an hour. The excitement is so great that we forget the danger, until we hear the roar of a great fall below. Then we back on our oars and are carried slowly toward its head, and succeed in landing just above, and find that we have to make another portage. At this, we are engaged until some time after dinner. Just here, we run out of the granite. Ten miles in less than half a day in limestone walls below. Good cheer returns. We forget the storms and the gloom and cloud-covered canyons and the black granite and the raging river and push our boats from shore in great glee. Though we are out of the granite, the river is still swift and we wheel about a point again to the right and turn 
so as to head back in the direction from which we come and see the granite again with its narrow gorge and black crags but we meet with no more great falls or rapids still we run cautiously and stop from time to time to examine some places which look bad yet we make ten miles this afternoon twenty miles in all today august twenty second we come to rapids again this morning and are occupied several hours in passing them letting the boats down from rock to rock with lines for nearly half a mile and then have to make a long portage while the men are engaged in this i climb the wall on the northeast to a height of about twenty five hundred feet where i can obtain a good view of a long stretch of canyon below its course is to the southwest the walls seem to rise very abruptly for twenty five hundred or three thousand feet and then there is a gently sloping terrace on each side for two or three miles and again we find cliffs fifteen hundred or two thousand feet high from the brink of these the plateau stretches back to the north and south for a long distance away down the canyon on the right wall i can see a group of mountains some of which appear to stand on the brink of the canyon the effect of the terrace is to give the appearance of a narrow winding valley with high walls on either side and a deep dark meandering gorge down its middle it is impossible from this point of view to determine whether we have granite at the bottom or not but from geological considerations i conclude that we shall have marble walls below after my return to the boats we run another mile and camp for the night we have made but little over seven miles today and a part of our flour has been soaked in the river again august twenty third our way today is again through marble walls now and then we pass for a short distance through patches of granite like hills thrust up into the limestone at one of these places we have to make another portage and taking advantage of the delay i go up a little stream to the north wading it all the way sometimes having to take a plunge in to my neck in other places being compelled to swim across little basins that have been excavated at the foot of the falls along its course are many cascades and springs gushing out from the rocks on either side sometimes a cottonwood tree grows over the water i come to one beautiful fall of more than a hundred and fifty feet and climb around it to the right on the broken rocks still going up i find the canyon narrowing very much being but fifteen or twenty feet wide yet the walls rise on either side many hundreds of feet perhaps thousands i can hardly tell in some places the stream has not excavated its channel down vertically through the rocks but is cut obliquely so that one wall overhangs the other in other places it is cut vertically above and obliquely below or obliquely above and vertically below so that it is impossible to see out overhead but i can go no farther the time which i estimated it would take to make the portage has almost expired and i start back on a round trot wading in the creek where i must and plunging through basins and find the men waiting for me and away we go on the river just after dinner we pass a stream on the right which leaps into the colorado by a direct fall of more than a hundred feet forming a beautiful cascade there is a bed of very hard rock above thirty or forty feet in thickness and much softer beds below the hard beds above project many yards beyond the softer which are washed out forming a deep cave behind the fall and the stream pours through a crevice above into a deep pool below around on the rocks in the cave-like chamber are set beautiful ferns with delicate fronds and enameled stalks the little frondlets have their points turned down to form spore cases it has very much the appearance of the maiden's hair fern but is much larger this delicate foliage covers the rocks all about the fountain and gives the chamber great beauty but we have little time to spend in admiration so on we go we make fine progress this afternoon carried along by a swift river and shoot over the rapids finding no serious obstructions the canyon walls for twenty five hundred or three thousand feet are very regular rising almost perpendicularly but here and there set with narrow steps and occasionally we can see away above the broad terrace to distant cliffs we camp tonight in a marble cave and find on looking at our reckoning we have run twenty-two miles 
August 24th. The canyon is wider today. The walls rise to a vertical height of nearly 3,000 feet. In many places, the river runs under a cliff in great curves, forming amphitheaters, half dome-shaped. Though the river is rapid, we meet with no serious obstructions and run 20 miles. It is curious how anxious we are to make up our reckoning every time we stop. Now that our diet is confined to plenty of coffee, very little spoiled flour, and very few dried apples, it has come to be a race for a dinner. Still, we make such fine progress all hands are in good cheer, but not a moment of daylight is lost. August 25th. We make 12 miles this morning when we come to monuments of lava standing in the river. Low rocks mostly, but some of them shafts more than a 100 feet high. Going on down three or four miles, we find them increasing in number. Great quantities of cooled lava and many cinder cones are seen on either side, and then we come to an abrupt cataract. Just over the fall, on the right wall, a cinder cone, or extinct volcano, with a well-defined crater, stands on the very brink of the canyon. This, doubtless, is the one we saw two or three days ago. From this volcano, vast floods of lava have been poured into the river, and a stream of the molten rock has run up the canyon, three or four miles and down, we know not how far. Just where it poured over the canyon wall is the fall. The whole north side, as far as we can see, is lined with the black basalt, and high up on the opposite wall are patches of the same material, resting on the benches and filling old alcoves and caves, giving to the wall a spotted appearance. The rocks are broken in two, along a line which here crosses the river, and the beds, which we have seen coming down the canyon for the last thirty miles, have dropped 800 feet on the lower side of the line, forming what geologists call a fault. The volcanic cone stands directly over the fissure thus formed. On the side of the river opposite, mammoth springs burst out of this crevice one or two hundred feet above the river, pouring in a stream quite equal in volume to the Colorado Chiquito. This stream seems to be loaded with carbonate of lime, and the water evaporating leaves an incrustation on the rocks, and this process has been continued for a long time, for extensive deposits are noticed in which are basins with bubbling springs. The water is salty. We have to make a portage here, which is completed in about three hours, and on we go. We have no difficulty as we float along, and I am able to observe the wonderful phenomena connected with this flood of lava. The canyon was doubtless filled to a height of twelve or fifteen hundred feet, perhaps by more than one flood. This would dam the water back, and in cutting through this great lava bed, a new channel has been formed, sometimes on one side, sometimes on the other. The cooled lava, being of firmer texture than the rocks of which the walls are composed, remains in some places. In others, a narrow channel has been cut, leaving a line of basalt, on either side. It is possible that the lava cooled faster on the sides against the walls, and that the center ran out, but of this we can only conjecture. There are other places where almost the whole of the lava is gone, patches of it only being seen where it is caught on the walls. As we float down, we can see that it ran out into side canyons. In some places, this basalt has a fine columnar structure, often in concentric prisms, and masses of these concentric columns have coalesced. In some places where the flow occurred, the canyon was probably at about the same depth as it is now, for we can see where the basalt is rolled out on the sands, and, what seems curious to me, the sands are not melted or metamorphosed to any appreciable extent. In places the bed of the river is of sandstone or limestone, in other places of lava, showing that it has all been cut out again where the sandstones and limestones appear, but there is a little yet left where the bed is of lava. What a conflict of water and fire there must have been here. Just imagine a river of molten rock running down into a river of melted snow. What a seething and boiling of the waters. What clouds of steam rolled into the heavens. 
35 miles today. Hurrah! August 26. The canyon walls are steadily becoming higher as we advance. They are still bold and nearly vertical up to the terrace. We still see evidence of the eruption discovered yesterday, but the thickness of the basalt is decreasing as we go down the stream. Yet it has been reinforced at points by streams that have come from volcanoes standing on the terrace above, but which we cannot see from the river below. Since we left the Colorado Chiquito, we have seen no evidences that the tribe of Indians inhabiting the plateaus on either side ever come down to the river. But about 11 o'clock today, we discover an Indian garden at the foot of the wall on the right, just where a little stream with a narrow flood plain comes down through a side canyon. Along the valley, the Indians have planted corn, using the water which burst out in springs at the foot of the cliff for irrigation. The corn is looking quite well, but is not sufficiently advanced to give us roasting ears. But there are some nice green squashes. We carry ten or a dozen of these on board our boats and hurriedly leave, not willing to be caught in the robbery, yet excusing ourselves by pleading our great want. We run down a short distance to where we feel certain no Indians can follow, and what a kettle of squash sauce we make! True, we have no salt with which to season it, but it makes a fine addition to our unleavened bread and coffee. Never was fruit so sweet as those stolen squashes. After dinner, we push on again, making fine time, finding many rapids, but none so bad that we cannot run them with safety. And when we stop just at dusk and foot up our reckoning, we find that we have run 35 miles again. What a supper we make, unleavened bread, green squash sauce, and strong coffee. We have been for a few days on half rations, but we have no stint of roast squash. A few days like this, and we are out of prison. August 29th. We start very early this morning. The river still continues swift, but we have no serious difficulty, and at 12 o'clock emerge from the Grand Canyon of the Colorado. We are in a valley now, and low mountains are seen in the distance, coming to the river below. We recognize this as the Grand Wash. A few years ago, a party of Mormons set out from St. George, Utah, taking with them a boat, and came down to the mouth of the Grand Wash, where they divided, a portion of the party crossing the river to explore the San Francisco Mountains. Three men, Hamblin, Miller, and Crosby, taking the boat, went on down the river to Colville, landing a few miles below the mouth of the Rio Virgin. We have their manuscript journal with us, and so the stream is comparatively well known. Tonight we camp on the left bank in a mesquite thicket. The relief from danger and the joy of success are great. When he who has been chained by wounds to a hospital cot until his canvas tent seems like a dungeon cell, until the groans of those who lie about tortured with probe and knife are piled up a weight of horror on his ears that he cannot throw off cannot forget and until the stench of festering wounds and anesthetic drugs has filled the air with this loathsome burden at last goes into the open field what a world he sees how beautiful the sky how bright the sunshine what floods of delirious music pour from the throats of birds how sweet the fragrance of earth and tree and blossom. The first hour of convalescent freedom seems rich, recompense for all, pain, gloom, terror. Something like this are the feelings we experience tonight. Ever before us has been an unknown danger, heavier than immediate peril. Every waking hour passed in the Grand Canyon has been one of toil. We have watched with deep solicitude the steady disappearance of our scant supply of rations, and from time to time have seen the river snatch a portion of the little left while we were a hungered, and danger and toil were endured in those gloomy depths, where oft times the clouds hid the sky by day, and but a narrow zone of stars could be seen at night. Only during the few hours of deep sleep, consequent on hard labor, has the roar of the waters been hushed. Now the danger is over, now the toil has ceased, 
now the gloom has disappeared now the firmament is bounded only by the horizon and what a vast expanse of constellations can be seen the river rolls by us in silent majesty the quiet of the camp is sweet our joy is almost ecstasy we sit till long after midnight talking of the grand canyon talking of home but chiefly talking of the three men who left us are they wandering in those depths unable to find a way out are they searching over the desert lands above for water or are they nearing the settlements end of chapter sixteen chapter seventeen of young people's treasury volume six famous travels and adventures by hamilton wright maybe this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by betty b sources of the mississippi by zebulon m pike january first eighteen o six passed six very elegant bark canoes on the bank of the river which had been laid up by the chippeways also a camp which we had conceived to have been evacuated about ten days my interpreter came after me in a great hurry conjuring me not to go so far ahead and assured me that the chippeways encountering me without an interpreter party or flag would certainly kill me but notwithstanding this i went on several miles farther than usual in order to make any discoveries that were to be made conceiving the savages not so barbarous or ferocious as to fire on two men i had one with me who were apparently coming into their country trusting to their generosity and knowing that if we met only two or three we were equal to them i having my gun and pistols and he his buckshot made some extra presents for new year's day january second fine warm day discovered fresh signs of indians just as we were encamping at night my sentinel informed us that some Indians were coming at full speed upon our trail or track. I ordered my men to stand by their guns carefully. They were immediately at my camp and saluted the flag by a discharge of three pieces, when four Chippeways, one Englishman, and a Frenchman of the Northwest Company presented themselves. They informed us that some women, having discovered our trail, gave the alarm and not knowing but it was their enemies had departed to make a discovery they had heard of us and revered our flag mr grant the englishman had only arrived the day before from lake de sable from which he marched in one day and a half i presented the indians with half a deer which they received thankfully for they had discovered our fires some days ago and believing them to be sioux fires they dared not leave their camp they returned home but mr grant remained all night january third my party marched early but i returned with mr grant to his establishment on the red cedar lake having one corporal with me after explaining to a chippeway warrior called curly head the object of my voyage and receiving his answer that he would remain tranquil until my return we ate a good breakfast for the country departed and overtook my sleds just at dusk killed one porcupine distance sixteen miles january fourth we made twenty-eight points in the river broad good bottom and of the usual timber in the night i was awakened by the cry of the sentinel calling repeatedly to the men at length he vociferated will you let the lieutenant be burned to death this immediately aroused me at first i seized my arms but looking round i saw my tents in flames the men flew to my assistance and we tore them down but not until they were entirely ruined this with the loss of my leggings moccasins and socks which i had hung up to dry was no trivial misfortune in such a country and on such a voyage but i had reason to thank god that the powder three small casks of which i had in my tent did not take fire if it had i must certainly have lost all my baggage if not my life january fifth mr grant promised to overtake me yesterday but has not yet arrived i conceived it would be necessary to attend his motions with careful observation distance twenty seven miles january sixth bradley and myself walked up thirty one points in hopes to discover lake de sable but finding a near cut of twenty yards 
for ten miles and being fearful the sleds would miss it we returned twenty-three points before we found our camp they had made only eight points met two frenchmen of the northwest company with about one hundred and eighty pounds on each of their backs with rackets snowshoes on they informed me that mr grant had gone on with the frenchmen snow fell all day and was three feet deep spent a miserable night january seventh made but eleven miles and was then obliged to send ahead and make fires every three miles notwithstanding which the cold was so intense that some of the men had their noses others their fingers and others their toes frozen before they felt the cold sensibly very severe days march january eighth conceiving i was at no great distance from sandy lake i left my sleds and with corporal bradley took my departure for that place intending to send him back the same evening we walked on very briskly until near night when we met a young indian one of those who had visited my camp near red cedar lake i endeavored to explain to him that it was my wish to go to lake de sable that evening he returned with me until we came to a trail that led across the woods this he signified was a near course i went this course with him and shortly after found myself at a chippeway encampment to which i believed the friendly savage had enticed me with the expectation that i would tarry all night knowing that it was too late for us to make the lake in good season but upon our refusing to stay he put us in the right road we arrived at the place where the track left the mississippi at dusk when we traversed about two leagues of a wilderness without any very great difficulty and at length struck the shore of lake de sable over a branch of which lay our course the snow having covered the trail made by the frenchman who had passed before us with the rackets i was fearful of losing ourselves on the lake the consequences of which can only be conceived by those who have been exposed on a lake or naked plain in a dreary night of january in latitude forty seven degrees and the thermometer below zero thinking that we could observe the bank of the other shore we kept a straight course and some time after discovered lights and on our arrival were not a little surprised to find a large stockade the gate being open we entered and proceeded to the quarters of mr grant where we were treated with the utmost hospitality january ninth sent away the corporal early in order that our men should receive assurances of our safety and success he carried with him a small keg of spirits a present from mr grant the establishment of this place was formed twelve years since by the northwest company and was formerly under the charge of mr charles bruski it has attained at present such regularity as to permit the superintendent to live tolerably comfortably they have horses they procure from red river from the indians they raise plenty of potatoes catch pike suckers pickerel and whitefish in abundance they have also beaver deer and moose but the provision they chiefly depend upon is wild oats of which they purchase great quantities from the savages giving at the rate of about one dollar and a half a bushel but flour pork and salt are almost interdicted to persons not principals in the trade flour sells at half a dollar salt at a dollar pork at eighty cents sugar at fifty cents and tea at four dollars and a half a pound the sugar is obtained from the indians and is made from the maple tree january tenth mr grant accompanied me to the mississippi to mark the place for my boats to leave the river this was the first time i marched on rackets snowshoes i took the course of the lake river from its mouth to the lake mr grant fell through the ice with his rackets on and could not have got out without assistance january eleventh remained all day within quarters january twelfth went out and met my men about sixteen miles a tree had fallen on one of them and hurt him very much which induced me to dismiss a sled and put the loading on the others january thirteenth after encountering much difficulty we arrived at the establishment of the northwest company on lake de sable a little before night the ice being very bad on the lake river owing to the many springs and marshes one sled fell through my men had an excellent room furnished them and were presented with potatoes and spirits 
Mr. Grant had gone to an Indian lodge to receive his credits. January 14th. Crossed the lake to the north side that I might take an observation. Found the latitude 46 degrees, 9 minutes, 20 seconds north. Surveyed that part of the lake. Mr. Grant returned from the Indian lodges. His party brought a quantity of furs and 11 beaver carcasses. January 15th. Mr. Grant and myself made the tour of the lake with two men whom I had for attendants. Found it to be much larger than could be imagined at a view. My men sawed stocks for the sleds, which I found it necessary to construct after the manner of the country. On our march, met an Indian coming into the fort. His countenance expressed no little astonishment when I told him who I was and whence I came. For the people of this country acknowledge that the savages hold the Americans in greater veneration than any other white people. They say of us, when alluding to warlike achievements, that we are neither Frenchmen nor Englishmen, but white Indians. January 16th, laid down Lake de Sable, a young Indian whom I had engaged to go as a guide to Lake Sang Sioux arrived from the woods. January 17th, employed in making sleds after the manner of the country. They are made of a single plank turned up at one end like a fiddlehead, and the baggage is lashed on in bags and sacks. Two other Indians arrive from the woods, engaged in writing. January 18th, busy in preparing my baggage for my departure for Leech Lake and Redding. January 19th, employed as yesterday, two men of the Northwest Company arrived from the Fond du Lac Superior with letters, one of which was from their establishment in Athapuscow, and had been since last May on the route. While at this point I ate roasted beaver, dressed in every respect as a pig is usually dressed with us. It was excellent. I could not discern the least taste of des bois. I also ate boiled moose's head, which when well boiled I consider equal to the tail of the beaver. In taste and substance they are much alike. January 20th. The men, with their sleds, took their departure about two o'clock. Shortly after I followed them, we encamped at the portage between the Mississippi and Leech Lake River. Snow fell in the night. January 21st. Snowed in the morning, but crossed about nine o'clock. I had gone on a few points when I was overtaken by Mr. Grant, who informed me that the sleds could not get along in consequence of water being on the ice. He sent his men forward. We returned and met the sleds, which had scarcely advanced one mile. We unloaded them, sent eight men back to the post with whatever might be denominated extra articles, but in the hurry sent my salt and ink. Mr. Grant encamped with me and marched early in the morning. January 22nd. Made a pretty good day's journey. My Indian came up about noon, distance 20 miles. January 23rd. Marched about 18 miles. Forgot my thermometer, having hung it on a tree. Sent boldly back five miles for it. My young Indian and myself killed eight partridges. Took him to live with me. January 24th. At our encampment this night, Mr. Grant had encamped on the night of the same day he left me. It was three days' march for us. It was late before the men came up. January 25th. Traveled almost all day through the lands and found them much better than usual. Boley lost the Sioux pipe stem, which I had carried along for the purpose of making peace with the Chippeways. I sent him back for it. He did not return until 11 o'clock at night. It was very warm, thawing all day. Distance, 44 points. January 26th. I left my party in order to proceed to a house or lodge of Mr. Grant's on the Mississippi, where he was to tarry until I overtook him, took with me an Indian, Boley, and some trifling provision. The Indian and myself marched so fast that we left Boley on the route, about eight miles from the lodge, met Mr. Grant's men on their return to Lake de Sable, having evacuated the house this morning, and Mr. Grant having marched for Leech Lake. The Indian and I arrived before sundown, passed the night very uncomfortably, having nothing to eat, not much wood nor any blankets. The Indian slept sound. I cursed his insensibility, being obliged to content myself over a few coals all night. Boley did not arrive. In the night, 
the indian mentioned something about his son january twenty seventh my indian rose early mended his moccasins then expressed by sign something about his son and the englishmen we met yesterday conceiving that he wished to send some message to his family i suffered him to depart after his departure i felt the curse of solitude although he was truly no company Foley arrived about ten o'clock he said that he had followed us until some time in the night when believing that he could overtake us he stopped and made a fire but having no axe to cut wood he was near freezing he met the indians who made him signs to go on i spent the day in putting my gun in order and mended my moccasins provided plenty of wood still found it cold with but one blanket january twenty eighth left our encampment at a good hour unable to find any trail passed through one of the most dismal cypress swamps i ever saw and struck the mississippi at a small lake observed mr grant's tracks going through it found his mark of a cut-off agreed on between us took it and proceeded very well until we came to a small lake where the trail was entirely hid but after some search on the other side found it when we passed through a dismal swamp on the other side of which we found a large lake at which i was entirely at a loss no trail to be seen struck for a point about three miles off where we found a chippeway lodge of one man and five children and one old woman they received us with every mark that distinguished their barbarity such as setting their dogs on us trying to thrust their hands into our pockets and so on but we convinced them that we were not afraid and let them know that we were chihuahua men americans when they used us more civilly after we had arranged a camp as well as possible i went into the lodge they presented me with a plate of dried meat i ordered miller to bring about two gills of liquor which made us all good friends the old squaw gave me more meat and offered me tobacco which not using i did not take i gave her an order upon my corporal for one knife and half a carrot of tobacco heaven clothes the lilies and feeds the raven and the same almighty providence protects and preserves these creatures after i had gone out to my fire the old man came out and proposed to trade beaver skins for whiskey meeting with a refusal he left me when presently the old woman came out with a beaver skin she also being refused he again returned to the charge with a quantity of dried meat this or any other i should have been glad to have had when i gave him a peremptory refusal then all further application ceased it really appeared that with one quart of whiskey i might have bought all they possessed of night remarkably cold was obliged to sit up nearly the whole of it suffered much with cold and from want of sleep january thirty first took my clothes into the indian's lodge to dress and was received very coolly but by giving him a dram unasked and his wife a little salt i received from them directions for my route past the lake or morass and opened on meadows through which the mississippi winds its course of nearly fifteen miles in length took a straight course through them to the head when i found we had missed the river made a turn of about two miles and regained it passed a fork which i supposed to be lake winnipie making the course northwest the branch we took was on leech lake branch course southwest and west passed a very large meadow or prairie course west the mississippi only fifteen yards wide encamped about one mile below the traverse of the meadow saw a very large animal which from its leaps i supposed to be a panther but if so it was twice as large as those on the lower mississippi he evinced some disposition to approach i lay down miller being in the rear in order to entice him to come near but he would not the night remarkably cold some spirits which i had in a small keg congealed to the consistency of honey february first left our camp pretty early passed a continuous train of prairie and arrived at lake sang sioux at half past two o'clock i will not attempt to describe my feelings on the accomplishment of my voyage for this is the main source of the mississippi the lake winnipee branch is navigable from thence to red cedar lake for the distance of five leagues which is the extremity of the navigation cross the lake twelve miles to the establishment of the northwest company 
where we arrived about three o'clock found all the gates locked but upon knocking were admitted and received with marked attention and hospitality by mr hugh mcgillis had a good dish of coffee biscuit butter and cheese for supper february second remained all day within doors in the evening sent an invitation to mr anderson who was an agent of dixon and also for some young indians at his house to come over and breakfast in the morning february third spent the day in reading volney's egypt proposing some queries to mr anderson and preparing my young men to return with a supply of provisions to my party february fourth miller departed this morning mr anderson returned to his quarters my legs and ankles were so much swelled that i was not able to wear my own clothes and was obliged to borrow some from mr mcgillis february fifth one of mr mcgillis's clerks had been sent to some indian lodges and expected to return in four days but had now been absent nine mr grant was dispatched in order to find out what had become of him february sixth my men arrived at the fort about four o'clock mr mcgillis asked if i had any objection to his hoisting their flag in compliment to ours i made none as i had not yet explained to him my ideas in making a traverse of the lake some of my men had their ears some their noses and others their chins frozen february seventh remained within doors my limbs being still very much swelled addressed a letter to mr mcgillis on the subject of the northwest company's trade in this quarter february eighth took the latitude and found it to be forty seven degrees sixteen minutes thirteen seconds shot with our rifles february ninth mr mcgillis and myself paid a visit to mr anderson an agent of mr dixon of the lower mississippi who resided at the west end of the lake found him eligibly situated as to trade but his houses bad i rode in a carriole for one person constructed in the following manner boards planed smooth turned up in front about two feet coming to a point about two and a half feet wide behind on which is fixed a box covered with dressed skins painted this box is open at the top but covered in from about two-thirds of the length the horse is fastened between the shafts the rider wraps himself up in a buffalo robe sits flat down having a cushion to lean his back against thus accoutred with a fur cap and so on he may bid defiance to the wind and weather upon our return we found that some of the indians had already returned from the hunting camps also monsieur roussand the gentleman was supposed to have been killed by the indians his arrival with mr grant diffused a general satisfaction through the fort february tenth hoisted the american flag in the fort february eleventh the sweet buck burnt and others arrived all chiefs of note but the former in particular a venerable old man from him i learned that the sioux occupied this ground when to use his own phrase he was made a man and began to hunt that they occupied it the year that the french missionaries were killed at the river pakagama the indians flocked in february twelfth bradley and myself with mr mcgillis and two of his men left leech lake at ten o'clock and arrived at the house of red cedar lake at sunset a distance of thirty miles my ankles were very much swelled and i was very lame from the entrance of the mississippi to the strait is called six miles a southwest course thence to the south end south thirty east four miles the bay at the entrance extends nearly east and west six miles about two and a half from the north side to a large point this may be called the upper source of the mississippi being fifteen miles above little lake winnipie and the extent of canoe navigation only two leagues to some of the hudson's bay waters end of chapter seventeen chapter eighteen of young people's treasury volume six famous travels and adventures by hamilton wright maybe this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by betty b expedition to the pacific ocean by captains lewis and clark 
Early in November, 1805, they set off in company with some Indians who had joined them the evening before. At the distance of three miles they passed a river on the left, to which, from the quantity of sand it bears along with it, they gave the name of Quicksand River. So great indeed was the quantity it had discharged into the Columbia that the river was compressed to the width of half a mile, and the whole force of the current thrown against the right shore. Opposite this was a large creek, which they call Seal River. The mountain, which they had supposed to be the Mount Hood of Vancouver, now bore south, 85 degrees, east, about 47 miles distant. About three miles farther on they passed the lower mouth of Quicksand River, opposite to which was another large creek, and near it the head of an island, three miles and a half in extent, and half a mile beyond it was another island, which they called Diamond Island, opposite to which they encamped, having made but thirteen miles distance. Here they met with some Indians ascending the river, who stated that they had seen three vessels at its mouth. Below Quicksand River, the country is low, rich, and thickly wooded on each side of the Columbia. The islands have less timber, and on them are numerous ponds, near which were vast quantities of fowl, such as swan, geese, brant, cranes, storks, white gulls, cormorants, and plover. The river is wide and contains a great number of sea otters. In the evening the hunters brought in game for a sumptuous supper. In continuing their descent the next day, they found Diamond Island to be six miles in length and three broad, and near its termination were two other islands. Just below the last of these proceeds their narrative. We landed on the left bank of the river, at a village of twenty-five houses, all of which were thatched with straw and built of bark, except one, which was about fifty feet long and constructed of boards, in the form of those higher up the river, from which it differed, however, in being completely above ground and covered with broad split boards. This village contained about two hundred men of the Skilut nation, who seemed well provided with canoes, of which there were at least fifty-two, and some of them very large, drawn up in front of the village. On landing we found an Indian from above, who had left us this morning, and who now invited us into a lodge of which he appeared to be part owner. Here he treated us with a root, round in shape, and about the size of a small Irish potato, which they called wapatu. It is the common arrowhead, or sagritifolia, so much cultivated by the Chinese, and when roasted in the embers till it becomes soft, has an agreeable taste, and is a very good substitute for bread. After purchasing some of this root, we resumed our journey, and at seven miles' distance came to the head of a large island near the left bank. On the right shore was a fine open prairie for about a mile, back of which the country rises and is well supplied with timber, such as white oak, pine of different kinds, wild crab, and several species of undergrowth, while along the borders of the river there were only a few cottonwood and ash trees. In this prairie were also signs of deer and elk. When we landed for dinner, a number of Indians came down for the purpose, as we supposed, of paying us a friendly visit, as they had put on their finest dresses. In addition to their usual covering, they had scarlet and blue blankets, sailor's jackets, and trousers, shirts, and hats. They had all of them either war axes, spears, and bows and arrows, or muskets and pistols, with tin powder flasks. We smoked with them and endeavored to show them at every attention, but soon found them very assuming and disagreeable companions. While we were eating, they stole the pipe with which they were smoking and a great coat of one of the men. We immediately searched them all and found the coat stuffed under the root of a tree near where they were sitting, but the pipe we could not recover. Finding us discontented with them and determined not to suffer any imposition, they showed their displeasure in the only way they dared, by returning in ill humor to their village. We then proceeded and soon met two canoes, with twelve men of the same Skalut nation, who were on their way from below. The larger of the canoes was ornamented, with the figures of a bear in the bow and a man in the stern, both nearly as large as life, both made of painted wood 
and very neatly fastened to the boat. In the same canoe were two Indians gaudily dressed and with round hats. This circumstance induced us to give the name of Image Canoe to the large island, the lower end of which we were now passing, at the distance of nine miles from its head. We had seen two smaller islands to the right and three more near its lower extremity. The river was now about a mile and a half in width, with a gentle current, and the bottoms extensive and low, but not subject to be overflowed. Three miles below Image Canoe Island, we came to four large houses on the left side. Here we had a full view of the mountain, which we had first seen from the Mussel Shell Rapid on the 19th of October, and which we now found to be, in fact, the Mount St. Helen of Vancouver. It bore north 25 degrees east, about 90 miles distant, rose in the form of a sugar loaf to a very great height, and was covered with snow. A mile lower we passed a single house on the left and another on the right. The Indians had now learned so much of us that their curiosity was without any mixture of fear, and their visits became very frequent and troublesome. We therefore continued on till after night in hopes of getting rid of them. But, after passing a village on each side, which, on account of the lateness of the hour, we could only see indistinctly, we found there was no escaping from their importunities. We accordingly landed at the distance of seven miles below Image Canoe Island and encamped near a single house on the right, having made during the day twenty-nine miles. The Skalutes that we pass today speak a language somewhat different from that of the Echelutes or the Chalukatakawas near the Long Narrows. Their dress, however, is similar, except that the Skalutes possess more articles procured from the white traders. And there is this farther difference between them, that the Skalutes, both males and females, have the head flattened. Their principal food is fish, wapatu roots, and some elk and deer, in killing which with arrows they seem to be very expert, for during the short time we remained at the village, three deer were brought in. We also observed there a tame blero, badger. As soon as we landed, we were visited by two canoes loaded with Indians, from whom we purchased a few roots. The grounds along the river continued low and rich, and among the shrubs, were large quantities of vines resembling the raspberry. On the right, the low grounds were terminated at the distance of five miles by a range of high hills covered with tall timber and running southeast and northwest. The game, as usual, was very abundant, and among other birds, we observed some white geese with a part of their wings black. Early the next morning, they resumed their voyage, passing several islands in the course of the day, the river alternately widening and contracting, and the hills sometimes retiring from, and at others approaching its banks. They stopped for the night at the distance of 32 miles from their last encampment. November 7th. The morning, proceeds the narrative, was rainy, and the fog so thick that we could not see across the river. We observed, however, opposite to our camp, the upper point of an island, between which and the steep hills on the right, we proceeded for five miles. Three miles lower was the beginning of an island, separated from the right shore by a narrow channel. Down this we proceeded under the direction of some Indians whom we had just met going up the river, and who returned in order to show us their village. It consisted of four houses only, situated on this channel behind several marshy islands formed by two small creeks. On our arrival, they gave us some fish, and we afterwards purchased wapatu roots, fish, three dogs, and two otter skins, for which we gave fish hooks chiefly, that being an article which they were very anxious to obtain. These people seemed to be of a different nation from those we had just passed. They were low in stature, ill-shaped, and all had their heads flattened. They called themselves Wakiakum, and their language differed from that of the tribes above, with whom they trade for Wapatu roots. The houses, too, were built in a different style, being raised entirely above ground, with the eaves about five feet high and the door at the corner. Near the end, opposite to the door, 
was a single fireplace round which were the beds raised four feet from the floor of earth over the fire were hung fresh fish and when dry they are stowed away with the wapatoo roots under the beds the dress of the men was like that of the people above but the women were clad in a peculiar manner the robe not reaching lower than the hip and the body being covered in cold weather by a sort of corset of fur curiously plaited and reaching from the arms to the hip added to this was a sort of petticoat or rather tissue of white cedar bark bruised or broken into small strands and woven into a girdle by several cords of the same material being tied round the middle these strands hang down as low as the knee in front and to the middle of the leg behind sometimes the tissue consists of strings of silk grass twisted and knotted at the end after remaining with them about an hour we proceeded down the channel with an indian dressed in a sailor's jacket for our pilot and on reaching the main channel were visited by some indians who have a temporary residence on a marshy island tenasillahi in the middle of the river where there are great numbers of waterfowl here the mountainous country again approaches the river on the left and a higher saddle mountain is perceived towards the southwest at a distance of twenty miles from our camp we halted at a village of wakiacombs consisting of seven ill-looking houses built in the same form with those above and situated at the foot of the high hills on the right behind two small marshy islands we merely stopped to purchase some food and two beaver skins and then proceeded opposite to these islands the hills on the left retire and the river widens into a kind of bay crowded with low islands subject to be overflowed occasionally by the tide we had not gone far from this village when the fog suddenly clearing away we were at last presented with a glorious sight of the ocean that ocean the object of all our labors the reward of all our anxieties this animating sight exhilarated the spirits of all the party who were still more delighted on hearing the distant roar of the breakers we went on with great cheerfulness along the high mountainous country which bordered the right bank the shore however was so bold and rocky that we could not until at a distance of fourteen miles from the last village find any spot fit for an encampment having made during the day thirty-four miles we now spread our mats on the ground and passed the night in the rain here we were joined by our small canoe which had been separated from us during the fog this morning two indians from the last village also accompanied us to the camp but having detected them in stealing a knife they were sent off november eighth it rained this morning and having changed our clothing which had been wet by yesterday's rain we set out at nine o'clock immediately opposite our camp was a pillar rock at the distance of a mile in the river about twenty feet in diameter and fifty in height and towards the southwest some high mountains one of which was covered with snow at the top we proceeded past several low islands in the bend or bay of the river to the left which were here five or six miles wide on the right side we passed an old village and then at the distance of three miles entered an inlet or niche about six miles across and making a deep bend of nearly five miles into the hills on the right shore where it receives the waters of several creeks we coasted along this inlet which from its little depth we called shallow bay and at the bottom of it stopped to dine near the remains of an old village from which however we kept at a cautious distance as like all these places it was occupied by a plentiful stock of fleas at this place we observed a number of fowl among which we killed a goose and two ducks exactly resembling in appearance and flavor the canvas back duck of the susquehanna after dinner we took advantage of the returning tide to go about three miles to a point on the right eight miles distant from our camp but here the water ran so high and washed about our canoe so much that several of the men became seasick it was therefore judged imprudent to proceed in the present state of the weather and we landed at the point our situation here was extremely uncomfortable the high hills jutted in so closely that there was not room for us to lie level 
nor to secure our baggage from the tide and the water of the river was too salty to be used but the waves increasing so much that we could not move from the spot with safety we fixed ourselves on the beach left by the ebb tide and raising the baggage on poles passed a disagreeable night the rain during the day having wet us completely as indeed we had been for some time past november ninth fortunately the tide did not rise as high as our camp during the night but being accompanied by high winds from the south the canoes which we could not place beyond its reach were filled with water and saved with much difficulty our position was exceedingly disagreeable but as it was impossible to move from it we waited for a change of weather it rained however during the whole day and at two o'clock in the afternoon the flood tide came in accompanied by a high wind from the south which at about four o'clock shifted to the southwest and blew almost a gale directly from the sea immense waves now broke over the place where we were and large trees some of them five or six feet through which had been lodged on the point drifted over our camp so that the utmost vigilance of every man could scarcely save the canoes from being crushed to pieces we remained in the water and were drenched with rain during the rest of the day our only sustenance being some dried fish and the rain-water which we caught yet though wet and cold and some of them sick from using salt water the men were cheerful and full of anxiety to see more of the ocean the rain continued all night and the following morning november tenth the wind lulling and the waves not being so high we loaded our canoes and proceeded the mountains on the right are here high covered with timber chiefly pine and descend with a bold and rocky shore to the water we went through a deep niche and several inlets on the right while on the opposite side was a large bay above which the hills are close on the river at the distance of ten miles the wind rose from the northwest and the waves became so high that we were forced to return two miles for a place where we could unload with safety here we landed at the mouth of a small run and having placed our baggage on a pile of drifted logs waited until low water the river then appearing more calm we started again but after going a mile found the waters too turbulent for our canoes and were obliged to put to shore here we landed the baggage and having placed it on a rock above the reach of the tide encamped on some drift logs which formed the only place where we could lie the hills rising steep over our heads to the height of five hundred feet all our baggage as well as ourselves was thoroughly wet with rain which did not cease during the day it continued indeed violently through the night in the course of which the tide reached the logs on which we lay and set them afloat november eleventh the wind was still high from the southwest and drove the waves against the shore with great fury the rain too fell in torrents and not only drenched us to the skin but loosened the stones on the hillsides so that they came rolling down upon us in this comfortless condition we remained all day wet and cold and with nothing but dried fish to satisfy our hunger the canoes at the mercy of the waves at one place the baggage in another and the men scattered on floating logs or sheltering themselves in the crevices of the rocks and hillsides a hunter was dispatched in the hope of finding some game but the hills were so steep and so covered with undergrowth and fallen timber that he could not proceed and was forced to return about twelve o'clock we were visited by five indians in a canoe they came from the opposite side of the river above where we were and their language much resembled that of the wakiacums they calling themselves kathlamas in person they were small ill-made and badly clothed though one of them had on a sailor's jacket and pantaloons which as he explained by signs he had received from the whites below the point we purchased from them thirteen red char a fish which we found very excellent after some time they went on board their boat and crossed the river which is here five miles wide through a very heavy sea november twelfth about three o'clock a tremendous gale of wind arose accompanied with lightning thunder and hail at six it lightened up for a short time but a violent rain soon began and lasted through the day 
during the storm one of our boats secured by being sunk with great quantities of stone got loose but drifting against a rock was recovered without having received much injury our situation now became much more dangerous for the waves were driven with fury against the rocks and trees which till now had afforded us refuge we therefore took advantage of the low tide and moved about half a mile round a point to a small brook which we had not observed before on account of the thick bushes and driftwood which concealed its mouth here we were more safe but still cold and wet our clothes and bedding rotten as well as wet our baggage at a distance and the canoes our only means of escape from this place at the mercy of the waves still we continued to enjoy good health and even had the luxury of feasting on some salmon and three salmon trout which we caught in the brook three of the men attempted to go round a point in our small indian canoe but the high waves rendered her quite unmanageable these boats requiring the seamanship of the natives to make them live in so rough a sea november thirteenth during the night we had short intervals of fair weather but it began to rain in the morning and continued through the day in order to obtain a view of the country below captain clark followed the course of the brook and with much fatigue and after walking three miles ascended the first spur of the mountains the whole lower country he found covered with almost impenetrable thickets of small pine with which is mixed a species of plant resembling arrowwood twelve or fifteen feet high with thorny stems almost interwoven with each other and scattered among the fern and fallen timber there is also a red berry somewhat like the solomon seal which is called by the natives salme and used as an article of diet this thick growth rendered travelling almost impossible and it was rendered still more fatiguing by the abruptness of the mountain which was so steep as to oblige him to draw himself up by means of the bushes the timber on the hills is chiefly of a large tall species of pine many of the trees eight or ten feet in diameter at the stump and rising sometimes more than one hundred feet in height the hail which fell two nights before was still to be seen on the mountains there was no game and no marks of any except some old tracks of elk the cloudy weather prevented his seeing to any distance and he therefore returned to camp and sent three men in an indian canoe to try if they could double the point and find some safer harbor for our boats at every flood tide the sea broke in great swells against the rocks and drifted the trees against our establishment so as to render it very insecure november fourteenth it had rained without intermission during the night and continued to through the day the wind too was very high and one of our canoes much injured by being driven against the rocks five indians from below came to us in a canoe and three of them landed and informed us that they had seen the men sent down yesterday fortunately at this moment one of the men arrived and told us that these very indians had stolen his gig and basket we therefore ordered the two women who remained in the canoe to restore them but this they refused to do till we threatened to shoot them when they gave back the articles and we commanded them to leave us they were of the wakiakum nation the man now informed us that they had gone round the point as far as the high sea would suffer them in the canoe and then landed that in the night he had separated from his companions who had proceeded farther down and that at no great distance from where we were was a beautiful sand beach and a good harbor captain lewis determined to examine more minutely the lower part of the bay and embarking in one of the large canoes was put on shore at the point whence he proceeded by land with four men and the canoe returned nearly filled with water november fifteenth it continued raining all night but in the morning the weather became calm and fair we began therefore to prepare for setting out but before we were ready a high wind sprang up from the southeast and obliged us to remain the sun shone until one o'clock and we were thus enabled to dry our bedding and examine our baggage the rain which had continued for the last ten days without any interval of more than two hours had completely wet all our merchandise spoiled some of our fish destroyed the robes 
and rotted nearly one half of our few remaining articles of clothing, particularly the leather dresses. About three o'clock the wind fell, and we instantly loaded the canoes and left the miserable spot to which we had been confined the last six days. On turning the point we came to the sand beach, through which runs a small stream from the hills, at the mouth of which was an ancient village of thirty-six houses, without any inhabitants at the time except fleas. Here we met Shannon, who had been sent back to us by Captain Lewis. The day Shannon left us in the canoe, he and Willard proceeded on till they met a party of twenty Indians, who, not having heard of us, did not know who they were, but they behaved with great civility. So great, indeed, and seemed so anxious that our men should accompany them toward the sea, that their suspicions were aroused, and they declined going. The Indians, however, would not leave them, and the men, becoming confirmed in their suspicions, and fearful if they went into the woods to sleep, that they would be cut to pieces in the night, thought it best to remain with the Indians. They therefore made a fire, and after talking with them to a late hour, laid down with their rifles under their heads. When they awoke, they found that the Indians had stolen and concealed their arms, and having demanded them in vain, Shannon seized a club and was about assaulting one of the Indians, whom he suspected to be the thief, when another of them began to load his fowling piece with the intention of shooting him. He therefore stopped and explained to them by signs that if they did not give up the guns, a large party would come down the river before the sun rose to a certain height and put every one of them to death. Fortunately, Captain Lewis and his party appeared at this very time, and the terrified Indians immediately brought the guns, and five of them came in with Shannon. To these men we declared that if ever any of their nation stole anything from us, he would be instantly shot. They resided to the north of this place and spoke a language different from that of the people higher up the river. It was now apparent that the sea was at all times too rough for us to proceed farther down the bay by water. We therefore landed, and having chosen the best spot we could, made our camp of boards from the old village. We were now comfortably situated, and being visited by four wakiacums with wapatoo roots, were enabled to make an agreeable addition to our food. November 16th. The morning was clear and pleasant. We therefore put out all our baggage to dry, and sent several of our party to hunt. Our camp was in full view of the ocean, on the bay laid down by Vancouver, which we distinguished by the name of Haley's Bay, from a trader who visits the Indians here, and is a great favorite among them. The meridian altitude of this day gave 46 degrees, 19 minutes, 11.7 seconds, as our latitude. The wind was strong from the southwest, and the waves were very high, yet the Indians were passing up and down the bay in canoes and several of them encamped near us. We smoked with them, but after our recent experience of their thievish disposition, treated them with caution. The hunters brought in two deer, a crane, some geese and ducks, and several brant, three of which were white, except a part of the wing, which was black, and they were much larger than the gray brant. November 17th, a fair cool morning and easterly wind. The tide rises at this place, eight feet six inches about one o'clock captain lewis returned after having coasted down haley's bay to cape disappointment and some distance to the north along the sea coast he was followed by several chinooks among whom were the principal chief and his family they made us a present of a boiled root very much like the common licorice in taste and size called kulwamo and in return we gave them articles of double its value we now learned, however, the danger of accepting anything from them, since nothing given in payment, even though ten times more valuable, would satisfy them. We were chiefly occupied in hunting, and were able to procure three deer, four brant, and two ducks, and also saw some signs of elk. Captain Clark now prepared for an excursion down the bay, and accordingly started. November 18th. At daylight, accompanied by eleven men, he proceeded along the beach one mile to a point of rocks about forty feet high, where the hills retired, leaving a wide beach and a number of ponds, 
covered with waterfowl, between which and the mountain there was a narrow bottom covered with alder and small balsam trees. Seven miles from the rocks was the entrance from the creek, or rather drain from the pond and hills, where was a cabin of Chinooks. The cabin contained some children and four women. They were taken across the creek in a canoe by two squaws, to each of whom they gave a fish hook, and then, coasting along the bay, passed at two miles the low bluff of a small hill, below which were the ruins of some old huts, and close to it the remains of a whale. The country was low, open, and marshy, interspersed with some high pine and with a thick undergrowth. Five miles from the creek they came to a stream, forty yards wide at low water, which they called Chinook River. The hills up this river and toward the bay were not high, but very thickly covered with large pine of several species. Proceeding along the shore, they came to a deep bend, appearing to afford a good harbor, and here the natives told them that European vessels usually anchored. About two miles farther on they reached Cape Disappointment, an elevated circular knob, says the journal, rising with a steep ascent one hundred and fifty or one hundred and sixty feet above the water, formed like the whole shore of the bay, as well as of the sea coast, and covered with thick timber on the inner side, but open and grassy on the exposure next the sea. From this cape a high point of land bears south twenty degrees west, about twenty-five miles distant. In the range between these two eminences is the opposite point of the bay, a very low ground which has been variously called Cape Ron by Le Perouse and Point Adams by Vancouver. The water for a great distance off the mouth of the river appears very shallow, and within the mouth nearest to Point Adams is a large sandbar, almost covered at high tide. November 19th. In the evening it began to rain, and continued until eleven o'clock. Two hunters were sent out in the morning to kill something for breakfast, and the rest of the party, after drying their blankets, soon followed. At three miles they overtook the hunters and breakfasted on a small deer which they had been fortunate enough to kill. This, like all those that we saw on the coast, was much darker than our common deer. Their bodies, too, are deeper, their legs shorter, and their eyes larger. The branches of the horns are similar, but the upper part of the tail is black, from the root to the end, and they do not leap, but jump like a sheep frightened. Continuing along five miles farther, they reached a point of high land, below which is a sandy point extended in a direction north 19 degrees west to another high point 20 miles distant. To this they gave the name of Point Lewis. They proceeded four miles farther along the sandy beach to a small pine tree, on which Captain Clark marked his name, with the year and day, and then set out to return to the camp where they arrived the following day, having met a large party of Chinooks coming from it. November 21st. The morning was cloudy, and from noon till night it rained. The wind, too, was high from the southeast, and the sea so rough that the water reached our camp. Most of the Chinooks returned home, but we were visited in the course of the day by people of different bands in the neighborhood, among whom were the Chilts, a nation residing on the seacoast near Point Lewis, and the Clapsops, who live immediately opposite, on the south side of the Columbia. A chief from the Grand Rapid also came to see us, and we gave him a medal. To each of our visitors we made a present of a small piece of ribbon, and purchased some cranberries, and some articles of their manufacture, such as mats and household furniture, for all of which we paid high prices. End of chapter 18 Chapter 19 of Young People's Treasury, Volume 6, Famous Travels and Adventures by Hamilton Wright Maybe. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Betty B. Arctic Perils by Elijah Kent Kane. In launching the Hope from the frail and perishing ice wharf on which we found our first refuge from the gale, she was precipitated into the sledge below, carrying away rail and bulwark, losing overboard our best shotgun, Bonsall's favorite, and worst of all, 
that universal favorite our kettle soup kettle paste kettle tea kettle water kettle in one i may mention before i pass that the kettle found its substitute and successor in the remains of a tin can which a good aunt of mine had filled with ginger nuts two years before and which had long survived the condiments that once gave it dignity sweet are the uses of adversity our descent to the coast followed the margin of the fast ice after passing the crimson cliffs of sir john ross it wore almost the dress of a holiday excursion a rude one perhaps yet truly one in feeling our course except where a protruding glacier interfered with it was nearly parallel to the shore the birds along it were rejoicing in the young summer and when we halted it was upon some green clothed cape near a stream of water from the ice fields above our sportsmen would clamber up the cliffs and come back laden with little auks great generous fires of turf that cost nothing but the toil of gathering blazed merrily and our happy oarsmen after a long day's work made easy by the promise ahead would stretch themselves in the sunshine and dream happily away till called to the morning wash and prayers we enjoyed it the more for we all of us knew that it could not last this coast must have been a favorite region at one time with the natives a sort of eskimo eden we seldom encamped without finding the ruins of their habitations for the most part overgrown with lichens and exhibiting every mark of antiquity one of these in latitude seventy six degrees twenty minutes was once no doubt an extensive village cairns for the safe deposit of meat stood in long lines six or eight in a group and the huts built of large rocks faced each other as if disposed on a street or avenue the same reasoning which deduces the subsistence of the coast from the actual base of the temple of serapis proves that the depression of the greenland coast which i had detected as far north as Upernavik is also going on up here. Some of these huts were washed by the sea or torn away by the ice that had descended with the tides. The turf, too, a representative of very ancient growth, was cut even with the water's edge, giving sections two feet thick. I had not noticed before such unmistakable evidence of the depression of this coast. Its converse elevation I had observed to the north of Wastenholm Sound. The axis of oscillation must be somewhere in the neighborhood of latitude 77 degrees. We reached Cape York on the 21st of July after a tortuous but romantic travel through a misty atmosphere. Here the land leads ceased, with the exception of some small and scarcely practicable openings near the shore, which were evidently owing to the wind that prevailed for the time. Everything bore proof of the late development of the season. The red snow was a fortnight behind its time. A fast flow extended with numerous tongues far out to the south and east. The only question was between a new rest for the shore ices to open or a desertion of the coast and a trial of the open water to the west. I climbed the rocks a second time with Mr. McGarry and took a careful survey of the ice with my glass. The fast, as the whalers call the immovable shore ice, could be seen in a nearly unbroken sweep, passing by Bushnell's Island and joining the coast not far from where I stood. The outside flows were large and had evidently been not long broken, but it cheered my heart to see that there was one well-defined lead which followed the main flow until it lost itself to seaward. I called my officers together, explained to them the motives which governed me, and prepared to re-embark. The boats were hauled up, examined carefully and as far as our means permitted repaired the red eric was stripped of her outfit and cargo to be broken up for fuel when the occasion should come a large beacon cairn was built on an eminence open to view from the south and west and a red flannel shirt spared with some reluctance was hoisted as a pennant to draw attention to the spot here i deposited a succinct record of our condition and purposes and then directed our course south by west into the ice fields by degrees the ice through which we were moving became more and more impacted and it sometimes required all our ice knowledge to determine whether a particular lead was practicable or not 
the irregularities of the surface broken by hummocks and occasionally by larger masses made it difficult to see far ahead besides which we were often embarrassed by the fogs i was awakened one evening from a weary sleep in my fox skins to discover that we had fairly lost our way the officer at the helm of the leading boat misled by the irregular shape of a large iceberg that crossed his track had lost the main lead some time before and was steering shoreward far out of the true course the little canal in which he had locked us was hardly two boats lengths across and lost itself not far off in a feeble zigzag both behind and before us it was evidently closing and we could not retreat without apprising the men of our misadventure i ordered the boats hauled up and under pretense of drying the clothing and stores made a camp on the ice a few hours after the weather cleared enough for the first time to allow a view of the distance and mcgarry and myself climbed a berg some three hundred feet high for the purpose it was truly fearful we were deep in the recesses of the bay surrounded on all sides by stupendous icebergs and tangled flow pieces my sturdy second officer not naturally impressible and long accustomed to the vicissitudes of whaling life shed tears at the prospect there was one thing to be done cost what it might we must harness our sledges again and retrace our way to the westward one sledge had been already used for firewood the red eric to which it had belonged was now cut up and her light cedar planking laid upon the floor of the other boats and we went to work with the rue raddies as in the olden time it was not till the third toilsome day was well spent that we reached the berg that had bewildered our helmsman we hauled over its tongue and joyously embarked again upon a free lead with a fine breeze from the north our little squadron was now reduced to two boats the land to the northward was no longer visible and whenever i left the margin of the fast to avoid its deep sinuosities i was obliged to trust entirely to the compass we had at least eight days allowance of fuel on board but our provisions were running very low and we met few birds and failed to secure any larger game we saw several large seals upon the ice but they were too watchful for us and on two occasions we came upon the walrus sleeping once within actual lance thrust but the animal charged in the teeth of his assailant and made good his retreat on the twenty eighth i instituted a quiet review of the state of things before us our draft on the stores we had laid in at providence halt had been limited for some days to three raw eggs and two breasts of birds a day but we had a small ration of bread dust beside and when we halted as we did regularly for meals our fuel allowed us to indulge lavishly in the great panacea of arctic travel tea the men's strength was waning under this restricted diet but a careful reckoning up of our remaining supplies proved to me now that even this was more than we could afford ourselves without an undue reliance on the fortunes of the hunt our next land was to be cape shackleton one of the most prolific bird colonies of the coast which we were all looking to much as sailors nearing home in their boats after disaster and short allowance at sea but meeting out our stores through the number of days that must elapse before we could expect to share its hospitable welcome i found that five ounces of bread dust four of tallow and three of bird meat must from this time form our daily ration so far we had generally coasted the fast ice it had given us an occasional resting place and refuge and we were able sometimes to reinforce our stores of provisions by our guns but it made our progress tediously slow and our stock of small shot was so nearly exhausted that i was convinced our safety depended on increase of speed i determined to try the more open sea for the first two days the experiment was a failure we were surrounded by heavy fogs a southwest wind brought the outside pack upon us and obliged us to haul up on the drifting ice we were thus carried to the northward and lost about twenty miles my party much overworked felt despondingly the want of the protection of the land flows nevertheless i held to my purpose 
steering south-southwest as nearly as the leads would admit, and looking constantly for the thinning out of the pack that hangs around the western water. Although the low diet and exposure to wet had again reduced our party, there was no apparent relaxation of energy, and it was not until some days later that I found their strength seriously giving way. It is a little curious that the effect of a short allowance of food does not show itself in hunger. The first symptom is a loss of power, often so imperceptibly brought on that it becomes evident only by an accident. I well remember our look of blank amazement, as one day, the order being given to haul the hope over a tongue of ice, we found she would not budge. At first I thought it was owing to the wetness of the snow-covered surface in which her runners were, but as there was a heavy gale blowing outside, and I was extremely anxious to get her on to a larger flow to prevent being drifted off, I lightened her cargo and set both crews upon her. In the land of promise off Crimson Cliff such a force would have trundled her like a wheelbarrow. We could almost have borne her upon our backs." Now, with incessant labor and standing hauls, she moved at a snail's pace. The faith was left behind and barely escaped destruction. The outside pressure cleft the flow asunder, and we saw our best boat with all our stores drifting rapidly away from us. The sight produced an almost hysterical impression upon our party. Two days of want of bread, I am sure, would have destroyed us, and we had now left us but eight pounds of shot in all. To launch the hope again and rescue her comrade or share her fortunes would have been the instinct of other circumstances, but it was out of the question now. Happily, before we had time to ponder our loss, a flat cake of ice eddied round near the flow we were upon. McGarry and myself sprang to it at the moment and succeeded in floating it across the chasm in time to secure her. The rest of the crew rejoined her only by scrambling over the crushed ice as we brought her in at the hummock lines. Things grew worse and worse with us. The old difficulty of breathing came back again, and our feet swelled to such an extent that we were obliged to cut open our canvas boots. But the symptom which gave me most uneasiness was our inability to sleep. A form of low fever which hung by us when at work had been kept down by the thoroughness of our daily rest. All my hopes of escape were in the refreshing influences of the halt. It must be remembered that we were now in the open bay, in the full line of the great ice drift to the Atlantic, and in boats so frail and unseaworthy as to require constant bailing to keep them afloat. It was at this crisis of our fortunes that we saw a large seal floating, as is the custom of these animals, on a small patch of ice, and seemingly asleep. It was an usuk, and so large that I at first mistook it for a walrus. Signal was made for the hope to follow astern, and, trembling with anxiety, we prepared to crawl down upon him. Peterson, with the large English rifle, was stationed in the bow, and stockings were drawn over the oars as mufflers. As we neared the animal, our excitement became so intense that the men could hardly keep stroke. I had a set of signals for such occasions, which spared us the noise of the voice, and when about three hundred yards off the oars were taken in, and we moved in deep silence with a single skull astern. He was not asleep, for he reared his head when we were almost within rifle shot, and to this day I can remember the hard, careworn, almost despairing expression of the men's thin faces as they saw him move. Their lives depended on his capture. I depressed my hand nervously as a signal for Peterson to fire. McGarry hung upon his oar, and the boat, slowly but noiselessly sagging ahead, seemed to me within certain range. Looking at Peterson, I saw that the poor fellow was paralyzed by his anxiety, trying vainly to obtain a rest for his gun against the cutwater of the boat. The seal rose on his fore flippers, gazed at us for a moment with frightened curiosity, and coiled himself for a plunge. At that instant, simultaneously with the crack of our rifle, he relaxed his long length on the ice, and at the very brink of the water, his head fell helpless to one side. I would have ordered another shot, but no discipline could have controlled the men. With a wild yell, each vociferating according to his own impulse, 
they urged both boats upon the floe. A crowd of hands seized the seal and bore him up to safer ice. The men seemed half crazy. I had not realized how much we were reduced by absolute famine. They ran over the floe, crying and laughing and brandishing their knives. It was not five minutes before every man was sucking his bloody fingers or mouthing long strips of raw blubber. Not an ounce of this seal was lost. The intestines found their way into the soup kettles without any observance of the preliminary home processes. The cartilaginous parts of the four flippers were cut off in the melee and passed round to be chewed upon, and even the liver, warm and raw as it was, bade fair to be eaten before it had seen the pot. That night, on the large halting floe, to which, in contempt of the dangers of drifting, we happy men had hauled our boats, two entire planks of the Red Eric were devoted to a grand cooking fire, and we enjoyed a rare and savage feast. This was our last experience of the disagreeable effects of hunger. In the words of George Stephenson, the charm was broken and the dogs were safe. The dogs I have said little about, for none of us liked to think of them. The poor creatures, Tudla and Whitey, had been taken with us as last resources against starvation. They were, as McGarry worded it, meat on the hoof, and able to carry their own fat over the flows. Once, near weary man's rest, I had been on the point of killing them, but they had been the leaders of our winner's team, and we could not bear the sacrifice. I need not detail our journey any farther. Within a day or two we shot another seal, and from that time forward had a full supply of food. Two days after this, a mist had settled down upon the islands which embayed us, and when it lifted we found ourselves rowing in lazy time under the shadow of Carcamut. Just then a familiar sound came to us over the water. We had often listened to the screeching of the gulls or the bark of the fox and mistaken it for the huck of the Eskimo, but this had about it an inflection not to be mistaken, for it died away in the familiar cadence of an halloo. Listen, Peterson, oars, men, what is it? And he listened quietly at first, and then trembling said in a half-whisper, Danamarkers. I remember this, the first tone of Christian voice which had greeted our return to the world. How we all stood up and peered into the distant nooks, and how the cry came to us again, just as, having seen nothing, we were doubting whether the whole was not a dream. And then how, with long sweeps, the white ash cracking under the spring of the rowers, we stood for the cape that the sound proceeded from, and how nervously we scanned the green spots which our experience, grown now into instinct, told us would be the likely camping ground of wayfarers. By and by, for we must have been pulling a good half hour, the single mast of a small shallop showed itself, and Peterson, who had been very quiet and grave, burst into an incoherent fit of crying, only relieved by broken exclamations of mingled Danish and English. "'Tis the Upernavik oil-boat, the Fräulein Fleischer, Carly Mawson, the assistant cooper, must be on his road to Kingatuck for blubber. The Marianne, the one annual ship has come, and Carly Mawson, and here he did it all over again, gulping down his words and wringing his hands. It was Carly Mawson, sure enough. The quiet routine of a Danish settlement is the same year after year, and Peterson had hit upon the exact state of things. The Marianne was at Proven, and Carly Mawson had come up in the Fräulein Fleischer to get the year's supply of blubber from Kingatok. End of section 19Chapter 20 of Young People's Treasury, Volume 6, Famous Travels and Adventures by Hamilton Wright Maybe. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Betty B. Life and Scenery in Venezuela by Alexander von Humboldt. We returned to the valley of Aragua and stopped at the farm of Barbula. We had heard of a tree called the cow tree, the sap of which is a nourishing milk and here we found one. When incisions are made in the trunk of this tree, it yields abundance of a glutinous milk, tolerably thick, devoid of all acridity, and of an agreeable and balmy smell. It was offered to us in the shell of a calabash. 
we drank considerable quantities of it in the evening before we went to bed and very early in the morning without feeling the least injurious effect the glutinous character of this milk alone renders it a little disagreeable the negroes and the free people who work in the plantation drink it dipping it into their bread of maize or cassava the overseer of the farm told us that the negroes grow sensibly fatter during the season when the palo de vaca furnishes them with most milk the juice exposed to the air presents at its surface membranes of a strongly animalized substance yellowish stringy and resembling cheese amidst the great number of curious phenomena which i have observed in the course of my travels i confess there are few that have made so powerful an impression on me as the aspect of the cow tree whatever relates to milk or to corn inspires an interest which is not merely that of the physical knowledge of things but is connected with another order of ideas and sentiments we can scarcely conceive how the human race could exist without farinaceous substances and without that nourishing juice which the breast of the mother contains and which is appropriated to the long feebleness of the infant the amylaceous matter of corn the object of religious veneration among so many nations ancient and modern is diffused in the seeds and deposited in the roots of vegetables milk which serves as an aliment appears to us exclusively the produce of animal organization such are the impressions we have received in our earliest infancy such is also the source of that astonishment created by the aspect of the tree just described it is not here the solemn shades of forests the majestic course of rivers the mountains wrapped in eternal snow that excite our emotion a few drops of vegetable juice recall to our minds all the powerfulness and the fecundity of nature on the barren flank of a rock grows a tree with coriaceous and dry leaves its large woody roots can scarcely penetrate into the stone for several months of the year not a single shower moistens its foliage its branches appear dead and dried but when the trunk is pierced there flows from it a sweet and nourishing milk it is at the rising of the sun that this vegetable fountain is most abundant the negroes and natives are then seen hastening from all quarters furnished with large bowls to receive the milk which grows yellow and thickens at its surface some empty their bowls under the tree itself others carry the juice home to their children the sun was almost at its zenith the earth wherever it appeared sterile and destitute of vegetation was at the temperature of one hundred twenty degrees not a breath of air was felt at the height at which we were on our mules yet in the midst of this apparent calm whirls of dust incessantly arose driven on by those small currents of air which glide only over the surface of the ground and are occasioned by the difference of temperature between the naked sand and the spots covered with grass all around us the plains seemed to ascend to the sky and the vast and profound solitude appeared like an ocean covered with seaweed on the horizon the earth was confounded with the sky through the dry mist and strata of vapor the trunks of palm trees were seen from afar stripped of their foliage and their verdant summits and looking like the masts of a ship descried upon the horizon there is something awful as well as sad and gloomy in the uniform aspect of these steps everything seems motionless scarcely does a small cloud passing across the zenith and denoting the approach of the rainy season cast its shadow on the earth i know not whether the first aspect of the lanos excites less astonishment than that of the chain of the andes when beneath the vertical rays of the bright and cloudless sun of the tropics the parched sward crumbles into dust then the indurated soil cracks and bursts as if rent asunder by some mighty earthquake and if at such a time two opposite currents of air by conflict moving in rapid gyrations come in contact with the earth a singular spectacle presents itself like funnel-shaped clouds their apexes touching the earth the sand rises in vapory form through the rarefied air in the electrically charged center of the whirling current 
sweeping on like the rushing water spout which strikes such terror from the heart of the mariner a dim and sallow light gleams from the lowering sky over the dreary plain the horizon suddenly contracts and the heart of the traveller sinks with dismay as the wide steppe seems to close upon him on all sides the hot and dusty earth forms a cloudy veil which shrouds the heavens from view and increases the stifling oppression of the atmosphere while the east wind when it blows over the long heated soil instead of cooling adds to the burning glow gradually too the pools of water which had been protected from evaporation by the now seared foliage of the fan palm disappear as in the icy north animals became torpid from cold so here the crocodile and the boa constrictor lie wrapped in unbroken sleep deeply buried in the dried soil everywhere the drought announces death yet everywhere the thirsty wanderer is deluded by the phantom of a moving undulating watery surface created by the deceptive play of the mirage a narrow stratum separates the ground from the distant palm trees which seem to hover aloft owing to the contact of currents of air having different degrees of heat and therefore of density shrouded in dark clouds of dust and tortured by hunger and burning thirst oxen and horses scour the plain the one bellowing dismally the other with outstretched necks snuffing the wind in the endeavor to detect by the moisture of the air the vicinity of some pool of water not yet wholly evaporated the mule more cautious and cunning adopts another method of allaying his thirst there is a globular and articulated plant the mellow cactus which encloses under its prickly integument an aqueous pulp after carefully striking away the prickles with his forefeet the mule cautiously ventures to apply his lips to imbibe the cooling thistle juice but the draught from this living vegetable spring is not always unattended by danger and these animals are often observed to have been lamed by the puncture of the cactus thorn even if the burning heat of day be succeeded by the cool freshness of the night here always of equal length the wearied ox and horse enjoy no repose huge bats now attack the animals during sleep and vampire-like suck their blood or fastening on their backs raise festering wounds in which mosquitoes hippoboscus and a host of other stinging insects burrow and nestle when after a long drought the genial season of rain arrives the scene suddenly changes the deep azure of the hitherto cloudless sky assumes a lighter hue scarcely can the dark space in the constellation of the southern cross be distinguished at night the mild phosphorescence of the magellanic clouds fades away like some distant mountain a single cloud is seen rising perpendicularly on the southern horizon misty vapors collect and gradually overspread the heavens while distant thunder proclaims the approach of the vivifying rain scarcely is the surface of the earth moistened before the teeming steppe becomes covered with a variety of grasses excited by the power of light the herbaceous mimosa unfolds its dormant drooping leaves hailing as it were the rising sun in chorus with the matin song of the birds and the opening flowers of aquatic plants horses and oxen buoyant with life and enjoyment roam over and crop the plains the luxuriant grass hides the beautifully spotted jaguar who lurking in safe concealment and carefully measuring the extent of his leap darts like the asiatic tiger with a cat-like bound upon his passing prey at times according to the accounts of the natives the human clay on the banks of the morasses is seen to rise slowly in broad flakes accompanied with a violent noise as on the eruption of a small mud volcano the upheaved earth is hurled high into the air those who are familiar with the phenomenon fly from it for a colossal water snake or a mailed and scaly crocodile awakened from its trance by the first fall of rain is about to burst from its tomb when the rivers bounding the plain to the south as the araka the apur and the payara gradually overflow their banks nature compels those creatures to live as amphibious animals 
which during the first half of the year were perishing with thirst on the waterless and dusty plain a part of the steppe now presents the appearance of a vast inland sea the mares retreat with their foals to the higher banks which project like islands above the spreading waters day by day the dry surface diminishes in extent the cattle crowded together and deprived of pasturage swim for hours about the inundated plain seeking a scanty nourishment from the flowing panicles of the grasses which rise above the lurid and bubbling waters many foals are drowned many are seized by crocodiles crushed by their serrated tails and devoured horses and oxen may not unfrequently be seen which have escaped from the fury of this bloodthirsty and gigantic lizard bearing on their legs the marks of its pointed teeth below the mission of santa barbara de aracuna we pass the night as usual in the open air on a sandy flat on the bank of the apur skirted by the impenetrable forest we had some difficulty in finding dry wood to kindle the fires with which it is here customary to surround the bivouac as a safeguard against the attacks of the jaguar the air was bland and soft and the moon shone brightly several crocodiles approached the bank and i have observed that fire attracts these creatures as it does our crabs and many other aquatic animals the oars of our boats were fixed upright in the ground to support our hammocks deep stillness prevailed only broken at intervals by the blowing of the fresh-water dolphins which are peculiar to the river network of the orinoco after eleven o'clock such a noise began in the contiguous forest that for the remainder of the night all sleep was impossible the wild cries of animals rang through the woods among the many voices which resounded together the indians could only recognize those which after short pauses were heard singly there was the monotonous plaintive cry of the howling monkeys the whining flute-like notes of the small sapajus the grunting murmur of the striped nocturnal ape the fitful roar of the great tiger the cougar or maneless american lion the peccary the sloth and a host of parrots paraquas and other pheasant-like birds whenever the tigers approached the edge of the forest our dog who before had barked incessantly came howling to seek protection under the hammocks sometimes the cry of the tiger resounded from the branches of a tree and was always then accompanied by the plaintive piping tones of the apes who were endeavoring to escape from the unwanted pursuit if one asks the indians why such a continuous noise is heard on certain nights they answer with a smile that the animals are rejoicing in the beautiful moonlight and celebrating the return of the full moon to me the scene appeared rather to be owing to an accidental long continued and gradually increasing conflict among the animals thus for instance the jaguar will pursue the peccaries and the tapers which densely crowded together burst through the barrier of tree-like shrubs which opposes their flight terrified at the confusion the monkeys on the tops of the trees join their cries with those of the larger animals this arouses the tribes of birds who build their nests in communities and suddenly the whole animal world is in a state of commotion further experience taught us that it was by no means always the festival of moonlight that disturbed the stillness of the forest for we observed that the voices were loudest during violent storms of rain or when the thunder echoed and the lightning flashed through the depths of the wood the good-natured franciscan monk who accompanied us through the cataracts of apures and maypures to san carlos on the rio negro and to the brazilian frontier used to say when apprehensive of a storm at night may heaven grant a quiet night both to us and to the wild beasts of the forest the new canoe intended for us was like all indian boats a trunk of a tree hollowed out partly by the hatchet and partly by fire it was forty feet long and three broad three persons could not sit in it side by side these canoes are so crank and they require from their instability a cargo so equally distributed that when you want to rise for an instant you must warn the rowers to lean to the opposite side 
without this precaution the water would necessarily enter the side pressed down it is difficult to form an idea of the inconveniences that are suffered in such wretched vessels to gain something in breadth a sort of lattice work had been constructed on the stern with branches of trees that extended on each side beyond the gunwale unfortunately the toldo or roof of leaves that covered this lattice work was so low that we were obliged to lie down without seeing anything or if seated to sit nearly double the necessity of carrying the canoe across the rapids and even from one river to another and the fear of giving too much hold to the wind by making the toldo higher render this construction necessary for vessels that go up toward the rio negro the toldo was intended to cover four persons lying on the deck or lattice work of brushwood but our legs reached far beyond it and when it rained half our bodies were wet our couches consisted of ox hides or tiger skins spread upon branches of trees which were painfully felt through so thin a covering the fore part of the boat was filled with indian rowers furnished with paddles three feet long in the form of spoons they were all naked seated two by two and they kept time in rowing with a surprising uniformity singing songs of a sad and monotonous character the small cages containing our birds and our monkeys the number of which augmented as we advanced were hung some to the toldo and others to the bow of the boat this was our travelling menagerie every night when we established our watch our collection of animals and our instruments occupied the centre around these were placed first our hammocks then the hammocks of the indians and on the outside were the fires which are thought indispensable against the attacks of the jaguar about sunrise the monkeys in our cages answered the cries of the monkeys of the forest in a canoe not three feet wide and so encumbered there remained no other place for the dried plants trunks sextant a dipping needle and the meteorological instruments than the space below the lattice work of branches on which we were compelled to remain stretched the greater part of the day if we wished to take the least object out of a trunk or to use an instrument it was necessary to row ashore and land to these inconveniences were joined the torment of the mosquitoes which swarmed under the toldo and the heat radiated from the leaves of the palm trees the upper surface of which was continually exposed to the solar rays we attempted every instant but always without success to amend our situation while one of us hid himself under a sheet to ward off the insects the other insisted on having green wood lighted beneath the toldo in the hope of driving away the mosquitoes by the smoke the painful sensations of the eyes and the increase of heat already stifling rendered both these contrivances alike impracticable with some gaiety of temper with feelings of mutual good will and with a vivid taste for the majestic grandeur of these vast valleys of rivers travellers easily support evils that become habitual the lower strata of air from the surface of the ground to the height of fifteen or twenty feet are absolutely filled with venomous insects if in an obscure spot for instance in the grottoes of the cataracts formed by super incumbent blocks of granite you direct your eyes towards the opening enlightened by the sun you see clouds of mosquitoes more or less thick i doubt whether there be a country upon earth where man is exposed to more cruel torments in the rainy season having passed the fifth degree of latitude you are somewhat less stung but on the upper orinoco the stings are more painful because the heat and the absolute want of wind render the air more burning and more irritating in its contact with the skin how comfortable people must be in the moon said a salive indian to father gumilla she looks so beautiful and so clear that she must be free from mosquitoes these words which denote the infancy of a people are very remarkable the satellite of the earth appears to all savage nations the abode of the blessed the country of abundance the eskimo who counts among his riches a plank or the trunk of a tree thrown by the currents on a coast destitute of vegetation sees in the moon plains covered with forests 
the Indian of the forest of Orinoco there beholds open savannas, where the inhabitants are never stung by mosquitoes. It would be difficult for me to express the satisfaction we felt on landing at Agostoro, the capital of Spanish Guiana. The inconveniences endured at sea in small vessels are trivial in comparison with those that are suffered under a burning sky, surrounded by swarms of mosquitoes and lying stretched in a canoe, without the possibility of taking the least bodily exercise. In seventy-five days, we had performed a passage of five hundred leagues, twenty to a degree, on the five great rivers, Apur, Orinoco, Atabapo, Rio Negro, and Cassiquiare, and in this vast extent we had found but a very small number of inhabited places. Coming from an almost desert country, we were struck with the bustle of the town, though it contained only six thousand inhabitants. We admired the conveniences which industry and commerce furnished to civilized man. Humble dwellings appeared to us magnificent, and every person with whom we conversed seemed to be endowed with superior intelligence. Long privations give a value to the smallest enjoyments, and I cannot express the pleasure we felt when we saw for the first time wheat and bread on the governor's table. End of chapter 20 this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 21 of Young People's Treasury, Volume 6 Famous Travels and Adventures by Hamilton Wright Maybe. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Spanish Life in Granada by Theophile Gautier we often went to San Domingo to sit beneath the shade of the laurels and bathe in a pool, near which, if the satirical songs are to be believed, the monks used to lead no very reputable sort of life. It is a remarkable fact that the most Catholic countries are always those in which the priests and monks are treated most cavalierly. The Spanish songs and stories about the clergy rival in license the facetiae of Rabelais and Beryl de Verville, and to judge by the manner in which all the ceremonies of the church are parodied in the old pieces, one would hardly think that the Inquisition ever existed. Talking of baths, I will here relate a little incident which proves that the thermal art, carried to so high a degree of perfection by the Arabs, has lost much of its former splendor in Granada. Our guide took us to some baths that appeared very well managed, the rooms being situated round a patio, shaded by a covering of vine leaves, while a large reservoir of very limpid water occupied the greater part of the patio. So far all was well, but of what do you think the baths themselves were made? Of copper, zinc, stone, or wood? Not a bit of it. You are wrong. I will tell you at once, for you will never guess. They were enormous clay jars, like those made to hold oil. These novel baths were about two-thirds buried in the ground. Before putting ourselves in them, we had the inside covered with a clean cloth, a piece of precaution which struck the attendant as something so extremely strange, and which astonished him so profoundly, that we were obliged to repeat the order several times before he would obey it. He explained this whim of ours to his own satisfaction by shrugging his shoulders and shaking his head in a commiserative manner as he pronounced in a low voice the one word, Inglese. There we sat, squatted down in our oil jars with our heads stuck out at the top, peasants en terrine, cutting rather grotesque figures. It was on this occasion that I understood, for the first time, the story of Ali Baba and the Forty Thieves, which had always struck me as being rather difficult to believe, and had made me for an instant doubt the veracity of the Thousand and One Nights. There are also, in the Albacin, some old Moorish baths, and a pond covered over with a vaulted roof, pierced by a number of little holes in the shape of stars, but they are not in working order, and you can get nothing but cold water. This is about all that is to be seen at Granada during a stay of some weeks. Public amusements are scarce. The theater is closed during the summer. The bullfights do not take place at any fixed periods. 
There are no clubs or establishments of this description, and the Lyceum is the only place where it is possible to see the French and other foreign papers. On certain days there is a meeting of the members, when they read papers on various subjects as well as poetry, besides singing and playing pieces generally written by some young author of the company. Everyone employs his time, most conscientiously, in doing nothing. Gallantry, cigarettes, the manufacture of quatrains and octaves, and especially card-playing, are found sufficient to fill up a man's existence very agreeably. In Granada you see nothing of that furious restlessness, that necessity for action and change of place, which torments the people of the North. The Spanish struck me as being very philosophical. They attach hardly any importance to national life, and are totally indifferent about comfort. The thousand factious wants created by the civilization of northern countries appear to them puerile and troublesome refinements. Not having to protect themselves continually against the climate, the advantages of the English home have no attractions in their eyes. What do people who would cheerfully pay for a breeze or a draft of air, if they could obtain such a thing, care whether or not the windows close properly? Favored by a beautiful sky, they have reduced human existence to its simplest expression. This sobriety and moderation in everything enables them to enjoy a large amount of liberty. A state of extreme independence, they have time enough to live, which we cannot say that we have. Spaniards cannot understand how a man can labor first in order to rest afterwards. They very much prefer pursuing an opposite course, and I think that by so doing they show their superior sense. A workman who has earned a few reals leaves his work, throws his fine embroidered jacket over his shoulders, takes his guitar, and goes and dances, or makes love to the mahas of his acquaintance until he has not a single quarto left. He then returns to his employment. An Andalusian can live splendidly for three or four sous a day. For this sum, he can have the whitest bread, an enormous slice of watermelon, and a small glass of aniseed, while his lodgings cost him nothing more than the trouble of spreading his cloak upon the ground under some portico or the arch of some bridge. As a general rule, Spaniards consider work something humiliating and unworthy of a free man which in my opinion is a natural and very reasonable idea, since heaven, wishing to punish man for his disobedience, found no greater infliction than the obliging him to gain his daily bread by the sweat of his brow. Pleasures procured as ours are by dint of labor, fatigue and mental anxiety, and perseverance, strike Spaniards as being brought much too dearly. Like all people who lead a simple life, approaching a state of nature, they possess a correctness of judgment which makes them despise the artificial enjoyments of society. Anyone coming from Paris or London, those two whirlpools of devouring activity, of feverish and unnaturally excited energy, is greatly surprised by the mode of life of the people of Granada, a mode of life that is all leisure, filled up with conversation, siestas, promenades, music, and dancing. The stranger is astonished at the happy calmness the tranquil dignity of the faces he sees around him. No one has that busy look which is noticeable in the persons hurrying through the streets of Paris. Everyone strolls leisurely along, choosing the shady side of the street, stopping to chat with his friends, and betraying no desire to arrive at his destination in the shortest possible time. The certitude of not being able to make money extinguishes all ambition. There is no chance of a young man making a brilliant career. The most adventurous among them go to Manila or Havana or enter the army, but on account of the piteous state of the public finances, they sometimes wait for years without hearing anything about pay. Convinced of the inutility of exertion, Spaniards do not endeavor to make fortunes, for they know that such things are quite out of the question, and they therefore pass their time in a delightful state of idleness, favored by the beauty of the country and the heat of the climate. I saw nothing of Spanish pride. Nothing is so deceptive as the reputation bestowed on individuals and nations. On the contrary, I found them exceedingly simple-minded and good-natured. Spain is the true country of equality, if not in words, at least in deeds. 
the poorest beggar lights his papalito at the puro of a powerful nobleman who allows him to do so without the slightest affectation of condescension a marchioness will step with a smile over the bodies of the ragged vagabonds who are slumbering across the threshold and when travelling will not make a face if compelled to drink out of the same glass as the mayoral the zagul and the escopitero of the diligence foreigners find great difficulty in accustoming themselves to this familiarity especially the english who have their letters brought upon salvers and take them with tongs an englishman travelling from seville to jerez told his calicero to go and get his dinner in the kitchen the calicero who in his own mind thought he was honouring a heretic very highly by sitting down at the same table with him did not make the slightest remark but concealed his rage as carefully as the villain in a melodrama but about three or four leagues from jerez in the midst of a frightful desert full of quagmires and bushes he threw the englishman very neatly out of the vehicle shouting to him as he whipped on his horse my lord you did not think me worthy of sitting at your table and i don jose balbrino bustamente y orozco do not think you good enough to sit on the seat in my callison good evening the servants both male and female are treated with a gentle familiarity very different from our affected civility which seems every moment to remind them of the inferiority of their condition a short example will prove the truth of this assertion we had gone to a party given at the country house of the signora in the evening there was a general desire to have a little dancing but there were a great many more ladies than gentlemen present to obviate this difficulty the signora sent for the gardener and another servant who danced the whole evening without the least awkwardness false bashfulness or servile forwardness but just as if they had been on a perfect equality with the rest of the company they invited in turn the fairest and most noble ladies present and the latter complied with their request in the most graceful manner possible our democrats are very far from having attained this practical equality and our most determined republicans would revolt at the idea of figuring in a quadrille opposite a peasant or a footman of course there are a great many exceptions to these remarks as there are to all other generalities there are doubtless many spaniards who are active laborious and sensible to all the refinements of life but what i have said conveys the general impression felt by a traveller after a stay of some little time an impression which is often more correct than that of a native observer who is less struck by the novelty of the various circumstances ascent of the sierra nevada as our curiosity was satisfied with regard to granada and its buildings we resolved from having had a view of the sierra nevada at every turn we took to become more intimately acquainted with it and endeavour to ascend the mulhasen which is the most elevated point of the range our friends at first attempted to dissuade us from this project which was really attended with some little danger but on seeing that our resolution was fixed they recommended us a huntsman whose name was alejandro romero as a person thoroughly acquainted with the mountains and possessing every qualification to act as guide he came and saw us at our casa de pupilos and his manly frank physiognomy immediately prepossessed us in his favour he wore an old velvet waistcoat a red woollen sash and white linen gaiters like those of the valencians which enabled you to see his clean-made nervous legs tanned like cordovan leather alpargatas of twisted rope served him for shoes while a little andalusian hat which had grown red from exposure to the sun slung across his shoulder completed his costume he undertook to make all the necessary preparations for our expedition and promised to bring at three o'clock the next morning the four horses we required one for my travelling companion one for myself a third for a young german who had joined our caravan and a fourth for our servant who was entrusted with the direction of the culinary department as for romero he was to walk our provisions consisted of a ham some roast fowls some chocolate bread lemons sugar and a large leathern sack called a bota filled with excellent val de penas 
which was the principal article in the list at the appointed hour the horses were before our house while romero was hammering away at the door with the butt end of his carbine still scarcely awake we mounted our steeds and the procession set forth our guide running on beforehand to point out the road although it was already light the sun had not risen and the undulating outlines of the smaller hills which we had passed were spread out all around us cool limpid and blue like the waves of an immovable ocean in the distance granada had disappeared beneath the vaporized atmosphere when the fiery globe at last appeared on the horizon all the hilltops were covered with a rosy tint like so many young girls at the sight of their lovers and appeared to experience a feeling of bashful confusion at the idea of having been seen in their morning deshabille the ridges of the mountains are connected with the plain by gentle slopes forming the first tableland which is easily accessible when we reached this place our guide decided that we should allow our horses a little breathing time give them something to eat and breakfast ourselves we ensconced ourselves at the foot of a rock near a little spring the water of which was as bright as a diamond and sparkled beneath the emerald-colored grass romero with all the dexterity of an american savage improvised a fire with a handful of brushwood while louis prepared some chocolate which with the addition of a slice of ham and a draught of wine composed our first meal in the mountains while our breakfast was cooking a superb viper passed beside us and appeared surprised and dissatisfied at our installing ourselves on his estate a fact that he gave us to understand by impolitely hissing at us for which he was rewarded by a sturdy thrust with a sword stick through the stomach a little bird that had watched the proceedings very attentively no sooner saw the viper disabled than it flew up with the feathers of its neck standing on end its eyes all fire and flapping its wings and piping in a strange state of exultation every time that any portion of the venomous beast writhed convulsively the bird shrunk back soon returning to the charge however and pecking the viper with its beak after which it would rise in the air about three or four feet i do not know what the serpent could have done during its lifetime to the bird or what was the feeling of hatred we had gratified by killing the viper but it is certain that i never beheld such an amount of delight we once again set out from time to time we met a string of little asses coming down from the higher parts of the mountains with their load of snow which they were carrying to granada for the day's consumption the drivers saluted us as they passed by with the time-honored vayan ustedes con dios and we replied by some joke about their merchandise which would never accompany them as far as the city and which they would be obliged to sell to the official who was entrusted with the duty of watering the public streets we were always preceded by romero who leaped from stone to stone with the agility of a chamois and kept exclaiming bueno camino a good road i should certainly very much like to know what the worthy fellow would call a bad road for as far as i was concerned i could not perceive the slightest signs of any road at all to our right and left as far as the eye could distinguish yawned delightful abysses very blue very azure and very vapory varying in depth from one thousand five hundred to two thousand feet a difference however about which we troubled ourselves very little for a few dozen fathoms more or less made very little difference in the matter i recollect with a shudder a certain pass three or four pistol shots long and two broad a sort of natural plank running between two gulfs as my horse headed the procession i had to pass first over this kind of tightrope which would have made the most determined acrobats pause and reflect at certain points there was just enough width for my horse's feet and each of my legs was dangling over a separate abyss i sat motionless in my saddle as upright as if i had been balancing a chair on the end of my nose this pass which took us a few minutes to traverse struck me as particularly long when i quietly reflect on this incredible ascent i am lost in surprise as at the remembrance of some incoherent dream we passed over spots where a goat would have hesitated to have set its foot and scaled precipices so steep that the ears of our horses touched our chins 
our road lay between rocks and blocks of stone which threatened to fall down upon us every moment and in zigzags along the edge of the most frightful precipices we took advantage of every favorable opportunity and although advancing slowly we still advanced gradually approaching the goal of our ambition namely the summit that we had lost sight of since we had been in the mountains because each separate piece of tableland hides the one above it every time our horses stopped to take breath we turned round in our saddles to contemplate the immense panorama formed by the circular canvas of the horizon the mountain tops which lay below us looked as if they had been marked out in a large map the vega of granada and all andalusia presented the appearance of an azure sea in the midst of which a few white points that caught the rays of the sun represented the sails of the different vessels the neighboring eminences that were completely bare and cracked and split from top to bottom were tinged in the shade a greenish color egyptian blue lilac and pearl gray while in the sunshine they assumed a most admirable and warm hue similar to that of orange peel tarnished gold or a lion's skin nothing gives you so good an idea of a chaos of a world still in the course of creation as a mountain range seen from its highest point it seems as if a nation of titans had been endeavoring to build a sacrilegious babel some prodigious lilac or other that they had heaped together all the materials and commenced the gigantic terraces when suddenly the breath of some unknown being had like a tempest swept over the temples and palaces they had begun shaking their foundations and leveling them with the ground you might fancy yourself amidst the ruins of an antediluvian babylon a pre-adamite city the enormous blocks the pharaoh-like masses awaken in your breast thoughts of a race of giants that has now disappeared so visibly is the old age of the world written in deep wrinkles on the bald front and rugged face of these millennial mountains we had reached the region inhabited by the eagles several times at a distance we saw one of these noble birds perched upon a solitary rock with its eye turned toward the sun and immersed in that state of contemplative ecstasy which with animals replaces thought there was one of them floating at an immense height above us and seemingly motionless in the midst of a sea of light romero could not resist the pleasure of sending him a visiting card in the shape of a bullet it carried away one of the large feathers of his wing but the eagle nothing moved continued on his way with indescribable majesty as if nothing had happened the feather whirled round and round a long time before reaching the earth it was picked up by romero who stuck it in his hat thin streaks of snow now began to show themselves scattered here and there in the shade the air became more rarefied and the rocks more steep and precipitous soon afterward the snow appeared in immense sheets and enormous heaps which the sun was no longer strong enough to melt we were above the sources of the gruil which we perceived like a blue ribbon frosted with silver streaming down with all possible speed in the direction of its beloved city the tableland on which we stood is about nine thousand feet above the level of the sea and is the highest spot in the range with the exception of the peak of valletta and the mulhasen which towers another thousand feet towards the immeasurable height of heaven on this spot romero decided we should pass the night the horses who were worn out with fatigue were unsaddled lewis and the guide tore up a quantity of brushwood roots and juniper plants to make a fire for although in the plain the thermometer stood at thirty or thirty-five degrees there was a freshness on the heights we then occupied which we knew would settle down into intense cold as soon as the sun had set it was about five o'clock in the afternoon my companion and the young german determined to take advantage of the daylight that remained to scale alone and on foot the last heights of the mountain for my own part i preferred stopping behind my soul was moved by the grand and sublime spectacle before me and i busied myself with scribbling in my pocket-book sundry verses which if not well turned 
had at least the merit of being the only alexandrines composed at such an elevation after my strophes were finished i manufactured some sorbets with snow sugar lemon and brandy for our dessert our encampment presented rather a picturesque appearance our saddles served us for seats and our cloaks for a carpet while a large heap of snow protected us from the wind a fire of broom blazed brightly in the centre and we fed it by throwing in from time to time a fresh branch which shrivelled up and hissed darting out its sap in little streams of all colours above us the horses stretched forward their thin heads with their sad gentle eyes and caught an occasional puff of warmth night was rapidly approaching the least elevated mountains were the first to sink into obscurity and the light like a fisherman flying before the rising tide leaped from peak to peak retiring to the highest in order to escape from the shade which was advancing from the valleys beneath and bearing everything in its bluish waves the last ray which stopped on the summit of the mulhasen hesitated for an instant then spreading out its golden wings winged its way like some birds of flame into the depths of heaven and disappeared the obscurity was now complete and the increased brilliancy of our fire caused a number of grotesque shadows to dance out upon the sides of the rocks eugene and the german had not returned and i began to grow anxious on their account i feared that they might have fallen down some precipice or been buried beneath some mass of snow romero and lewis already requested me to sign a declaration to the effect that they had neither murdered nor robbed the two worthy gentlemen and that if the latter were dead it was their own fault meanwhile we tore our lungs to pieces by indulging in the most shrill and savage cries to let them know the position of our wigwam in case they should not be able to perceive the fire at last the report of firearms which was hurled back by all the echoes of the mountains told us that we had been heard and that our companions were but a short distance off in fact at the expiration of a few minutes they made their appearance fatigued and worn out asserting that they had distinctly seen africa on the other side of the ocean it is very possible they had done so for the air of these parts is so pure that the eye can perceive objects at the distance of thirty or forty leagues we were all very merry at supper and by dint of playing the bagpipes with our skin of wine we made it almost as flat as the wallet of a castilian beggar it was agreed that each of us should sit up in turn to attend the fire an arrangement which was faithfully carried out but the circumference of our circle which was at first pretty considerable kept becoming smaller and smaller every hour the cold became more intense and at last we literally laid ourselves in the fire itself so as to burn our shoes and pantaloons lewis gave vent to his feelings in loud exclamation he bewailed his gazpacho cold garlic soup his house his bed and even his wife he made himself a formal promise by everything he reverenced never to be caught a second time attempting an ascent he asserted that mountains are far more interesting when seen from below and that a man must be a maniac to expose himself to the chance of breaking every bone in his body a hundred thousand times and having his nose frozen off in the middle of the month of august in andalusia and in sight of africa all night long he did nothing but grumble and groan in the same manner and we could not succeed in reducing him to silence romero said nothing and yet his dress was made of thin linen and all that he had to wrap round him was a narrow piece of cloth at last the dawn appeared we were enveloped in a cloud and romero advised me to begin our descent if we wished to reach granada before night when it was sufficiently light to enable us to distinguish the various objects i observed that eugene was as red as a lobster nicely boiled and at the same time he made an analogous observation with respect to me and did not feel himself bound to conceal the fact the young german and lewis were also equally red romero alone had preserved his peculiar tint which resembled by the way that of a boot-top and although his legs of bronze were naked they had not undergone the slightest alteration it was the biting cold and the rarefaction of the air 
that had turned us this color. Going up a mountain is nothing because you look at the objects above you, but coming down with the awful depths before your eyes is quite a different affair. At first the thing appeared impracticable, and Lewis began screeching like a jay who is being picked alive. However, we could not remain forever in the Mulhasen, which is as little adapted for the purpose of habitation as any place in the known world. And so, with Romero at our head, we began our descent. It would be impossible, without laying ourselves open to the charge of exaggeration, to convey any notion of the paths, or rather the absence of paths, by which our daredevil of a guide conducted us. Never more breakneck obstacles crowded together in the course marked out for any steeplechase, and I entertained strong doubts as to whether the feats of any gentlemen riders ever outrivaled our exploits on the Mulhasen. The Montaigne Russe were mild declivities in comparison to the precipices with which we had to do. We were almost constantly standing up in our stirrups and leaning back over the cruppers of our horses in order to avoid performing an incessant succession of parabolas over their heads. All the lines of perspective seemed jumbled together. The streams appeared to be flowing up toward their source. The rocks vacillated and staggered on their bases, and the most distant objects appeared to be only two paces off. We had lost all feeling of proportion, an effect which is very common in the mountains, where the enormous size of the masses and the vertical position of the different ranges do not allow of your judging distances in the ordinary manner. In spite of every difficulty, we reached Granada without our horses, having even made one false step, only they had got but one shoe left among them all. Andalusian horses, and ours were of the most authentic description, cannot be equaled for mountain traveling. They are so docile, so patient, and so intelligent that the best thing the rider can do is to throw the reins on their necks and let them follow their own impulse. We were impatiently expected, for our friends in the city had seen our fire burning like a beacon on the tableland of Mulhasen. I wanted to go and give an account of our perilous expedition to the charming Signora's B, but was so fatigued that I fell asleep on a chair, holding my stocking in my hand, and I did not wake before ten o'clock the following morning, when I was still in the same position. Some few days afterward we quitted Granada, sighing quite as deeply as ever King Boabdil did. End of chapter 21、Chapter、Twenty Two of Young People's Treasury, Volume Six. Famous Travels and Adventures by Hamilton Wright Maybe. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Betty B. Old Rotterdam by Edmondo de Amicis. As we neared Rotterdam, it rained and was foggy. We could see, as through a veil, only an immense confusion of ships, houses, windmills, towers, trees, and people in motion on the dikes and bridges. There were lights everywhere. A great city with such an aspect as I had never seen before, and which fog and darkness soon hid from me altogether. When I had taken leave of my travelling companions and had put my luggage in order, it was night. So much the better, I thought, as I entered a carriage. I shall see the first Dutch city by night, which must be a strange spectacle. And indeed, when Monsieur Bismarck was at Rotterdam, he wrote to his wife that at night he saw spectres on the roofs. It is difficult to make much of the city of Rotterdam, entering it at night. The carriage passed almost immediately over a bridge that resounded hollowly beneath it, and while I thought myself, and was in fact within the city, I saw with amazement on my right and left two rows of ships vanishing in the gloom. Leaving the bridge, we passed through a street, lighted and full of people, and found ourselves upon another bridge, and between two rows of vessels as before, and so on from bridge to street, from street to bridge. And to increase the confusion, an illumination of lamps at the corners of houses, lanterns on masts of ships, lighthouses on the bridges, small lights under the houses, and all these lights reflected in the water. All at once the carriage stopped, 
People crowded about. I looked out and saw a bridge in the air. In answer to my question, someone said that a vessel was passing. We went on again, seeing a perspective of canals and bridges, crossing and recrossing each other, until we came to a great square, sparkling with lights and bristling with masts of ships, and finally we reached our inn in an adjacent street. My first care on entering my room was to see whether Dutch cleanliness deserved its fame. It did indeed, and may be called the religion of cleanliness. The linen was snow-white, the windows transparent as the air, the furniture shining like a crystal, the floor so clean that a microscope could not discover a black speck. There was a basket for waste paper, a tablet for scratching matches, a dish for cigar ashes, a box for cigar stumps, a spittoon, and a bootjack. In short, there was no possible pretext for soiling anything. My room examined, I spread a map of Rotterdam upon the table, and made some preparatory studies for the morrow. It is a singular thing that the great cities of Holland, although built upon a shifting soil and amid difficulties of every kind, have all great regularity of form. Amsterdam is a semicircle, the Hague Square, Rotterdam an equilateral triangle. The base of the triangle is an immense dike, which defends the city from the Meuse, and is called the Bumpfes, signifying in Dutch small trees from a row of little elms, now very tall, that were planted when it was first constructed. Another great dike forms a second bulwark against the river, which divides the city into two almost equal parts, and from the middle of the left side to the opposite angle. That part of Rotterdam which is comprised between the dikes is all canals, islands, and bridges, and is the new city. That which extends beyond the second dike is the old city. Two great canals extend along the other two sides of the town to the apex, where they meet, and receive the waters of the river Rot, which, with the affix of dam, or dike, gives its name to the city. Having thus fulfilled my conscientious duty as a traveler, and with many precautions not to soil, even by a breath, the purity of that jewel of a chamber, I abandoned myself with humility to my first Dutch bed. Dutch beds, I speak of those in the hotels, are generally short and wide, and occupied in a great part by an immense feather pillow, in which a giant's head would be overwhelmed. I may add that the ordinary light is a copper candlestick, of the size of a dinner plate, which might sustain a torch, but holds instead a tiny candle, about the size of a Spanish lady's finger. In the morning, I made haste to rise and issue forth into the strange streets, unlike anything in Europe. The first I saw was the Hoogstraat, a long, straight thoroughfare running along the interior dike. The unplastered houses of every shade of brick, from the darkest red to light rose color, chiefly two windows wide and two stories high, have the front wall rising above and concealing the roof, and in the shape of a blunt triangle surmounted by a parapet. Some of these pointed facades rise into two curves, like a long neck without a head. Some are cut into steps like the houses that children build with blocks. Some present the aspect of a conical pavilion, some of a village church some of theatrical cabins. The parapets are in general surrounded by white stripes, coarse arabesques in plaster, and other ornaments in very bad taste. The doors and windows are bordered by broad white stripes. Other white lines divide the different stories. The spaces between the doors in front are marked by white wooden panels, so that two colors, white and red, prevail everywhere and as in the distance the darker red looks black, the prospect is half festive, half funereal, all the houses looking as if they were hung with white linen. At first I had an inclination to laugh, for it seemed impossible that it could have been done seriously, and that quite sober people lived in those houses. They looked as if they had been run up for a festival, and would presently disappear, like the paper framework of a great display of fireworks. While I stood looking vaguely at the street, I noticed one house that puzzled me somewhat, and, thinking that my eyes had been deceived, I looked more carefully at it, 
and compared it with its neighbors turning into the next street the same thing met my astonished gaze there is no doubt about it the whole city of rotterdam presents the appearance of a town that has been shaken smartly by an earthquake and is on the point of falling into ruin all the houses in any street one may count the exceptions on his fingers lean more or less but the greater part of them so much that at the roof they lean forward at least a foot beyond their neighbors which may be straight or not so visibly inclined one leans forward as if it would fall into the street another backward another to the left another to the right at some point six or seven contiguous houses all lean forward together those in the middle most those at the ends less looking like a paling with the crowd pressing against it at another point two houses lean together as if supporting one another in certain streets the houses for a long distance lean all one way like trees beaten by a prevailing wind and then another long row will lean in the opposite direction as if the wind had changed sometimes there is a certain regularity of inclination that is scarcely noticeable and again at crossings and in the smallest streets there is an indescribable confusion of lines a real architectural frolic a dance of houses a disorder that seems animated there are houses that nod forward as if asleep others that start backward as if frightened some bending toward each other their roofs almost touching as if in secret conference some falling upon one another as if they were drunk some leaning backward between others that lean forward like malefactors dragged onward by their guards rows of houses that courtesy to a steeple groups of small houses all inclined toward one in the middle like conspirators in conclave observe them attentively one by one from top to bottom and they are interesting as pictures in some upon the summit of the facade there projects from the middle of the parapet a beam with cord and pulley to pull up baskets and buckets in others jutting from a round window is the carved head of a deer a sheep or a goat under the head a line of whitewashed stone or wood cuts the whole facade in half under this line there are two broad windows with projecting awnings of striped linen under these again over the upper panes a little green curtain below this green curtain two white ones divided in the middle to show a suspended bird cage or a basket of flowers and below the basket or the cage the lower panes are covered by a network of fine wire that prevents the passer-by from seeing into the room within behind the netting there stands a table covered with objects in porcelain crystal flowers and toys of various kinds outside on the stone sill is a row of small flower pots from the stone sill or from one side projects an iron stem curving upward which sustains two small mirrors joined in the form of a book movable and surmounted by another also movable so that those inside the house can see without being seen everything that passes in the street on some of the houses there is a lamp projecting between the two windows and below is the door of the house or a shop door if it is a shop over the door there is the carved head of a moor with his mouth wide open or that of a turk with a hideous grimace sometimes there is an elephant or a goose sometimes a horse's or a bull's head a serpent a half moon a windmill or an arm extended the hand holding some object of the kind sold in the shop if it is the house door always kept closed there is a brass plate with the name of the occupant another with a slit for letters another with the handle of a bell the whole including the locks and bolts shining like gold before the door there is a small bridge of wood because in many of the houses the ground floor or basement is much lower than the street and before the bridge two little stone columns surmounted by two balls two more columns in front of these are united by iron chains the large links of which are in the form of crosses stars and polygons in the space between the street and the house are pots of flowers and at the windows of the ground floor more flower pots and curtains 
in the more retired streets there are bird cages on both sides of the windows boxes full of green growing things clothes hung out to air or dry a thousand objects and colors like a universal fair but without going out of the older town one need only to go away from the center to see something new at every step in some narrow straight streets one may see the end suddenly closed as if by a curtain concealing the view but it disappears as it came and is recognized as the sail of a vessel moving in a canal in other streets a network of cordage seems to stop the way the rigging of vessels lying in some basin in one direction there is a drawbridge raised and looking like a gigantic swing provided for the diversion of the people who live in those preposterous houses and in another there is a windmill tall as a steeple and black as an antique tower moving its arms like a monstrous firework on every side finally among the houses above the roofs between the distant trees are seen masts of vessels flags and sails and rigging reminding us that we are surrounded by water and that the city is a seaport meantime the shops were opened and the streets became full of people there was great animation but no hurry the absence of which distinguishes the streets of rotterdam from those of london between which some travellers find great resemblance especially in the colour of the houses and the grave aspect of the inhabitants white faces pallid faces faces the colour of parmesan cheese light hair very light hair reddish yellowish broad beardless visages beards under the chin and around the neck blue eyes so light as to seem almost without a pupil women stumpy fat rosy slow with white caps and earrings in the form of corkscrews these are the first things one observes in the crowd but for the moment it was not the people that first stimulated my curiosity i crossed the hoog street and found myself in the new city here it is impossible to say if it be port or city if land or water predominate if there are more ships than houses or vice versa broad and long canals divide the city into so many islands united by drawbridges turning bridges and bridges of stone on either side of every canal extends a street flanked by trees on one side and houses on the other all these canals are deep enough to float large vessels and all full of them from one end to the other except a space in the middle left for passage in and out an immense fleet imprisoned in a city when i arrived it was the busiest hour so i planted myself upon the highest bridge over the principal crossing from thence were visible four canals four forests of ships bordered by eight files of trees the streets were crammed with people and merchandise droves of cattle were crossing the bridges bridges were rising in the air or opening in the middle to allow vessels to pass through and were scarcely replaced or closed before they were inundated by a throng of people carts and carriages ships came and went in the canals shining like models in a museum and with the wives and children of the sailors on the decks boats darted from vessel to vessel the shops drove a busy trade servant women washed the walls and windows and all this moving life was rendered more gay and cheerful by the reflections in the water the green of the trees the red of the houses the tall windmills showing their dark tops and white sails against the azure of the sky and still more by an air of quiet simplicity not seen in any other northern city i took observations of a dutch vessel almost all the ships crowded in the canals of rotterdam are built for the rhine and holland they have one mast only and are broad stout and variously colored like toy ships the hull is generally of a bright grass green ornamented with a red or a white stripe or sometimes several stripes looking like a band of different colored ribbons the poop is usually gilded the deck and mast are varnished and shining like the cleanest of house floors the outside of the hatches the buckets the barrels the yards the planks are all painted red with white or blue stripes the cabin where the sailors families are is colored like a chinese kiosk and has its windows of clear glass and its white muslin curtains tied up with knots of rose-colored ribbon 
in every moment of spare time sailors women and children are busy washing sweeping polishing every part with infinite care and pans and when their little vessel makes its exit from the port all fresh and shining like a holiday coach they all stand on the poop and accept with dignity the mute compliments which they gather from the glances of the spectators along the canals from canal to canal and from bridge to bridge i finally reach the dyke of the boomjus upon the moss where boils and bubbles all the life of the great commercial city on the left extends a long row of small many-colored steamboats which start every hour in the day for dordrecht arnhem gonda schiedam brilla zealand and continually send forth clouds of white smoke and the sound of their cheerful bells to the right lie the large ships which make the voyage to various european ports mingled with fine three-masted vessels bound for the east indies with names written in golden letters java sumatra borneo samarang carrying the fancy to those distant and savage countries like the echoes of distant voices in front the moss covered with boats and barks and the distant shore with a forest of beech trees windmills and towers and over all the unquiet sky full of gleams of light and gloomy clouds fleeting and changing in their constant movement as if repeating the restless labor on the earth below end of chapter twenty two chapter twenty three of young people's treasury volume six famous travels and adventures by hamilton wright maybe this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by betty b on the road in russia by d mackenzie wallace whilst i was considering how i could get beyond the sphere of west european languages a friend came to my assistance and suggested that i should go to his estate in the province of novgorod where i should find an intelligent amiable parish priest quite innocent of any linguistic acquirements this proposal i at once adopted and accordingly found myself one morning at a small station of the moscow railway endeavoring to explain to a peasant in sheep's clothing that i wished to be conveyed to ivanovka the village where my future teacher lived at that time i still spoke russian in a very fragmentary and confused way pretty much as spanish cows are popularly supposed to speak french my first remark therefore being literally interpreted was ivanovkov horses you can the point of interrogation was expressed by a simultaneous raising of the voice and the eyebrows ivanovkov said the peasant in an interrogatory tone of voice in russia as in other countries the peasantry when speaking with strangers like to repeat questions apparently for the purpose of gaining time ivanovkov i replied now now after some reflection the peasant nodded and said something which i did not understand but which i assumed to mean that he was open to consider proposals for transporting me to my destination rubles how many to judge by the knitting of the brows and the scratching of the head i should say that that question gave occasion to a very abstruse mathematical calculation gradually the look of concentrated attention gave place to an expression such as children assume when they endeavor to get a parental decision reversed by means of coaxing then came a stream of soft words which were to me utterly unintelligible how many i repeated ten said the peasant in a hesitating apologetic way as if he were more than half ashamed of what he was saying ten i exclaimed indignantly two enough and waving my hand to indicate that i should be no party to such a piece of extortion i re-entered the station as i reached the door i heard him say master master eight but i took no notice of the proposal i must not weary the reader with a detailed account of the succeeding negotiations which were conducted with extreme diplomatic caution on both sides as if a cession of territory or the payment of a war contribution had been the subject of discussion three times he drove away and three times returned 
each time he abated his pretensions and each time i slightly increased my offer at last when i began to fear that he had finally taken his departure and had left me to my own devices he re-entered the room and took up my baggage indicating thereby that he agreed to my last offer the sum agreed upon four roubles would have been under ordinary circumstances more than sufficient for the distance which was only about twenty miles but before proceeding far i discovered that the circumstances were by no means ordinary and i began to understand the pantomimic gesticulation which had puzzled me during the negotiations heavy rain had fallen without interruption for several days and now the track on which we were travelling could not without poetical license be described as a road in some parts it resembled a watercourse in others a quagmire and at least during the first half of the journey i was constantly reminded of that stage in the work of creation when the water was not yet separated from the dry land during the few moments when the work of keeping my balance and preventing my baggage from being lost did not engross all my attention i speculated on the possibility of constructing a boat carriage to be drawn by a swift-footed hippopotamus or some other animal that feels itself at home equally on land and in water on the whole the project seemed to me then as useful and as feasible as fourier's idea of making whales play the part of tug steamers fortunately for us our two lean wiry little horses did not object to being used as aquatic animals they took the water bravely and plunged through the mud in gallant style the telega in which we were seated a four-wheeled skeleton cart did not submit to the ill treatment so silently it creaked out its remonstrances and entreaties and at the more difficult spots threatened to go to pieces but its owner understood its character and capabilities and paid no attention to its ominous threats once indeed a wheel came off but it was soon fished out of the mud and replaced and no further casualty occurred the horses did their work so well that when about midday we arrived at a village i could not refuse to let them have some rest and refreshment all the more as my own thoughts had begun to turn in that direction the village as villages in that part of the country generally consisted of two long parallel rows of wooden houses the road if a stratum of mud more than a foot in depth can be called by that name formed the intervening space all the houses turned their gables to the road and some of them had pretensions to architectural decoration in the form of rude perforated woodwork between the houses and in a line with them were great wooden gates and high wooden fences separating the courtyards from the road into one of these yards near the farther end of the village our horses turned of their own accord an inn i said in an interrogative voice the driver shook his head and said something in which i detected the word friend evidently there was no hostelry for man and beast in the village and the driver was using a friend's house for the purpose the yard was flanked on the one side by an open shed containing rude agricultural implements which might throw some light on the agriculture of the primitive aryans and on the other side by the dwelling house and stable both the house and stable were built of logs nearly cylindrical in form and placed in horizontal tiers two of the strongest of human motives hunger and curiosity impelled me to enter the house at once without waiting for an invitation i went up to the door half protected against the winter snows by a small open portico and unceremoniously walked in the first apartment was empty but i noticed a low door in the wall to the left and passing through this entered the principal room as the scene was new to me i noted the principal objects in the wall before me were two small square windows looking out upon the road and in the corner to the right nearer to the ceiling than to the floor was a little triangular shelf on which stood a religious picture before the picture hung a curious oil lamp in the corner to the left of the door was a gigantic stove built of brick and whitewashed from the top of the stove to the wall on the right stretched what might be called an enormous shelf six or eight feet in breadth 
this is the so-called palati as i afterward discovered and serves as a bed for part of the family the furniture consisted of a long wooden bench attached to the wall on the right a big heavy deal table and a few wooden stools whilst i was leisurely surveying these objects i heard a noise on the top of the stove and looking up perceived a human face with long hair parted in the middle and a full yellow beard i was considerably astonished by this apparition for the air in the room was stifling and i had some difficulty in believing that any created being except perhaps a salamander or a negro could exist in such a position i looked hard to convince myself that i was not the victim of a delusion as i stared the head nodded slowly and pronounced the customary form of greeting i returned the greeting slowly wondering what was to come next ill very ill sighed the head i'm not astonished at that i remarked in an aside if i were where you are i should be very ill too hot very hot i remarked interrogatively Nichevo, that is to say not particularly this remark astonished me all the more as i noticed at that very moment that the body to which the head belonged was enveloped in a sheepskin after living some time in russia i was no longer surprised by such incidents for i soon discovered that the russian peasant has a marvellous power of bearing extreme heat as well as extreme cold when a coachman takes his master or mistress to the theatre or to a party he never thinks of going home and returning at an appointed time hour after hour he sits placidly on the box and though the cold be of an intensity such as is never experienced in our temperate climate he can sleep as tranquilly as the lazarone at midday in naples in that respect the russian peasant seems to be first cousin to the polar bear but unlike the animals of the arctic regions he is not at all incommoded by excessive heat on the contrary he likes it when he can get it and never omits an opportunity of laying in a reserve supply of calorie he even delights in rapid transitions from one extreme to the other as is amply proved by a curious custom which deserves to be recorded the reader must know that in the life of the russian peasantry the weekly vapor bath plays a most important part it is even a certain religious signification for no good orthodox peasant would dare to enter a church after being soiled by certain kinds of pollution without cleansing himself physically and morally by means of the bath in the weekly arrangements it forms the occupation for saturday afternoon and care is taken to avoid thereafter all pollution until after the morning service on sunday many villages possess a public or communal bath of the most primitive construction but in some parts of the country i am not sure how far the practice extends the peasants take their vapor bath in the household oven in which the bread is baked in all cases the operation is pushed to the extreme limit of human endurance far beyond the utmost limit that can be endured by those who have not been accustomed to it from childhood for my own part i only made the experiment once and when i informed my attendant that my life was in danger from congestion of the brain he laughed outright and told me that the operation had only begun most astounding of all and this brings me to the fact which led me into this digression the peasants in winter often rush out of the bath and roll themselves in snow this aptly illustrates a common russian proverb which says that what is health to the russian is death to the german end of chapter twenty three chapter twenty four of young people's treasury volume six famous travels and adventures by hamilton wright maybe this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by betty b perils of alpine climbing by edward whymper we started from zermatt on the thirteenth of july at half past five on a brilliant and perfectly cloudless morning we were eight in number crows old peter and his two sons lord francis douglas haddow hudson and i to ensure steady motion one tourist and one native walked together the youngest togwalder fell to my share and the lad marched well 
proud to be on the expedition and happy to show his powers. The wine bags also fell to my lot to carry, and throughout the day, after each drink, I replenished them secretly with water, so that at the next halt they were found fuller than before. This was considered a good omen, and little short of miraculous. On the first day we did not intend to ascend to any great height, and we mounted accordingly very leisurely, picked up the things which were left in the chapel at Schwarzy at 8.20, and proceeded thence along the ridge connecting the Hornley with the Matterhorn. At half-past eleven we arrived at the base of the actual peak, then quitted the ridge and clambered round some ledges on to the eastern face. We were now fairly upon the mountain, and were astonished to find that places which from the Riffel, or even from the Fergengletscher, looked entirely impracticable, were so easy that we could run about. Before twelve o'clock we had found a good position for the tent, at a height of eleven thousand feet. Crows and young Peter went on to see what was above, in order to save time on the following morning. They cut across the heads of the snow slopes, which descended toward the Fergengletscher, and disappeared round a corner, but shortly afterward we saw them high up on the face, moving quickly. We others made a solid platform for the tent in a well-protected spot, and then watched eagerly for the return of the men. The stones which they upset told that they were very high, and we supposed that the way must be easy. At length, just before 3 p.m., we saw them coming down, evidently much excited. What are they saying, Peter? Gentlemen, they say it is no good. But when they came near, we heard a different story. Nothing but what was good. Not a difficulty, not a single difficulty. We could have gone to the summit and returned today easily. We passed the remaining hours of daylight, some basking in the sunshine, some sketching or collecting, and when the sun went down, giving, as it departed, a glorious promise for the morrow, we returned to the tent to arrange for the night. Hudson made tea, I coffee, and we then retired each one to his blanket bag. The Togwalders, Lord Francis Douglas and myself occupying the tent, the others remaining by preference outside. Long after dusk the cliffs above echoed with our laughter and with the songs of the guides, for we were happy that night in camp and feared no evil. We assembled together outside the tent before dawn on the morning of the 14th, and started directly it was light enough to move. Young Peter came on with us as a guide, and his brother returned to Zermatt. We followed the route which had been taken on the previous day, and in a few minutes turned the rib which had intercepted the view of the eastern face from our tent platform. The whole of this great slope was now revealed, rising for three thousand feet like a huge natural staircase. Some parts were more and others were less easy, but we were not once brought to a halt by any serious impediment, for when an obstruction was met in front, it could always be turned to the right or to the left. For the greater part of the way, there was indeed no occasion for the rope, and sometimes Hudson led, sometimes myself. At 6.20 we had attained a height of 12,800 feet, and halted for half an hour. We then continued the ascent without a break until 9.55, when we stopped for 50 minutes at a height of 14,000 feet. Twice we struck the northeastern ridge and followed it for some little distance, to no advantage, for it was usually more rotten and steep, and always more difficult than the face. Still we kept near to it, lest stones perchance might fall. We had now arrived at the foot of that part which, from the Riffelberg, or from Zermatt, seems perpendicular, or overhanging, and could no longer continue upon the eastern side. For a little distance we ascended by snow upon the arete, that is, the ridge, descending toward Zermatt, and then by common consent turned over to the right, or to the northern side. Before doing so, we made a change in the order of ascent. Crows went first, I followed, Hudson came third, Haddow and old Peter were last. Now, said Crows as he led off, now for something altogether different. The work became difficult and required caution. In some places there was little to hold, and it was desirable that those should be in front who were least likely to slip. The general slope of the mountain at this part was less than forty degrees 
and snow had accumulated in and had filled up the interstices of the rock face leaving only occasional fragments projecting here and there these were at times covered with a thin film of ice produced from the melting and refreezing of the snow it was the counterpart on a small scale of the upper seven hundred feet of the point des Ecrins. only there was this material difference the face of the Ecrins was about or exceeded an angle of fifty degrees and the matterhorn face was less than forty degrees it was a place over which any fair mountaineer might pass in safety and mr hudson ascended this part and as far as i know the entire mountain without having the slightest assistance rendered to him upon any occasion sometimes after i had taken a hand from crows or received a pull i turned to offer the same to hudson but he invariably declined saying it was not necessary mr haddow however was not accustomed to this kind of work and required continual assistance it is only fair to say that the difficulty which he found at this part arose simply and entirely from want of experience this solitary difficult part was of no great extent we bore away over it at first nearly horizontally for a distance of about four hundred feet then ascended directly toward the summit for about sixty feet and then doubled back to the ridge which descends toward zermatt a long stride round a rather awkward corner brought us to snow once more the last doubt vanished the matterhorn was ours nothing but two hundred feet of easy snow remained to be surmounted you must now carry your thoughts back to the seven italians who started from Bruy on the eleventh of july four days had passed since their departure and we were tormented with anxiety lest they should arrive on the top before us all the way up we had talked of them and many false alarms of men on the summit had been raised the higher we rose the more intense became the excitement what if we should be beaten at the last moment the slope eased off at length we could be detached and crows and i dashing away ran a neck-and-neck -neck race which ended in a dead heat at one forty p m the world was at our feet and the matterhorn was conquered hurrah not a footstep could be seen it was not yet certain that we had not been beaten the summit of the matterhorn was formed of a rudely level ridge about three hundred and fifty feet long and the italians might have been at its farther extremity i hastened to the south end scanning the snow right and left eagerly hurrah again it was untrodden where were the men i peered over the cliff half doubting half expectant i saw them immediately mere dots on the ridge at an immense distance below up went my arms and my hat crows crows come here where are they monsieur there don't you see them down there ah the coquin they are low down crows we must make those fellows hear us we yelled until we were hoarse the italian seemed to disregard us we could not be certain crows we must make them hear us they shall hear us i seized a block of rock and hurled it down and called upon my companion in the name of friendship to do the same we drove our sticks in and pried away the crags and soon a torrent of stones poured down the cliffs there was no mistake about it this time the italians turned and fled still i would that the leader of that party could have stood with us at that moment for our victorious shouts conveyed to him the disappointment of the ambition of a lifetime he was the man of all those who attempted the ascent of the matterhorn who most deserved to be the first upon its summit he was the first to doubt its inaccessibility and he was the only man who persisted in believing that its ascent would be accomplished it was the aim of his life to make the ascent from the side of italy for the honor of his native valley for a time he had the game in his hands he played it as he thought best but he made a false move and lost it times have changed with carrel his supremacy is questioned in the val tournanche new men have arisen and he is no longer recognized as the chasseur above all others but so long as he remains the man that he is to-day it will not be easy to find his superior the others had arrived so we went back to the northern end of the ridge crows now took the tent pole and planted it in the highest snow yes we said there is a flagstaff but where is the flag here it is he answered 
pulling off his blouse and fixing it to the stick. It made a poor flag, and there was no wind to float it out, yet it was seen all around. They saw it at Zermatt, at the Riffel, in the Val Tournanche. At Bruy, the watchers cried, Victory is ours! They raised bravos for Carrel and vivas for Italy, and hastened to put themselves en fête. On the morrow they were undeceived. All was changed. The explorers returned, sad, cast down, disheartened, confounded, gloomy. It is true, said the men. We saw them ourselves. They hurled stones at us. The old traditions are true. There are spirits on the top of the Matterhorn. We returned to the southern end of the ridge to build a cairn, and then paid homage to the view. The day was one of those superlatively calm and clear ones which usually precede bad weather. The atmosphere was perfectly still and free from all clouds or vapors. Mountains fifty, nay, a hundred miles off, look sharp and near. All their details, ridge and crag, snow and glacier, stood out with faultless definition. Pleasant thoughts of happy days and bygone years came up unbidden as we recognized the old familiar forms. All were revealed. Not one of the principal peaks of the Alps was hidden. I see them clearly now, the great inner circles of giants, backed by the ranges, chains, and massifs. First came the Dent Blanche, hoary and grand, the gable horn and pointed Rothhorn, and then the peerless Weisshorn, the towering Michel Bellhorner, flanked by the Alelalen Horn, Strahlhorn, and Rimp Fishhorn, then Monterosa, with its many spitzes, the Liscom and the Brighthorn. Behind were the Bernese Oberland, governed by the Finsterhorn, the Simplon, and St. Goddard groups, the Disgracia, and the Orteller. Toward the south we looked down to Chavazzo, on the plain of Piedmont, and far beyond. The Viso, one hundred miles away, seemed close upon us. The Maritime Alps, one hundred and thirty miles distant, were free from haze. Then came my first love, the Pelvou, the Ecrin, and the Meige, the clusters of the Grayon, and lastly, in the west, gorgeous in the full sunlight, rose the Monarque Val, Mont Blanc. Ten thousand feet beneath us were the green fields of Zermatt, dotted with chalets from which blue smoke rose lazily. Eight thousand feet below, on the other side, were the pastures of Breuil. There were forests black and gloomy, and meadows bright and lively, bounding waterfalls and tranquil lakes, fertile lands and savage wastes, sunny plains and frigid plateau. There were the most rugged forms and the most graceful outlines, bold perpendicular cliffs and gentle undulating slopes, rocky mountains and snowy mountains, somber and solemn or glittering and white, with walls, turrets, pinnacles, pyramids, domes, cones, and spires. There was every combination that the world can give and every contrast that the heart could desire. We remained on the summit for one hour, one crowded hour of glorious life. It passed away too quickly, and we began to prepare for the descent. On another occasion, Mr. Wimper had a dangerous fall, which he describes as follows. Generally speaking, the angles on the Matterhorn are too steep to allow the formation of considerable beds of snow, but here there is a corner which permits it to accumulate, and it is turned to gratefully, for by its assistance one can ascend four times as rapidly as upon the rocks. The tower was now almost out of sight, and I looked over the central Pennine Alps to the Grand Combin and to the chain of Mont Blanc. My neighbor, the Dont d'Arin, still rose above me, although but slightly, and the height which had been attained could be measured by its help. So far I had no doubt about my capacity to descend that which had been ascended, but in a short time on looking ahead I saw that the cliffs steepened, and I turned back, without pushing on to them and getting into inextricable difficulties, exulting in the thought that they would be passed when we returned together, and that I had without assistance got nearly to the height of the Dent d'Arin, and considerably higher than any one had been before. My exultation was a little premature. About 5 p.m. I left the tent again, and thought myself as good as at Broy. The friendly rope and claw had done good service, and had smoothed all the difficulties. I lowered myself through the chimney, 
however by making a fixture of the rope which i then cut off and left behind as there was enough and to spare my axe had proved a great nuisance in coming down and i left it in the tent it was not attached to the baton but was a separate affair an old navy boarding axe while cutting up the different snow beds on the ascent the baton trailed behind fastened to the rope and when climbing the axe was carried behind run through the rope tied round my waist and was sufficiently out of the way but in descending when coming down face outward as is always best where it is possible the head or the handle of the weapon caught frequently against the rocks and several times nearly upset me so out of laziness if you will it was left in the tent i paid dearly for this imprudence the col de lyon was passed and fifty yards more would have placed me on the great staircase down which one can run but on arriving at an angle of the cliffs of the tete du lion while skirting the upper edge of the snow which abuts against them i found that the heat of the two past days had nearly obliterated the steps which had been cut when coming up the rocks happened to be impracticable just at this corner so nothing could be done except to make steps afresh the snow was too hard to beat or tread down and at the angle it was all but ice half a dozen steps only were required and then the ledges could be followed again so i held to the rock with my right hand and prodded at the snow with the point of my stick until a good step was made and then leaning round the angle did the same for the other side so far well but in attempting to pass the corner to the present moment i cannot tell how it happened i slipped and fell the slope was steep on which this took place and descended to the top of a gully that led down through two subordinate buttresses toward the glacier de lyon which was just seen a thousand feet below the gully narrowed and narrowed until there was a mere thread of snow lying between two walls of rock which came to an abrupt termination at the top of a precipice that intervened between it and the glacier imagine a funnel cut in half through its length placed at an angle of forty-five degrees with its point below and its concave side uppermost and you will have a fair idea of the place the knapsack brought my head down first and i pitched into some rocks about a dozen feet below they caught something and tumbled me off the edge head over heels into the gully the baton was dashed from my hands and i whirled downward in a series of bounds each longer than the last now over ice now into rocks striking my head four or five times each time with increased force the last bound sent me spinning through the air in a leap of fifty or sixty feet from one side of the gully to the other and i struck the rocks luckily with the whole of my left side they caught my clothes for a moment and i fell back on to the snow with motion arrested my head fortunately came the right side up and a few frantic catches brought me to a halt in the neck of the gully and on the verge of the precipice baton hat and veil skimmed by and disappeared and the crash of the rocks which i had started as they fell onto the glacier told how narrow had been the escape from utter destruction as it was i fell nearly two hundred feet in seven or eight bounds ten feet more would have taken me in one gigantic leap of eight hundred feet on to the glacier below the situation was still sufficiently serious the rocks could not be let go for a moment and the blood was spurting out of more than twenty cuts the most serious ones were in the head and i vainly tried to close them with one hand while holding on with the other it was useless the blood jerked out in blinding jets at each pulsation at last in a moment of inspiration i kicked out a big lump of snow and stuck it as a plaster on my head the idea was a happy one and the flow of blood diminished then scrambling up i got not a moment too soon to a place of safety and fainted away the sun was setting when consciousness returned and it was pitch dark before the great staircase was descended but by a combination of luck and care the whole forty eight hundred feet of descent to bruy was accomplished without a slip or once missing the way i slunk past the cabin of the cowherds who were talking and laughing inside utterly ashamed of the state to which i had been brought by my imbecility and entered the inn stealthily wishing to escape to my room unnoticed 
but favre met me in the passage demanded who is it screamed with fright when he got a light and aroused the threshold two dozen heads then held solemn council over mine with more talk than action the natives were unanimous in recommending that hot wine synonym vinegar mixed with salt should be rubbed into the cut i protested but they insisted it was all the doctoring they received whether their rapid healing was to be attributed to that simple remedy or to a good state of health is a question they closed up remarkably soon and in a few days i was able to move again as it seldom happens that one survives such a fall it may be interesting to record what my sensations were during its occurrence i was perfectly conscious of what was happening and felt each blow but like a patient under chloroform experienced no pain each blow was naturally more severe than that which preceded it and i distinctly remember thinking well if the next is harder still that will be the end like persons who have been rescued from drowning i remember that the recollection of a multitude of things rushed through my head many of them trivialities or absurdities which had been forgotten long before and more remarkable this bounding through space did not feel disagreeable but i think that in no very great distance more consciousness as well as sensation would have been lost and upon that i base my belief improbable as it seems that death by a fall from a great height is as painless an end as can be experienced the battering was very rough yet no bones were broken the most severe cuts were one four inches long on the top of the head and another of three inches on the right temple this latter bled frightfully there was a formidable looking cut of about the same size as the last on the palm of the left hand and every limb was grazed or cut more or less seriously the tips of the ears were taken off and a sharp ruck cut a circular bit out of the side of the left boot sock and ankle at one stroke the loss of blood although so great did not seem to be permanently injurious the only serious effect has been the reduction of a naturally retentive memory to a very commonplace one and although my recollections of more distant occurrences remain unshaken the events of that particular day would be clean gone but for the few notes which were written down before the accident End of chapter 24chapter twenty five of young people's treasury volume six famous travels and adventures by hamilton wright maybe this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by betty b the midnight sun by langley coleridge norway is a land of pure delight to the traveller there are no picture galleries to make one's neck ache no museum to make the weary feet throb no promenades no sherry cobblers to sip while bands play in the gardens no continuations of london and brighton there are no crowds you may see a magnificent waterfall all by yourself or ascend a hundred riggies without meeting a soul there are no loafers and you may get into boats and out of boats into carrioles and out of carrioles without one hump-backed beggar boy or man with his eye in a sling to whine at you or one officious person getting in the way in order to be paid for it there are no mammoth hotels where you have to climb a dozen flights of stairs before you can reach your bed no billiards when once you have left the three chief towns no stuffy railways to whiz you past the best scenery no dressing for dinner now all these things to one who has been over and over again to the most civilized places in the world are very refreshing and yet these are perhaps but minor points and do not explain the secret of the great charm of norway Rip van winkles was a wonderful sleep he woke and found the world had gone forward a hundred years but the traveller who sleeps on the north sea and wakes up in the morning in norway has had a more wonderful sleep he wakes and finds the world has gone back half a millennium southward the countries of europe have struggled and slaved in the race for the perfection of civilization while norway is as it was in the beginning southward the countries have obeyed the watchword forward norway has obeyed the signal as you were now 
Fancy yourself arriving at a little village in an out-of-the-way place in Norway. Nobody flutters about your carriole to escort you to a hotel, but you enter the station, a low, rambling wooden structure, with diffidence. You see the lady of the house and shake hands with her. You ask her to be good enough to let you stay there the night. You enter a bedroom where everything is plain as a deal box, but clean as a Dutch tulip. Then you sit down with the family in the general room to your meal. It will assuredly consist of either trout and salmon or salmon and trout, with perhaps an egg, perhaps potatoes, perhaps black bread. No bass, but perhaps some Norse all, a very pleasant beverage. After supper, you will smoke a pipe with your landlord, who will probably invite you to see the pigs, or will lend you a hand to splice up any broken harness of your carriole. About nine or ten o'clock you will go to bed in the broad daylight if it be summer time, and in the morning you will wake up finding the landlady's daughter at your bedside with a delicious cup of hot coffee and a natty little roll or perchance a biscuit. And then, still early in the morning, you will bid farewell as to old friends, you will shake hands all around and away in your carriole to drive through romantic scenery and to feel as though Norway had been made specially for you. Before you have been two days in the country, you will love the quaint, unsophisticated people, so hearty in their kindness, so ungrudging in their hospitality, in their old-world manners and customs, so genuine in an age of sham, so solid in an age of veneer. One great charm of Norway, then, is its people. Another, and perhaps more to be appreciated by some, is its scenery. Is it like Switzerland? No. Norway is only like Norway. It is not so grand as regards the height of its mountains, yet its grandeur is far more solemn. It has a dozen fjords more startling than the Lake of Lucerne. In a day's journey you will pass waterfalls and cascades, which would make a fortune to proprietors in Switzerland, and are not so much as mentioned in the Norwegian guidebooks. Switzerland is grand beyond compare, but it must be confessed it is a monotonous grandeur. Not so with Norway. Its charms of scenery are varied as they are unique. A coast, wild and rugged, mighty pine forests, interminable. Lakes beautiful as Windermere, fjords awful in their grandeur, valleys rich in their fertility, fields bare and barren, sport with the gun, sport with the rod. These and a hundred other charms may be entered in the catalogue. But all these are outweighed by the strange, weird beauty and grandeur of the neighborhood of the North Cape. I know of nothing that comes within the range of tourist experiences that will make a more lasting impression on the memory than a day or two in the region of the midnight sun. For the student, the professional man, the overworked generally, and especially those whose brains are overworked, there is no tour that will be more beneficial than the one I propose briefly to sketch. Go to Christian Sand. Then, if you have never been to Norway, proceed to Christiania, and after staying a day or two in that interesting town and neighborhood, continue your journey either to Trondheim or Bergen. It matters not which, or better still, if you can, do both. The trip to one, the other, or both will give you a good idea of scenery in Norway. At either Bergen or Trondheim, take the steamer for Hammerfest and then will commence one of the most delightful voyages it is possible to make. The steamer keeps close to the shore, and the shore is the most curious in the world. You have but to look at a map to see its wonderful indentations. You cannot realize them until you find yourself now in a bay or a cove, now among groups of islands, then in the midst of a fjord, with sheer rocks rising perpendicularly from the sea and anon in the harbor of a little town, with groups of wandering peasantry around you. You will see some parts of the coast so wild that you cannot credit the fact that human beings can be found there, and you will find verdant nooks so peaceful and pretty that you will be tempted to think that there, away from the world, you would like to build your house and finish up your days. At one time you will come to the haunts of waterfowl innumerable, at another, a shoal of whales will be around you. The towns and villages at which you will halt will have a special charm. The curious costumes of the people, the antique architecture of their houses and churches, the good but old-fashioned contrivances 
connected with their fishing avocations. All these will be novel. Among the red-letter days of the trip will be a sail among the Lofoden Islands, jagged as the jaws of a shark, and swarming with sea-fowl, a glimpse at the neighborhood of the maelstrom, so celebrated in fable, a visit to a lap encampment, and an occasional stroll through some of the towns at which the steamer stays. Tromso is one of these halting places. It is a modern town, which has grown rapidly. It was only founded in 1794, and in 1816 had but 300 inhabitants. Now, owing to the success of its herring fishery, it has grown strangely for Norway and has a population of over 5,000. It is charmingly situated on an island, and its rich fertility contrasts most singularly with the wildness of the surrounding mountains. Hammerfest, too, is interesting, not only because it is the most northerly town in the world, and because, in the season, it is crowded with representatives of all nations who come here to trade, but because here you are within the limits of the region of the midnight sun, and from here you will take your boat, unless you continue by the Vadso steamer for the North Cape. The effect of the midnight sun has been variously described. Carlyle revels in the idea that while all the nations of the earth are sleeping, you here stand in the presence of that great power which will wake them all. Bayard Taylor delights in the gorgeous coloring, and each traveler has some new poetic thought to register. For myself, the midnight sun has a solemnity which nothing else in nature has. Midnight is solemn in the darkness. It is a hundredfold more solemn in the glare of sunlight. Richer than ever is sun under tropical skies. It is silence as of death, not the hum of a bird, not the buzz of an insect not the distant voice of a human being. Silence palpable. You do not feel drowsy, though it is midnight. You feel a strange fear creep over you as if in a nightmare, and dare not speak. You think, what if it should be true that the world is in its last sleep, and you are the last living ones, yourselves on the verge of the eternal ocean? It is amusing afterwards to think of the way in which you landed on your excursion to the North Cape how everyone seemed impressed with the same idea that it was a sacrilege to break the silence, and the party that set forth in high spirits had settled down into the gravity of a funeral cortege. And it is strange how the stillness and awfulness felt while in the little boat upon the silent sea, held you spellbound and entranced, and the spell could not be broken until you set to work on the difficult climb to the head of the North Cape, and when you reached the top you felt well i don't know how to some standing on the highest part of the plateau a thousand feet above the sea and looking away to that great unknown arctic ocean it has seemed as if they had come to the end of the earth that they were gazing upon the confines of the eternal regions that they saw in the distance the outlines of the land of which it is said there is no night there every tourist mind had its own particular magnet I do not know what event in the history of a tourist life most attracts my memory. No one can ever forget the day when he first gazes upon Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives, or Damascus seen from the Mount of Mohammed, or the sunny morning when he rounds the golden horn and Constantinople bursts on the view. These are memories which never grow dim, and I am inclined to think that when a tourist finds himself in a small boat at midnight, drawing near to the North Cape, in the midst of the most gorgeous sunlight ever seen, he has found a sensation which will be green in his memory to the day of his death. In this brief paper I have not found time to be practical. The trip to the North Cape should be made in June or July. It may be made in August or September, and in the latter month there is a chance of seeing the first blushes of the Aurora Borealis. I am much inclined to think that a winter excursion to the North Cape would be one of the grandest sensations that the tourist's heart could wish, but of this I am not in a position to judge. If my readers are like myself, they never bring one summer trip to a close before they have arranged in their own minds for the next, and so I throw out the hint that ere the North Cape shall be scribbled over with the names of Smith and Jones, ere excursion boats with Ethiopian serenaders on board shall put forth from Hammerfest, ere a big hotel shall stand upon the summit, 
and a man shall blow a horn to announce when the sun is at its best it will be well to consider whether a trip to the north cape is not worth serious consideration end of chapter twenty five Chapter Twenty Six of Young People's Treasury, Volume Six: Famous Travels and Adventures by Hamilton Wright Mabie. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Betty B. Old Antwerp by Rose G. Kingsley. In Flanders, there are quaint cities, beautiful buildings, glorious pictures, and a tangled mess of historic interest. Thus it came to pass that we went to Brussels and three days later we were steaming out into the, to us, unknown, on our way to Antwerp. Our three days had been chiefly spent in making close acquaintance with Flemish art in the museum of the capital, a collection most valuable and typical, a collection too often ignored or hastily glanced through by the tourist, who, if by chance he cares for such things, hurries on to see Memling at Bruges, Van Eck at Ghent, or rubens at antwerp he forgets or does not know that as fromentin justly says belgium is a magnificent book of art which happily for provincial glory the chapters are scattered everywhere but of which the preface is at brussels and only at brussels to all who are tempted to skip the preface in order to get at the book i should say they are wrong that they open the book too soon and will read it ill we therefore studied the preface with some care, and now we're about to turn the first page of the book itself. Everything seemed new, pretty, and amusing as the train cleared the last of the suburbs of Brussels. The sun shone on the long lines of poplars, just burnished with autumn's gold, which cast their shadows on damp green meadows, ruled off into squares with almost mathematical precision. Here, a man in a brown apron and brilliant crimson sleeves was raking up the aftermath of a water meadow there a girl in a blue frock was herding black and white cows and we began to think of coip then we saw across flat stretches of smiling country pointed steeples and red roofs showing behind thick groups of trees in a soft blue haze while an old windmill on blackened wooden stilts a little donkey cart and a group of crimson-jacketed peasants in the foreground made us think of some of Tenier's the Younger's landscapes, and recollect that we must be close to Dre Torren, his house at Perk. Then came Malines, our first brown canal, with red-sailed green and black-painted barges, the great cathedral rising through a screen of trees over scarlet house roofs, a picturesque crowd on the platform of burly shovel-hatted priests nuns with black shawls over their white caps men with blue blouses and brilliant yellow sabots and we thought of prout it was all so absurdly like what we had expected with a difference just the difference between art and nature then came more flat country more canals more fields more absurd cocky little wheat ricks with hardly corn enough in them to make a loaf of bread more white and purple lupins on the embankments more red tiled roofs half thatch half tile which m pronounced most aesthetic more sun yes that was perhaps the best of all then a great green fort and we were at antwerp we hardly gave ourselves time to swallow a hasty dejeuner and then set forth with a charming feeling that we had nothing to do but amuse ourselves we had not an idea of where we were going or what we meant to see all was new therefore all to us was worth seeing only a vague impression floated in our minds that we ought before long to find our way to the cathedral it was not hard to find in fact it was impossible to miss it for as we sauntered down the place de mer the golden clock face on the steeple shone before us like a beacon over the high house roofs and far up the carillon did search the wind we pushed our way past the odious touters, clamorously asking in vile French and still viler English if we wished to see the cathedral. Had we seen it? Did we know we ought to see it? Finally, of course, should they show it to us? We were in too mighty a presence to heed them. Above us, 
almost painfully high rose the great steeple pointing up to the clear blue sky we stood at a corner of the old marche and gazed and gazed hardly able at first to take in the idea of its real height foreshortened as it is when one stands so near it grew upon us revealed itself to us as we looked and wondered and ever after while in the city we seemed to feel its protecting presence even though it might be hidden from our eyes and we thought how often must weary sailors beating up the stormy waters of the north sea have longed for a glimpse of that weather-stained tower token to them of home and safety after some perilous voyage to bring gold and sugar from the new world or priceless stuffs and spices from the indies and far cathay or as painters after long study in the schools of rome and venice made their slow way northward once more across the alps to add fresh glory to the guild of st luke how eagerly they must have watched for the first sight of their cathedral pointing heavenward out of the flat misty plain as if to lift their minds from earth into some purer atmosphere yet splendid as is the casket still more precious is the treasure it contains many men have built cathedrals there has been but one rubens and of all rubens works the descent from the cross enshrined in antwerp cathedral is one may venture to say without fear of criticism unquestionably the most wonderful and beautiful there is a sobriety a reticence about it in color in movement in drawing in the exquisite balance of light and shade in the nobility and yet tenderness of conception which one hardly looks for in the painter splendid though he be of the assumption of the virgin over the high altar close by still less of the gorgeous but revolting marie de medici's series in the louvre to quote fromentin once more tout y est contenu conci laconique con dans une page du texte sacré let those who judge him merely by pictures such as the last go to antwerp and casting aside all preconceived ideas say then whether peter paul rubens shall not be pardoned all his carelessness his coarseness yes even his horrors and be to them henceforth the painter of the noble and majestic descent from the cross it was long before we could summon resolution to leave the cathedral half a dozen times we started as many times we turned back to the great triptych to impress some detail more firmly on our minds and at last when the door swung to behind us and we saw the great master's statue standing in dusty sunshine in the place verte we were in no humor for more sightseeing so we wandered happily and aimlessly on now enchanted by some pignon espagnol the quaint gable running up in a series of steps which was introduced some say by the spaniards or to look at a street shrine on a corner house with its figure and lamp and tinsel flowers until at last we found ourselves on the quays here where van nort where rubens where jordan made studies among the rude fishermen for their pictures of the miraculous draught here where generations of painters from their day down to our own have loved to dwell upon the changing aspects of the quiet river the hurrying quays the picturesque people here was indeed a spot where we humble disciples of apelles might hope to gather inspiration from the example of the great departed so we hunted out a pile of wood on the very brink of the river a quiet corner where we ran no risk of being trampled underfoot by gigantic flemish dray horses or knocked down by heavily laden wagons and there we sat peacefully sketching the long reaches of the scheldt bathed in a flood of golden haze up it sailed long low boats floating past us with full red sails flat faint wooded shores behind them a tall smoking chimney or little church spire breaking the blue line of the trees here and there the river reaches were full of repose to eye and mind alike and our thoughts turned instinctively to vandeveld to his glassy water where little gleams catch the curl of some lazy ripple and his skiffs and schooners floating in a veil of filmy gold which warms his usual pearly grays while they in turn give a sober undertone to the golden glory 
a contrast to the quiet river was the foreground of the picture where a steamer was lading for some distant voyage funnels rigging hull a great mass of black and brown against the pale golden water and the bustling quay where horses men carriages foot passengers long low trolleys apparently on only two wheels so minute were the front pair piled high with bales and barrels were jumbled in inextricable confusion we were working away thankful that every one was too full of his own business to care to look at us when suddenly a pleasant smell of burning made us wonder whether the municipality were trying to fumigate the town and overpower the very unsavory odors around us presently blacks began to settle on our sketchbooks then burning morsels flew through the air and turning around we saw that a quantity of bales standing on the quay twenty yards behind us were on fire half a dozen bystanders looked on with true flemish phlegm a woman in blue and gray with yellow sabot stood watching on a fallen mast then others began to arrive and as the flames rose higher some slight interest arose with them the gray woman turned and ran for the pompiers the interest grew and spread among the gathering crowd soldiers just landing from the tete de flandre caught sight of the crackling flames and rushed towards them stevedores left the lading of their steamer and leaping across masts and spars with sacks over their heads and their blue blouses puffed into balloons by the wind rushed to the scene of action m and i thought it prudent to retire to a street corner away from the turmoil such a street all in warm shade with rich reds and grays and browns among its high-roofed houses out of the fish market close by poured a motley crowd men in blue jerseys men in red jerkins men in shirt sleeves little lads in sailor clothes with bright yellow sabots women with yellow sabots and blue stockings or yellow stockings and black sabots or black shoes and pink stockings women in three-cornered shawls women in long black cloaks the tardily awakened interest had grown into intense excitement everyone ran soldiers ladies porters priests and as we left the quay van dyke to go home and looked up at the stone lacework of the cathedral tower against the bright blue sky the pompiers raced past us with their little hand engine to find that the fire had burnt itself out too tired by our long day to walk any more but unwilling to waste the evening in our rooms we chartered a comfortable little carriage and drove down to the port just after sunset the cathedral tower stood stately and sombre against a pale pink sky against this delicate background too we caught fantastic irregular outlines of old houses at every turn of the streets the busy quay van dyke we now saw under a completely changed aspect the pink of the upper sky melted into yellow the yellow into a heavy blue purple blending with the farther shore of the river the bands of color intensified by black masts and sails rising from yet blacker hulls lying under the bank were reflected in the opalescent water while fluttering pennons on a forest of fishing boats looked as m said like a shoal of minnows as we drove along the growing darkness the scene was weird and strange we caught glimpses of black figures with heavy burdens on their shoulders rushing up and down gangways of loading steamers like the demons of some while purges knocked lighted by oil cans flaming from their two spouts then came a street of ancient houses we could see only the steps of their gables against the sky and instead of a roadway below the street was full of water and ships sails half furled lights red green and yellow repeating themselves in long reflections amid the black boats on the smooth surface of the canal across the river steamer lights crept to and fro low carts with huge horses that brought to mind paul potter's etching of the friesland horse grazed past us then came a black mass the house of the hanseatic league then great docks like the sea stretching away infinitely into the darkness a mysterious confusion of masts spars cordage chimneys lights water black hulls on shore a tangle of carts and trolleys standing horseless barrels cotton bales wool sacks 
a locomotive snorted past us in dangerous proximity appearing one knew not from whence disappearing again into the gloom electric lights flashed on ahead far up the line we passed more huge warehouses more canals more narrow streets then the port and its strange life its flaming oil cans its murky darkness were left behind and we found ourselves back in nineteenth-century civilization driving down the new frenchified boulevards with only the statue of david tenier and the italian facade of rubens house to remind us where we were End of chapter 26chapter twenty seven of young people's treasury volume six famous travels and adventures by hamilton wright maybe this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by betty b st petersburg by samuel s cox our steamer glides on what becomes a summer sea of smoothness the few passengers begin to appear on deck and stretch their vision for the first glance at the imperial city upon the right snug amidst its royal greenery lies the town of peterhof and its domes minarets and imperial palace with its splendid woods and waters our time is opportune for a glorious sight for it is sunset and the sun goes down here at a discreet hour bright dots of burnished gold begin faintly to spangle the sky in front they are domes half hidden by the mist and the distance then a tall spire also gilded brilliant and needle-like pierces the heavens it is the admiralty spire or perhaps that of the church of the fortress the westminster of russia the mausoleum of its dead kings a few minutes and st isaac's church the st peter's of russia looms up in majestic and stupendous proportions its copper dome is surrounded by four others all ablaze like burnished gold and surmounted by the gilded greek cross which towers aloft above the bronze saints and angels which people its architraves and its corners its roofs and its pillared granite cupola beneath it is a city whose roofs of varied hue cover almost a million people a city the outgrowth from a swamp in less than two hundred years we enter the neva whose divided waters flow in canals and lagoons between grand pavements and superb palaces at length we are moored alas how soon the beatific vision vanishes amidst the traffic and troubles of trade we are to undergo a search the first yet made with rigor since our journey began nor can i complain of this rigor recent events make police regulations here necessarily stringent but was it not a little humorous to see the long-robed customs officers scrutinize the heterogeneous matters in our trunks nothing was found contraband but what think you new york journals we had received a mail at stockholm and expected to read up fully in st petersburg some dozen of these journals lay in a pile in my wife's trunk it would have done you good to see the leonine veracity with which these papers were seized who was it that talked of the thousand tongues of the press clearer far than the silver trumpet of the jubilee louder than the voice of the herald at the games these tongues had not a word of protest the music of their trumpet was frozen like that of the voracious traveller out of the bundle tumbled an engraving of charles the twelfth the old enemy of russia did i tremble for the ominous spectre of this dead madcap of sweden the courteous officer handed it back with a gracious smile to my wife who reached for the rest of the bundle while her face flushed at the indignity to and the confusion of her domestic arrangements but with a hasty push and an impetuous neeped neeped no no our papers were confiscated to the state the sun would not go down in this land the tribune was a voiceless oracle the world ceased to move after all the times were out of joint and the express came to a dead halt but all this had its compensations for soon we cross the great bridge and are housed in the hotel d'angleterre where though no papers were found in our expected mail plenty of news as to the president and the land we love were found in letters 
and these twelve days only from New York. There shine into my windows in dazzling glitter the copper domes of that marvel of cathedrals, St. Isaac's, which we saw from afar, upon whose sides and pedestals, encamping night and day about us, are the angels of this edifice of beauty. The guns of the citadel thunder out the memory of this, the birthday of the empress of this vast empire, and, in spite of all ominous auguries to the contrary, we sojourn in peace and safety in this city of beauty and bazaars, palaces and pigeons, monuments and minarets, domes and deviltry, ceremonies and cemeteries, armies and assassinations. Why does everybody except the Russians call this city St. Petersburg? It was not named after St. Peter, but Peter the Great. It is a magnificent city of palaces and wide avenues. Its very hospitals and barracks are palatial, and there is no narrowness to any thoroughfare. Its domes, where not painted blue with golden stars or green, are gilded and make the city seem like a Constantinople new risen upon the north. In fact, with its canals and rivers, its streets, columns, and palaces, its churches and their outside and inside decorations, St. Petersburg combines in itself and in its vistas, in its plan and its magnificence, Venice, Amsterdam, Paris, and Constantinople. If it were not stucco on the yellow houses, if it were only solid stone, how much more impressive would be its mighty and superb aspect. Only one palace is of granite, and but one church, St. Isaac's, of marble. The energy which has reared such a city out of a bog in less than two centuries betokens the one-man energy which its founder inspired and illustrated. Still, St. Petersburg, as a look from an elevation will show, unless it be approached as we approached it by the gulf and river, is a vast plain, if not a swamp. The Neva saves it. It is a splendid river and makes its delta where the city stands. It is a city of islands connected by beautiful bridges. Red granite faces the banks and makes the quay solid structures. Everything is colossal like the empire. The informing genius of the male gender is Peter the Great, and of the other gender, Catherine the Second. If these sovereigns were insane, and they were very peculiar for Russia, more insanity is desirable among the princes of the earth. Peter opened this city, as he said, for a window for Russia to look out of into civilized Europe. Peter was a useful emperor for Russia and his time, although he did many diabolical things. The Russian humor is like that of Byron, which Edgar Poe said was too savage to be laughed at. Someone calls it grotesque savagery and illustrates it by the freaks of Russian princes and czars. John the Terrible thought that there was no church like that of St. Basil, and put out the architect's eyes to end any future work of that gifted artist. Peter the Great proposed to hang the lawyers in his realm. He thought one was too much. There is a story of the Empress Annie, who married off her favorite dwarf or fool in an ice palace, and gave them an icy marriage bed where they froze to death. This I have seen pictured in fine color and delineation. It was a Russian pleasantry. Catherine II slaughtered many of the men whom she did not love, out of a vagary of fun. Most of the people here hold their revels in graveyards. Peter stuffed the skin of one of his favorite servants, a tall fellow, and put him in a museum. Paul issued a ukazi against shoestrings and round hats. He was fond of colors, and had fantastic hues painted on bridges and gates. It is hardly mirthful to make an eagle out of gun flints and swords, or portray a group in heaven of Russians looking down on Jews, Germans, and Negroes. But this is Moscovite merriment. In the Moscow markets the slaughtered animals are stuffed with sawdust and look odd. It is said of the Emperor Paul that he dug up the bones of those who murdered his father to pulverize them and blow them to the winds. He arrested an Englishman for not taking off his hat to royalty and ordered him to wear magnifying glasses. This was jolly but not exceptional, for the Russian is not adept in making genial fun. The climate is not genial. The Drosky is an odd-looking fleet sort of cab 
which barely seats two it is near the ground and if it upsets it is safer than when it is going its speed over the boulders is immense its driver is good and good-humoured the carts wagons drays as well as droskies have a peculiar harness for the horse the eminent characteristic of the establishment is a sort of harness or yoke about four or five feet above the animal's shoulders this is not peculiar to russia but it is here developed in a higher degree it rests on the shafts and somehow as i believe loquor non inexpertus the horse has freer motion and an easier draught under this yoke it does not strain him about the vitalities like our harness he seems to run loosely as under a canopy of green though many of the yokes are thus painted with emblems and owners names on them while watching a caravan of these yokes which do not oppress i had occasion to look through a long line of them fifty in number carrying the rye flour in sacks across the city and discovered another peculiarity there is a stout rope from the horse's shoulders to the front axle which extends some two feet out of the hub to hold these extra traces the strain seemed to be upon these traces as much as upon the shafts and just as i was driving in a hurried way for our driver was dashing at the usual pace one of our wheels came off and rolled a rod and down we were thanks to the good gray team and some promptitude we escaped harm while sympathies all about from the gathered crowd showed that there was much kindness upon the street what sights to our unaccustomed eyes are on every side as we drive little tartar children dressed in green the soldiers with heavy coats and long spears from the tribes of the don the cossack of history hussars of red gay uniform caucasian soldiers with dresses as gay as the spahis of algiers with the various large breeched natives in top boots or with red shirts only covered by a dark vest add to the spectacle the avenues are wide and lined with high yellow buildings palaces and government edifices all proportionate to the immense empire of the two continents the signs look quaint with their peculiar lettering and the houses which rarely have doors in front are unusual in their aspect the sheet iron roofs painted green and red the police in their green uniform and sword the rivers and canals full of strange craft darting about in active business some from far inland laden with grain and some bearing passengers over the neva and under its bridges all these odd pictures contribute to keep us on the alert we drive along the neva whose splendid avenues and quays are one they are lined by the same yellow buildings where the families of the royal house reside then we cross the neva on a pontoon bridge called the troutson from which a splendid view is had of the spreading waters of the river bounded at one end by the elegant edifice of the commercial exchange in winter the river is used for races upon the ice then we turn into alexandria park and admire the villas of the merchant princes upon the lagoons into which the neva is divided from the rounding point we perceive the finland gulf kronstadt and peterhof and all the points which we passed on our route hither then we turn into the zoological gardens where white bears and young cubs wolves and walruses along with thousands of pleasure seekers together enjoy the brilliant mimic scenes till midnight there we found for fifteen cents only a splendid theatre outdoors and famous dogs and monkeys performing followed by a ballet in pantomime in which greeks and turks play parts and in which the heroes and heroines of the former are lifted through a gorgeous display of many-colored lights into clouds of glory amidst the cheers of the populace which never forgets that turkey is its natural foe and that constantinople is its natural if not national capital upon our drive we notice some fine triumphal arches copied after the classic models and those of other countries and other monuments but none equals the superb alexander column erected in eighteen thirty two it is a solid shaft of red granite the greatest monolith of the world it is based on an enormous block of red granite there is an angel on the summit the monument is one hundred and fifty four feet high 
and has a noble and inspiring grace and grandeur other statues to peter and catherine besides statues to soldiers and poets make every square of this grand city monumental there is also an equestrian statue of nicholas the horse is like that of general jackson's in lafayette square washington and stands upon his hind legs only it is so much more elegantly and gracefully posed that i could not but compare it to the disadvantage of our own favorite charger on no day have we failed to find something about peter the great in the summer gardens there is an old palace where are sacred relics of his handiwork such as chairs cabinets and chinese designs the kitchen and bathroom have tiles of the old dutch style which he greatly affected the chimney is as huge as the room within is a prison where he is said to have kept his personal enemies without benefit of habeas corpus or clergy it looks gloomy and the grating seems to be peculiarly adapted to a jail but it is not very likely that peter would have enjoyed such society in his own favorite home the drives in the parks are beautiful therein is a lovely palace where lived the princess dagmar before she became empress the armory here forms a museum of wonderful interest for it has gifts of untold value from spain to persia and beyond every kind of gun sword and dagger is here and those from the conquered sheiks and khans of asia shine resplendent in jewels by the mass the saddle cloths from the orient and especially the presents from the shah of persia are the richest known to any collection in the world among the manifold things here to be seen are the lock and key found near the site of the temple of jerusalem the jewelry of the harem of the khan of kiva a wonderful collection for female adornment chevalier bayard's cuirass a spear which opens after it enters the body an alarm clock which shoots off a gun to awaken the sleeper the flags taken in the hungarian insurrection of eighteen forty nine the baton of chamil the circassian chief who fought russia so many years the emeralds by the quantity which the shah of persia sent to the czar the horse furniture of the indian sheiks and a circular knife which they use to hurl which cut your head off before you could say your little prayer and as a proper apex to this collection of curious gifts and gems worth alone sixty millions of rubies the sword of mazeppa the brave hetman of the poles who will never cease to ride through histrionic and historic dangers on that fierce untamed charger of the desert if you would find in full perfection the richest in all respects of all the palaces in the world i suppose the winter palace would be that superlative edifice since the attempt to blow it up as the royal people were about to dine it has been closed i made an effort through colonel hoffman our charge d'affaires to obtain an entrance for the americans now stopping here but vainly recent events forbade the czar himself will not go into it again it is shut for two years this was a disappointment but it was partly compensated for by admission to the hermitage which is a part or a neighbor to the winter palace but the hermitage seems to be enough for all our time all the masters old and young native and foreign are in profusion here as well as specimens of the exhaustless mineral glories of russia and siberia in every form of carved beauty and tasteful grace museums of ancient statuary coins jewels and intaglios illustrating every age and phase of history and as a climax of interest the relics of the city of kerch and other palaces in the greek colonies of two thousand years ago now in southern russia are here this exhibition supplements general cesnola's cyprian antiquities and would add fresh interest to our home museum upon these greek relics are found such dresses worn by the ancient scythians as our drusky drivers now wear and bas reliefs on these old vases show horses managed exactly as my former ohio constituent rary used to quell the worst cruisers of the equestrian world but as a small american boy remarked at the end of our six hours promenade through these corridors we feel two thousand years old ourselves we have traveled so much and so far 
do you ask is peter the great to be found at the hermitage surely he is everywhere here are his lathes tools and knives and plaques or discs of copper and ivory cut by his own hand here too is his measuring staff which was a foot taller than any one in our party and that of his valet a foot taller than peter how could he be such a warrior statesman mechanic and architect ruling such an immense and incongruous people so well and make so many knick-knacks with his own hand and out of his own mechanical contrivance this conundrum puzzles the brain we are curious to know the secret of peter's power and of the glamour of grandeur around this giant of muscovite history and modern civilization the staircase of this palace of the hermitage has no equal in its size and proportion outside there are immense black colossal porphyry figures bearing up the portico each an atlas itself they are emblems of the eighty millions of subjects which from every rank uphold this extended empire with its sixty millions of farmers now free its seven millions of villagers its one million of gentry nobles and officers and its four millions of military men and their families it would seem that the vast edifice of the russian power would be stable supported by such atlantean shoulders is it really so time will tell for the welfare of all it is to be wished that there was more comfort and elevation among these vast masses of men End of chapter 27chapter twenty eight of young people's treasury volume six famous travels and adventures by hamilton wright maybe this librivox recording is in the public domain recorded by betty b a mecca pilgrim in disguise by richard f burton in the autumn of eighteen fifty two i offered my services to the royal geographical society of london for the purpose of removing that opprobrium to modern adventure the huge white blot which in our map denotes the eastern and central regions of arabia on the evening of april third eighteen fifty three i left london and upon reaching suez about three months later left there for jidda the port of mecca immense was the confusion on the eventful day of our departure suppose us standing on the beach on the morning of a fiery july day carefully watching our hurriedly packed goods and chattels surrounded by a mob of idlers who are not too proud to pick up waifs and strays while pilgrims rush about apparently mad and friends are weeping acquaintances vociferating adieus boatmen demanding fees shopmen claiming debts women shrieking and talking with inconceivable power children crying in short for an hour or so we were in the thick of a human storm to confound confusion the boatmen have moored their skiff half a dozen yards away from the shore lest the porter should be unable to make more than double their fare from the pilgrims when on the water the pilgrims offer this prayer o allah o exalted o almighty o all pitiful o all powerful thou art my god and sufficeth to me the knowledge of it glorified be the lord my lord and glorified be the faith my faith thou givest victory to whom thou pleasest and thou art the glorious the merciful we pray thee for safety in our goings forth and in our standing still in our words and our designs in our dangers of temptation and doubts and the secret designs of our hearts subject unto us this sea even as thou didst subject the deep to moses and as thou didst subject the fire to abraham and as thou didst subject the iron to david and as thou didst subject the wind and the devils and genie and mankind to solomon and as thou didst subject to the moon and il barak to mohammed upon whom be allah's mercy and his blessing and subject unto us all the seas in earth and heaven in the visible and in thine invisible worlds the sea of this life and the sea of futurity o thou who reignest over everything and unto whom all things return kayar kayar we traveled through a country fantastic in its desolation a mass of huge hills barren plains and desert vales even the sturdy acacias here failed and in some places the camel grass 
could not find earth enough to take root in the road wound among mountains rocks and hills of granite over broken ground flanked by huge blocks and boulders piled up as if man's art had aided nature to disfigure herself vast clefts seemed like scars on the hideous face of earth here they widened into dark caves there they were choked up with glistening drift sand not a bird or a beast was to be seen or heard their presence would have argued the vicinity of water and though my companions opined that bedouins were lurking among the rocks i decided that these bedouins were the creatures of their fears above a sky like polished blue steel with a tremendous blaze of yellow light glared upon us without the thinnest veil of mist or cloud the distant prospect indeed was more attractive than the near view because it borrowed a bright azure tinge from the intervening atmosphere but the jagged peaks and the perpendicular streaks of shadow down the flanks of the mountainous background showed that no change for the better was yet in store for us we travelled that night up a dry river course in an easterly direction and at early dawn found themselves in an ill-famed gorge called shuab el hajj the pilgrim's pass the loudest talkers became silent as we neared it and their countenances showed apprehension written in legible characters presently from the high precipitous cliff on our left thin blue curls of smoke somehow or other they caught every eye rose in the air and instantly afterwards rang the loud sharp cracks of the hillmen's matchlocks echoed by the rocks on the right my shugduf had been broken by the camels falling during the night so i called out to mansour that we had better splice the framework with a bit of rope he looked up saw me laughing and with an ejaculation of disgust disappeared a number of bedouins were to be seen swarming like hornets over the crests of the rocks boys as well as men carrying huge weapons and climbing with the agility of cats they took up comfortable places in the cutthroat eminence and began firing upon us with perfect convenience to themselves the height of the hills and the glare of the rising sun prevented my seeing objects very distinctly but my companions pointed out to me places where the rock had been scarped and a kind of breastwork of rough stones the sangha of afghanistan piled up as a defense and a rest for the long barrel of the matchlock it was useless to challenge the bedouins to come down and fight us upon the plain like men and it was equally unprofitable for our escort to fire upon a foe ensconced behind stones we had therefore nothing to do but to blaze away as much powder and to veil ourselves in as much smoke as possible the result of the affair was that we lost twelve men besides camels and other beasts of burden though the bandits showed no symptoms of bravery and confined themselves to slaughtering the enemy from their hilltop my companion seemed to consider this questionable affair a most gallant exploit half an hour after leaving the wadi el akik or blessed valley we came to a huge flight of steps roughly cut in a long broad line of black scoriaceous basalt this is called the muduraj or flight of steps over the western ridge of the so-called el heratain it is holy ground for the prophet spoke well of it arrived at the top we passed through a lane of black scoria with steep banks on both sides and after a few minutes a full view of the city suddenly opened on us we halted our beasts as if by word of command all of us descended in imitation of the pious of old and sat down jaded and hungry as we were to feast our eyes with a view of the holy city the prayer was o oh allah this is the haram sanctuary of the prophet make it to us a protection from hell-fire and a refuge from eternal punishment o oh, open the gates of thy mercy and let us pass through them to the land of joy as we looked eastward the sun arose out of the horizon of low hills blurred and dotted with small tufted trees which gained a giant stature from the morning mists and the earth was stained with gold and purple before us lay a spacious plain bounded in front by the undulating ground of nejid on the left was a grim barrier of rocks the celebrated mount ohad with a clump of verdure and a white dome 
or two nestling at its base rightward broad streaks of lilac-colored mists were thick with gathered dew there pierced and thinned by the morning rays stretched over the date groves and the gardens of cuba which stood out in emerald green from the dull tawny surface of the plain below at the distance of about two miles lay el medina at first sight it appeared a large place but a closer inspection proved the impression to be an erroneous one passing through muddy streets they had been freshly watered before evening time i came suddenly upon the prophet's mosque like that at mecca the approach is choked up by ignoble buildings some actually touching the holy enceinte others separated by a lane compared with which the road around st paul's is a vatican square there is no outer front no general aspect of the prophet's mosque consequently as a building it has neither beauty nor dignity in entering the bab el rama the gate of pity by a diminutive flight of steps i was astonished at the mean and tawdry appearance of a place so universally venerated in the moslem world it is not like the meccan mosque grand and simple the expression of a single sublime idea the longer i looked at it the more it suggested the resemblance of a museum of second-rate art a curiosity shop full of ornaments that are not accessories and decorated with pauper splendor our days in medina were spent thus at dawn we arose washed prayed and broke our fast upon a crust of stale bread before smoking a pipe and drinking a cup of coffee then it was time to dress to mount and to visit the haram in one of the holy places outside the city returning before the sun became intolerable we sat together and with conversation shishas and chabuks coffee and cold water perfumed with mustiche smoke we whiled away the time till our aristal an early dinner which appeared at the primitive hour of eleven a m the meal was served in the majis on a large copper tray sent from the upper apartments ejaculating bismillah the moslem grace we all sat around it and dipped equal hands in the dishes set before us we had usually unleavened bread different kinds of meat and vegetable stews and at the end of the first course plain boiled rice eaten with spoons then came the fruits fresh dates grapes and pomegranates after dinner i used invariably to find some excuse such as the habit of a kalula midday siesta or the being a sadawi or person of melancholy temperament to have a rug spread in the dark passage and there to lie reading dozing smoking or writing all through the worst part of the day from noon to sunset then came the hour for receiving and paying visits the evening prayers ensued either at home or in the haram followed by our supper another substantial meal like the dinner but more plentiful of bread meat vegetables rice and fruits in the evening we sometimes dressed in common clothes and went to the cafe sometimes on festive occasions we indulged in a late supper of sweetmeats pomegranates and dried fruits usually we sat upon mattresses spread upon the ground in the open air at the sheikah's door receiving evening visits chatting telling stories and making merry till each as he felt the approach of the drowsy god sank down into his proper place and fell asleep my companions and i joined the caravan from damascus the day's march was peculiarly arabian it was a desert peopled only with echoes a place of death for what little there is to die in it a wilderness where to use my companion's phrase there is nothing but he allah nature scalped flayed discovered her anatomy to the gazer's eye the horizon was a sea of mirage gigantic sand columns whirled over the plain and on both sides of our road were huge piles of bare rock standing detached upon the surface of sand and clay here they appeared in oval lumps heaped up with a semblance of symmetry there a single boulder stood with its narrow foundation based upon a pedestal of low dome-shaped rock all are of a pink coarse-grained granite which flakes off in large crusts under the influence of the atmosphere on the morning of sunday september eleventh eighteen fifty three about one a m i was aroused by general excitement mecca mecca cried some voices i looked out from my litter there at last it lay the bourne of my long and weary pilgrimage 
realizing the plans and hopes of many and many a year the mirage medium of fancy invested the huge catalfalque and its gloomy pall with peculiar charms there were no giant fragments of hoar antiquity as in egypt no remains of graceful and harmonious beauty as in greece and italy no barbaric gorgeousness as in the buildings of india yet the view was strange unique and how few have looked upon the celebrated shrine i may truly say that of all the worshippers who clung weeping to the curtain or who pressed their beating hearts to the stone none felt for the moment a deeper emotion than did the haji from the far north it was as if the poetical legends of the arab spoke truth and that the waving wings of angels not the sweet breeze of morning were agitating and swelling the black covering of the shrine but to confess humbling truth theirs was the high feeling of religious enthusiasm mine was the ecstasy of gratified pride for a long time i stood looking in despair at the swarming crowd of bedouin and other pilgrims that besieged the black stone our boy mohammed was equal to the occasion during our circuit he had displayed a fiery zeal against heresy and schism by foully abusing every persian in his path and the inopportune introduction of hard words into his prayers made the latter a strange patchwork he might for instance be repeating and i take refuge with thee from ignominy in this world when o thou rejected one son of the rejected would be the interpolation addressed to some long-bearded Khorasani, and in that to come o hog and brother of a hoggess and so he continued till i wondered that no one dared to turn and rend him after vainly addressing the pilgrims of whom nothing could be seen but a mosaic of occiputs and shoulder blades the boy mohammed collected about half a dozen stalwart meccans with whose assistance by sheer strength we wedged our way into the thin and light-legged crowd the bedouins turned round upon us like wild cats but they had no daggers the season being autumn they had not swelled themselves with milk for six months and they had become such living mummies that i could have managed single-handed half a dozen of them after thus reaching the stone despite popular indignation testified by impatient shouts we monopolized the use of it for at least ten minutes whilst kissing it and rubbing hands and forehead upon it i narrowly observed it and came away persuaded that it is a big aerolite on september twelfth we mounted the litter and set out for arafat the mount of wrestling in prayer arafat is about a six hours march or twelve miles on the taif road due east of mecca we arrived there in a shorter time but our weary camels during the last third of the way frequently threw themselves upon the ground human beings suffered more between muna and arafat i saw no less than five men fall down and die upon the highway exhausted and moribund they had dragged themselves out to give up the ghost where it departs to instant beatitude the spectacle showed how easy it is to die in these latitudes each man suddenly staggered fell as if shot and after a brief convulsion lay still as marble the corpse were carefully taken up and carelessly buried that same evening in a vacant space among the crowds encamped upon the arafat plain nothing can be more picturesque than the view the mountain affords of the blue peaks behind and the vast encampment scattered over the barren yellow plain below on the north lay the regularly pitched camp of the guards that defend the unarmed pilgrims to the eastward was the sheriff's encampment with the bright mamals and the gilt knobs of the grander pavilions whilst on the southern and western sides the tents of the vulgar crowded the ground disposed in dowers or circles for penning cattle after many calculations i estimated the number to be not less than fifty thousand of all ages and sexes the ceremony of rami or stoning the great devil is a curious sight the shaitan el kabir is a stone pillar backed by a wall as the ceremony must be performed on the first day by all pilgrims between sunrise and sunset and as the fiend was malicious enough to appear in a rugged pass the crowd makes the place dangerous 
on one side of the road which is not forty feet broad stood a row of shops belonging principally to barbers on the other side is the rugged wall of the pillar with a chevaux de frise of bedouins and naked boys the narrow space was crowded with pilgrims all struggling like drowning men to approach as near as possible to the devil it would have been easy to run over the heads of the mass among them were horsemen with rearing chargers bedouins on wild camels and grandees on mules and asses with outrunners were breaking away by assault and battery i had read ali bey's self-felicitations upon escaping this place with only two wounds in the left leg and had duly provided myself with a hidden dagger the precaution was not useless scarcely had my donkey entered the crowd then he was overthrown by a dromedary, and I found myself under the stamping and roaring beast's stomach. By a judicious use of the knife, I avoided being trampled upon, and lost no time in escaping from a place so ignobly dangerous. Finding an opening at last, we approached within about five cubits of the place, and holding each stone between the thumb and forefinger of the ring hand, cast it at the pillar, exclaiming, In the name of Allah, and Allah is almighty, I do this in hatred of the fiend, and to his shame. The seven stones being duly thrown, we retired, and entering the barber's booth, took our places upon one of the earthen benches around it. This was the time to remove the iram, or pilgrim's garb, and to return to ilal, the normal state of El islam The barber shaved our heads, and after trimming our beards and cutting our nails, made us repeat these words. I propose loosening my iram according to the practice of the Prophet, whom may Allah bless and preserve. O Allah, make unto me in every hair a light, a purity, and a generous reward. In the name of Allah, and Allah is almighty. At the conclusion of his labor, the barber politely addressed to us a naiman, pleasure to you, to which we have ceremoniously replied, Allah give thee pleasure. Later, upon returning to the city from the sacrifice of sheep in the valley of muna we bathed and when noon drew nigh we repaired to the haram for the purpose of hearing the sermon descending to the cloisters below the babel ziada i stood wonderstruck by the scene before me the vast quadrangle was crowded with worshippers sitting in long rows and everywhere facing the central black tower the showy colors of their dresses were not to be surpassed by a garden of the most brilliant flowers and such diversity of detail would probably not be seen massed together in any other building upon earth the women a dull and sombre looking group sat apart in their peculiar place the pasha stood on the roof of zemzem surrounded by guards in nizam uniform where the principal ulema stationed themselves the crowd was thicker and in the more auspicious spots naught was to be seen but a pavement of heads and shoulders nothing seemed to move but a few dervishes who censer in hand sidled through the rows and received the unsolicited alms of the faithful apparently in the midst and raised above the crowd by the tall pointed pulpit whose gilt spire flamed in the sun sat the preacher an old man with snowy beard the style of headdress called talesan covered his turban which was white as his robes, and a short staff supported his left hand. Presently he arose, took the staff in his right hand, pronounced a few inaudible words, and sat down again on one of the lower steps, whilst Amusin, at the foot of the pulpit, recited the call to sermon. Then the old man stood up and began to preach. As the majestic figure began to exert itself, there was a deep silence. Presently a general Amin was intoned by the crowd at the conclusion of some long sentence, and at last, towards the end of the sermon, every third or fourth word was followed by the simultaneous rise and fall of thousands of voices. I have seen the religious ceremonies of many lands, but never, nowhere, aught so solemn, so impressive as this spectacle. End of chapter 28 Chapter 29 of Young People's Treasury, Volume 6, Famous Travels and Adventures by Hamilton Wright Maybe. 
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Betty B. The Holy City by Elliot Warburton. The road from Jaffa has been for four thousand years the highway between Jerusalem and the western plains that border on the sea, and its slippery rocks are so round and smooth as to render firm footing difficult. Chariots never could have been used here, and it would be impossible for cavalry to act, or even to advance against a hostile force. The scenery resembled that of the wildest glens of Scotland, only that here the grey crags were thickly tufted with aromatic shrubs, and instead of the pine, the sycamore, the olive, and the palm shaded the mountain's side. We passed by the village of Jeremiah and the Terebinthine Vale, in the last we recognize the scene of David's combat with Goliath, and its little brook still sparkles here as freshly as when he picked thence pebbles to smite the Philistine. Generally speaking, the river beds were as dry as the path we trod, and this was the only stream but one that I saw between Jaffa and the Jordan. A large caravan was assembled on its banks, with all its picturesque variety of laden camels, mules with gay trappings, mountain cavaliers with turban and embroidered vests, veiled women on donkeys, half-naked Arabs with long spears, dwellers in cities with dark caftan or furred police. All, however, various their nation, profession, or appearance, were eagerly quaffing the precious stream, or waiting under the shadow of a high rock for the caravan to proceed. Hills became more and more precipitous, as we approached Jerusalem, most of them were of a conical form and terraced to their summit. Yet on these steep acclivities the strenuous labor of the Israelite had formerly grown corn, wine, and oil, and on the terraces that remained uninjured the few present inhabitants still plant wheat and vineyards and olive groves. There was no appearance of water except the inference that might be drawn of wells within the few villages that hung on the mountain side. The pathway continued as rough as ever, while we wound through the rocky defiles leading to the upper plains, but it was much more frequented, and I had joined a large and various company for the sake of listening to their talk about the city that now absorbed every other interest. At each acclivity we surmounted we were told that the next would reveal to us the object of our destination, and at length, as we emerged upon a wide and sterile plain, the leading pilgrims sank upon their knees, the most contagious shout of enthusiasm I ever heard burst from each traveler and every man of that large company, Arab, Italian, Greek, and Englishman, exclaimed each in his own tongue, El Quds, Jerusalem, Heopolis, the Holy City. It was indeed Jerusalem, and had the Holy City risen before us, in its palmiest days of magnificence and glory, it could not have created deeper emotion or been gazed at more earnestly or with intenser interest. Apart from all associations, the first view of Jerusalem is a most striking one. A brilliant and uncheckered sunshine has something mournful in it when all that it shines upon is utterly desolate and drear. Not a tree or green spot is visible. No sign of life breaks the solemn silence. No smile of nature's gladness ever varies the stern scenery around. The flaming, monotonous sunshine above and the pale, distorted, rocky wastes beneath realize but too faithfully the prophetic picture. Thy sky shall be brass and the land shall be iron. To the right and left, as far as the eye can reach, vague undulations of colorless rocks extend to the horizon. A broken and desolate plain in front is bounded by a wavy, battlemented wall, over which towers frown and minarets peer, and mosque domes swell, intermingled with church turrets and an indistinguishable mass of terraced roofs. High over the city, to the left, rises the Mount of Olives, and the distant hills of Moab, almost mingling with the sky, afford a background to the striking picture. I had always pictured to myself Jerusalem as standing upon lofty hills and visible from afar. It is, on the contrary, on the edge of the wide platform by which we approached from Jaffa, and is commanded by the Mount of Olives, the Hill of Scopus, 
and other eminences from which it is divided by the deep and narrow ravines called the valley of jehoshaphat and the valley of hinnom these ravines meet in the form of a y the lower part of which describes the precipitous glen through which the brook kidron flows in winter to the dead sea the site of the city is in itself unique selected originally from the strength of its position only it offers none of the features usually to be found surrounding the metropolis of a powerful people no river nor any stream flows by it no fertility surrounds it no commerce seems able to approach its walls no thoroughfare of nations finds it in the way it seems to stand apart from the world exempt from its passions its ambitions and even its prosperity like the high priest who once ministered in its temple it stands solitary and removed from all secular influences and receives only those who come to worship at its mysteries all the other cities of the earth are frequented by votaries of gain science luxury or glory zion offers only privations to the pilgrim's body solemn reflections for his thoughts awe for his soul her palaces are ruins her hostels are dreary convents her chief boast and triumph is a tomb the greater part of the time i passed at jerusalem i was as solitary as in the desert in the cool of the evening i used to ride up the mount of olives or explore the glens and caverns once the refuge places of the prophets now the resort of robbers and outlaws if i had been reconnoitring for titus i could not have made myself more familiar with every feature of the doomed city than solitude and curiosity conspired to make me during those frequent rambles toward noon i was driven by the heat to take shelter in my apartments which i shall describe as affording a specimen of the houses of jerusalem i passed only one night in the dreary hospice of the terra santa and the next evening found myself on my return from a distant ride the tenant of abu habib in the via dolorosa he was a portly old christian very like lablache in the garb of figaro but that a long robe of brown silk enveloped his person and a capacious turban his broad brow he could speak but few words of italian and the gesticulations with which he endeavored to express some difficult emotion in arabic were irresistibly ludicrous he piqued himself on his cookery and was continually inventing some new abomination of grease and rice to tempt my appetite there was a hospitality about the old fellow notwithstanding his reputed avaricious propensities that prevented me from ever scrutinizing his bills if he made the most of his guests in one respect he also did it in every other my servant was quite superseded in the culinary department as soon as i rose in the morning it was abu habib who presented my coffee when i came in from riding pipe and coffee were handed by abu habib and in a few moments risoles in vine leaves or pieces of pilan in cucumbers with a broiled fowl and a flask of vino d'oro were presented by abu habib if i clapped my hands throughout the day the same portly figure presented itself if i fell asleep on the divan i found him fanning away the flies at dinner he was at once cook and butler in the evening he was killing chickens while he whistled a tune or plucking them as he chanted some unintelligible old song he even climbed the housetop to offer my pipe and at length actually took to grooming my horses the entrance to this house of hospitality was by a narrow flight of stone steps leading out of the via dolorosa a door opened thence into a courtyard where my horses were stabled in an enclosure and picketed to the wall by the fetlock a corridor in which there were doors leading to a kitchen on one side and sleeping rooms on the other connected this outer with an inner court shaded by a few lemon and cypress trees in this were my apartments consisting of a sleeping room and a large wainscoted chamber surrounded with a divan and diversified with a variety of shelves presses and cupboards opposite were the sleeping apartments of my host his buxom wife and her blooming sister these women seemed to lead a life of perfect idleness for the indefatigable abu habib was all in all and monopolized all the offices of the establishment even to dressing 
in more senses than one a young son of his was the plague of the household my host was civil and humble even to servility but the female members of his family appeared to be as free from constraint as they were from forwardness during a short but severe illness they attended me with the greatest kindness and afterward gave me lessons in arabic and folding turbans and other eastern accomplishments it was pleasant when evening fell as i lay on the divan and looked upon the clear bright sky against which the cypresses trembled in the night breeze to hear the low sweet plaintive voices in which these eastern women sang the songs of their historic land hebron was their native place and they were christians though they had never heard of the bible but the name of the koran was familiar to them their dress in the house consisted of a close-fitting tunic buttoned from beneath the bosom for some distance down thence open to allow free motion to their limbs that were clothed with very full loose trousers tied at the ankle and falling over the slippered foot the bosom was generally open or but partly enclosed by the crape garment within a light turban or a handkerchief of damascus silk covered the head from which rich hair flowed free or was plaited into two long braids in the streets the christian women wear the yashmak or veil across the face as the moslems do but in the house it is entirely laid aside the women of all religions pass much of their time on the housetops peeping through the circular tiles that are built into a wall so as to admit the air yet conceal the inhabitants of each roof i rode forth to make a circuit of the city to walk round about her and mark well her battlements sadly has all changed since this proud challenge was spoken yet the walls are still towering and imposing in their effect they vary in height from twenty to sixty feet according to the undulations of the ground and are everywhere in good repair the columns and architraves are as old as at least the roman conquered city that are worked into these walls instead of ruder stones bear eloquent testimony to the different nature of their predecessors a bridle path leads close to their base all round the valleys of hinnom and jehoshaphat yawn suddenly beneath them on the west south and north separating them from mount jehan the hill of evil counsel and the mount of olives these hills are utterly barren and lonely as fear can make them though within gunshot of the city robberies are here committed with impunity and few people venture to leave the walls without being well armed and attended the deep gloom of the valley of hinnom the sterility of all around the silence and desolation so intense yet so close to the city the sort of memory with which i could trace each almost familiar spot from the tower of hippicus to the hill of scopus made this the most interesting excursion i ever undertook now we look down upon the pool and valley of jehan from the summit of mount zion now upon the vale of hinnom with the pool of siloam and aceldama beyond the brook now over mount moriah with the valley of jehoshaphat beneath and the village of siloam on the opposite side scattered along the banks where kidron used to flow then passing through the turkish cemetery and over the brook kidron we come to the venerable garden of gethsemane in which say the legends still stand the olive trees that sheltered christ this garden is only a small grove occupying perhaps two acres of ground but it is one of the best authenticated scenes of interest about jerusalem from it a steep and rocky path leads to the three summits of the mount of olives on the loftiest of which stands the church of the ascension an armenian priest admitted me into the sacred enclosure motioned to a little monk to lead about my horse and led the way in silence to the roof of the church from hence is the most interesting if not the most striking view in the world from such a summit might the great leader of the people have viewed the land which was to be the reward of their desert wanderings from it is laid bare every fibre of the great heart of palestine the atmosphere is like a crystal lens and every object in the holy city is as clear as if it lay within a few yards instead of a mile's distance each battlement upon those war-worn walls each wildflower that clusters over them 
the dogs prowling about the waste places among the ruins and cactus and cypress the turbaned citizens slowly moving in the streets all these are recognizable almost as clearly as the prominent features of the city the eminence called mount moriah lies nearest to our view just above the narrow valley of jehoshaphat the city wall passes over the center of it embracing a wide enclosure studded with cypresses and cedars in the center of which stands the magnificent mosque of omar this is of a very light fantastic architecture bristling with points and little spires and minarets many of which have gilded crescents that flash and gleam in the sunshine while the various groups of moslems seated on bright carpets or slowly wandering among the groves give life and animation to the scene the mosque occupies the site of the temple and is held holy by the moslem as the place where abraham offered isaac to be a sacrifice to the left of the mosque enclosure within the walls is a space covered with rubbish and jungles of the prickly pear then part of the hill of zion and david's tower to the right of the enclosure is the pool of bethesda beyond which st stephen's gate affords entrance to the via dolorosa a steep and winding street along which christ bore the cross in his ascent to calvary to the right of the street and toward the north stands the hill of acre on which salem the most ancient part of the city was built they say by melchizedek this hill is enclosed by the walls of the modern town but the hill of Bethesda lies yet farther to the right and was enclosed within the walls that the romans stormed beyond Bethesda stands the hill of scopus where from titus gazed upon jerusalem the day before its destruction and wept for the sake of the beautiful city beneath us is the garden of gethsemane the valley of hinnom with its tophet and the vale of jehoshaphat with its brook kidron which meets the waters of siloam at the well of job the tombs of the kings of nehemiah of absalom and of the judges lie before us the caves of the prophets everywhere pierce the rocks that have so often resounded to the war cry of the chaldean the roman the saracen and the crusader beyond the city spreads the vale of Rephaim, with bethlehem in the distance every rock and hill and valley that is visible bears some name that is rung in history and then the utter desolation that everywhere prevails as if it was all over with that land and the rocks had indeed fallen and the hills indeed had covered the mighty the beautiful and the brave who once dwelt there in prosperity and peace no flocks no husbandmen nor any living thing is there except a group of timid travellers turbaned figures and veiled women and a file of camels winding along the precipitous pathway under the shadow of the palm tree descending from the mount of olives i re-entered the city by st stephen's gate where turkish soldiers constantly keep guard turning to the left i visited the pool of bethesda and then wandered slowly over the via dolorosa in which is pointed out each spot where the saviour fell under the burden of the cross as he bore it to calvary along this steep and rugged way in after days i impatiently traversed the squalid city with a monk for my guide in search of its various localities of traditionary sanctity but i will not ask the reader to stoop to such a labour my monkish cicerone pointed out to me where Divas lived where lazarus lay where the cock crowed or roosted that warned peter of his crime and even where the blessed virgin used to wash her son's linen it is difficult to speak of such things gravely and yet i would not have one light feeling or expression intermingled with the solemn subjects of which this chapter attempts to treat the character of the city within corresponds with that of the country without most of it very solitary and silent echo only answers to your horse's tread and frequent waste places among which the wild dog prowls convey an indescribable impression of desolation it is not those waste places alone that give such an air of loneliness to the city but many of the streets themselves dark dull and mournful looking seem as if the templar's armed tread was the last to which they had resounded the bazaars and places of business 
are confined to one small quarter of the city. Everywhere else you generally find yourself alone. No one is even there to point out your way, and you come unexpectedly upon the pool of Bethesda, or wander among the vaulted ruins of the hospitaller's courts, without knowledge. The remains of the ancient city that meet your eye are singularly few. Here and there a column is led into the wall, or you find that the massive and uneven pavement is of costly marble. But, except the pools of Hezekiah and Bethesda, the town of Hippicus, and some few other remains preserved on account of their utility, there is little of art to connect the memory with the past. The chief place of interest in Jerusalem is the Holy Sepulchre, whose site I believe to be as real as the panorama that the priests have gathered around it, must needs be false. You descend by a narrow lane and a flight of steps into a small enclosure, where a guard of Turkish soldiers is stationed to keep peace among the Christians. After paying tribute to this infidel police, you enter into a large circular hall, supported by a colonnade of eighteen pillars and surrounded by a large dome, in the center of which is a pavilion containing the Holy Sepulchre. The whole of this church has been so frequently described that I shall only mention that within its walls are collected a panorama of all the events that took place at the crucifixion, the place where Christ was scourged, the hole in the rock where the cross stood, the fissure where the rock was rent in twain, the place where the soldiers cast lots for the garments, the stone whereon the body was anointed, and lastly, the grave wherein it was laid. End of chapter 29 Chapter 30 of Young People's Treasury, Volume 6, Famous Travels and Adventures. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty B. Young People's Treasury, Volume 6, Famous Travels and Adventures by Hamilton Wright, Maybe. The Great Ruins of Bashan by J. L. Porter. From the first moment of my arrival in Damascus, I felt an intense desire to visit the ancient kingdom of Bashan. The ancient cities and even the villages of western Palestine have been almost annihilated, with the exception of Jerusalem, Hebron, and two or three others. Not one stone has been left upon another. In some places, we can scarcely discover the spot where a noted city stood, so complete has been the desolation. Even in Jerusalem itself, only a very few vestiges of the ancient buildings remain. The Tower of David, portions of the wall of the temple area, and one or two other fragments, just enough to form the subject of dispute among antiquaries. The state of Bashan is totally different. It is literally crowded with towns and large villages, and, though the vast majority of them are deserted, they are not ruined. I have more than once entered a deserted city in the evening, taken possession of a comfortable house, and spent the night in peace. Many of the houses in the ancient cities of Bashan are as perfect as if finished only yesterday. The walls are sound, the roofs unbroken, the doors and even the window shutters in their places. Let not my readers think that I am transcribing a passage from the Arabian Nights. I am relating sober facts. I am simply telling what I have seen and what I propose more fully to describe. But how, you ask me, can we account for the preservation of ordinary dwellings in the land of ruins? If one of our modern English cities were deserted for a millennium, there would scarcely be a fragment of a wall standing. The reply is easy enough. The houses of Bashan are not ordinary houses. Their walls are from five to eight feet thick, built of large, squared blocks of basalt. The roofs are formed of slabs of the same material, hewn like planks, and reaching from wall to wall. The very doors and window shutters are of stone, hung upon pivots projecting above and below. Some of these ancient cities have from two to five hundred houses still perfect, but not a man to dwell in them. On one occasion, from the battlements of the castle of Salka, I counted some thirty towns and villages, dotting the surface of the vast plain, many of them almost as perfect as when they were built, and yet for more than five centuries 
there has not been a single inhabitant in one of them on a bright and balmy morning in february we defiled from the east gate of damascus rode for half an hour among the orchards that skirt the old city and then turning to the left struck out along a broad beaten path through the open fields in a southeasterly direction the leader was a wild-looking figure his dress was a red cotton tunic or shirt fastened round the waist by a broad leather girdle over it was a loose jacket of sheepskin the wool inside his feet and legs were bare on his head was a flame-colored handkerchief fastened above by a coronet of black camel's hair which left the ends and long fringe to flow over his shoulders he was mounted on an active shaggy pony with a pad for a saddle and a hair halter for a bridle before him across the back of his little steed he carried a long rifle his only weapon immediately behind him on powerful arab horses were three men in western costume one of these was the rider next came an arab who acted as dragoman or rather courier and two servants on stout hacks brought up the rear on gaining the beaten track our guide struck into a sharp canter the great city was soon left far behind and on turning we could see its tall white minarets shooting up from the sombre foliage and thrown into bold relief by the dark background of anti-lebanon the plain spread out on each side smooth as a lake covered with the delicate green of the young grain here and there were long belts and large clumps of dusky olives from the midst of which rose the gray towers of a mosque or the white dome of a saint's tomb on the south the plain was shut in by a ridge of bare black hills appropriately named jebel el aswad the black mountains while away on the west in the distance hermon rose in all its majesty a pyramid of spotless snow from whatever point one sees it there are few landscapes in the world which for richness and soft enchanting beauty can be compared with the plain of damascus after riding about seven miles during which we passed straggling groups of men some on foot some on horses and donkeys and some on camels most of them dressed like our guide and all hurrying on in the same direction as ourselves we reached the eastern extremity of the black mountains and found ourselves on the sides of a narrow green vale through the center of which flows the river farpar a bridge here spans the stream and beyond it in the rich meadows the haran caravan was being marshalled up to this point the road is safe and may be traveled almost at any time but on crossing the awaj we enter the domains of the bedouin whose law is the sword and whose right is might our further progress was liable to be disputed at any moment the attacks of the bedouin when made are sudden and impetuous and resistance to be effectual must be prompt and decided during the winter season this eastern route is in general pretty secure as the arab tribes have their encampments far distant on the banks of the euphrates or in the interior of the desert but the war between the druze and the government which had just been concluded had drawn these daring marauders from their customary haunts and they endured the rain and snow of the syrian frontier in the name of plunder all seemed fully aware of this and appeared to feel here as elsewhere that the hand of the ishmaelite is against every man consequently stragglers hurried up and fell into the ranks bales and packages on mules and camels were rearranged and more carefully adjusted muskets and pistols were examined and cartridges got into a state of readiness armed men were placed in something like order along the sides of the file of animals and a few horsemen were sent on in front to scour the neighboring hills and the skirts of the great plain beyond so as to prevent surprise a number of druze who here joined the caravan and were easily distinguished by their snow-white turbans and bold manly bearing appeared to take the chief direction in these warlike preparations though as the caravan was mainly made up of christians one of these called musa was the nominal leader it was a strange and exciting scene and one would have thought that an attempt to reduce such a refractory and heterogeneous multitude of men and animals to anything like order would be absolutely useless 
some of the camels and donkeys breaking loose scattered their loads over the plain and spread confusion all around them others growled kicked and brayed drivers shouted and gesticulated men and boys ran through the crowd asking for missing brothers and companions horsemen galloped from group to group entreating and threatening by turns at length however the order was given to march it passed along from front to rear and the next moment every sound was hushed the very beasts seemed to comprehend its meaning for they fell quietly into their places and the long files now four and five abreast began to move over the grassy plain with a stillness that was almost painful the sun went down and the short twilight was made still shorter by heavy clouds which drifted across the face of the sky a thick rain began to fall which made the prospect of a night march or a bivouac equally unpleasant still i rode on through the darkness striving to dispel gloomy forebodings by the stirring memory of bashan's ancient glory and the thought that i was now treading its soil and on my way to the great cities founded and inhabited four thousand years ago by the giant Refrain. before the darkness set in musa had pointed out to me the towers of three or four of these cities rising above the rocky barrier of the Leha. How I strained my eyes in vain to pierce the deepening gloom. Now I knew that some of them must be close at hand. The sharp ring of my horse's feet on pavement startled me. This was followed by painful stumbling over loose stones and the twisting of his limbs among jagged rocks. The sky was black overhead, the ground black beneath. The rain was drifting in my face so that nothing could be seen. A halt was called, and it was with no little pleasure that I heard the order given for the caravan to rest till the moon rose. Is there any spot, I asked of an Arab at my side, where we could get shelter from the rain? There is a house ready for you, he answered. A house. Is there a house here? Hundreds of them. This is the town of Barak. We were conducted up a rugged winding path, which seemed, so far as we could make out in the dark, and by the motion of our horses, to be something like a ruinous staircase at length the dark outline of high walls began to appear against the sky and presently we entered a paved street here we were told to dismount and give our horses to the servants an arab struck a light and inviting us to follow passed through a low gloomy door into a spacious chamber i looked with no little interest round the apartment of which we had taken such unceremonious possession but the light was so dim and the walls roof and floor so black that i could make out nothing satisfactorily getting a torch from one of the servants i lighted it and proceeded to examine the mysterious mansion for though drenched with rain and wearied with a twelve hours ride i could not rest i felt an excitement such as i never before had experienced i could scarcely believe in the reality of what i saw and what i heard from my guides in reply to eager questions the house seemed to have undergone little change from the time its old master had left it and yet the thick nitrous crust on its floor showed that it had been deserted for long ages the walls were perfect nearly five feet thick built of large blocks of hewn stones without lime or cement of any kind the roof was formed of large slabs of the same black basalt lying as regularly and jointed as closely as if the workmen had only just completed them they measured twelve feet in length eighteen inches in breadth and six inches in thickness the ends rested on a plain stone cornice projecting about a foot from each side wall the chamber was twenty feet long twelve wide and ten high the outer door was a slab of stone four and a half feet high four wide and eight inches thick it hung on pivots formed of projecting parts of the slab working in sockets in the lintel and threshold and though so massive i was able to open and shut it with ease at one end of the room was a small window with a stone shutter an inner door also of stone but of finer workmanship and not quite so heavy as the other admitted to a chamber of the same size and appearance from it a much larger door communicated with a third chamber to which there was a descent by a flight of stone steps this was a spacious hall equal in width to the two rooms and about twenty-five feet long by twenty high 
a semicircular arch was thrown across it, supporting the stone roof and a gate so large that camels could pass in and out opened on the street. The gate was of stone and it appeared to have been open for ages. Here our horses were comfortably installed. Such were the internal arrangements of this strange old mansion. It had only one story and its simple massive style of architecture gave evidence of a very remote antiquity. On a large stone which formed the lintel of the gateway there was a Greek inscription, but it was so high up and my light so faint that I was unable to decipher it, though I could see that the letters were of the oldest type. It is probably the same which was copied by Burckhardt and which bears a date apparently equivalent to the year B.C. 306. Owing to the darkness of the night and the shortness of our stay, I was unable to ascertain from personal observation either the extent of Barak or the general character of its buildings, but the men who gathered around me when I returned to my chamber had often visited it. They said the houses were all like the one we occupied, only some smaller and a few larger, and that there were no great buildings. Barak stands on the northeast corner of the Laha, and was thus one of the frontier towns of ancient Argob. It is built upon rocks, and encompassed by rocks so wild and rugged as to render it a natural fortress. After a few hours' rest, the order for march was again given. We found our horses at the door, and mounting at once, we followed Musa. The rain had ceased, the sky was clear, and the moon shone brightly, half revealing the savage features of the environs of Barak. I can never forget that scene. Huge masses of shapeless rocks rose up here and there, among and around the houses, to the height of fifteen and twenty feet, their summits jagged and their sides all shattered. Between them were pits and yawning fissures, as many feet in depth, while the flat surfaces of naked rock were thickly strewn with huge boulders of basalt. The narrow, tortuous road by which Musa led us out was in places carried over chasms and in places cut through cliffs. An ancient aqueduct ran alongside of it, which in former days conveyed a supply of water from a neighboring winter stream to the tanks and reservoirs from which the town gets its present name, Barak, the tanks. These aqueducts appear to have been constructed as follows. A shaft was sunk to the depth of ten to twenty feet at a spot where it was supposed water might be found. Then a tunnel was excavated on the level of the bottom of the shaft and in the direction of the town to be supplied. At the distance of about one hundred yards, another shaft was sunk, connecting the tunnel with the surface, and so the work was carried on until it was brought close to the city, where a great reservoir was made. Some of these aqueducts are nearly twenty miles in length, and even if no living spring should exist along their whole course, they soon collect, in the rainy season, sufficient surface water to supply the largest reservoirs. Springs are rare in Bashan. It is a thirsty land, but cisterns of enormous dimensions, some open, others covered, are seen in every city and village. Scrambling through, or rather over, a ruinous gateway, we entered the city of Bathayana. A wide street lay before us, the pavement perfect, the houses on each side standing, streets and lanes branching off to the right and left. There was something inexpressibly mournful in riding along that silent street and looking in through half-open doors to one after another of those desolate houses with the rank grass and weeds in their courts and the brambles growing in festoons over the doorways and branches of trees shooting through the gaping rents in the old walls. The ring of our horses' feet on the pavement awakened the echoes of the city and startled many a strange tenant. Owls flapped their wings around the gray towers. Daws shrieked as they flew away from the housetops. Foxes ran in and out among the shattered dwellings, and two jackals rushed from an open door and scampered off along the street before us. One of the houses in which I rested for a time might almost be termed a palace. A spacious gateway with massive folding doors of stone opened from the street into a large court. On the left was a square tower some forty feet in height. Round the court and opening into it were the apartments, all in perfect preservation, and yet the place does not seem to have been inhabited for centuries. 
Greek inscriptions on the principal buildings prove that they existed at the commencement of our era, and in the whole town I did not see a solitary trace of Mohammedan occupation, so that it has probably been deserted for at least a thousand years. Salka is one of the most remarkable cities in Palestine. It has been long deserted, and yet, as nearly as I could estimate, five hundred of its houses are still standing, and from three to four hundred families might settle in it at any moment, without laying a stone or expending an hour's labor on repairs. The circumference of the town and castle together is about three miles. Besides the castle, a number of square towers, like the belfries of churches, and a few mosques appear to be the only public buildings. The castle occupies the summit of a steep conical hill, which rises to the height of some three hundred feet, and is the southern point of the mountain range of Bashan. Round the base of the hill is a deep moat, and another still deeper encircles the walls of the fortress. The building is a patchwork of various periods and nations. The foundations are Jewish, if not earlier. Roman rustic masonry appears about them, and over all is lighter Saracenic work, with beautifully interlaced inscriptions. The exterior walls are not much defaced, but the interior is one confused mass of ruins. The view from the top is wide and wonderfully interesting. It embraces the whole southern slope of the mountains, which, though rocky, are covered from bottom to top with artificial terraces and fields divided by stone fences. Wherever I turned my eyes, towns and villages were seen. On the section of the plain between south and east, I counted fourteen towns, all of them, so far as I could see with my telescope, habitable, like Salka, but entirely deserted. From this one spot I saw upward of thirty deserted towns. Not only is the country, plain and hillside alike, checkered with fenced fields, but groves of fig trees are here and there seen, and terraced vineyards still clothe the sides of some of the hills. These are neglected and wild, but not fruitless. Mahmoud tells us that they produce great quantities of figs and grapes, which are rifled year after year by the Bedouins in their periodical raids. Nowhere on earth is there such a melancholy example of tyranny, rapacity, and misrule as here. Fields, pastures, vineyards, houses, villages, cities, all alike deserted and waste. Even the few inhabitants that have hidden themselves among the rocky fastnesses and mountain defiles drag out a miserable existence, oppressed by robbers of the desert on the one hand and robbers of the government on the other. I could not but remark, while wandering through the streets and lanes of Korea, the biblical Kirioth, that the private houses bear the marks of the most remote antiquity. The few towers and temples, which inscriptions show to have been erected in the first centuries of the Christian era, are modern in comparison with the colossal walls and massive stone doors of the private houses. The simplicity of their style, their low roofs, the ponderous blocks of roughly hewn stone with which they are built, the great thickness of the walls, and the heavy slabs which form the ceilings, all point to a period far earlier than the Roman age, and probably even antecedent to the conquest of the country by the Israelites. Moses makes special mention of the strong cities of Bashan, and speaks of their high walls and gates. He tells us, too, in the same connection, that Bashan was called the land of the giants, or Raphaim, leaving us to conclude that the cities were built by giants. Now the houses of Kiriath and other towns of Bashan appear to be just dwellings as a race of giants would build. The walls, the roofs, but especially the ponderous gates, doors, and bars are in every way characteristic of a period when architecture was in its infancy, when giants were masons, and when strength and security were the grand requisites. I measured a door in Kiriath, it was nine feet high, four and a half feet wide, and ten inches thick, one solid slab of stone. I saw the folding doors of another town in the mountains, still larger and heavier. Time produces little effect on such buildings as these. The heavy stone slabs of the roofs resting on the massive walls make the structure as firm as if built of solid masonry, and the black basalt used is almost as hard as iron. These houses are the only specimens in the world 
of the ordinary private dwellings of remote antiquity. The monuments designed by the genius and reared by the wealth of imperial Rome are fast moldering to ruin in this land. Temples, palaces, tombs, fortresses are all shattered or prostrate in the dust, but the simple massive houses of the Rafaim are in many cases as perfect as if completed only yesterday. End of chapter 30「XXXI of Young People's Treasury, Volume 6, Famous Travels and Adventures, by Hamilton Wright Maybe. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Betty B. Ascent of Mount Ararat, by James Bryce. About 1 a.m. we got off, 13 in all, and made straight across the grassy hollows for the ridges which trend up toward the Great Cone, running parallel in a west northwesterly direction and enclosing between them several long narrow depressions hardly deep enough to be called valleys the kurds led the way and at first we made pretty good progress the cossacks seemed fair walkers though less stalwart than the kurds the pace generally was better than that with which swiss guides start however we were soon cruelly undeceived in twenty-five minutes there came a steep bit and at the top of it they flung themselves down on the grass to rest. So did we all. Less than half a mile farther, down they dropped again, and this time we were obliged to give the signal for resuming the march. In another quarter of an hour they were down once more, and so it continued for the rest of the way. Every ten minutes walking, it was seldom steep enough to be called actual climbing, was followed by seven or eight minutes of sitting still, smoking and chattering how they did chatter it was to no purpose that we continued to move on when they sat down or that we rose to go before they had sufficiently rested they looked at one another so far as i could make out by the faint light and occasionally they laughed but they would not and did not stir till such time as pleased themselves we were helpless impossible to go on alone impossible also to explain to them the reason why every moment was precious for the man who had acted as interpreter had been obliged to stay behind at sardar bulak and we were absolutely without means of communication with our companions one could not even be angry had there been any use in that for they were perfectly good-humoured it was all very well to beckon them or pull them by the elbow or clap them on the back they thought this was only our fun and sat still and chattered all the same. When it grew light enough to see the hands of a watch and mark how the hours advanced while the party did not, we began for a second time to despair of success. About 3 a.m. there suddenly sprang up from behind the median mountains the morning star, shedding a light such as no star ever gave in these northern climes of ours, a light that almost outshone the moon. An hour later it began to pale in the first faint flush of yellowish light that spread over the eastern heaven, and first the rocky masses above us, then little Ararat, throwing behind him a gigantic shadow, then the long lines of mountains beyond the Araxis became revealed, while the wide Araxis plain still lay dim and shadowy below. One by one the stars died out as the yellow turned to a deeper glow that shot forth in long streamers the rosy fingers of the dawn from the horizon to the zenith cold and ghostly lay the snows on the mighty cone till at last there came upon their topmost slope six thousand feet above us a sudden blush of pink swiftly it floated down the eastern face and touched and kindled the rocks just above us then the sun flamed out and in a moment the araxes valley and all the hollows of the savage ridges we were crossing were flooded with overpowering light. It was nearly six o'clock, and progress became easier now that we could see our way distinctly. The Cossacks seemed to grow lazier, halting as often as before and walking less briskly. In fact, they did not relish the exceeding roughness of the jagged lava ridges along whose tops or sides we toiled. I could willingly have lingered here myself, for in the hollows 
wherever a little soil appeared some interesting plants were growing whose similarity to and difference from the alpine species of western europe alike excited one's curiosity time allowed me to secure only a few i trusted to get more on the way back but this turned out to be impossible as we scrambled along a ridge above a long narrow winding glen filled with loose blocks one of the curds suddenly swooped down like a vulture from the height on a spot at the bottom and began peering and grubbing among the stones in a minute or two he cried out and the rest followed he had found a spring and by scraping in the gravel had made a tiny basin out of which we could manage to drink a little here was a fresh cause of delay everybody was thirsty and everybody must drink not only the water which as we afterwards saw trickle down hither under the stones from a snow-bed seven hundred feet higher but the water mixed with some whiskey from a flask my friend carried which even in this highly diluted state the cossacks took too heartily when at last we got them up and away again they began to waddle and straggle after a while two or three sat down and plainly gave us to see they would go no farther by the time we had reached a little snow-bed whence the now strong sun was drawing a stream of water and halted on the rocks beside it for breakfast there were only two cossacks and the four curds left with us the rest having scattered themselves about somewhere lower down we had no idea what instructions they had received nor whether indeed they had been told anything except to bring us as far as they could to see that the curds brought the baggage and to fetch us back again which last was essential for jaffar's peace of mind we concluded therefore that if left to themselves they would probably wait our return and the day was running on so fast that it was clear there was no more time to be lost in trying to drag them along with us accordingly i resolved to take what i wanted in the way of food and start at my own pace my friend who carried more weight and had felt the want of training on our way up decided to come no farther but wait about here and look out for me toward nightfall we noted the landmarks carefully the little snow bed the head of the glen covered with reddish masses of stone and gravel and high above it standing out of the face of the great cone of ararat a bold peak or rather projecting tooth of black rock which our cossacks called the monastery and which i suppose from the same fancied resemblance to a building is said to be called in tatar tak kalisa the church rock it is doubtless an old cone of eruption about thirteen thousand feet in height and is really the upper end of the long ridge we have been following which may perhaps represent a lava flow from it or the edge of a fissure which at this point found a vent it was an odd position to be in guides of two different races unable to communicate either with us or with one another guides who could not lead and would not follow guides one half of whom were supposed to be there to save us from being robbed and murdered by the other half but all of whom i am bound to say looked for the moment equally simple and friendly the swarthy iranian as well as the blue-eyed slav at eight o'clock i buckled on my canvas gaiters thrust some crusts of bread a lemon a small flask of cold tea four hard-boiled eggs and a few meat lozenges into my pocket bade good-bye to my friend and set off rather to our surprise the two cossacks and one of the kurds came with me whether persuaded by a pantomime of encouraging signs or simply curious to see what would happen the ice axe had hugely amused the cossacks all through climbing the ridge to the left and keeping along its top for a little way i then struck across the semicircular head of a wide glen in the middle of which a little lower lay a snow bed over a long steep slope of loose broken stones and sand this slope a sort of talus or screen as they say in the lake country was excessively fatiguing from the want of firm foothold and when i reached the other side i was already so tired and breathless having been on foot since midnight that it seemed almost useless to persevere farther however on the other side i got upon solid rock where the walking was better and was soon environed by a multitude of rills bubbling down over the stones from the stone slopes above 
the summit of Little Ararat, which had for the last two hours provokingly kept at the same apparent height above me, began to sink, and before ten o'clock I could look down upon its small flat top, studded with lumps of rock, but bearing no trace of a crater. Mounting steadily along the same ridge, I saw at a height of over thirteen thousand feet, lying on the loose blocks, a piece of wood about four feet long and five inches thick, evidently cut by some tool, and so far above the limit of trees that it could by no possibility be a natural fragment of one. Darting on it with a glee that astonished the Cossack and the Kurd, I held it up to them and repeated several times the word Noah. The Cossack grinned, but he was such a cheery, genial fellow that I think he would have grinned whatever I had said and I cannot be sure that he took my meaning, and recognized the wood as a fragment of the true ark. Whether it was really gopher wood, of which material the ark was built, I will not undertake to say, but am willing to submit to the inspection of the curious the bit which I cut off with my ice axe and brought away. Anyhow, it will be hard to prove that it is not gopher wood, and if there be any remains of the ark on Ararat at all, a point as to which the natives are perfectly clear. Here rather than the top is the place where one might expect to find them, since in the course of ages they would get carried down by the onward movement of the snow beds along the declivities. This wood, therefore, suits all the requirements of the case. In fact, the argument is for the case of a relic exceptionally strong. The crusaders who found the holy lance at Antioch the archbishop who recognized the holy coat at Treves, not to speak of many others, proceeded upon slighter evidence. I am, however, bound to admit that another explanation of the presence of this piece of timber on the rocks of this vast height did occur to me, but as no man is bound to discredit his own relic, and such is certainly not the practice of the Armenian church, I will not disturb my readers' minds or yield to the rationalizing tendencies of the age by suggesting it. Fearing that the ridge by which we were mounting would become too precipitous higher up, I turned off to the left, and crossed a long narrow snow slope that descended between this ridge and another line of rocks more to the west. It was firm, and just steep enough to make steps cut in the snow comfortable, though not necessary, so the ice axe was brought into use. The Cossack, who accompanied me, there was but one now, for the other Cossack had gone away to the right some time before, and was quite lost to view, had brought my friend's alpenstock, and was developing a considerable capacity for wielding it. He followed nimbly across, but the Kurd stopped on the edge of the snow and stood peering and hesitating, like one who shivers on the plank at a bathing place, nor could the jeering cries of the Cossack induce him to venture on the treacherous surface. Meanwhile, we who had crossed were examining the broken cliff which rose above us. It looked not exactly dangerous, but a little troublesome, as if it might want some care to get over or through. So after a short rest, I stood up, touched my Cossack's arm, and pointed upward. He reconnoitered the cliff with his eye and shook his head. Then, with various gestures of hopefulness, I clapped him on the back and made as if to pull him along. He looked at the rocks again and pointed to them, stroked his knees, turned up and pointed to the soles of his boots, which certainly were suffering from the lava, and once more solemnly shook his head. This was conclusive, so I conveyed to him by pantomime that he had better go back to the bivouac where my friend was, rather than remain here alone, and that I hoped to meet him there in the evening took an affectionate farewell, and turned toward the rocks. There was evidently nothing for it but to go on alone. It was half-past ten o'clock, and the height about 13,600 feet, little Ararat now lying nearly 1,000 feet below the eye. Not knowing how far the ridge I was following might continue passable, I was obliged to stop frequently to survey the rocks above and erect little piles of stone to mark the way. This not only consumed time, but so completely absorbed the attention that for hours together I scarcely noticed the marvelous landscape spread out beneath, 
and felt the solemn grandeur of the scenery far less than many times before on less striking mountains. Solitude at great heights or among majestic rocks or forests commonly stirs in us all deep veins of feeling, joyous or saddening, or more often of joy and sadness mingled. Here the strain on the observing senses seemed too great for fancy or emotion to have any scope. When the mind is preoccupied by the task of the moment, imagination is checked. This was a race against time, in which I could only scan the cliffs for a route, refer constantly to the watch, husband my strength by morsels of food taken at frequent intervals, and endeavor to conceive how a particular block or bit of slope which it would be necessary to recognize would look when seen the other way in descending. All the way up this rock slope, which proved so fatiguing that for the fourth time I had almost given up hope, I kept my eye fixed on its upper end to see what signs there were of crags or snowfields above. But the mist lay steadily at the point where the snow seemed to begin, and it was impossible to say what might be hidden behind that soft white curtain. As little could I conjecture the height I had reached by looking around, as one so often does on mountain ascents, upon other summits, for by this time I was thousands of feet above Little Ararat, the next highest peak visible, and could scarcely guess how many thousands. From this tremendous height it looked more like a broken obelisk than an independent summit, 12,800 feet in height. Clouds covered the farther side of the great snow basin and were seething like waves about the savage pinnacles, the towers of the Jinn Palace, which guard its lower margin, and past which my upward path had lain. With mists to the left and above, and a range of black precipices cutting off all view to the right, there came a vehement sense of isolation and solitude, and I began to understand better the awe with which the mountain silence inspires the Kurdish shepherds. Overhead the sky had turned from dark blue to an intense bright green, a color whose strangeness seemed to add to the weird terror of the scene. It wanted barely an hour to the time when I had resolved to turn back, and as I struggled up the crumbling rocks, trying now to right and now to left, where the foothold looked a little firmer, I began to doubt whether there was strength enough left to carry me an hour higher. At length, the rock slope came suddenly to an end, and I stepped out upon the almost level snow at the top of it, coming at the same time into the clouds which naturally clung to the colder surfaces. A violent west wind was blowing, and the temperature must have been pretty low, for a big icicle at once enveloped the lower half of my face, and did not melt till I got to the bottom of the cone, four hours afterward. Unluckily, I was very thinly clad, the stout tweed coat reserved for such occasions having been stolen on a Russian railway. The only expedient to be tried against the piercing cold was to tighten in my loose light coat by winding around the waist a Spanish faja, or scarf, which I had brought up to use in case of need as a neck wrapper. Its bright purple looked odd enough in such surroundings, but as there was nobody there to notice, appearances did not much matter. In the mist, which was now thick, the eye could pierce only some thirty yards ahead, so I walked on over the snow five or six minutes following the rise of its surface, which was gentle, and fancying there might still be a good long way to go. To mark the backward track, I trailed the point of the ice axe along behind me in the soft snow, for there was no longer any landmark, all was cloud on every side. Suddenly, to my astonishment, the ground began to fall away to the north. I stopped, a puff of wind drove off the mists on one side, the opposite side to that by which I had come, and showed the Araxes plain at an abysmal depth below. It was the top of Ararat. End of chapter 31《Chapter 32 of Young People's Treasury, Volume 6, Famous Travels and Adventures by Hamilton Wright Mabey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Betty B. The Lost City of Petra by Johann Ludwig Burckhardt. South of the Dead Sea, 
at about sixteen hours distance from the extremity of that body of water is the valley of araba running in almost a straight line declining to the west as far as akaba at the extremity of the eastern branch of the red sea the existence of this valley appears to have been unknown to ancient as well as to modern geographers although it is a very remarkable feature in the geography of syria and arabia petraea and is still more interesting for its productions in this valley of the jordan the manna is still found it drops from the sprigs of several trees but principally from the garab it is collected by the arabs who make cakes of it and who eat it with butter they call it asal beirut or the honey of beirut indigo gum arabic and the silk tree called ashiar whose fruit encloses a white silky substance from which the arabs twist their matches grow in this valley i was particularly desirous of visiting wadi musa of the antiquities of which i had heard the country people speak in terms of great admiration and from thence i had hoped to cross the desert in a straight line to cairo but my guide was afraid of the hazards of a journey through the desert and insisted on my taking the road to akaba the ancient ezion jiber at the extremity of the eastern branch of the red sea where he said we might join some caravan and continue our route toward egypt i wished on the contrary to avoid akaba as i knew that the pasha of egypt kept there a numerous garrison to watch the movements of the wahhabis and of his rival the pasha of damascus a person therefore like myself coming from the latter place without any papers to show who i was or why i had taken that circuitous route would certainly have roused the suspicions of the officer commanding at akaba and the consequences might have been dangerous to me among the savage soldiery of that garrison the road from shobak to akaba lies to the east of wadi musa and to have quitted it out of mere curiosity to see the wadi would have looked suspicious in the eyes of the arabs i therefore pretended to have made a vow to slaughter a goat in honour of harun aaron whose tomb i knew was situated at the extremity of the valley and by this stratagem i thought that i should have the means of seeing the valley on my way to the tomb to this my guide had nothing to oppose the dread of drawing down upon himself by resistance the wrath of harun completely silenced him i hired a guide to eldj to conduct me to harun's tomb and paid him with a pair of old horseshoes he carried the goat and gave me a skin of water to carry as he knew there was no water in the wadi below in following the rivulet of eldj westward the valley soon narrows again and it is here that the antiquities of wadi musa petra begin of these i regret that i am not able to give a very complete account but i knew well the character of the people around me i was without protection in the midst of a desert where no traveller had ever before been seen and a close examination of these works of the infidels as they are called would have excited suspicions that i was a magician in search of treasures i should at least have been detained and prevented from prosecuting my journey to egypt and in all probability should have been stripped of the little money which i possessed and what was of infinitely more value to me of my journal future travellers may visit the spot under the protection of an armed force the inhabitants will become more accustomed to the researches of strangers and the antiquities of wadi musa will then be found to rank among the most curious works of ancient art the approach to wadi musa is a ravine in places only twelve feet wide and with rocky walls one hundred feet high along this ravine are the famous ruin of petra the kushna or treasury of pharaoh and a theatre both cut in the solid rock the floor of the valley within about two miles wide is strewn with ruins near the west end of wadi musa are the remains of a stately edifice of which part of the wall is still standing the inhabitants call it kasir bint farun or the palace of pharaoh's daughter in my way i had entered several sepulchres to the surprise of my guide but when he saw me turn out of the footpath towards the kasir he exclaimed i see now clearly that you are an infidel 
who has some particular business among the ruins of the city of your forefathers but depend upon it that we shall not suffer you to take out a single para of all the treasures hidden therein for they are in our territory and belong to us i replied that it was mere curiosity that prompted me to look at the ancient works and that i had no other view in coming there than to sacrifice to harun but he was not easily persuaded and i did not think it prudent to irritate him by too close an inspection of the palace as it might have led him to declare on our return his belief that i had found treasures which might have led to a search of my person and to the detection of my journal which would most certainly have been taken from me as a book of magic it was of no avail to tell them to follow me and see whether i searched for money their reply was of course you will not dare to take it out before us but we know that if you are a skilful magician you will order it to follow you through the air to whatever place you please the sun had already set when we arrived on the plain it was too late to reach the tomb and i was excessively fatigued i therefore hastened to kill the goat in sight of the tomb at a spot where i found a number of heaps of stones placed there in token of as many sacrifices in honor of that saint while i was in the act of slaying the animal my guide exclaimed aloud o harun look upon us it is for you we slaughter this victim o harun be content with our good intentions for it is but a lean goat o harun smooth our paths and praise be to the lord of all creatures this he repeated several times after which he covered the blood that had fallen to the ground with a heap of stones we then dressed the best part of the flesh for our supper as expeditiously as possible for the guide was afraid of the fire being seen and of its attracting thither some robbers on our return we crossed the valley of araba ascended on the other side of it the barren mountain of bayan and entered the desert called el tih which is the most barren and horrid tract of country i have ever seen black flints cover the chalky or sandy ground which in most places is without any vegetation the tree which produces the gum arabic grows in some spots and the tamarisk is met with here and there but the scarcity of water forbids much extent of vegetation and the hungry camels are obliged to go in the evening for whole hours out of the road in order to find some withered shrubs upon which to feed during ten days forced marches we passed only four springs or wells of which only one at about eight hours east of suez was of sweet water the others were brackish or sulphurous we passed at a short distance to the north of suez and arrived at cairo by the pilgrim road i left hada disguised as a mussulman pilgrim to mecca my guide who knew nothing further respecting me than that i had business with the pasha at taif that i performed all the outward observances of a moslem pilgrim and that i had been liberal to him before our departure asked me the reason of his having been ordered to take me by the northern road i replied that it was probably thought shorter than the other that is a mistake he replied the mecca road is quite as short and much safer and if you have no objection we will proceed by that this was just what i wished though i had taken care not to betray any anxiety on the subject and we accordingly followed the great road in company with the other travellers rez el Kora is the most beautiful spot in the heja and more picturesque and delightful than any spot i had seen since my departure from lebanon in syria the top of jebel Kora is flat but large masses of granite lie scattered over it the surface of which like that of the granite rocks near the second cataract of the nile is blackened by the sun several small rivulets descend from this peak and irrigate the plain which is covered with verdant fields and large shady trees on the side of the granite rocks to those who have known only the dreary and scorching sands of the lower country of the heja the scene is as surprising as the keen air which blows here is refreshing many of the fruit trees of europe are found here figs apricots peaches apples the egyptian sycamore almonds pomegranates but particularly vines the produce of which is of the best quality after passing through this delightful district for about half an hour just as the sun was rising 
when every leaf and blade of grass diffused a fragrance as delightful to the smell as was the landscape to the eye i halted near the largest of the rivulets which although not more than two paces across nourishes upon its banks a green alpine turf such as the mighty nile with all its luxuriance can never produce in egypt at the northeast corner of the kaaba near the door is the famous black stone it forms a part of the sharp angle of the building at four or five feet above the ground it is an irregular oval of about seven inches in diameter with an undulating surface composed of about a dozen smaller stones of different sizes and shapes well joined together with a small quantity of cement and perfectly smoothed it looks as if the whole had been broken into many pieces by a violent blow and then united again it is very difficult to determine accurately the quality of this stone which has been worn to its present surface by the millions of touches and kisses it has received it appeared to me like a lava containing several small extraneous particles of a whitish and of a yellowish substance its color is now a deep reddish brown approaching to black it is surrounded on all sides by a border composed of a substance which i took to be a close cement of pitch and gravel of a similar but not quite the same brownish color this border serves to support its detached pieces it is of two or three inches in breadth and rises a little above the surface of the stone both the border and the stone itself are encircled by a silver band broader below than above and on the two sides with a considerable swelling below as if a part of the stone were hidden under it the lower part of the border is studded with silver nails in the procession to mount ararat every pilgrim issued from his tent to walk over the plains and take a view of the busy crowds assembled there long streets of tents fitted up as bazaars furnished all kinds of provisions the syrian and egyptian cavalry were exercised by their chiefs early in the morning while thousands of camels were seen feeding on the dry shrubs of the plain all around the camp the syrian hajj was encamped on the south and southwest side of the mountain an isolated mass of granite about two hundred feet high the egyptian on the southeast around the house of the sherif yaha himself was encamped with his bedouin troops and in its neighborhood were all the hejaz people mohammed ali and Soleiman, pasha of damascus as well as several of their officers had very handsome tents but the most magnificent of all was that of the wife of mohammed ali the mother of hunsun pasha and ibrahim pasha who had lately arrived from cairo for the hajj with a truly royal equipage five hundred camels being necessary to transport her baggage from jidda to mecca her tent was in fact an encampment consisting of a dozen tents of different sizes inhabited by her women the whole enclosed by a wall of linen cloth eight hundred paces in circuit the single entrance to which was guarded by eunuchs in splendid dresses around this enclosure were pitched the tents of the men who formed her numerous suite the beautiful embroidery on the exterior of this linen palace with the varied colors displayed in every part of it constituted an object which reminded me of some descriptions in the familiar arabian tales of the thousand and one nights when the preacher began his sermon the two pashas with their whole cavalry drawn up in two squadrons behind them took their post in the rear of the deep line of camels of the hajis to which those of the people of the hejaz were also joined and here they waited in solemn and respectful silence till the conclusion of the sermon further removed from the preacher was the sherif yaya with a small body of soldiers distinguished by several green standards carried before him the two mammals or holy camels which carry on their backs the high structure that serves as the banner of their respective caravans made way with difficulty through the ranks of camels that encircled the southern and eastern sides of the hill opposite to the preacher and took their station surrounded by their guards directly under the platform in front of him the preacher or katyib who is usually the khadid of mecca 
was mounted upon a finely comparisoned camel which had been led up to the steps it being traditionally said that mohammed was always seated when he addressed his followers a practice in which he was imitated by all the caliphs who came to the hajj and who from thence addressed their subjects in person the turkish gentleman of constantinople however unused to camel riding could not keep his seat so well as the hardy bedouin prophet and the camel becoming unruly he was soon obliged to alight from it he read his sermon from a book in arabic which he held in his hands at intervals of every four or five minutes he paused and stretched forth his arms to implore blessings from above while the assembled multitudes around and before him waved the skirts of their irams over their heads and rent the air with shouts of lebek allah huma lebek here we are at thy bidding o god during the wavings of the irams the skirts of the mountain thickly crowded as it was by the people in their white garments had the appearance of a cataract of water while the green umbrellas with which several thousand hajis sitting on their camels below were provided bore some resemblance to a verdant plain End of chapter thirty two chapter thirty three of young people's treasury volume six famous travels and adventures by hamilton wright maybe this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by betty b the ride to kiva by frederick g burnaby having once resolved to go to central asia the next question was how to execute my intention and on returning to england from africa i eagerly read every book that could be found and which seemed likely to give any information about the country which i proposed to visit van Berry's travels abbott's from herat to kiva and mcgahan's campaigning on the oxus were each in turn studied and judging by the difficulties that the gallant correspondent of the new york herald had to overcome before he carried his project of reaching kiva into execution i felt convinced that the task i had laid out for myself was anything but an easy one the time of year in which i should have to attempt the journey was another obstacle to the undertaking for my leave of absence from my regiment would not begin until december i had already in previous journeys through russia discovered what the term cold really means in that country and judging from the weather experienced by captain abbott when travelling in the month of march in a latitude a good deal to the south of that which seemed to me the most practicable i felt convinced that careful preparations must be made for a ride through the steppes in midwinter or that i should inevitably be frozen the cold of the kirghiz desert is a thing unknown i believe in any other part of the world or even in the arctic region an enormous expanse of flat country extending for hundreds of miles and devoid of everything save snow and salt lakes and here and there sac savol a species of bramble tree would have to be traversed on horseback ere kiva could be reached the winds in those parts of asia are unknown to the inhabitants of europe who when they grumble at the so-called east wind can little imagine what that wind is like in those countries which lie exposed to the full fury of its first onslaught for there you meet with no warm ocean to mollify its rigor no tree no rising land no hills or mountains to check it in its course and it blows on uninterruptedly over a vast snow and salt-covered track until absorbing the saline matter it cuts the faces of those exposed to its gusts with a sensation more like the application of the edge of a razor than anything else to which it can be likened there was beside this something else to be taken into consideration i was well aware that no assistance could be expected from the russian authorities who might not content themselves by indirectly throwing obstacles in my way but might even stop me by sheer force if they found all others fail the account of the prohibitory order which i had seen published in the pall mall gazette was i had every reason to believe correct and should i not find after crossing the ural river and entering asia that my long sleigh journey had been all to no purpose and have to retrace my steps through european russia 
these were my first impressions on arriving in england but on talking the matter over with some russians of my acquaintance they assured me that i was entirely mistaken that on the contrary the authorities of st petersburg would readily permit english officers to travel in central asia and it was observed that the order to which i had alluded referred only to merchants or people who tried to smuggle contraband goods into the recently annexed canates a few months later i had the honor of making the acquaintance of his excellency count shuvalov the russian ambassador in london and formerly the head of the secret police at st petersburg he was excessively kind and promised to do what he could to further my plans but in answer to a straightforward question as to whether i should be permitted to travel in russian asia or not his reply was my dear sir that is a subject about which i cannot give you any answer but on arriving at st petersburg the authorities there will be able to afford you every possible information it was a diplomatic answer one which bound the count to nothing and i went away charmed with the tact and affability of the russian ambassador apparently there was nothing to be learned officially from russian sources but unofficially one by one many little bits of information crept out i now learned that general milutin the minister of war at st petersburg was personally very opposed to the idea of an english officer travelling in central asia particularly in that part which lies between the boundaries of british india and russia according to him a russian traveller a mr pacino had not been well treated by the authorities in india and this gentleman had not been permitted to enter afghanistan and in consequence general militin did not see why he should allow an englishman to do what was denied to a russian subject another peculiarity which i remarked in several russians whose acquaintance i had at that time the honour of making it may here be not out of place to mention this was their desire to impress upon my mind the great advantage it would be for england to have a civilized neighbour like russia on her indian frontier and when i did not take the trouble to dissent from their views for it is a waste of breath to argue with russians about this question how eager they were for me to impress their line of thought upon the circle of people with whom i was the more immediately connected of course the arguments brought forward were based upon purely philanthropic motives upon christianity and civilization they said that the two great powers ought to go together hand in glove that there ought to be railways all through asia formed by anglo-russian companies that russia and england had every sympathy in common which should unite them that they both hated germany and loved france that england and russia could conquer the world and so on it was a line of reasoning delightfully russian though i was not so rude as to differ from my would-be persuaders and lent an attentive ear to all their eloquence i could not help thinking that the mutual sympathy between england and germany is much greater than that between england and russia that the greek faith as practised by the lower orders in russia is pure paganism in comparison with the protestant religion which exists in prussia and great britain that germany and great britain are natural allies against russia or any other power aggressively disposed toward them that germans and englishmen who are well acquainted with russia understand by the term russian civilization something diametrically opposite to what is attributed to it by those people who form their ideas of muscovite progress from the few russians whom they meet abroad and that the honduras railway would be a paying concern to its english shareholders in comparison with an anglo-russian line to be constructed in central asia with english capital and russian directors the time was wearing on november was drawing to a close my leave of absence would begin on the first day of the following month and on that day i must begin my travels preparations were rapidly made under the advice of captain allen young of arctic fame i ordered a huge waterproof and consequently airproof bag of prepared sailcloth the bag was seven feet and a half long and ten feet around a large aperture was left on one side and the traveller could thus take up his quarters inside and sleep well protected from the cold winds the bag would also be useful in many other ways and i found it of great convenience for every other person save the one for which it was originally intended 
the manufacturer not calculating on the enormous dimensions an individual assumes when enveloped in furs had not made the aperture large enough and the consequence was that the difficulties when i attempted to take a header into the recess of my sleeping apartment were almost insurmountable and only on one occasion and when clad somewhat more lightly than usual i succeeded in effecting an entrance four pairs of the thickest scotch fishing stockings were also ordered and jerseys and flannel shirts of a texture to which people in this country are but little accustomed then came a suit of clothes made by messrs kinney of regent street and in which they assured me it would be impossible to feel cold the clothes i must admit were exceptionally well made and well suited to be worn under a sheepskin attire but i cannot wish my worst enemy a greater punishment than forcing him to sleep out on the steps in winter time with cloth attire no matter how thick fur or skins of some kind must be worn or without this precaution the traveller should he once close his eyes will undergo a great risk of never opening them again two pairs of boots lined with fur were also taken and for physic with which it is as well to be supplied when travelling in out-of-the-way places some quinine and cockles pills the latter a most invaluable medicine and one which i have used on the natives of central africa with the greatest possible success in fact the marvellous effects produced upon the mind and body of an arab sheik who was impervious to all native medicines when i administered to him five cockles pills will never fade from my memory and a friend of mine who passed through the same district many months afterward informed me that my fame as a medicine man had not died out but that the marvellous cure was even then a theme of conversation in the bazaar so far as i could learn from the books which related to central asia there would be but little game and nothing particular in the shape of sport so i determined not to take a rifle when the cartridges would have considerably added to the weight of my luggage the prime object being to travel as light as possible however as it was well to have some sort of gun in the event of falling in with wild fowl which i had been told abounded in some places i took a favorite old number twelve small bore and some cartridges made up with number five shot and ball in the event of falling in with any bears or wolves while a regulation revolver with about twenty cartridges made up my defensive arsenal in the event of an attack from the turkomans the next thing to be thought of was a cooking apparatus and if i had taken the advice of many kind friends i should have travelled with a battery de cuisine sufficient for the wants of mr sawyer himself but canteens could not be thought of for a moment on account of the extra weight so i limited myself to two soldiers mess tins and admirable little utensils that are too whether for cooking over a spirit lamp or on a fire and far superior to any of the more costly and cumbersome articles especially invented to get out of order and perplex the traveller a trooper's hold-all with the accompanying knife fork and spoon completed my kit and with the thermometer barometer and pocket sexton by way of instruments i was ready to start even this amount of luggage was much more than was desirable and when placing the baggage for my journey consisting of the sleeping sack a pair of saddle bags railway bag and gun into the scales i found that it weighed exactly eighty five pounds an officer in the foot guards my friend k wished very much to accompany me in my journey and he would have been a most cheery and agreeable companion as he was accustomed to travel and capable of roughing it to any amount but as he was ignorant of russian and by this time i was thoroughly aware of the difficulties that would most likely be thrown in my way and of the little chance i had of getting to kiva alone i was compelled at the last moment with great reluctance to decline his proposal on the track again but this time alone in my apartment till i was joined by an official whose business it was to inspect the line between moscow and riayan his chief object was to find out if any unnecessary delays took place at the different stations on this railway a number of complaints having been lately made about the unpunctuality of the trains it was supposed to be the station master's fault and that these officials being slack in the performance of their duties were the main cause of the delay 
i could easily find them out remarked the inspector if it were not for the confounded telegraph but that beats me for the rugs are all in collusion the one with the other and as soon as ever they see me on the platform they telegraph the intelligence to their brethren down the line it appeared that there used formerly to be a great deal of fraud committed on the railway companies in russia by the guards of the trains who would ask a passenger when about to take his ticket at the booking office what class are you going by if by the first or second the guard would say take a third class ticket give me a few roubles and i will let you go first class as i am guard of the train by which you will travel but according to the inspector this system of roguery has now been put down and the result is a better return on the railway capital although up to the present time the lines have been anything but remunerative to investors from the inspector i found out that i ought to have taken my ticket to Sizerin, which was the terminus of the line in the direction of orenburg but that it was too late now to pay the difference and that i must wait till we arrived at penza when i should just have time to get a new ticket and relabel my luggage it was a bitter cold night in spite of all our furs and at riayan where it was necessary to wait an hour and to change trains a fellow traveller a russian nobleman who had got into the carriage at an intermediate station was very indignant with the stoker whose business it was to keep up the fire and repeatedly called him the son of an animal the culprit trembling and crying out as if he were under the lash of a whip it will take a good many years thoroughly to eliminate the old spirit of serfdom in russia although the law has long ceased to exist and the men who have been brought up as slaves find it difficult to get rid of a feeling of awe when they are in the presence of their superiors perhaps it is as well that things follow on in this groove for it would be a bitter day for russia should the socialistic and nihilistic tendencies which are being developed in her larger towns become extended amidst her rural population at the present moment the love for the emperor predominates over every feeling but one amidst the peasantry and this devotion to their father as he is termed is well deserved for the emperor alexander underwent an enormous personal risk when at one stroke of the pen he did away with slavery in his dominions it was a step which required great moral courage on the part of its originator and few emperors would have risked mortally offending the upper classes of the country even to do an act of justice to the lower probably the only influence which could be brought to bear upon a peasant's mind to such an extent that i believe it would counterbalance his affection for the czar is the religious one in perhaps no country in the world has this element so powerful a sway as in russia in religion coupled with superstition lay a power which could even thwart the wishes of the emperor nicholas himself and the ecclesiastical hierarchy is certainly more powerful than the czar hitherto the two dominant influences have gone hand in glove together and it is as well that it should be so for any rupture between them would inevitably lead to a revolution in the waiting-room at ryashk waiters were hurrying about with glasses of scalding tea which were eagerly called for by the traveller in fact the amount of this beverage that a russian can drink is somewhat astonishing to the stranger and the traditional washerwoman of our country whose capabilities in this respect are supposed to be unrivalled would have no chance whatever if pitted against a subject of the czar a large samovar a brass urn stood on the refreshment table the water being kept to boiling point not by a funnel as in england but by a funnel which fitted into the centre of the urn and was filled with red-hot charcoal economy was evidently the order of the day with some of the travellers for instead of putting the sugar into their glasses they would take a lump in their mouths and thus sweeten the scalding draught i took advantage of our delay at riach and walked through the other waiting-rooms these were crammed with third-class passengers it was a strange sight to see the mixture of different nationalities which huddled together like sheep lay in different attitudes on the floor here a tartar merchant his head covered with a small yellow fez while a long party-coloured gown and a pair of high boots completed his attire was fast asleep in a corner a woman her face covered with a thick white veil lay folded in his arms while a child enveloped in a bundle of rags 
was playing with the fur cap of its parent next to them a man whose peculiarly shaped nose showed a distinct relationship to the tribe of israel was breathing hard through his nasal organ from time to time he clutched convulsively at a small leather bag which half hidden beneath a greasy-looking black coat was even in his dreams a source of anxiety peasants in every posture their well-knit frames clad in untanned leather which was tightly girt about their loins with narrow leather belts studded with buttons of brass and silver re-echoed the hebrew's melody an old bacharan in flowing robes sat listlessly with his legs twisted up under him beside the stove he appeared to be under the influence of opium and was possibly dreaming of celestial houris and bliss to come while a smart-looking lad perhaps his son judging from the likeness between them had withdrawn a little from the rest of the throng apparently not very well pleased by his vicinity to the russian peasants the mohammedans of central asia have certainly one great advantage over the muzhik and that is their love for water indeed if the russian peasant could only be persuaded to be a little more particular in his ablutions it would be conducive if not to his own comfort at least to that of his fellow travellers superstition and dirt are twin brothers in russia and i have frequently observed that the more particular a peasant is in his adoration of the various idols obradis which are prominently displayed on the threshold of every cottage the more utterly he is forgetful of the advantages of soap and water at penza i had barely time to secure another ticket to Cizeran, where my railway travelling would terminate and presently found myself in a large saloon carriage here almost every seat was taken and the porters had piled upon them some railway bags and parcels belonging to passengers travelling in another carriage these articles had been put in while the owners were in the waiting-room the object being to diminish the length of the train this was attained but at the cost of considerable discomfort to the travellers who were eagerly searching for their lost property by the dim light of a smoky tallow dip in the course of conversation with one of the party a tall and very stout middle-aged man i discovered that my shortest route to orenburg would be through samara he said that he was going to the last mentioned town and proposed that we should hire a troika a three-horse sleigh and travel together i readily embraced the offer when after a few hours more travelling we stepped out on the platform of the station at Cizeran. here my companion was evidently well known for the railway officials and porters respectfully saluted him and hastened to bring our luggage to the waiting-room i must say that i was surprised to find so good a refreshment room so far from the capital as with but very short halts for the purpose of changing trains we had been travelling for more than sixty hours and all this time in the direction of asia on nearing which you expect at each stride to leave civilization farther and farther in your wake but the buffet at Cizeran left nothing to be desired and in a very short time as good a breakfast was supplied as could be obtained in any french restaurant we now had to think over the preparations for our sleigh journey and after a little bargaining my companion made arrangements with a farmer in the neighbourhood to supply us with a sleigh and relays of horses as far as samara the distance is about eighty-five miles and there is no regular government postal station between the two towns you had better put on plenty of clothes was the friendly caution i received from my companion as i entered the dressing-room for the thermometer marks twenty degrees below zero rumour and there is a wind people in this country who have never experienced a russian winter have little idea of the difference even a slight breeze makes when the mercury stands low in the thermometer for the wind then cuts through you furs and all and penetrates to the very bones determining to be on my guard against the frost i dressed myself as i thought as warmly as possible and so as to be utterly impervious to the elements first came three pairs of the thickest stockings drawn up high above the knee and over them a pair of fur-lined low shoes which in their turn were inserted into leather galoshes my limbs being finally deposited in a pair of enormous cloth boots the latter reaching up to the thigh previously i had put on some extra thick drawers and a pair of trousers the astonishment of the foreman of messrs kind's establishment lord love you sir 
being his remark when I tried them on. No cold can get through them trousers anyhow. I must confess that I rather chuckled as my legs assumed Herculean proportions, and I thought that I should have a good laugh at the wind, no matter how cutting it might be. But Aeolus had the laugh on his side before the journey was over. A heavy flannel undershirt and shirt covered by a thick wadded waistcoat and coat encased my body, which was further enveloped in a huge shuba, or fur pelisse, reaching to the heels, while my head was protected by a fur cap and vaslik, a sort of cloth headpiece of a conical shape, made to cover the cap, and having two long ends which tie round the throat. Being thus accoutred in all my armor, I sallied forth to join my companion, who, an enormous man naturally, now seemed a very colossus of roads in his own winter attire. How people would have laughed if they could have seen us in Piccadilly in our costumes. I think you will do, said my friend, scanning me well over, but you will find your feet get very cold for all that. It takes a day or so to get used to this sleigh traveling, and though I am only going a little beyond Samara, I shall be uncommonly glad when my journey is over. He was buckling on his revolver, and as we were informed that there were a great many wolves in the neighborhood, I tried to do the same, but this was an impossibility. The man who made the belt had never foreseen the gigantic proportions my waist would assume when clad in this Russian garb. I was obliged to give it up in despair and contented myself by strapping the weapon outside my saddlebags. For provisions for possibly a 36 hours journey, and as nothing could be bought to eat on the road, I provided myself with some cutlets and chicken, which fitted capitally into the mess tins, while my companion agreed to furnish the tea and bread, the former an article without which no true Russian will ever travel. He had not much baggage with him, and my own was reduced to as little as possible, but we soon discovered that it was impossible to stow away the luggage in the first sleigh that had been brought for our inspection for when my railway bag saddle bags cartridge box gun and sleeping sack had been put inside and were well covered with straw i essayed to sit upon them but found that there was too little distance from the improvised seat to the roof and my back was nearly bent double in consequence bring out another sleigh said my friend how the wind cuts does it not he continued as the breeze whistling against our bodies made itself felt in spite of all the precautions we had taken. The vehicle now brought was broader and more commodious than the previous one, which, somewhat in the shape of a coffin, seemed specially designed so as to torture the occupants, particularly if, like my companion and self, they should happen to be endowed by nature with that curse during a sleigh journey. However desirable appendages they may be when in a crowd, long legs three horses abreast their coats white with pendant icicles and hoarfrost were harnessed to the sleigh the center animal was in the shafts and had his head fastened to a huge wooden head collar bright with various colors from the summit of the head collar was suspended a bell while the two outside horses were harnessed by cord traces to splinter bars attached to the sides of the sleigh the object of all this is to make the animal in the middle trot at a brisk pace while his two companions gallop their necks arched round in a direction opposite to the horse in the centre this poor beast's head being tightly reined up to the head collar a well-turned-out troika with three really good horses which get over the ground at the rate of twelve miles an hour is a pretty sight to witness particularly if the team has been properly trained and the outside animals never attempt to break into a trot, while the one in the shafts steps forward with high action. But the constrained position in which the horses are kept must be highly uncomfortable to them, and one not calculated to enable a driver to get as much pace out of his animals as they could give him if harnessed in another manner. Off we went at a brisk pace, the bell dangling from our horse's head collar and jingling merrily at every stride of the team. The sun rose high in the heavens. It was a bright and glorious morning, in spite of the intense cold, and the amount of oxygen we inhaled was enough to elevate the spirits of the most dyspeptic of mankind. Presently, after descending a slight declivity, 
our yehu turned sharply to the right then came a scramble and a succession of jolts and jerks as we slid down a steep bank and we found ourselves on what appeared to be a broad high road here the sight of many masts and shipping which bound in by the iron fetters of a relentless winter would remain embedded in the ice till the ensuing spring showed me that we were on the volga it was an animated spectacle this frozen highway thronged with peasants who strode beside their sledges which were bringing cotton and other goods from orenburg to the railway now a smart troika would dash by us its driver shouting as he passed when our yehu stimulating his steeds by loud cries and frequent applications of the whip would vainly strive to overtake his brother coachman old and young alike seemed like octogenarians their short thick beards and mustaches being white as hoarfrost from the congealed breath according to all accounts the river had not been long frozen until very recently steamers laden with corn from southern russia had plied between Sizeran and samara the price of corn is here forty kopecks the pood of forty pounds while the same quantity at samara could be purchased for eighteen kopecks an iron bridge was being constructed a little farther down the volga here the railroad was to pass and it was said that in two years time there would be railway communication not only between samara and the capital but even as far as orenburg presently the scenery became very picturesque as we raced over the glistening surface which flashed like a burnished cuirass beneath the rays of the rising sun now we approach a spot where seemingly the waters from some violent blast or other had been in a state of foam and commotion when a stern frost transformed them into a solid mass pillars and blocks of the shining and hardened element were seen modeled into a thousand quaint and grotesque patterns here a fountain perfectly formed with ionic and doric columns was reflecting a thousand prismatic hues from the diamond-like stalactites which had attached themselves to its crest there a huge obelisk which if of stone might have come from ancient thebes lay half buried beneath a pile of fleecy snow farther on we came to what might have been a roman temple or vast hall in the palace of a caesar where many half-hidden pillars and monuments erected their tapering summits above the piles of the debris the wind had done in that northern latitude what had been performed by some violent pre-adamite agency in the berber desert take away the ebon blackness of the stony masses which had been cast forth from the bowels of the earth and replace them on a smaller scale by the crystal forms i have faintly attempted to describe and the resemblance would be striking we were now fast nearing kiva which could be just discerned in the distance but was hidden to a certain extent by a narrow belt of tall graceful trees however some richly painted minarets and high domes of colored tiles could be seen towering above the leafy groves orchards surrounded by walls eight and ten feet high continually met the gaze and avenues of mulberry trees studded the landscape in all directions the two kievans rode first i followed having put on my black fur pelisse instead of the sheepskin garment so as to present a more respectable appearance on entering the city nazar who was mounted on the horse that stumbled brought up the rear he had desired the camel driver to follow in the distance with the messenger and the caravan my servant being of opinion that the number of our animals was not sufficient to impress deeply the kievans with my importance and that on this occasion it was better to ride in without any caravan than with the small one i possessed we now entered the city which is of oblong form and surrounded by two walls the outer one is about fifty feet high its basement is constructed of baked bricks the upper part being built of dried clay this forms the first line of defense and completely encircles the town which is about a quarter of a mile within the wall four high wooden gates clamped with iron barred the approach from the north south east and west while the walls themselves were in many places out of repair the town itself is surrounded by a second wall not quite so high as the one just described and with a dry ditch which is now half filled with ruined debris the slope which leads from the wall to the trench had been used as a cemetery 
and hundreds of sepulchres and tombs were scattered along some undulating ground just within the city. The space between the first and second walls is used as a marketplace, where cattle, horses, sheep, and camels are sold, and where a number of carts were standing, filled with corn and grass. Here an ominous-looking cross-beam had been erected, towering high above the heads of the people with its bare, gaunt poles. This was the gallows on which all people convicted of theft are executed, murderers being put to death in a different manner, having their throats cut from ear to ear in the same way that sheep are killed. This punishment is carried out by the side of a large hole in the ground, not far from the principal street in the center of the town. But I must here remark that the many cruelties stated to have been perpetrated by the present Khan previous to the capture of his city did not take place. Indeed, they existed only in the fertile Muscovite imagination, which was eager to find an excuse for the appropriation of a neighbor's property. On the contrary, capital punishment was inflicted only when the laws had been infringed, and there is no instance of the Khan having arbitrarily put any one to death. The two walls above mentioned appear to have made up the defenses of the city, which was also armed with sixteen guns. These, however, proved practically useless against the Russians, as the garrison fired only solid shot, not being provided with shell. The Khan seemed to have made no use whatever of the many enclosed gardens in the vicinity of the city during the Russian advance, as, if he had, and firmly contested each yard of soil, I much doubt whether the Tsar's troops could have ever entered the city. It is difficult to estimate the population of an Oriental city by simply riding around its walls. So many houses are uninhabited, and others again are densely packed with inhabitants. However, I should say, as a mere guess, that there are about 25,000 human beings within the walls of Kiva. The streets are broad and clean, while the houses belonging to the richer inhabitants are built of highly polished bricks and colored tiles, which lend a cheerful aspect to the otherwise somewhat somber color of the surroundings. There are nine schools, the largest, which contains 130 people, was built by the father of the present Khan. These buildings are all constructed with high, colored domes and are ornamented with frescoes and arabesque work, the bright aspect of the cupolas first attracting the stranger's attention on his nearing the city. End of chapter 33「Chapter thirty four of Young People's Treasury, Volume six Famous Travels and Adventures by Hamilton Wright Maybe. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Betty B. The Taj Mahal by Joseph Moore. Delhi, the capital of the extinct Mughal Empire, is the Mecca of the East. What a train of thought is suggested by its very name. With a history dating back to the mythical period of the early Aryans, it was destroyed seven times and as often rose again to dominion and grandeur. Here, the Pathans of Guzni, under Mohammed Giri, founded A.D. 1193 the Moslem Empire of India, and two centuries later, 1398, the ruthless Tamerlane came with his fanatical hordes to burn, plunder, and drench the streets with blood. Next, the Sultan Baber, the descendant of Zengis Khan and Tamerlane, crossed the Indus and established the Mughal throne, 1526, in the conquered city. This memorable dynasty continued to flourish with only one interruption, and with increasing luster, for a 180 years, under a succession, unprecedented in Indian history, of six sovereigns, distinguished by their gallantry in the field, and, with one exception, by their ability in the cabinet. This galaxy of successful, though cruelly rapacious and utterly unprincipled rulers, consists of Baber, Humayun, Akbar, Jahangir, Shah Jahan, and Oren's Zebi. About these names cluster the relics of the power and splendor of the great moguls. The superb monuments of dazzling extravagance by which travelers are chiefly drawn to the imperial seats of Delhi and Agra. Modern Delhi is the work of the Emperor Shah Jahan, 1627 to 1658, 
a monarch celebrated for the splendor of his tastes, for the order of his finances, and for his love of building. As the new city approached completion, he left Agra, whither the great Akbar had removed his court, and Delhi again became the Mughal capital. The fort, or citadel, which contains the palace, now partly destroyed, the exquisite marble gem known as the Pearl Mosque, the luxurious baths, and the lavish pavilions of state, is the finest in India. Its gateways are in themselves imposing structures, and the lofty, castellated walls of red sandstone describe a circuit of more than a mile. Within the enclosure of the city are the famous Shalimar Gardens, now called the Queens, beyond which the inmates of the Zinana, or Harem, never passed. The culmination of all this magnificence is reached in the Diwan e Kaz, or Hall of Private Audience, which overlooks the river Jumna and the plain. This edifice is of marble, open at the sides and supported by massive square columns, the whole being adorned with mosaics of costly stones and inlaid gold. Adjoining it are the private apartments of the sovereign, where the pierced marble screens wrought in floral designs are of startling richness. In this hall stood the renowned peacock throne, which was plundered by the Persians, a mass of solid gold flanked by two peacocks with distended tails, all studded with diamonds and rubies, sapphires, emeralds, and pearls. The value of this wonder was estimated at six crores, or sixty millions of rupees, nominally thirty millions of dollars. On the cornices of the marble platform which bore the throne is the Persian inscription which Thomas More introduced so effectively in The Light of the Harem. And, oh, if there be an Elysium on earth, it is this, it is this. Shah Jahan was not long permitted to enjoy the grandeur he had created. During an illness which brought him to the point of death, his four sons became involved in a bitter conflict for the succession. And so far had it been carried by the time of his recovery that he was unable to resume his authority. The bold and subtle Aurangzebi overpowered all resistance, dethroned his father, and imprisoned the fallen monarch in the fort at Agra. There he spent the remaining seven years of his life within sight of that sublime mausoleum, the Taj, which he had reared to the memory of the adored wife of his youth. Despite this heartless act, to which he added the death of his brothers, Arunzebi lived to reign almost half a century, 1658 to 1707, and to wage a war of intolerance for twenty-five years. But the close of his career was tortured by suspicion, gloom, and remorse, and after his death the strained empire began to decline. Lala Rukh was the daughter of this cruel prince, and it was from the gate of the fort already noticed that she set out upon the journey to reach her future husband in the Vale of Kashmir. The day of her departure was as splendid as sunshine and pageantry could make it. The bazaars were all covered with the richest tapestry, hundreds of gilded barges upon the Jumna floated with their banners shining in the water, while through the streets groups of children went strewing the most delicious flowers around. And as Arunzebi stood to take a last look from his balcony, the procession moved slowly on the road to Lahore. Although Ireland's sweetest lyrist never visited the East, the scene he pictures may have been enacted at Delhi a century before his generation. But if his studies of forgotten writers have not prompted him to exaggerate, as in many instances, how completely has everything changed? Not a shred of the pomp he sketches is now to be seen. Delhi is yet the revered center of the forty millions of Moslems in India. Their cathedral mosque, the Jumna Mojid, is the most imposing religious edifice in the peninsula. It is built of red stone and stands on an elevated terrace, approached by a lofty flight of steps. Upon passing any of the three gates, we enter an immense paved quadrangle, with a marble reservoir in the middle, and surrounded by a cloistered colonnade. The mosque itself, on the western side of the enclosure, is surmounted by three bulbous domes of white marble, flanked by two high minarets constructed of alternate vertical stripes of marble and red sandstone. The whole, says Ferguson, 
forms a group intelligible at the first glance and as an architectural object possesses a variety of outline and play of light and shade which few buildings can equal delhi has now less than two hundred thousand population but it once had almost two million the remains of the cities which preceded the present one are strewn in profusion over the neighboring plain covering a distance of nearly sixty square miles temples and mosques tombs and palaces walls and forts are here crumbling and falling unheeded and deserted in the midst of this decay is the magnificent kutub minar the loftiest independent tower on the globe excepting the washington monument although it has stood nearly seven hundred years time has scarcely marred this noble achievement of pathan architecture unquestionably one of the wonders of the medieval world it far surpasses either the campanile of florence or the giralda of seville while the tower of the kremlin probably the highest in europe is unworthy of comparison because of its inferior construction we spent two days in exploring this vast area of ruins and marveled at the infinite waste which man has committed in the name of religion and through vain efforts to perpetuate his own memory the moral of this sumptuous wreck the fabrics of wealth wrung from the poor is written in the eternal law of nations that the era of luxury is the herald of decline a conquered race dragging out a most abject existence peoples this land of fabled riches and the vacant thrones of the tyrant moguls symbols of a paradise lost stand in the gorgeous halls of state waiting for old mortality to inscribe them with the words of milton they themselves ordained their fall as we rolled away from delhi and crossed the jumna bridge the young crescent faintly illuminated the snowy domes of the immaculate pearl mosque in the distance we could distinguish the tall memorial column on the commanding ridge from which british guns thundered their command to the mutineers to yield the stolen city when the train halted for a moment on the bridge we caught the martial notes of the english bugler within the embattled citadel of the splendor-loving shah jahan the exquisite marble balcony in which the great moguls sat to review their legions was vacant and the parade plain beneath as silent and peaceful as the shallow winding jumna lahore the present capital of the punjab holds an important place in mogul history and the plain which surrounds it like that of delhi is marked with the ruins of its departed greatness it was the chosen residence of the emperor jehangir whose splendid mausoleum richly decorated with mosaics stands on the opposite banks of the river ravi from the city before his accession to the throne this prince was called selim the name under which he appears in lala Rook, as the estranged lover of nor mahal the light of the harem but history presents a different story of this couple from that woven by the poet's fancy jehangir who was a drunkard and of cruel instincts already had four wives when he fell in love with the beautiful nor mahal she was the daughter of a persian adventurer named itmadud daula who afterward became prime minister of the empire the great akbar father of the prince interfered and dispatched the girl to bengal where she married one shur ufgan when akbar died jahangir sent for the object of his affection her husband naturally objected to the transfer so he was put to the sword to remove the difficulty the lady was then brought to agra where the emperor awaited her but she indignantly refused his advances this was the something light as air which more with rosy imagination has transformed into a mere lover's tiff upon the occasion of the feast of roses in the shalimar gardens at Kashmir. the lady's ambition however shortly allayed her scornful anger and obscured the memory of her murdered husband she wedded the sanguinary suitor and was raised to the throne as the favorite empress at this time she was a woman of middle age in addition to these realisms the veil of romance in which moore has enveloped her is further rent by the fact that she was a virago and given to unscrupulous political intrigue on the other hand it must be stated that husband and wife were very devotedly attached to each other when the emperor died he was profoundly mourned by nor mahal 
who reared the costly tomb in which she was afterwards laid by his side. One relic of that storied past yet exists in all its luxurious beauty, Shah Jahan's House of Joy, the Shalimar Gardens. We wandered through the orange groves and erotic retreats of this Elysium, picturing in our imagination the days of history and of song, when the marble pavements were trodden by the houris of the Zinana, and the five hundred fountains, strung in endless vista, terrace upon terrace, threw their sparkling jets into the sunshine to greet the august presence of the great Mogul. When we arrived at Agra, the great Mohammedan festival of the Moharam was at its height. In the bazaars, the shops of the Moslems and of many of the Hindus were closed, and the streets thronged with people in gay holiday attire. Notch girls, wives and daughters, all decked with the showy trinkets of the East, filled the windows and balconies, waiting for the culminating pageant of the day. As the procession approached, the crowd surged toward its head, and the excitement became intense. Agra is essentially a mogul city, and nowhere are the wealth and splendor of that oppressive dynasty evinced to a greater degree than in its sumptuous monuments. Here Akbar located his capital and built the imposing citadel which overhangs the Jumna. Within its crenellated walls, a mile and a half in circuit, stand the architectural gems, some in a condition of ruin which attests the magnificence of the imperial court. After passing the massive gateway of the enclosure, itself a fortress, and crossing a garden, we come to the hall of public audience. Next we enter the Zinana, where the beauty of the East was once gathered, and then the luxurious baths, all lavishly adored, which resemble the cool retreats and sprinkling fountains of the Alhambra. One of these chambers and its passages, called the Palace of Glass, are decorated with little mirrors, similar to the room at Amber. The hall of private audience consists of two pavilions, smaller than the one at Delhi, and more of the Hindu style, but almost as richly finished. Here we found the black throne of Akbar, upon which we coiled ourselves in oriental fashion, without, however, feeling like a great mogul. Then follow the elegant private apartments of the emperor, and pavilions, kiosks, and balconies overlooking the river, seventy feet below, all of snowy marble, with exquisite fretted lattices of the same material, and inlaid with mosaics of precious stones. Nearby is the immaculate Pearl Mosque, which is much larger than its queenly namesake at Delhi. Although purely Saracenic in style, this edifice depends for its exalted effect upon absolute simplicity of outline and graceful proportion, eschewing almost all ornament. The whole is of white marble, from the pavement of the court to the three crowning domes. Silvery bubbles which have rested a moment on its walls, and which the next breeze will sweep away. Even while the fort was in process of construction, Akbar was engaged in rearing a stupendous summer establishment about twenty miles from Agra. The ruins of this city, for such it is, are within a walled park, seven miles in circumference, embracing the present villages Fulapur and Sikri. The plateau of a long, rocky hill in the center of the enclosure was selected for the court, and upon this site arose a prodigal array of stately piles. Red sandstone is the prevailing material, but considerable marble was also used. Many of these structures are yet intact, while others exist in a state of partial decay. According to the statements of early travelers, Akbar once intended this most noble city for his seat of government. Scarcely, however, was it completed before he quitted the place for sanitary reasons. Palaces and mosques, zinanas and baths, walls and towers, tombs and gateways, pavilions, courts, and halls, built with the money and the labor of his subjects, were thus abandoned to neglect and decline. This transitory paradise seems to have owed its creation to the advice of a fakir, or holy mendicant, named Sheikh Salim, whose marble tomb stands in the quadrangle of the mosque, to commemorate the birth of the child that became the emperor Jahangir. Legend has interwoven its story with the history of this event, but in whatever light it may be viewed, we must conclude that Akbar either abetted a fraud or yielded to the baldest superstition. 
but with all his faults akbar was the greatest prince that ever sat on the throne of the moguls although constantly at war he never lost a battle during his reign the dominion of the empire was vastly extended and wise reforms were successfully introduced while a mohammedan by birth and education he was tolerant of all religions at one time he inclined to a belief in christ when he married the alleged christian lady the miriam of whittier's exquisite poem whose tomb is pointed out near his own superb mausoleum at secundra a short drive from agra he invited hindus to accept civil and military offices and chose two wives of that faith akbar's efforts to establish religious equality led him to devise an eclectic creed which sought to unite the followers of christ of zoroaster of brahma and of mohammed in this impossible task he naturally encountered failure and the abnormal system died with its founder every department of his court was sustained upon a scale of splendor before unknown in india under him and his successors agra blended the magnificence of the palaces of nineveh and the temples of babylon with the enchantments of the sylvan elysium of Kashmir. Yet after the recital of all this wondrous grandeur, the crowning glory of Agra and of India remains to be told. The incomparable Taj Mahal, that peerless marvel of love, of skill, of patience, of beauty, of treasure, and of power, the faultless, dazzling mausoleum which Shah Jahan raised to the memory of his beautiful, idolized court, in accordance with a promise made beside her deathbed. As a last request, she begged of him a memorial befitting a queen. In response, he vowed to rear above her remains a sepulchre that the world should hold matchless. More than two centuries have elapsed since this shrine of affection was completed. Attracted by its fame, in that period travelers from every clime have journeyed to Agra to behold the jeweled wonder. Man is critical, either from instinct or pedantry but not a single voice has yet denied that Shah Jahan has redeemed the fullest measure of his pledge. Entering a magnificent gateway, we find ourselves in a garden which rivals the charms of Shalimar. Before us stretches a lengthy avenue of the trembling cypress, along the middle of which a row of fountains toss their slender jets high into the stilly air, a superb vista a third of a mile long. At the extreme end, partially obscured by the abundant foliage, rises the Taj, so white and dazzling that it seems to be the source of the sunlight which crowns it like an aureole. Approaching it, we mount a broad terrace of red sandstone, upon which are two mosques of the same material, one on each side. From this base we ascend to a smaller platform of polished marble, whereon four towering minarets, snowy and graceful, dart upward from the corners. In the center of this fitting pedestal stands the Taj, radiant and of spotless white. The edifice is square, but as the corners are truncated, it might also be called octagonal. Surrounding it is a symmetrical, bulbous dome, flanked by four lesser bulbs raised on delicate pavilions. A lofty arched entrance and twin pairs of smaller arches pierce each of the four identical facades, adding an air of lightness and plasticity to faultless proportions. The walls of the exterior, not less than within, are lavishly embellished with inlaid vines and flowering texts from the Moslem scriptures. Indeed, it is credibly stated that the entire Quran is thus placed upon the mausoleum. Everywhere the finish is that of a jewel case, in supreme forgetfulness of toil or treasure. We enter the rotunda and stand thrilled by a beauty and solemnity which pass all expression. Lost in admiration, we unconsciously speak, and instantly the garden echo catches up the note and carries it round and round the lofty vault, calling it back softer and softer, as if not to wake the dead, until it fades into profound silence. Windows of marble lace temper the light within, harmonizing it with the religious sentiment which pervades the tomb. Directly beneath the dome is the cenotaph, of the empress covered with mosaics of flowers and foliage wrought in turquoise and jasper carnelian and sard chalcedony and agate lapis lazuli and jade bloodstone onyx and heliotrope 
Beside it is that of the emperor, similarly adorned. Surrounding them is a screen of marble filigree, elaborate and delicate beyond all conception. In a vault below the central hall is the inlaid sarcophagus, which contains the ashes of the Lady of the Taj, Muntaz e Mahal, the exalted one of the harem. There, also, close to the bride of his youth, rests the faithful Shah Jahan, deathless love joined for evermore. We came by moonlight to the sanctuary, when all was silent save the rippling of the Jumna, which flows by its side, and, walking around the shimmering pile, confess that the rare genius of the calm building finds its way unchallenged to the heart. End of chapter 34